The year was 4,280, according to the Yulan calendar, on the territory of the Poant Empire, the continent of Yulan. A time of a strange world and incredible events. A continent inhabited by unusual people and animals, warriors and magicians. High in the sky there was a battle. A mysterious girl in a mask and black overalls was hovering in the air and striking the ground with her staff. She was flying perfectly in the air and skillfully wielding a weapon, and a man on the ground was constantly dodging her blows. The force of her blows was so strong that the flashes could be seen far beyond the mountains. The sound of breaking stones and cracking was very frightening for the local animals. It was Delin Coward, a young girl with purple hair, a black mask on her head and glasses, dressed in black overalls and holding a staff. She was shouting at her grandfather, asking him if he was scared to see her and that he had nowhere to run. Constantly pointing her spear, she was shooting fire at an old man who was constantly trying to hide from her on the ground. She shouted at him that he would not escape her today, and that he was the only one who would die. The old man was gray-haired and bearded, dressed in a warm cloak and also waving some unknown weapon in Delin's direction. It was Hamelin, a stout old man who was cursing at her and shouting that she had been chasing him for three and three nights, so that now she would fight him to the death. He was brutally angry with her. He kept shouting that she should not even think that she could defeat him. We both have the holy level of great magic, so there will be no winners, he shouted at her. And shouting, he began to draw magic from his palm and it turned into fire. It was clear that he was really angry. Hamelin quickly shouted the spell Salamander's Dance and launched huge columns of fire towards Delin. The fire engulfed the girl from all sides and trapped her in a ball of fire, but her face showed no fear or confusion. She began to draw a cooling ball in the air around her with her staff, thus extinguishing the enemy's fire. Hamelin called her a turtle hiding behind a shell. Deline shouted at him that his words didn't hurt her, and laughed out loud. She continued to mock Hamelin, saying that he had said that he would become the most powerful firebender, and he was still at that level. Hamelin was furious and shouted that Delin was being ridiculous. His rage was overwhelming, and it seemed that he was going to explode. But then suddenly Delin heard the spell scorching stroke in her back, and she was pierced with pain and electric shock. She turned around with a roar of surprise and saw the mummy flying in the air next to her. And an incredible battle began. The mummy constantly attacked Delin with aggression and incredible strength. She was only able to fight back with her spear. Only lightning flashed in the sky. The mummy was shouting at Delin that she had a holy level of earth magic. It was provoking Delin to show her some more megatrix. And Delin, confused, just kicked it, throwing it back a few meters. Dillon thought in an instant that Hamelin had used an assistant, but close combat was not favorable for her, so she had to use magic to defeat him. She spun around and created a circle of fire around her and shouted a spell directing it at the mummy. There was an incredible explosion, and the stones under the mummy's feet split. The mummy continued to mock Dillon, saying that she had a good spell, but it was too slow, and that the difference between an Avenger and a magician was speed. Delin's next punch was even stronger, and the mummy flipped several times in the air. It was clear that it was not without pain. Delin thought that perhaps she should limit the mummy's movements and use a new strategy, namely, to summon the Earth Shield, and then she could restrain its speed. But then Hamelin insidiously intervened in the battle, and with his sword, he launched a pillar of fire at Delin's body, setting fire to the ground beneath her. The force of the fire was so strong that Delin could not understand what was happening and could not use her staff. She was in so much pain and heat that she thought it was probably best to go down to the ground. But then the mummy blocked the air between Delin and the ground with her sword. The mummy was laughing and shouting at Delin, but she probably didn't know that she could kill with both hands and use both sword and dagger at the same time. The mummy plunged the blade of her dagger into Delin's back. Blood spurted out and Delin's body convulsed with pain. The girl began to fall. Her body showed no signs of life. Her face turned white, and her legs were bleeding. After several rolls, she fell face down on the ground. Everything was silent in an instant. Delin laying in the bloody sand, not moving, with only the wind playing with her hair. 
Hamelin shouted to her with satisfaction that he had spent a lot of his efforts to lure her to a place where no one would find her body, and that not everything is solved by magic. The mummy stood behind him and laughed nastily, but at that moment Delin came to her senses. She looked up and gritted her teeth, saying that Hamelin had no pride left in the wizard if he had thought to trap her in this place. She began to struggle to get up and continued to tell Gamelin that he was just an earth mage who was arrogant enough to go up against a fire mage who had a thousand-year-old holy level of great magic. Hamelin mockingly replied that the job was done, no matter how. The mummy began to demand payment for his actions. The bandaged miracle stood there begging for money, but Hamelin would not listen. He kept threatening Daleen that he would kill her in order to absorb her essence and become the strongest forever. Delin thought she was being too careless, but she told Hamelin that he was underestimating her because she had more experience than him, and even if he trained for a hundred years, he would still not be like her. And even if I do die, it won't be by your hand. Hamelin laughed at her and called her stubborn. Delin quietly put her hand on the ground and whispered the incantation, O oh Mother Earth, I believe in you. Instantly she rose up and shouted the divine earth crush. A crown appeared above her head, glowing with blue light, and magic came into play. Dylan was rapidly rising into the sky from where she shouted to Hamelin to look at her one last time in the sky. This is my power, a heavenly field of fire, she shouted to him. Hamelin stood there in shock, he could not believe his eyes. At that moment he thought, where did she get so much power from, and he swung his sword from which a stream of fire came, and an incredible thing happened. Delin's heavenly field of fire met Hamelin's at the same time, and there was a huge explosion. Hamelin's last words were that it was impossible, and he would never believe it. His grandfather was burning in the fire. The mummy quietly muttered that the old battle was lost. The shockwave was terrible. Trees were torn up by the roots, Mountains were crushed into small stones, the earth and air were on fire, and it seemed as if the end of the world had begun. Five thousand years passed. The year was 9,990. Wushan Village, Fenglai Kingdom. Two men stood watching the children train. They were Lori and Roger. Lori said that today they had applicants who were full of energy. Roger replied that these kids were new to the group, so they wanted to show off their skills. Lori looked at Roger's face and said that he looked too embarrassed and excited. The guys were watching the fight between two people who looked completely different. They were discussing Lenli, the future leader of Wushan, who was stronger than an ordinary person, but his opponent in the battle had much more experience. It was Lenli Baruch, a young blonde boy who did not seem to be a big or pumped-up athlete. His opponent was five times bigger than him, had thick arms and stomach, and looked like he was going to crush Lenly with his weight. The man shouted at him that Lenly would not even be able to push him, but the latter unnoticeably clung to the big man's arm, and in an instant the big man fell face first into the ground, and it was clear that he was not happy about this disgrace. Lenly did not expect such a fall from his opponent, and was surprised, but he continued to fight with determination. He again took his opponent in an arm lock and threw him over himself hitting him painfully on the ground. Lori, Roger, and the other boys watched the fight with amazement and admiration, and someone in the crowd praised Lenly for beating an opponent who was older than him. How did you manage to knock me down? The fat man shouted in shock. Lenly smiled and gave him a hand to get up. Lori looked at him and said that the group of applicants was good, but no one could be compared to Lenly. This guy had trained since he was a child more than they had in their time. The knight standing next to them asked them if they were sure of their words. The knight was fully armored and holding a spear. He asked the boys what kind of behavior was expected of applicants. Laurie just opened his mouth to tell him about his impressions, calling him Captain instead of his first name. Then the knight quickly swung his spear and unexpectedly hit the unsuspecting Lenly. He hit the boy's shoulders so hard that he lost his balance and shouted, Uncle Hillman, come on! The children in the crowd were frightened by what they saw. Captain Hillman skillfully twisted his spear around Lenly's body like a spiral, which he helplessly spun like a toy. But at some point, Lenly gathered himself and managed to get to his feet, catching his balance. 
And then, unexpectedly for everyone around him, he quickly grabbed the sharp spear of the surprised captain. With a sharp yank, Lenly bent the spear to the ground and jumped on top of it. The crowd of children whispered, Is he really standing on the captain's spear? The children kept asking each other. Lindley began to spin on the spear, then stood on his feet, then stood on his hands. He looked like a circus acrobat. Hillman took off his helmet and said with satisfaction that little Lenley had great skills, and none of his attacks had hit the boy. To himself, the captain thought that Lenley was indeed a real miracle of Wushan, maybe even the whole Feng Lai kingdom. It was just a small test, so I'll teach you more later, the captain promised the kid. Hillman turned to the crowd of children and asked if anyone knew how many levels the warrior class was divided into. The crowd shouted, Nine levels! He then asked the amazed children if anyone knew anything about these levels and could tell him, Tomorrow we will start physical training, but today I will teach you the basics of warriorhood, Hillman promised them. The children were excited that the captain would teach them personally. Hillman walked over to a large stone standing nearby and touched it lightly with his fist. Shouting at that moment, Strike Chi! The stone shattered into small stones in front of the amazed crowd of children. Hillman explained to all the children that this was the true power of a sixth-level warrior, and the captain continued his story about the ranks. The continent of Yulan was founded on wars and battles. If a person didn't reach the first level, no one would fight them. Having the first level was the minimum requirement to join the army. A warrior of the third level can become an elite soldier, and if you reach the fifth or sixth level, you can become a captain. Lindley slyly asked Captain Hillman what he had to say about level nine soldiers. Hillman replied that Lindley had been able to dodge his attacks, but if he showed his full strength, the boy would not be able to escape. Even if he had dodged, he would not have been able to avoid the next attack. Seventh and eighth level warriors are stronger than him. I've never met a real warrior of the ninth level in my life, the captain replied to the disappointed boy. Above the ninth level, there are four other legendary supreme warriors who have become saint level warriors, Hillman continued to explain. Hillman explained that the great generals of Yulan are only level eight. If there is a level nine warrior, then in Fenglai he will become the number one warrior, but level nine is not the maximum level. The four great warriors are the Dragon Blood Warrior, the Purple Flame Warrior, the Striped Tiger Warrior, and the Immortal Warrior. They appeared thousands of years ago, and each of them can destroy an army of millions with one hand. Roger asked Hillman how it was that he had never seen a level nine warrior, but could describe four great warriors in such detail. The crowd of children heard this answer and began to laugh out loud. And then Lori slapped Roger across the face and hissed at him that he was an idiot. Couldn't he see how excited the children were? The captain was trying to create an idol for them to motivate them to train harder. How perceptive you are, Hillman smiled at him. On a hill not far from this training camp, there was a huge old castle with strange architecture. It was the home of Lenly, or rather the home of the Baruch clan. It was a huge building of Japanese architecture of that time and with all the relevant attributes. The courtyard of the house sat a man who had carved a sculpture of a child's face out of wood. He muttered that time had passed very quickly and Lenly was already twelve years old. It was time to tell him everything. Turning to the sculpture he was holding in his hand, he asked, If you are still alive, will you support my methods? At that time, three sons had already left the Baruch family clan and the story of this family would probably end soon. This was Nog Baruch, Lenly's father. He was a tall, stout man with a beard about 45 years old with tired eyes. Nog walked over to the shelves with the carved busts of his children and whispered, Maybe your generation is the last chance for our family, little Lenly. Don't let us down. The Barak clan's estate covered a huge area, but most of the land was abandoned and uncultivated. Lenly ran around the courtyard of the old manor with all his might, shouting and looking for his father, but he was nowhere to be found. A little boy ran out to meet him and threw his arms around his neck, screaming, Brother, I have learnt so much today, it was Horton Baruch, Lenly's younger brother. Lenly was startled by the boy's scream and asked him where their father was. Horton did not listen to him but showed him a small rag. 
Lenly smiled and asked him what he had done with it. The proud little boy replied that he was wiping everything around him. He went on to say that he had wiped the column, the jugs, and even the toilet paper. He was very proud of himself. Today, my brother, I have learned the most important thing, how to use a rag, Horton shouted. He even rubbed his father's favorite dishes with it to shine. Lenly heard this and laughed out loud throughout the yard. He bent down to the boy and whispered to him not to say anything about the dishes to his father, just in case. At this time, Heary, the butler, came out to them and reported that the master was in the study waiting for someone. Lenly ran to his father's study and met him there, and Nog asked him how today's training was going. Lenly happily replied that Uncle Hillman had praised him. Lenly called out to his father again, but he had turned his back on the blazing fireplace and was staring at the fire without hearing him. Nog quietly told him that as the heir to the Baruch clan and as the future leader of Wushan, he had to be better than the others. His father seemed unhappy and gloomy today. I wonder what happened, thought Lenly. There was some tension. He asked his father if he would teach him today. Nog agreed and asked Lenly to repeat the areas of Yulin. Lenly explained that there were twelve kingdoms west of the ridge and thirty-two principalities divided into two divisions. The Holy Alliance, led by the kingdom of Fin Lai, and the Dark Alliance, led by the kingdom of Henli, are at war. In the east, there are six kingdoms and many principalities. In the empires, the laws of the emperor are inviolable. They consist of the Central Empire, the Yulin Empire, the Southeastern Empire, the Rin Empire, the Eastern Empire, the Roholt Empire, and the Northern Empire, the O'Brien Empire. Lenly continued his story. And then Lenly's speech was interrupted. They heard the doorbell ring. Someone came in and greeted Nog. But Nog didn't hear anything, that someone had entered their house and continued to question Lenly. Philip, a traitor, came into the room and greeted Nog with words of joy that he had invited him to visit. Nog hugged Philip and said that he was also very happy to see him. He was an old friend of his. Nog turned to his son and told him that he should know all about the Holy Alliance in which he lived. And he explained to Philip that Hillman was about to bring what he had invited him to come for. Philip was impatient and kept asking where Captain Hillman was and why he was taking so long. Suddenly, Hillman brought into the room a huge sculpture of a lion, the size and fleshiness of which was impressive. Philip, completely delighted with the sculpture, offered Nog five hundred gold coins for it. He looked at the sculpture for a long, long time and exclaimed that it was definitely the cruel lion. But Nog answered him that five hundred gold coins was a very small price. This sculpture was of historical importance, and it is worth much more. Meanwhile, Lenly looked at the men and thought that this was his father's favorite sculpture, and how could he sell it so cheaply? But Philip began to persuade Nog, saying that the history of Yulan is very rich, and there are such treasures at every turn. However, he liked the sculpture very much, but he thought that its artistic value was not very high. Lindley continued to think that things must not be going well in the family. Otherwise, his father would never have sold this sculpture. The boy ran out in despair and turned to Captain Hillman, tears in his eyes. But the latter stopped him abruptly, telling him to forget everything and to stay out of his father's business, because he was still young. Philip's servants packed the sculpture of the cruel lion on rails and carefully carried it home to their master. Philip turned to Hillman and said that although he ruled twelve cities, he had never met anyone stronger than him. The sculpture was very heavy, but Hillman moved it from one place to another with ease with one hand. He had never seen anything like it. Hillman thanked him. Philip offered Captain Hillman to serve him, and he was ready to pay him a huge salary. But the latter abruptly refused, explaining that Wu Shan was his home, and apologized for not being able to accept the offer. Captain Hillman and Lenly went out of the house into the yard, where it was quiet and they could talk in peace. On the way, Lenly asked him if things were really that bad in the family. Hillman told him that his father was a very good man, but that he was of little importance to Wushan. Gritting his teeth, Hillman said, These bastards with their new money. Long ago the Baruch clan was prosperous. They both stood there and watched in silence as the sculpture of the beloved cruel lion was carefully carried away from their home. Nog approached them unnoticed. He told Kamatan Hillman not to talk like that, 
It was not the fault of these people. Nog lowered his gray head and whispered quietly, sadly, that he was very ashamed in front of his whole family. I just want to revive my luck, even if it means selling off the family inheritance. Looking back, we are probably guiding our descendants, Nog continued. It often happens that talented, beautiful works lie idle, and there is no interest in them. Lenly asked him why he had sold the sculpture of the cruel lion, and why doesn't he sell his sculptures, being a very good carver. Nog explained to him that they belonged to the Bara clan. In the past, they had a powerful sculpting technique that surpassed many masters. Compared to them, he was a mediocrity. Lenly was very angry and he vowed that when he grew up, he would help his father revive the clan. Hillman listened and said that although he had no talent as a sculptor, he recognized that becoming a sculptor was as difficult as becoming a warrior. But Linley has the opportunity to become an eighth-level warrior. It was a warm summer night. The moon was full, and the sky was clear, inky, and strewn with bright stars. Linley found his father in the ancestral hall and asked him what they were doing out so late. Norg said in a sad voice that it was time to tell him their family's long-held secret. He asked the boy to come to the shelves with the sculptures. He explained that he had turned twelve years old and was considered an adult according to the Baruch family's traditions. Lenly was shocked to hear that his family had some family secrets. But Nog asked his son to tell him the story of their family, which they had studied together, and Lenly began to tell. That according to the legend, they are descendants of a sculptor who was an eighth-level warrior. He created techniques for sculpting and fighting, but after he died, no one could reach his level, and so the family was split up. The father put his palm on the table and said that he was right, but unfortunately, this was not their true story. The room where they were standing began to glow brightly, and Lenly was very frightened. He had never seen anything like it. Suddenly, a furious column of hot fire rose from his father's hands. Lenly's body was filled with incredible fear. Nog shouted loudly that all the sculptures of their ancestors reflected their entire family's past. Lenly saw an unknown old thick book on the table and shouted loudly to his father. What is it? Nog told the boy what Hillman had told him, that Lenly already knew about the four great warriors, and Lenly confirmed it. Nog began to read the old book and tell the true story of their family which he had never told his son. The first warrior of the family had dragon blood in his veins and lived on the Yulan continent. The year 4560, in the city of Linan, Baruch killed a titanic ice snake and a black dragon, and because of this he became very famous. And in 4579, Baruch fought a nine-headed imperial snake. The waves crashed and smashed the nearest towns, he fought the dragon for a day, and finally took off all the heads, and then founded a clan and became its leader. Ryan Baruch was already the second dragon-blooded warrior on the Yulan continent. In the year 4690, Ryan Baruch tamed a saint-level golden dragon in the Mountains of Magical Beasts and became known as the Golden Dragon Rider of the Saint. Together with the Golden Dragon, he tamed all the magical beasts and became a legend of the Mountain of Magical Beasts. The third warrior of Dragonblood was Azar Baruk, who, in the year 5395, fought against a blood-eyed lion in his first battle. He defeated the lion and made it flee, but he was afraid of becoming world famous. Nog continued to read the magical family book louder and louder, and Lenly listened attentively, holding his breath. Azar Baruch alone maintained the Holy Alliance and fought the forces of the Dark Alliance for hundreds of years. Nog continued to read. No one but our family knows the true story, Nog told the impressed young Lenly. The blood of Baruch has been passed down in our family for five thousand years. The blood of a dragon-blooded warrior runs in our veins, Nog continued. To say that Lenly was shocked is an understatement. He could not believe what he was hearing. His eyes were wide open. A dragon blood warrior! Nog shouted these words loudly to the whole room and a long echo echoed through the room. The last warrior had disappeared from the continent two thousand years ago. A hundred years after the clan was founded, four dragon blood warriors appeared. But none have appeared since, Nog said. To become a dragon blood warrior, 
One must have a high concentration of dragon blood in the human body. Linley thought that his family had indeed once been very strong and could fight back against anyone, but not anymore. The concentration of dragon blood has definitely decreased significantly in our blood, Lenly continued to think. Here Nog began to read the old book again, continuing with the words, but generation after generation. But Lenly interrupted and asked what this dragon blood manual was. And is it possible to reverse the dragon bloodline? Nog explained to him that their blood was passed down from generation to generation, but sometimes someone would manifest dragon blood. The secret manual of dragon blood guides a warrior on the path of a warrior, calls dragon blood into the body, and releases energy. But this manual was lost a thousand years ago. In order to protect our family, we have to keep it a secret, he said. You're twelve years old now, I can pinpoint the dragon blood in your body, Nog said loudly. Putting his hand on his son's shoulder, he said that he really hoped that he or his younger brother would have dragon blood. Nog took out a strange long dragon blood needle from a drawer. It was a very powerful magic item. Lenly's insides cringed with wild fear. He was just a child, so he was afraid of all kinds of injections. This needle is an indicator. It can tell if you really have dragon blood or not, his father told him. Nog told the boy to get ready. He was going to prick his finger. A little more and Lenly would have lost consciousness. The boy stretched out his right hand to his father, shaking with fear. His legs began to bend awkwardly. Nog lightly touched the boy's finger with the needle, and for some reason everything began to glow, both the finger and the magic needle. The father looked at the needle and his hands trembled. He really did not want to hurt his beloved son. When he finally pierced the finger, blood began to drip from the needle, and they both stood there looking at it in silence. And then a strong earthquake began. The ground shook so violently that all five statues in the room disappeared. Nog and Lenly started to hold each other's hands, but they couldn't hold on to their feet from the tremors and fell heavily to the ground. The man got up and ran to the courtyard to see what had happened. He felt that something terrible was happening there. At that moment, Lenly noticed a strange black ring on the floor lying in the corner and absorbing light. Still holding the needle in his hands, he looked at it and thought, maybe he should put it away. What was that light? Was it good or bad? All sorts of thoughts swarmed through his mind. He finally made up his mind and picked up the ring and began to look at it. Looking through it, nothing seemed strange to him. He decided to keep it for now and put it in his pocket, in the safest place. That evening in Wushan... Captain Hillman and the rest of his unit went out to patrol the streets of the village. Hillman told the soldiers that if they compared him and Lenly, he thought that when he was ten years old, he would be superior in strength. But the little boy was so strong and skillful that he did not have even half of his talent. Baruch's family can no longer practice their secret manual, Nog told me that, Hillman said. One of the warriors in the squad asked Hillman what Nog's strength level was because he didn't look very strong. I don't know. I only know that all previous generations of the Baruch family were sculptors who were skilled in martial arts. But I don't think it takes strength alone to reach the eighth level, replied Hillman. They continued to patrol the streets on the outskirts of the village, carefully looking into all the dark corners of the settlement. And then at the end of the road they saw some disturbances, and one of the warriors saw that something strong and unusual was happening there and that everyone should be careful. When they looked closely, they saw a mountain of magical animals. Captain Hillman peered very carefully into the darkness and analyzed what he saw with amazement. He was surprised to see the huge horns of an unknown beast. And then Captain Hillman shouted loudly to someone. You? The crowd of soldiers could not understand what he was talking about. A huge buffalo with red eyes came out to them with human figures on its back. Someone shouted to them, Hello, everyone. When they came closer, they saw that there were people with weapons on the back of the buffalo. The most important of them had red hair. He shouted to his men that the guards had responded. Someone shouted that they did not believe that there were people with powers in the guard. The soldiers hysterically shouted to Hillman that these strangers were looking down on them. Hillman asked if they were mercenaries, but the strangers were silent for some reason. Their faces were full of aggression and anger. There was a fierce hatred in the air. 
Captain Hillman loudly explained to the strangers that they did not welcome such guests and would not let anyone in. One of the strangers whispered to the red-haired man that they might have to fight, and he jumped off the buffalo. I'm going to teach this uncle a lesson. Who doesn't even know how old he is, the stranger shouted. And he hit the soldier of the guard with all his might, and he fell to the ground in surprise. In response, the soldier of the guard gave the stranger a good punch. Now it's your turn, they shouted to Captain Hillman. The stranger pulled out his huge dagger and charged at Captain Hillman. Hillman drew his forged sword and struck the stranger with an unprecedented force. The stranger did not expect him to be so strong. The stranger was thrown twenty meters away with a roar and fell painfully on his back in the bushes. If you are not afraid of death, then attack me, the captain shouted at him. He was very aggressive. The stranger got to his feet with difficulty, saying that he would beat him much harder than the last time. Everyone sitting on the buffalo's back, including the girls, watched the fight with bated breath. The stranger shouted something incomprehensible to everyone and swung his dagger at the captain again. He ran with a terrible scream at Captain Hillman, who stood firmly on his feet and unmoving, ready to take any blow. Captain Hillman quickly thrust his spear towards the stranger, who was running towards him with a beastly face. With a terrible whistle, the dagger and spear of Captain Hillman and the mad stranger clashed in the air. A terrible battle broke out. The air rang with the blows of their weapons and the swings of their arms, and the ground was deafeningly humming. But Captain Hillman stood boldly and firmly on his feet, and skillfully wielded his spear and sword in all directions. The stranger did not yield for a moment. He was very angry and waved his dagger as much as the captain. Watching this wild and terrible fight, Luke finally shouted at them, Stop at last, both of you! The stranger stopped angrily. He could not understand how it could be that his opponent was so strong. Luke stood on the bull's head and told the captain that he recognized his strength, but did not want to fight with him, and suggested that they stop fighting. He explained that they were not angry people and had come here on important business. Captain Hillman told the stranger that their city would never accept such bandits. Then the stranger's soldiers and the guards heard a strange loud sound coming from the mountains. Luke looked back in fright and shouted that everything was very bad. Had he caught up with them? No one could understand what he meant. Captain Hillman could not understand what he was talking about. He was constantly looking into the distance to see something. Then a huge red dragon appeared in front of everyone's eyes. It was just gigantic, with red scales and spikes. Oh my God, what is that? All the warriors shouted in a chorus. It was the seventh rank of the magical beast, the Velocity Dragon. The girls on the buffalo shouted that it had caught up with them. And one of them mockingly asked if they still wanted to continue their battle. People ran out of the doors and climbed out of the windows, all looking at the magic dragon in disbelief. Meanwhile, in the Baruch family's ancestral hall, Lenly decided to hang the dark ring around his neck so he wouldn't lose it. And then he heard his friends shouting, saying how could he sleep when there was such a scream outside. The boy ran out into the yard and saw his two friends and told them that it was late. What were they doing here? But the children kept shouting to the whole yard that it was some kind of terrible, magical beast. So this is not an ordinary earthquake, thought Linley and fear stiffened his body and his legs began to shake. Perhaps there is something in the ancestral hall that does not let sounds through, he thought. But his friends started calling him to go and see. All three of them ran very quickly to the outskirts of the village, heading straight for the unusual sound coming from the distance. And then the ring hanging from a string around Linley's neck began to glow with a bright blue light. I must have been asleep for a very long time. Some unknown girl stretched sweetly in the air. She materialized in midair and began to move right behind Linley. Did that boy wake me up? She said in surprise, stretching to her full height. It was Dellen Coward. The girl could not believe that she was really woken up by this strange little boy. She began to move invisibly through the air behind Linley, being completely light and transparent. Meanwhile, the red dragon came as close as possible to the buffalo and the warriors, who were on it, and the guard squad. One of the soldiers shouted that there was a magician who controlled it, but everyone covered his mouth so as not to draw the dragon's attention to them. They all saw an elderly man in a hat with a monocular who shouted at them, You won't escape this time! But Luke knew this man very well. 
so he boldly asked him what was true. The man in the hat stood on the neck of a red dragon, holding a spear with a green stone and shouted, We meet again, my friend. But let's not have any of that bullshit today, just give me this thing, he ordered Luke menacingly. In Luke's hands was a large stone of unprecedented beauty, shimmering from all sides, blue and green. He took it out of the inside pocket of his colorful vest and rubbed it on his sleeve. It was the DeBarrow Shadow Diamond, worth 10,000 gold coins. It could be used as a core to improve the quality of a weapon. If it was put into a staff, it would improve the quality of the weapon and reduce the time it took to cast magic. Difficult to create weapons. Captain Hillman was shocked to think that this could be the very legendary. But his thoughts were interrupted by a man in a hat who shouted, Diamond de Barrow, we finally meet. Not that we didn't want to. But there are no such idiots who want to offend a high-ranking magician, Luke replied. But the wizard began to shout that he had not only refused the exchange, but had stolen it from him. Roger shouted at the top of his lungs that it was very, very expensive for them. In response, Luke shouted that the magician wanted it for a thousand gold coins. How could anyone agree to such terms? All the soldiers on the buffalo began to shout that they could not accept such a bad deal. The magician shouted that he was ready to trade with them. Don't even think about refusing. Stop hinting. Give it to me, he shouted. Luke shouted back that they did not agree to this at all. Suddenly, the magician launched huge columns of fire right at Luke's feet. Luke was furious and shouted, I, the Tsolo clan of Fenglai. He put his dookie armor in front of the stream of fire that was flying straight at him. The maid sharpened his monocle and looked at Luke's armor and said that it was not bad at all. Luke fearlessly pointed his sword and shouted to him that no one was afraid of him at all. Fire magic. Luke shouted a spell and a blue glow appeared around him. We will decide everything today in battle, the wizard shouted nervously to him. All the warriors who were sitting on the buffalo quickly began to jump down with fire. Feel the power of the seventh-ranked magical beast, the Velocity Dragon, the wizard shouted, and the dragon opened its mouth and gave out a column of fire. Everyone who got down from the buffalo began to line up in a fighting seven and took out all their weapons. The two girls who had come down from the buffalo shouted a spell. Holy water! Luke, with all his fury, threw himself into this fierce battle alone. The girls cast magic. The red dragon gave off fierce fire. Everything was mixed into one big pile. The battle moved to the walls of the outpost, which Luke completely destroyed with his sword. Hillman's soldiers rushed to him. The magician's soldiers and Luke's soldiers mixed their slaughter into one heap. It was no longer possible to see who was beating whom. This terrible massacre destroyed all the buildings that stood in its way, burning everything around. Huge pieces of buildings were flying in all directions, some of them flying towards the Red Dragon. What kind of incomprehensible attack is this? shouted a very angry mage, who could be heard throughout the neighborhood. Twenty minutes later, the Red Dragon was in the center of the battle. Everything was on fire, houses and trees alike. Frightened residents were running out of the destroyed houses, and Hillman ordered his soldiers to take all the refugees to the city center. Luke's soldiers hit the dragon's body with everything they had at hand, including swords, spears, and clubs. Bless us all with ice battle armor, Luke shouted loudly, his head thrown back. His strong body and the bodies of the warriors were instantly covered with ice armor, which was in the form of a ball of thick ice. An incredible ice magic barrier was created for all the soldiers, preventing any magic power from passing through. The silhouette of a flying lion appeared in the sky on which the magician's archer stood trying to take aim. The battle came so close to the magician that the warriors began to fly over his head. He was forced to fight back with his spear. Are you all tired of living? The furious magician shouted to all the warriors, shocked at the way they were fighting. But at that moment, sharp arrows suddenly flew past his head. The village was on fire. Some houses had already burned down to the foundations. And Captain Hillman was in deep shock. Roger and other soldiers rushed to him. They did not know what to do. Hillman gave them an order to inform the Lord that they could not stay here. Think we need to evacuate all the residents of Wushan immediately. Because there will be many deaths, Hillman exclaimed. We can't stop this battle. We can rebuild the destroyed houses, but we can't bring back the dead people. 
said the captain. Is there no other way out but to evacuate? asked Hillman. The soldiers asked Captain Hillman if there was any other option but to evacuate the villagers. They all thought that this was absolutely stupid. The captain remained silent. His hands were shaking and the soldiers saw this and ran to the old lord with all their might. Meanwhile, the three teenagers were running as fast as they could through the narrow streets of Wushan to meet the strange sound. They were terribly curious about what was happening there, and none of them felt afraid at that moment. If we are late, we will miss Hillman defeating the magic beast, said one of them. The second boy replied that the strongest magic beast was only of the fourth rank, and even if a fifth rank beast appeared, it would be no match for him. The teenagers were running down the street, and a crowd of people were running towards them wearing whatever they could, crying and screaming. The children did not understand what was happening. Linley ran and thought about the magical animals, not noticing the crowd of people he encountered. Until one man shouted to him, Why are they running there? It's too dangerous and there's a fierce battle going on. Luo Zui quickly ordered everyone to flee, or there will be irresistible consequences for them. The stranger continued to shout at them. The teenagers finally stopped on the outskirts of the village, and after catching their breath, they looked at each other, all of them hearing the scary sounds. And then Lenly began to see some strange and unusual flashes in the forest. The children shouted that it must be a cruel, magical beast, and they had to see it. And they ran fearlessly into the forest. The patrolling soldiers shouted to the boy that Master Lee should not go there. But the children asked the patrolling soldiers that they really wanted to see the dragon. Their conversation was interrupted by a terrible explosion. The flames of fire rose high into the sky, and a fierce blast wave hit the bodies of the children and the patrolling soldiers. Lenly covered his face with his hands in surprise from the intense fire and shock wave, his body covered in heat and dust. The patrol officers shouted at them that the place was too dangerous for them as well. Lindley shouted, What kind of magical beast is this? There was another terrible explosion. This one was stronger than the previous one and the patrolmen and the teenagers started running away. It's a seventh-ranked magical beast, a velociraptor, and it's controlled by a magician. Lori shouted to them. It's coming again. Everyone take cover! He shouted again, and everyone started running to find somewhere to hide. As they were running, they saw the body of one of the strangers lying unnaturally with his arms outstretched and not moving. The teenagers saw this and started screaming in terror throughout the forest. Laurie ran over and saw that it was one of the mercenaries who had come with him, and he was lying dead. At that moment, Captain Hillman ran up to them and started shouting at them to get out of here. Hillman was shouting for everyone to be careful because another huge fireball was coming at them. But unfortunately, the ball came too close to them, exploding on impact into small pieces of fire that created a blast wave. The captain announced to everyone that the mercenaries would most likely not last long so they had to evacuate quickly. The forest behind them was starting to burn more and more. The wind that came out of nowhere was insidiously fanning the fire. I told you the magician was shouting in defiance as if he had gone mad, that no one could match him, a high-class wizard. The battle turned into a fiery massacre, a dragon, warriors, fire, screams of the villagers, blood, and the endless sounds of clanging weapons. On the ground lay the corpse of another warrior. It was Lu Iza. The magician shouted to everyone that today everyone would be like Lou. And then Lenly finally saw for the first time in his life the Velociraptor, which was impressive in its gigantic size. One of the mercenaries rushed at him with a sword, and in response the Velociraptor launched a strong column of fire. The guy fell down from surprise, but it was good that he was alive and well. One of the mercenaries shouted that they should try to extinguish the dragon with a water geyser. The other mercenaries tried to slay the dragon with their swords, going behind its spiked back, so that it would not notice them. And then the mage shouted for everyone to look at him and learn what eighth-rank magic looks like. He shouted the spell, Dance of the Fire Snakes, and began to draw with his staff fire eights that really looked like snakes. Ugh, what a nasty spell he just said, Delon thought. She was also there, hovering nearby in the air, watching this frantic battle with great interest. All over the sky, the wizard was launching fiery circles and figure eights that looked like fiery fantasy dragons. 
And then Luke realized that this was an eighth-ranked spell and ordered everyone to flee. His girls shouted that the water geyser was also destroyed. The magician laughed, saying that it was too late and that everyone should accept their deaths. The terrible fire he launched engulfed the bodies of the mercenary girls. The girls began to burn in terrible agony and screaming. The scene was horrific. No one had expected it. Then the fire spread from them to other mercenaries. One of them tried his best to shoot an arrow at the magician's head to stop him somehow. It was the archer who had appeared earlier with the flying lion. But it was all in vain. The arrow also burned. Luke shouted with a swing of his sword that he could not defeat an eighth-ranked magician. But he risked his due chi and still tried to cut the magician once. But the mage shouted as he entered the fight that Luke was the last of his team of seven. The magician continued to shout that Luke would not have enough strength, but he whispered to him that the magician was still a big bastard. And a barrel of fire from the magician flew into his body. The force of the blow was so great that the unfortunate boy was thrown several hundred meters straight into the forest. With the last of his strength, Luke climbed onto a lion that flew up to him and began to move away from the magician. And he launched an unusual spell after him with his staff. Element of Electricity Thunderstorm. Captain Hillman was amazed to think that this wizard was also a dual element wizard. The force of magical electricity struck Luke's body, and he fell from the lion to the ground. The magician was laughing to the whole neighborhood. Hillman, gritting his teeth, continued to watch this irrepressible and vile wizard in silence. Lindley asked Uncle Sea Ear Man who these unusual two style magicians were. He readily replied that there were no more than two magicians in the kingdom who were stronger than this. If he wanted to, he could destroy this city in one go, and everyone would prepare to die. Dylan mockingly thought that he was only the eighth rank. She hung in the air and watched all the soldiers standing there in despair, as well as little Lenly. Dylan couldn't calm down. How could this boy wake her up? Maybe the secret was in his blood. The girl looked at the frightened children in the crowd and found herself laughing. Deline quietly muttered that such magic was only good for barbecuing, not killing people, and that it was not a power. With her hand outstretched and focused, Dellen began to form magic. Suddenly she shouted out the giant meteorite drop spell. It was a rank nine magic. A small stone flew past her very quickly. Lenly, who was busy watching the battle, felt something strange fall on his head. The meteorite stone that Dellen had launched fell on him and rolled to the ground. Rift. Dellen snorted in displeasure and mockery. Meanwhile, the mage holding the diamond in his hand was snickering that he had finally got the dark Debero diamond, even though it had been ten years. He stood over Luke's body and twirled the mysterious diamond in his hands. The wizard inserted the diamond into the handle of his staff and proclaimed that it was absolutely beautiful. When he calmed down, he turned to the crowd and asked who was in charge and to come out to him. Captain Hillman bravely answered the magician that he was the most important warrior and boldly stepped out of the crowd. When the magician saw him, he cried out hysterically that Hillman was a low-ranking warrior and that this battle had caused a lot of damage to the people of Wushan, but only a couple of houses. And then the magician came up with a brilliant idea. He pretended that, in his opinion, the mercenaries were naive but strong, but they probably had a lot of money with them. He then suggested that Hillman count the money, take it for himself, and consider the damage done. Hillman did not understand anything and mumbled what the magician wanted to say. But then, unexpectedly for everyone, the captain continued that he was very grateful to His Highness for the kindness of the whole village of Wushan. The magician laughed evilly jumped up on his dragon and said that only gold coins melted in the fire. He sat on his dragon and flew away. Roger asked Hillman if he could search the bodies, even though there was not enough money to rebuild the village. But the captain flatly forbade him to do so. Finally, the nightmare was over and the stupid magician was gone, the captain thought. He ordered the soldiers to bury the mercenaries with all their wealth and according to the appropriate rules. And then one of the soldiers asked what we were going to do as many of the residents were left without homes. Suddenly everyone heard people thanking Nog. Lenly and Captain Hillman turned round and saw him, too. Nog told them to remove the tattoos and that the Talu K family would rebuild everything at their own expense. He asked Hillman what kind of beast it was. 
he began to tell him that it was a velociraptor, and when he saw it, his legs shook, and if this magician wanted to destroy the village, they would not be able to resist him. But Nog was still very happy that no one was hurt, and sincerely thanked Hillman. But the captain was embarrassed, and quietly replied that it was his duty, and he was very sorry that he would now have to pay for the new building. Nog looked at his son and asked if he was hurt. He remained silent and did not answer. But the man could not calm down, because he believed that he had to take responsibility for failing to protect all his subjects. Linley thought that if he had been a dragon-blooded warrior, he would have been able to protect everyone and defeat the enemy. The boy remembered that the ritual to test his blood with a needle was interrupted, but his father stood silently with his head bowed, thinking about something. Lenly was also upset. He thought that nothing had worked, just as his father thought he was useless and he would never become a dragon blood warrior. But Nog patted the boy's head and told him not to be upset, because no one had had this blood for the last thousand years. But he said with hope in his eyes that the day would come when their clan would regain its glory. His father continued to reassure him, saying that even if he failed and his younger brother did not succeed, there would be future generations. He sent everyone to rest after a very scary and busy day. The little boy asked him if he could become a wizard if he failed to become a warrior. The father looked at him in surprise, and Delon was also very surprised, sitting in the air and watching Lenly. Delon thought again. Maybe Lenly called me because he wants to become a wizard. If it were that easy, there would be wizards everywhere, she laughed as she said it out loud. Dylan continued to hover in the air above the boy and his father, watching them, curious. Holding hands, the father and son walked slowly towards their home. Dylan's mind was racing, wondering if her body was absorbing the rest of the magic. In the darkness, sitting on his dragon, the magician looked at his diamond. He wanted to use it to create a new staff. And then, at last, his dream would come true. He would become the master of the universe. Suddenly, he heard a strange rustling in the bushes. Someone was mysteriously approaching him. The magician saw someone's strange feet coming towards him. He shouted in fright into the darkness, Who is it? And how dare a stranger approach him and talk to him, and he launched the magic of fire. The stranger finally told him that the magician was indeed very strong. As befitted an eighth-ranked wizard, and even after a victory, he never relaxed. The wizard lost his temper and threw the spell Tornado of Heavenly Fire at the stranger. The fire completely enveloped the stranger's body. The magician began to launch streams of fire with his staff again. He could not calm down, but kept releasing the fire again and again. Deline was hovering in the air and kept thinking about how to make the boy become a magician, and she saw that this was his most cherished dream. She was very impressed by this boy. When morning came, Lenly's younger brother Horton came running to wake up his beloved older brother. He jumped on top of his sleeping brother and demanded that he wake up and come to breakfast with him. Lenly was sleeping very soundly. The little boy jumped on him and rolled away, laughing. After a while, Lenly could barely open his eyes. He had been so tired the night before. He got dressed and quickly made his bed with Horton. Sleepy, he went down to the kitchen where his father was waiting for him and the three of them sat down to breakfast. Lenly told him that he had had a strange dream, but his father cut him off for some reason. After five minutes, Nog finally asked his son what he had dreamed. Horton woke me up and I forgot everything, Lenly said sadly. But then I remembered and shouted out loud that he had dreamed of a way to become a wizard. His father warmly asked him if he was serious about becoming a wizard. Horton loudly told everyone that it was all thanks to him and laughed. Lenly decided to ask his father how he could really become a wizard. Nog told him that every year, at the time when warriors are recruited, or rather in autumn, the city of Feng Lai recruits wizards. In the history of their clan of dragon blood warriors, there were wizards, but there were only two of them. But remember, to become a wizard you need great talent. Out of ten thousand people, only one will be a wizard. His father said once again that if he really wanted to become a wizard, he would have to wait until autumn. Delon heard all this. A new day came. The sun rose high, brightly gilding the roofs of the Lenly house. Nog stood in his yard and continued to tell him that they were looking for talent. The boy asked him who was stronger, a magician or a warrior. They are both on the same level, but who must be stronger? 
the father explained. Lindley took a hammer and started carving the sculpture, thinking he had only six months to go. Nog continued that what was more important was that the positions of mages were higher than those of warriors. For example, the position of an early eighth rank two elemental mage, even a ninth rank warrior would be much lower. Lindley asked him if their strength was so much higher. Why were their positions so different? His father continued to explain that mages are divided into nine ranks. The first and second ranks are beginners. The third and fourth ranks are advanced mages. The fifth and sixth ranks are advanced. And the seventh and eighth ranks are also advanced. There are saints whose power is higher than that of the ninth rank. The boy listened to all this with wide open eyes and was greatly impressed. If it's a dragonborn warrior, his sword can kill a hundred warriors. When they meet an army of millions, the most they can do is kill the commander. But a single forbidden spell from a mage can destroy an entire city. And the worst is a sound level mage. Rank nine and eight mages are extraordinary in combat, which is why the position of a mage is so very high. The chance of a person becoming a mage's apprentice is one in ten thousand, so don't expect too much, Nog said. Lenly sat and silently carved and thought about his small chances. Dylan also listened attentively to the story, thinking constantly. Lenly was disturbed from his gloomy thoughts by his younger brother Horton, who shouted that he had finished making the sculpture. But everyone heard Roger urgently gathering the army and lining it up. He lined them up and checked their weapons. Captain Hillman was standing there watching the formation with attention and concentration. He made a sharp remark that everyone was crouching and it didn't look like a line. Someone in the crowd asked if the captain was going to teach them. Hillman replied that the training time would not be short. The future warriors were excited to be dealing with magical beasts and learning new skills. Hillman announced to everyone that today they would all be hunting magic beasts. He also explained to everyone that this time the hunt would be dangerous, so not everyone would be able to take part in it, but only those with the skills. Everyone else just stayed to practice, and those who understood went to pack. Uncle Shini Man, whispered Lenly. He went on to say that you should never say in front of a strong man that you can defend your house, because you might not be able to save your own skin. Thus, it was decided to make the training more difficult, so that everyone would learn to fight faster. Lenly asked to go to the animals with the others to become stronger. The captain smiled and agreed warning him that he might get injured. They went in the afternoon. Lindley thought to himself that he had to get stronger as soon as possible so that his father wouldn't have to fight all the time alone. He made his way through the bushes and trees of the forest with his squad of volunteer warriors. Dillin kept watching him and thought it was good that he decided to take part in the training, but he should find a companion. Suddenly a wild boar jumped out from behind a tree, and Lindley screamed out loud in fright. Who caban? Dellen smiled when she saw this action. The boy ran and waved his toy sword as he ran, imagining how he would fight the magical beasts. For some reason, Dellen remembered her last battle, which was too hard for her. She remembered how she had been struck by fire and her body was burning painfully. Dellen knew that the Earth Ring had protected her soul, but unfortunately not her body. During that magical battle, her soul had suffered greatly which was why she had been asleep for so long until now. She remembered how, many years later, when Lenly was a little boy, she had contacted his consciousness, in which he called her a little fairy, and she whispered softly that it was not easy to absorb a little magic from the fire snake dance. Her thoughts were tearing her up. She thought she had become a spiritual object and she didn't want to. She had no power at all, so she had to meditate and gather some magic power. But the most difficult thing was that she couldn't go far from the ring. Meanwhile, Lenly was thinking that the path of a magician is not as easy as he thought. And then the boy couldn't help but shout out that he had to find the gift that Uncle Sheeny Man had hidden in the forest. Only then would he be able to pass the test. Lenly began to wonder where he could hide it in such a large forest. Dealing thought about it and decided to help the boy no matter what. The boy said out loud that the test was to train his fighting skills, so maybe the gift was somewhere near the animals. When Dellen heard this, she was skeptical, thinking that he was either going to defeat them or become their food. 
Suddenly, Captain Hillman came out to the boy. Dellen instantly realized that the boy was under the protection of humans, so everything would be fine. Hillman decided to go along with the youngest participant just in case. Blenley behaved like a real warrior, listening and looking closely at all the sounds in the forest. Then suddenly a hare jumped out of the grass and Lenley was childishly frightened. But after the hare, the boy and Captain Hillman heard a terrible unknown roar nearby. The darkness, Lenley saw big green eyes that shone with light. A magical beast of the third rank jumped out at the boy. It was a wind wolf. The beast was three times the size of the boy, with huge claws and sharp calls. Dellen immediately shouted to Lenley to be careful, but no one heard her. The boy was very frightened and screamed from the surprise of what he saw. The wolf opened its terrible mouth and screamed at the boy, and the wind blew the boy several meters away. Dellen nervously thought that this was some kind of curse, and why did it have to happen now? She was forced to say the spell, Earth Elemental Magic destroying earth, and launched her magic towards the boy. The ground beneath the wolf became as viscous as a swamp, and he sank into it with all his might. The wolf howled in pain and helplessness. He couldn't move a single paw. His body was not obeying as if something was holding him down. Deline thought hysterically that she would not be able to hold the wolf back for long with her weak strength, and that the boy had to run away. But Lenly turned around and pulled his sword from its sheath and decided to fight. Dellen looked at this picture in amazement. She shouted again that the boy shouldn't do this, and that he was no match for this beast. But no one heard her again. The boy boldly approached the wolf's paws, which for some reason glowed with blue light. He grabbed his wooden sword and fearlessly struck at the beast's paw. Lenly was overcome with animal fear, and finally realized that he was alone with the wolf. The boy could not understand why he could not move either, and he realized that in the eyes of the wolf he was just prey, not an opponent. Gathering all his childhood strength, Lenly decided to finally run away. It was absolutely pointless to fight the wolf because the forces were not equal. He ran as fast as he had ever run before, sweat streaming down his back, the wind whistling in his ears, his heart pounding out of his chest. The boy skillfully jumped over all the puddles and pits, Dellen guiding him from the air like a guardian angel. She was mentally shouting nervously for the boy to run as fast as possible. Lindley ran 300 meters in 10 seconds, overcoming all the obstacles. His eyes were big in fear. Dellen thought that it was strange that the man who was guarding Lindley had disappeared. Hillman stood in a forest clearing, surrounded by wolves as big as the one that had been with Lindley. He mentally cursed. The captain quickly picked up his spear and began to circle the perimeter. Thinking that he had planned everything from the beginning, he was slowly following the kid. But the appearance of wolves was not part of his plan. Hillman was in complete despair. He was very worried that the child must be in great danger now. And the battle began. Hillman used his spear to cut down the wolves, hitting them on their backs. The wolves howled from the pain of his spear and still aggressively rushed at him. They bit Hillman's hands and feet, and a real mess began. The captain began to spin in a circle, pointing his spear and cutting down all the beasts along the trajectory. The only thought in his head was to finish them all off as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Lenly was running like a deer with unprecedented speed. He was followed by a wolf that had escaped from the magical land. Delin flew quickly after the boy, wondering what would happen to her if he suddenly died. In her mind, she encouraged the boy and Lenly could not tear himself away from the wolf who was constantly on his heels. But then he stopped abruptly and screamed in fright. There was a deep abyss under his feet, and he thought that it was a dead end and that he was probably dead. He quickly looked to the other side of the abyss and saw some vines, and immediately decided that if he grabbed them he could survive. Dellen was shocked. Would the boy dare to jump? It's only a few meters away but he had no other choice. The wolf was already catching up with him. So the boy began to accelerate to jump over, but the girl was not sure what he was doing. And then for some reason, Lenly heard a real puppy barking behind him. The wolf turned around and started running away in the other direction. The boy was frightened and couldn't understand what had happened to the magical animal. But it didn't matter. The main thing was that he had escaped. Lenly stared after him in amazement. Dulin stared at the scene in amazement but she could understand the feeling. 
Lenly lay down on the grass to rest. This idiot was very lucky, she thought. Dellen looked at Lenly on the grass and became quite sure that it had some significance. Hillman had finished his terrible fight. The wolf carcasses were scattered all over the clearing. He looked very tired. He said out loud to himself that it was really hard for him to cope with it. But most of all, he was worried about where little Linley was. He had to find him immediately. We have to end this trial now. The situation was getting out of hand, the captain decided, and fired a flare into the sky. The soldiers of the squad saw the green light of the rocket and realized that it was over. The rocket rose high into the sky, illuminating everything around. Meanwhile, in the Baruch family's mansion, Nog sat by the fireplace and quietly drank tea. The butler also saw the light of the rocket and reported that it must be the end of the test. The butler was excited because it meant that Lenley would be coming home soon and he would have to prepare a festive dinner. The cup fell out of Nog's hand and he realized that something must have happened if it was over so soon. He went outside and looked up at the sky and realized that the problem was no small one. Lenley looked at the sky and his expression kept changing. Even if it was only a third-ranked wind wolf, all I could do was run away, he thought. Just then, Lenley and Dellen started looking at the same spot in the sky. It's here, she thought. A huge black dragon was flying above them. Lenley shouted out in astonishment, What kind of beast is that? Everyone in the forest, including hunters and warriors, saw the black dragon. There was a commotion. Lenley assumed that the wolf had escaped because of this black dragon. They both stood there dumbfounded and could not believe their eyes. Then the figure of an unknown magician in a green cloak with a huge sword appeared in the sky. The dragon called him Dylan and asked him why he was so stubborn. He replied that he had come to test how strong you were. The vile lizard shouted that even though Dylan was a holy mage, he was not afraid of him. Dylan offered to test him to see how long he could hold out. So he shouted the spell Battle Aura and pointed his sword at the dragon and a green glow was emitted. An earth element. Stone Rain was the next spell he cast and stones fell from the sky. Deftly swinging his sword between the stones, Dylan began to attack the dragon with determination. As the stones fell to the ground with all their might, Lenly began to run, dodging them. While the boy was running, having every chance of being crushed, Dylan could not understand why the earthbender was here now. The stones were getting bigger and bigger, and the boy was already jumping over them. Lenly was very worried about his father. He understood that even if the dragon was just moving, each of its movements would be a complete destruction. The power of the magicians was really scary. The rockfall continued and gained momentum. Chunks of mountains were already flying around, and the village of Wushan was finally hit. The patrol policemen shouted to the villagers that everyone should take shelter, and people ran to the shelters, which were built in the rocks, in whatever clothes they had on. Nog stood there upset. It was another holy mage. The butler reported that the people had taken refuge, and that he also had to hurry to the shelter. He thought about his son, and that as a member of the Baruch family, he should be able to defend himself. The butler could not calm down. He asked if he should send people to get the boy. Nog told him that Sini Man was watching the boy, and he would be safe. The stones were already covering everything around him, and Lenly began to crawl over them. And then something heavy hit his legs, and he fell. He was lying on the ground and did not understand what had happened. Looking down at his feet, Lenly shouted that he saw a squirtle. At his feet stood a small animal with ears gray in color, looking like a rabbit or a kitten. The little animal was looking at Lenly with its huge eyes. He couldn't tell what kind of animal it was, but it looked most like a mouse. Linley sat down next to the animal and apologized for falling on it so rashly, and the animal frowned. The animal began to sneeze loudly and funny from the ground and dust. He was cleaning his paws and tail from the dirt. Lenley watched him and thought that he must be going mad if he was talking to mice. Suddenly the ground under his feet gave way and he fell into a hole. Dellen also looked closely at the unknown animal and could understand what it was. The animal started screaming, Squirtle! Squirtle! in fright, looking at the falling boy. Lenley kept falling, hitting the stones and the ground hard with his whole body. Then the animal took off and flew towards Lenley, calling out, Squirrel! Squirrel! The boy opened his eyes and saw that there were vines twining along the walls, and he intuitively managed to grab hold of them. 
A black dragon was circling above the gap, and the boy looked at it and did not understand how to get out. Lenly clearly understood that he could not die here. He had to live for the sake of his father and little brother. Suddenly, at his feet, he saw a small animal that continued to squeal hysterically. Squirtle! The blood flowing from his temple began to drip onto the ring that was tied around his neck. Squirtle looked at the boy carefully, and even there it was clear that he liked him. Suddenly, the furry wonder began to push the boy to the surface of the abyss. Dellen noticed that Lenly's blood was activating the ring. Once again, everyone felt a fierce shock and a corresponding destructive wave. The holy mage had managed to split the Earth Protector stone monster in two with his magic. The impact sent tons of stones flying all around, and everything was covered again. Double smasher! Dylan shouted a spell at the Earth Defender. He waved his sword furiously and smashed everything around him. Did the mage on the dragon shout at the Earth Defender, or did he see that level of holy magic? It was impossible to deal with such aggression, and demanded that he give him something. Dylan gritted his teeth and began to growl. The Earth Protector replied that if he didn't get it, Dylan would never know. And just as the mage started to say something, he clutched at the dragon's mane, and then... Dylan shouted the spell Dispel and that now no one would get it. Dylan started to pull out his sword, saying that he was wounded, but he could still fight for his life. Suddenly the holy wizard answered him that he could easily kill him, but his time had not yet come. And his dragon flapped its wings and began to rise. Lenly muttered out loud in amazement that this was a saintly master, and how could he walk away so easily? And what about the giant? The dragon, together with the magician, rose very high into the sky and slowly began to disappear from sight. The little fluffy animal jumped up to the defender of the earth. He had noticed something. And then Delin noticed that the defender was still activated. The stone giant raised his hand and hit the animal with all his might. The animal flew down with a squeal and pain, hitting the stones. It was scary to look at him. He flew like a ball, painfully bouncing off everything on the road. Lenly watched with fear and decided that he had to do something because he would kill him. He picked up the first rock he could find and threw it at the giant with all his might. The boy shouted after him, I am the protector of Wushan village, Linlei Baruch. Fight the giant with me. Duling roared that the boy had gone mad and was provoking the magic of a saintly earth protector level. Lenly whispered to the beast to hide quickly because it would be hot and the boy began to jump acrobatically on the stone giant to make it angry and to make it follow him. He jumped from one rock to another, and the earth protector began to chase him furiously. Dylan watched and couldn't understand what this restless child was up to, but at least he wasn't killed. He continued to lead the giant, and then the incredible happened. The giant roared into the crevice to which Lenly was leading, and the boy succeeded in his plan. Dulin could not understand why Lin Lei did not run away from the edge of the crevice. The boy was running and jumping over all the obstacles. Then suddenly he slipped and began to fall straight into the gap towards the monster. Delin screamed in fear, but no one heard her. The boy was really flying straight into the monster's jaws. Suddenly, Lin Lei's body began to rise in an incredible way. Someone or something was pulling him up, and he saw Delin in all her glory. She had finally materialized, and he could see her. The boy was amazed and asked her who she was. Delin introduced herself in a reserved and formidable voice, saying that she was Daring Cowart, her full name. She was a Saint-ranked Grand Mage from the Puentian Empire. Lenly stared at her in confusion. The girl shouted that he couldn't tell anything about her from her clothes or something, but Lenly could not understand anything. He asked her again if she was really from the Puente's Empire. Delin pompously replied that, yes, she was from the Puente Empire, the empire with the best magic on Earth. Having calmed down a bit, the girl asked what year it was. 9,990, Lenly blurted out in amazement. The Puente's empire was founded 8,000 years ago and lasted for 3,000 years before being destroyed in a war for territory. That was 5,000 years ago, Lenly quoted his knowledge. Dylan freaked out and dropped her staff. She couldn't believe it was 9,990. Linley started to get it and asked if she was really a wizard and had saved him with her magic. But the girl didn't listen to him. She mumbled in shock that she had been asleep for 5,000 years. For fuck's sake. 
Thanks to your blood, I finally woke up after 5,000 years. Delin did not calm down. And then she gloated and asked Lenly if he really thought he could defeat the Holy Mage and save his family. He was nothing against him. Then Delin, with a serious face, began to broadcast that she was a great wizard who lived in a ring. And she asked him if he understood how dangerous it was. He was an earth elemental, an earth protector, using the energy of the earth to live. She wondered if Lenly realized how powerful magicians were, and if he still wanted to be a magician. Meanwhile, the stones continued to fall around them. The girl explained to the boy that when she was wearing the ring he had found, she heard everything, and knew what the boy was thinking. And to confirm her words, she asked if Lenly wanted to help his father and resurrect his family. Because if he doesn't have dragon blood in him, he will never be able to become a mere magician. Lenly whispered back to her asking her how she knew all this. Delin rolled her eyes in annoyance. The boy was under the impression that he didn't know anything. Then with all the confidence he had, he shouted that he wanted to study magic. The girl jumped in surprise. I've never seen him like this, Delin thought with satisfaction. Lenly begged her even louder, becoming a shout, and finally fell to his knees in front of her. Delin looked at his suffering and suggested that he take her test first, and then see the results. Suddenly, she frantically said that she had changed her mind and did not want to teach the first person she met. She had a frantic and restless personality. Her mood changed every minute. Suddenly, she ordered the guy to kill the Defender of the Earth. She was a bit out of it. The boy was surprised and told her that he could not stand up to the giant with his own strength. The boy suddenly looked down at his feet and asked what was that. He lifted his sword and felt a great power. Its compatibility with the element of Earth is impressive, Delin thought, and smiled. This is very average, Delin said in a monotone. Ten times the strength, that's wonderful. Ten times the spiritual power of an ordinary person, she thought. Delin began to direct a pillar of liberation magic at the giant, and Lenly rushed at him with his sword. You can't rely on your strength alone. You have to let the light become a part of your body, and only then will magic and your body become one she explained to the boy. The boy took her advice, concentrated and merged the fire and magic into one, turning his attention to his sword. Shouting the spell Earth Elemental Magic, he struck the ground with his sword. His joy knew no bounds. He jumped and shouted that he had just used real magic. Lenly shouted, raising his sword above his head, that he had done it. Dilin was smiling at him with satisfaction. She was glad that she had motivated the boy even more. Not so bad for a first time, she thought looking at the boy and his strength, so daring coward, who had been sleeping for 5,000 years on the Yulan continent, woke up sealed in a dragon ring. She also became the master of the teenager who awakened her with the help of his unusual blood. Teenager and soul, and so begins the story of the master and the apprentice. Lin Lei took his first important step in his life. Lin Lei returned home and went to bed, and soon Delin appeared in his room. Opening his eyes sleepily and seeing Delin's silhouette, Lenly screamed at the top of his lungs that he was seeing a ghost. This scared the girl herself. Frightened, he fell out of bed, and then, after waking up a little, he mumbled that he had forgotten the events of yesterday. Delin asked him in surprise why he was so screaming and surprised. The boy called her Grandma Delin and asked her not to show up in the middle of the night because he was scared. Delin barked at him saying that he should call her granny, and she almost burst into tears. They looked out of the window together. It was a beautiful, quiet night. Looking at the boy, Delin asked why he was so confident. Because I recently defeated a giant and I feel great, Lenly answered her happily. With hope in his voice, he asked the girl if he had already become a strong magician. Delin laughed and advised him not to be so overconfident that it was she who activated his magic and power and controlled it as well and he was just waving his sword. I hope you can feel and understand how powerful she is, Delin said. The boy frowned and asked her if she was telling the truth. Even Uncle Hillman, a sixth-ranked warrior, could not defeat the giant, but he used magic to do it, the boy proved to her. You're right. Even if a magician's body is as strong as a warrior's, when they use different types of magic, their fighting power is much greater than that of a warrior, Delin explained to him. The boy asked her how it was that she was so strong and then became a spirit. 
Dellen snapped back at him and smacked him over the head with her staff, shouting at him not to be rude to her. She went on to explain to him that even if he had dragon blood, he would still not be the equal of a saint-ranked magician. If it wasn't for that sneak attack by another sun-level warrior, Delan would not have had to use self-destruction, and she was one of the top five mages. But now she was just a soul in a ring. Delan was extremely upset. In a battle five thousand years ago, she had used a forbidden spell, and only her soul remained. But if Lenly hadn't found the ring, there was no telling how long she would have slept. Lenly stood there and turned the ring in his hands thoughtfully. Delan asked him if he really didn't understand what had happened earlier. But it didn't matter. She thought it was because of his unusual blood. Lindley asked the girl if he would really be able to learn magic and become a great magician. Dylan promised him that she would fulfill her promise and teach him magic. She would become his personal teacher. Someone knocked on the door. Lindley asked if it was Uncle Hillman. Dylan thought the boy was still in shock. It was indeed Captain Hillman standing at the door, asking if Lindley was awake and if he could come into the room. Lenly happily answered him. Delan hissed that he didn't think she might be seen, but Lenly could not hear them. He loved his uncle too much. Hillman opened the door and walked into the room. He began to explain himself awkwardly and told him that at first he had to protect the boy by being nearby. But then the wind wolf pack appeared, and he was delayed, and then the black dragon appeared. He really wanted to know how the boy had managed to get out. He was very happy that the boy had come back unharmed, so he was finally at peace. And only the boy was going to tell him everything. Dylan hissed that he had better not tell him about her, otherwise there could be unintended consequences. The boy stumbled. So he decided to lie a little and started to tell him that when he was running away from the wind wolf, he fainted. And then he had a strange dream. And I woke up at home, he said. What kind of thing? What are you talking about? Dellen asked in surprise. The captain listened to Lenly in amazement and decided that he needed to rest tonight and would come to him tomorrow. It's all because I couldn't protect you, Hillman added. And then Dellen grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and flew out the window with him into the yard. The kid was shocked. If I had known that you were invisible, I wouldn't have been so nervous. Dellen answered him sharply that they were flying to the mountains and would begin his training. As an earth elemental magician, she could teach him only if Lenly had enough brains to understand the essence of earth magic, and she suggested that they check it out. And they flew on. When they arrived at an empty clearing, Dellen sat the boy down and told him to cross his legs and put his hands on them. To concentrate, she cracked him on the head with her staff and shouted again, Concentrate. Dellen said Linley has a penchant for earth magic, and he's quite talented. She had noticed that last time. You need to think about your connection to the earth. She ordered him to make a sign with his hands and hold them until he concentrated. Dellen said with satisfaction that she was ready to teach Linley magic, and the first lesson was the basics, and they started with meditation. But Linley couldn't hear her. He couldn't understand what sign she was talking about with her hands. Dellen explained that he had to think of any hand sign that he would make all the time when using magic. The boy showed two fingers on each hand. Dellen said, What kind of sign is that? And he is some kind of a freak. She exhaled and told him to just put his fingers down. The boy sat cross-legged, closed his eyes, put his hands on the ground and touched it one finger at a time. In your thoughts, become one with it. Try to meditate. Absorb its power into yourself, Dellen said to him. The boy was trying very hard. It was obvious and suddenly the stones lying on the ground around him began to bounce. They were being pushed by a force. All the stones rose into the air to the level of his shoulders. Lenly did not open his eyes. And then a miracle happened. The stones began to spin in a circle around him. It was as if they were alive. There were more and more of them, and a bright glow could be seen through the boy's fingers. Dylan whispered that his first meditation had such an incredible effect. It looked like he was as strong as Deline had been when she was a child, or maybe even stronger. The girl was very impressed. I think our meeting was no coincidence, she thought. Or maybe it was even fated, she continued to think. Among the stones, a familiar fluffy animal was watching the boy. And then something twisted in his nose and he sneezed loudly. 
Dylan mockingly asked how he could sneeze while meditating, and in an instant all the stones fell to the ground. Since you have learnt the power of meditation, you must meditate every day. The boy asked her how he could use the magic he had learned. There are many strong magic skills that you can master using the magic of the earth, Dylan explained. Okay, Auntie's spirit, the child replied. Dylan burst out laughing again and barked at him to call her sister. Early in the morning, Lenly walked into the kitchen. His father, younger brother, and the butler were there, all eating breakfast, and he greeted them all. Horton jumped into his arms and shouted that Lenly was so tough because he had fought the wind wolf and the black dragon, and he only had scratches. He asked Lenly to tell him what happened. Nog said to his son, Yesterday's hunt was a bit of a challenge, but you didn't do too badly. If you are well, sit down with us for breakfast. I've never been praised by my father before, thought Lenly. Then Lenly saw Delin, and she sat down quietly and whispered that no one would see her anyway. She quietly asked the boy what was wrong with a father worrying about his son. Even if I go crazy, no one will see me, she laughed. Dylan started jumping around the kitchen, and for some reason Nog looked in her direction. Dylan asked if Nog had noticed her, but he was surprised and reminded her that she had said that no one else would see her. Dylan explained that only people who are on the same spiritual level as her can find her. Because Lenly is the owner of the dragon's coiling ring, they have a spiritual connection, but that doesn't mean that no one can see Dylan. The boy could not understand what this meant. Dylan explained that only people on the level of a saint could sense her. She added that if it was inside the ring, even a saint mage wouldn't be able to see it, but she suddenly stopped talking. Looking at Noga again, she said that it was impossible for his father to be a saint. He had no aura at all. He had barely saved their family business, so it was impossible for him to be a saint. Father, the boy said quietly, looking at him. Nog calmly told him to stop flying in the clouds and finish eating. It must be an illusion, the boy thought to himself. His younger brother beckoned him to eat breakfast with him. Outside, the warriors began training, led by Hillman. Lenly trained at night with Delin, where he honed his earth magic. And during the day, he trained with Captain Hillman, where they learnt martial arts. At night with Delin, he would again lift piles of stones in a state of meditation. She controlled the whole process. The ground trembled during their magical training and shone. The stones flew around Lindley in perfect circles, and there were several of them. He concentrated and made progress every training day. After a while, during one of the training sessions, Dellen told him to try to hit a stone and pointed to a huge rock. And Lenly concentrated and used his arm strength to smash the rock into rubble. Wow, not bad, your power of destruction has improved, she commented. The boy continued to lift huge rocks into the air and smash them. Dellen said that he would need to improve his accuracy, but overall, Lenly had mastered this type of magic. She was happy for him. Lenly was also happy with the results. Lenly clenched his fists and decided to go to the Magic Academy for his father's sake. Time is flying fast. There is only a month left before the enrollment of students at the Magic Academy, Dellen reminded him. The professors at the Academy won't care what family Lenly comes from. Even the fact that she is teaching him is not a guarantee that Lenly will be able to easily enter the Magic Academy even if he beats his head against the wall. She went on to say that training mages is much more difficult than training warriors. Money, teachers, training. Lenly has to have it all. But with a teacher like her, and the knowledge and skills she had acquired, Dellen was sure that it would be enough to get into the academy. But the boy mumbled that he doubted it. Deline could not calm down, because she would need to buy more artifacts, equipment. It all costs a lot of money. Denley asked her in shock that skills and spells would not be enough for magic. He was getting frustrated. But Dellen couldn't stop her speech and continued that if he didn't have enough money, it would take him a long time to develop. Lenley listened attentively in silence and thought that now the Baruch name was in its decline. His father had to sell his family heirlooms to make a living. He did not understand where he could get the money for all this. And then he had a brilliant idea. What if he could repair the magic beast? And as long as it had the magic power, it could fight instead of Lenly. Its fighting power must be enormous. Dellen shouted at him. 
Does he think that a magic beast will just fall out of the sky and obey him? She explained once again that firstly, Lenly would need to make a contract with the dragon, and if it was a velociraptor, he would need 10,000 gold coins for it. Lenly exclaimed that 10,000 was a cosmic sum, but the girl summarized that it was true a real magician must also be rich. Alas, Lenly could not understand and asked what kind of animal would want to sign a contract with him. She explained that a magical animal could sign a contract with him. The boy almost started to cry, explaining that he didn't have a single gold coin and couldn't become a magician. Dellen was thinking when she noticed a glowing trail, the footprints of the little beast. The tracks led to Lenley's house. Dellen quietly followed the little animal. It ran over the rubble. Dellen called out loudly to the boy and asked him if he remembered the little animal from the cleft in the forest. The little animal, not hearing them, shouted Squirtle and jumped inside the house through a huge hole. He started to look around and scratch at something with his paws. Dylan and Lindley watched him quietly, and the animal continued to dig actively. It dug more and more aggressively, throwing stones and earth around. And then everyone saw a huge, gorgeous diamond. The animal began to squeak loudly with pleasure. It's the shadow diamond that that magician had, Deline shouted. She told Lin Lei to grab the magic beast as soon as possible. The boy could not believe that this was a real magic beast. Meanwhile, the animal happily grabbed the diamond with its paws and hugged it. At that moment, Lenly reached out to grab it. The animal aggressively began to scream and lunge at him. But the boy grabbed him by the tail and started pulling him towards him. At that moment, the animal bit the boy's finger painfully, but it escaped from his hands. Having caught it, the boy said that it looked very much like an ordinary mouse, but bigger. Dellen remembered that there are two types of mice. One is a stone eater, and they usually go in groups. The first type, the shadow mice, are magical beasts of the third rank, very fast and painful to fight. The second type of mouse, the stone eater, has a very keen sense of smell. Looking at its size, it is a shadow mouse. He is a lower-ranked magical beast, but if he allows him to make a contract with him, he will become his magical beast. The mouse was freaking out. Lenly restrained it with a magic ring. He had a better idea. Dylan thought, what if we could use magic to scare him into signing a contract? She suggested becoming a demon so that the mouse could sense her, and she turned into a big demonic shadow that shouted at the mouse that she had stolen the crystal and that she would pay for it. The mouse was scared. Dylan shouted that it could not escape. Lindley asked if this would really help him get the contract. Dellen giggled and said to calm down, because shadow mice are not that brave. She turned to the mouse and screamed at him to sign the contract with Lenly. The mouse started to get nervous and glowed. It didn't understand where it was being attacked from, and having managed to create a circle of fire, it escaped. This is an unusual shadow mouse, Dellen shouted. The mouse jumped all over the room, bouncing its body against all the walls at a frantic speed. Dellen shouted to Linlay, Find a net somewhere, because we have to catch it! But Linlay found another way out of the situation. He brought a fried chicken leg from somewhere. He waved it in front of the animal and asked him to eat it. A fried leg, thought the hungry little animal, not taking his eyes off it. Lenly smiled and said gently that no one would hurt him. Dellen was screaming her head off because she had asked for a net and Lenly had kept the chicken leg and was feeding it. Meanwhile, the little animal chewed on the leg with gusto and purred contentedly. Lenly began to stroke it on the head. Dellen mumbled in amazement that the animal was letting her pet him. She thought that she had spent all her energy to capture and subdue the animal, but she didn't think it would ignore it so easily. But Lin Lei brought a chicken leg and stroked it, which is not something magical animals usually allow. Linley turned to the animal and told him that this diamond was his find and belonged to him, and that his name was Lin Le Baruch, and this was his family's ancestral hall, so he could come here whenever he wanted. But then something strange began to happen. The animal bit the boy's finger again. Lenley screamed. He did not understand why. A beast will always be a beast, said Dellen, but wait. Is this a contract? She looked at the two of them in shock. Lenley's finger and the beast's foot joined together. Dellen explained that when an equal contract is made, you become closer to the magical beast. It can perform any task for you, 
so they will have a strong bond. The boy asked what kind of contract it was. He could not understand its meaning. She went on to explain that when a magical animal is born, it has the opportunity to enter into an equal contract, but the animal can only enter into it once in its life. When a person breaks the contract, the animal can still enter into it with another. But in order for an animal to make a contract, it has to trust Lenly and consider him its family and not want to leave you. Only then can the contract be made. They joined the finger and the paw again. Now the contract was considered concluded, the contract of two identical creatures. Now they would fight together. The contract is made, whispered Lenly. The mouse squeaked out, Bay, bay, bay. The boy asked Delin if she could talk. The girl explained that it was a young mouse and that it did not speak properly yet, so it was just talking nonsense. Lenly happily shouted that it was his own personal magic animal, a mouse. The mouse was still chewing on its leg and looking at him with its big eyes, but it was calm now. The mouse climbed up on his shoulder and made itself comfortable. Now that he was the owner of Bebe, his next step was to take the test to the Magic Academy. I'll call you Bebe and I'll talk to you more often, Lenly promised the mouse. Dalen remembered that anyone who studies magic dreams of becoming a student at a Magic Academy. If a magician had not studied there, he or she was no higher than the third rank. They decided to go to the academy, and after a while, when they entered the city, they saw a grand building with incredible architecture. It was a magic academy. Magicians were flocking to it from the sky. It was the largest kingdom of the Holy Alliance, the kingdom of Feng Lai, and the headquarters of the Shining Church, the city of Feng Lai. All the students who wanted to study at the academy came here. It was a rich city with beautiful houses, developed infrastructure, and happy people. Linley saw Uncle Hillman and told him that this city was richer than Wushan. The man smiled at him and said he was sure Lenley would pass the test. He stumbled and continued, confused, saying that it was a bit unexpected but that the boy should listen to him. Dylan whispered in the boy's ear to tell him to watch his language. Hillman patiently explained to him that there had once been a dragon-blooded warrior in the Baruch family, but he did not show any magical talents. So even if Lenley failed the test, it wouldn't mean anything. Lenley confidently asked Hillman not to worry about him. He was sure of his success. But Dellen could not stand it and concluded that it was impossible not to pass because she was his teacher. Hillman recalled that when he came to Baruch's house and didn't find Lenley, his father told him that the boy had gone to the academy, and he was furious. He shouted at Nog that if the child did not pass the test, it would affect his confidence in his abilities, and he would suffer a mental trauma. Nog calmly replied that his son was not as weak as he thought. Hillman looked at Lenley and said that he still couldn't believe that Nog was right. They approached the magic training grounds of Fung Lai City, where hundreds of eager applicants had gathered. Lenley looked at the people and everything around him with delight. One of the teachers at the academy was shouting at one of the applicants that he was a failure. The boy was crying and screaming, proving that he had just touched the crystal. But he couldn't understand how the magician knew he had failed. The teacher began to shout at him that his mind power was only slightly stronger than that of an ordinary person, and he did not have the basic qualities to become a magician. He advised him not to spend the money because the boy's shockwave of elemental magic was too weak. The teacher continued to reprimand the boy, saying that he really thought that anyone could become a magician. But his elemental aptitude was very low, and there was no point in taking the test. The crowd of applicants listened to this conversation in dismay, and whispered that no one would probably pass. Dylan was also watching, and couldn't understand why these methods were so old-fashioned. Her thoughts were interrupted by Lenly, who asked her to explain how the test worked. She began to say in a serious voice, This is the elemental aptitude test. It measures the power of the mind and then the elemental aptitude. Usually, if the power of the mind is eight times higher than that of an ordinary person, then such a candidate has a good chance of becoming a magician. However, this was a magical academy, so Lenly's mind must be at least ten times stronger. The boy began to doubt his abilities and asked what was in his head. Dellen reassured him because in the last test, Lenley was twenty times stronger. That's why this test is a must. Hillman called the animal to his shoulder 
and it went without question feeling his kind heart. Lenly explained to him that he could not take him with him to the test, because these are the rules. And he began to push his way through the crowd of applicants to the arena, where the examiner was standing. Upon entering the arena, Lenly bent down to greet him. The examiner turned to him menacingly and ordered him to say hello. The boy said that he was Lin Lei, twelve years old, and came from the Feng Lai Kingdom, Wushan Village. The man wrote this information down in a notebook. The examiner ordered Lenly to put his hand on the crystal to check everything. Lenly put his hand on the crystal and thought, What if Deline's test is wrong? In an instant, the crystal glowed, and a circle of fire lit up around it. The magicians around the stage began to watch the boy with interest. The examiner smiled and decided to see what the boy was made of, and cast the spell Elemental Aptitude. And then the wizards were alarmed. One by one, they started shouting out the results. Earth Element, Perfect Aptitude, Wind Element, Perfect Aptitude, Fire Element, Average Aptitude. Lenly was shocked. The crowd gasped. Hillman, Dellen, and the Beastie were also astonished. Two perfect dispositions, it seems we have found a valuable specimen, said the examiner. Lindley couldn't believe his ears, his eyes, and the results, especially the wind element. Oh, I see, I completely forgot. Dellen shouted something incomprehensible, but she explained that she was tested for the earth element. In that case, she asked Lenley which element he would be studying, but then the examiner ordered the boy to enter the magic circle, where they would test the power of his mind. Lenley entered the circle and suddenly something began to press on his back. Lenley whispered to Dellen, What is this? It's a very strong magic that will put pressure on your body to see how much you can take, she answered. It was very hard for Lenley. The examiner announced that everyone would hope that the boy was at least ten times stronger. And then Lenley decided to try to concentrate on meditation to make it easier. He spread his arms and legs and closed his eyes. The examiner asked everyone if he was meditating or just dreaming. Lenley uses the meditation technique he learnt with Lenley to absorb the power of magic and weaken it. Even she knew it was possible. One of the magicians asked him if it had been twenty minutes and if he could continue. And the boy continued to stand patiently. And then the magicians became alarmed and began to whisper among themselves, How could this happen? The situation had changed. Lindley fell down and knelt on his knees. The examiner shouted that he could not believe that the boy, and stumbled. He turned to the boy and explained that he had used meditation to pass the magic pressure test, but he should have fallen, and no one had ever done that before. Captain Hillman couldn't bear to ask what this meant. He could not understand what had happened. Boy, you passed the exam. As a representative of the Magic Academy, I invite you to study with us. Hillman shouted with joy that this was wonderful. The animal also squeaked with joy. The boy jumped for joy, constantly shouting the words Magic Academy. When the joy subsided, the examiner sternly told Lenley that he was done with the test and that he should go and check in and not disturb others. The boy danced with joy that he could now study at the Magic Academy. Captain Hillman and the animal danced with him. Hillman asked Lin Lei to hurry up and register, and he would run to his father to tell him the good news. Lin Lei took Baby with him and rushed to register. His dream had come true. The exam was still going on in the square, and there were a lot of people. Lin Lei ran up to the registration desk but it was completely overwhelmed with suitcases and other junk. But he expected to see a completely different picture. And then he heard someone's disgruntled voice asking who had brought all those suitcases. An old man came up to him and started attacking him, demanding that he take all this stuff away. For some reason, he thought it was Lenley's. The boy sharply told him that it was not his stuff. A guy came up to the counter and said that calling his things rubbish and junk was disrespectful to him. It was Yale, the son of one of the biggest businessmen in Yulin. He understood his grandfather's remark that if he didn't respect things enough, he would never become a great businessman. But the old man was furious and demanded that he put his clothes away. He shouted that this was a school of magic, not business. But the boy calmly replied that his things would be taken care of, and good-naturedly told Lenley that they were now classmates. The guy said he knew his name was Lin Lei and that his performance in the test was outstanding. 
Then he turned his eyes to his suitcases and explained that because of the inconvenience of traveling, he had only brought the most essentials. Lenley asked him why he needed so many things, but he laughed and explained that it wasn't much. He opened one of the suitcases and proudly said, This is a tea set. Lenley rounded his eyes. The next suitcase was his personal wardrobe, and it was huge, the size of a real wardrobe. After this long conversation, the guy finally introduced himself as Yale, a member of the Sacred Union. He turned to the registrar and politely asked that he put him in the same room as Lenley. He will be my first classmate, Lenley thought happily. But the registrar threw the suitcase at Yale, shouting at him to take his clothes and get out. Yale fell and bruised himself. And at that time, a strange guy approached them. Lenley looked at him curiously, and Yale tried to get up. The stranger said that Yale was a talentless idiot. Lenley asked Yale in a high-pitched voice that he thought he would have enough magic to enter the academy. And he added that if it wasn't for his money, he wouldn't have been able to set foot here. The stranger looked at the two boys and asked them if they were here together. Don't be so rude, Lenley said. Anyone who hangs around with rubbish is like that, the stranger said and went to the registrar. Lindley asked Yale who he was. Yale nervously replied that his name was Gene, and that he had a very strong aptitude in mind, and was the strongest of the hundred new recruits. He went on to say that he was even stronger than Lindley in terms of skills. The guy thought this is where the power gathers. And this is not Wushan Village. Every opponent is strong. Yale was trampled. He began to justify himself to Lindley, saying that Gene was right. His aptitude and mental strength were only slightly above average. So what if his father was rich? And then Bibi rushed off to the arena where the test was taking place. Yale suggested that they go and see what was happening there, too. Dylan began to feel strong elemental radiation. The boys made their way to the arena through the crowd. All the applicants were excited about someone. They saw a beautiful blonde girl and heard from the magicians that her mental power was sixty times greater than the human mind. It was the sister of the prodigy who studies here. Her name is Dice, Yale explained. The girl turned around and introduced herself to the boys. Her name was Delia. She was very beautiful. Her blue eyes shone and her hair was long and white. The news of Lenley's acceptance to the Magic Academy made his father Noga very happy. The entire Wushan village rejoiced and celebrated the occasion. Captain Hillman watched the celebrations and found himself thinking that he couldn't wait for the day when Lenley would bring back the lost greatness of the Baruch family. Lenley packed his belongings into a single bundle, said goodbye to Uncle Hillman and his father, and ran to the Magic Academy. His educational adventure had begun. He walked beside Yale and told him that Hillman was a friend of his father's, who had looked after him since childhood. Yale listened with interest and said that if he had come from his family, with qualities like his, he would have been loved. To encourage him, Lenley reminded him that Yale had passed the test and his skills were not that bad, but he had something to worry about. He was sad. It was so painful to say goodbye to them. Yale explained that his family paid 10,000 gold coins to the Magic Academy every month. Lenley was shocked. For him, 10,000 gold coins were fabulous money. Yale continued his story. His aptitude and mental power are above average. If he went to an ordinary academy, he would be the best student, but this magical academy attracts the best monsters. If it wasn't for his father's connections and the 10000 he paid every month, he wouldn't have been accepted. Lenley walked away thinking that his father had only sold the sculpture for 500 gold coins, which would have been enough for Yale to pay for half a month. So Yale whispered in Lenley's ear that Lenley would save his face if he brought the sorceress from the academy. Then he explained with a mysterious face that money meant nothing to him. He had another goal, which was implied in this expression. Lindley asked him in surprise if he had really come to the academy for the girl they had seen. Yale was surprised to hear him say that, because he had heard that that impudent Jean, who was at the registration desk, liked her. That's what everyone around him said, to which Lindley replied that her brain power was sixty times stronger. She was smart, a good student. A great option. Recalling how stunning she looks, Yale replied that he understood because he saw Lenley's reaction. You misunderstood me, Lenley shouted at him. 
They came to a door with a hundred and nine written on it and the keys. This was their dormitory. Yale was sad that everything here was so old and small. But what can you do, we will study. Nothing can be changed. After all, he was used to living in luxury. They went inside and saw a spacious room with nice furniture and renovation. It's not so bad, Lenley exclaimed. They saw two other boys who also lived here, and one of them exclaimed with joy that they had finally arrived and rushed to greet them. The boys introduced themselves. I'm Renard from the O'Brien Empire, one of them said. Oh, these are the new roommates. I forgot that the room is for four people, said Lenley. I'm Lin Lei from the Fung Lai Empire, he replied. And then the mannequin started to fall on him, and he was scared. One of the boys rushed to his rescue and used his sword to push the mannequin away. Renard exclaimed that it was so cool that Lin Lei had come to them. Who knew that he would come to study and have such skills in magic? Another boy with glasses explained that Renard had always wanted to go to a swordsmanship school to become a great swordsman. But when he was tested, he was found to have magical abilities. So his family sent him here to study, he continued to explain. Renard said he set up dummies everywhere so he could train. Now Lin Lei can be my opponent and my skills won't deteriorate, laughed Renard. Renard asked why he had two swords. Meanwhile, Yale was in charge of moving his belongings so that they wouldn't be damaged. He shouted to the last people to start choosing their rooms. Yale pompously dismissed the service and jokingly offered to put money on a magic crystal card for him to buy equipment. Lenley went out to the balcony. He wanted to be alone and collect his thoughts. He looked at the building of the Magic Academy and wondered if he could become a seventh-level magician or maybe an eighth-level magician. He decided that if I couldn't become a dragon-blooded knight, I could become a magician so that his family could become powerful again. And he made a promise to himself. The night in the dormitory was peaceful, and in the morning the magic courses began. After studying various elements, the boys went to different classes. Dellen appeared and asked Lenley where she should go. The boy could not understand why she was asking him. She thought about it. In the first lesson, Lenley was the only student with a double element. The wind and earth lessons were held at the same time. He decided to go to the wind lesson left Bebe in the room and gave her a chicken leg to calm her down and explained that she couldn't come with him. Dylan confidently declared that who could teach the earth element better than her. She patted Bebe's head and asked her to stay in the dormitory as well. So the wind lesson began and a separate classroom was set aside for it. It was built in such a way that the desks were arranged in a circle and the teacher was in the center. Lenley stood there looking at everything, but he heard people whispering behind him and thought he was famous. But the other boys were discussing the unusual girl from the test. The teacher wasn't there yet. He was late and everyone was waiting for him. I think something good is about to happen, Lenley said to himself when he saw the test girl enter the classroom. She was looking for a seat. And then a miracle happened. She sat down right next to Lenley and the whole class froze. Lenley realized that everyone had been discussing and waiting for her. My name is Delia, the girl said, turning to him. And you're the one who has two elements, and that's cool. She laughed out loud. And she stretched out her hand to say hello, and the classroom fell into a deathly silence. Everyone's jaws dropped. I'm Lin Lei, the boy said. And I'm Yale. And his new friend's hand was extended to the girl. Lenley hissed to his new friend, who sat down next to him, that this was no reason to overplay the hand. But Yale said loudly that he hadn't said that Lenley was interested in her. What's the matter? And then a dark-haired young man of about twenty-five came into the classroom. It was the teacher. And he stood in the center of the classroom on a platform that was also moving. He greeted everyone and explained that he would be their first-year teacher. Delia quietly added that, in addition to being a teacher, he was also the head boy. The teacher introduced himself as Trey, a sixth-year student, and the lesson began. Trey offered to talk about the basics of wind elemental magic and told them that he had used a wind blade to get to class. He explained that when they became fifth-level wind mages, they would be able to use the hovering technique, but that these were very simple spells. He went on to say that legend has it that Spatial Blade is a powerful single-target spell. 
Yale whispered that the wind element was cooler than the earth element, he thought so. Then Lenly asked him why Yale was sitting in their class. He had gone to study the earth element. Yale replied that he was bored in his earth element class and came to them because Lenly and Delia were there. And he winked and smiled. Trey reprimanded the boys for talking and threatened to cut out their tongues with his blade. Suddenly a blade of wind flew past Yale's face. Trey asked Yale what class he was in and his name. But the boy exploded with anger at the blade and started shouting at the teacher. Yale shouted that Trey didn't even know his name and he would not forgive him. Yale stood up abruptly and ran out of the classroom. The teacher was shocked, and so was the class. Dellen, who was also watching the scene, thought that the elements should actually balance each other out. There are spells in wind element magic, raging destruction and spatial blade. And the earth element has holy earth destruction and holy meteor shower, Trey told the students. Dylan exploded as she listened, because this guy dared to say that the magic of the earth element was primitive. So the teacher put up a table comparing the wind element, namely the higher level spells, raging destruction and spatial blade, with their performance characteristics for all the students to look at and write in their notebooks. The teacher then brought out the comparative characteristics of the earth element, namely the higher level spells, holy earth destruction, and holy meteor shower. Linley quietly asked Ellen what about the stone giant? What level was it? And she began to tell him that a long time ago, she had been ambushed by a fire mage, and she had used holy earth destruction to take him with her. Lenly could not calm down. He began to prove to her that he had easily killed him last time. But Dellen reminded him that it was thanks to her. She continued that the spatial blade can cut through physical matter, and although it is destructive, it is a simple strike, unlike the Earth Guardian spell. When Lenly summoned it, it would continue to fight the enemy. Lenly asked her what would happen if the knight also had dragon blood. Dellen pretended not to hear. Are you saying that the elements of wind and earth can be used at the same time? Of course, if the two elements are at the sixth level, they can be used to defeat the seventh level, Dellen explained to him. But the girl finally realized that Lenly was disappointed that he hadn't become a dragon blood knight. Then he would be a saint level person, Dellen explained. Lenly remembered the promise he had made to himself, that he was a member of the famous Baruch family. And he decided to make a note of it right in class. He thought nothing would happen. Suddenly, Trey turned his gaze to him and exploded in anger. He shouted that he saw those in the class who were not concentrating, and that he hated inattentive students. My wind blade will catch up with those who refuse to learn. Trey shouted and launched his blade. No, no, no. Lenly screamed as he saw the flying blade. But the blade caught up with him and struck Lenly, and he fell under the table. Trey said, Don't follow the example of such students. To the other students in the class who were in complete shock, Trey said that only those who had improved their abilities would be able to move on to the next course, so they would be able to graduate when they reached the sixth level. If they didn't become a sixth-level mage in sixty years, they would be expelled from the Magic Academy. He went on to say that even though the Academy didn't have many rules, they still held tests every year to test your abilities. The children began to buzz around, discussing the news some shouting that it was rare to find a sixth-level wizard, others indignant that it was impossible to learn magic in sixty years, others worried that they might be expelled from the academy. There was a lot of noise. Children, you need to concentrate and study. Let's take a deep breath, Trey suggested to everyone. Those who use the wind element must understand how to unite with it. And everyone began to breathe frantically like locomotives. The air in the classroom began to stir. When Lenly left the classroom, he was still breathing deeply. Dellen explained to him that this is the same principle as in the earth element meditation. The boy loudly exclaimed that it was based on the power of the mind. Dellen confirmed that he had understood correctly. They continued to walk down the corridor together, and then she shouted to Lenly to watch out. The boy instinctively ducked down and flames passed over his head. A blonde guy with a ball of fire in his hand stood by the wall and said angrily that it was just a joke, but it scared Lenly good, but it doesn't have any big consequences. Another rather familiar guy added that it seems the double element privilege is not that special. Lenly finally recognized him. It was the guy from the front desk, 
and Jean said that he was the stronger one this trimester, not Lenly. Stay away from Delia, he hissed. Everyone in the crowd whispered, and someone said that Jean really liked Delia. That's right, Yale had said that. He must be mistaken, thought Lenly. But wait a minute, Lenly exclaimed. Lenly thought he would not give in to his aggression, but he wondered aloud if he really thought that using these dirty tricks would scare him. The blonde dude laughed and shouted at Jean that this guy was no threat to them, and he would deal with him himself. The blonde shouted that the academy was no place for rednecks and trash, and he cast the first level fire element spell, Tongue of Flame, and a layer of fire instantly appeared in his palms. He spread his arms and launched fire towards the surprised Lenly. The crowd of students gasped. The boy was terrified, and Dellen asked if it was really a fire elemental spell. The fire surrounded Lenly in a circle. Everything was on fire. The fire spread into several circles. The class realized that their classmate was in trouble. I know only one spell, and it can attack objects, said Lenly in a low voice. Dellen giggled softly. That was enough. Then she whispered to him that he knew magic, too and she tried to explain how an earth elemental magician could lose to a fire elemental magician. Lenly was furious, and he shouted at the top of his lungs the spell Earthquake. The earth rose and covered all the fire around him. The blonde was shocked, and in a second some unknown spell in the form of mud destroyed his fire circle. Lenly loudly shouted the next spell, Destroy fire! Delen, watching this, shouted that Lenly should not sleep because he had a very energetic opponent. And a battle broke out in the Academy Hall. The power of earth and fire joined together. Everything was flying and burning around. Deline became a guardian angel for the boy in this battle, constantly warning him when there was danger. Aijan also joined the battle. He also had the magic of fire. His anger was completely transformed into the power of the flame. It was an unequal battle. Jean launched a huge column of fire straight at Lenly. The force of the blow was incredible. And then the inexplicable and incredible happened. Lenly just managed to dodge the column of fire. He flew into the air and did a flip away from the flames. And he continued to spin again and again without stopping. The hall was absolutely silent. Dellen watched the boy in fright and noticed a strange glow around him. Then she understood everything and shouted that it was wind magic. Although the boy hadn't learnt everything yet, she asked Lenly how he could understand how to use it. I just took a deep breath and this happened, Lenly replied. Jean couldn't calm down. He shouted the spell Tongue of Fire again and produced a column of fire. Lenly was not at a loss and shouted the spell Earthquake in Jean's direction. And then, with the power of the two magics, the boys collided head on. Why did you hit me? Doesn't your head hurt? Jean shouted. It was you who crashed into me, shouted Lenly. And then everyone noticed Trey, who frightened the two brawlers with the help of magic and asked who allowed them to fight. Trey said to Jean that he was a teacher of wind magic, and Jean looked like a student of fire magic and asked him why he had come here. Jean shot back that he had come to say hello to his friend. Lenly couldn't stand it and shouted back that he was lying shamelessly. You two are very good friends. Trey smiled slyly. Jean whispered to Lenly that if he had the strength to fight, he should come to the arena and they could fight as long as they wanted, even to infinity. Lenly whispered back that he doubted he would be honest. Trey waved his hand and the boys went flying. Finally, he told them not to block the passage and not to forget their promises. And the whole crowd dispersed with the participants. Everyone knew that there would be a sequel. Lenly went outside and sat down under a tree to meditate. He was extremely tired. Dellen quietly asked him if he was really going to fight the fire elemental gene in the arena. Wouldn't Lenly be asking him to cheat? This guy is crazy, but he's the best student in the class, she exclaimed. Lenly replied that he had to win the fight himself, and although his chances were not great, he had to take it seriously. After listening to the boy's answer, Dellen told him that he did have the courage, and if he needed her help in a fight that would not end in death, he could ask her. But he trains too slowly, Dellen teased the boy. She promised to teach Lenly the secret of sword fighting, which was lost to everyone five thousand years ago. The boy looked at her in surprise. Dellen dragged the boy to a secret place, 
pulled out a wooden mannequin, blindfolded him, and handed him a sword. Lenly thought with a smile that Delling was probably testing his sword skills, but it was good that he had trained in Wushan village. The boy picked up the sword and skillfully began to fight the dummy with his eyes closed, smashing it to pieces from all sides. He was doing very well, cutting off its legs and arms and making many holes. There were only shavings all around. When he had finished smashing the dummy, the boy exclaimed with satisfaction that he had learnt very useful skills in Wushan. Of course not, Delin shouted and hit him over the head with her staff as usual. She explained irritably that his fighting technique was mediocre and weak, but the boy proved to her that he had learnt absolutely everything in Wushan village. Flat blade. This is a spell I never taught anyone when I was alive. If you can learn it and master it, you can easily become a sixth-level mage in ten years, Delin said in a monotone and businesslike manner. Lenly replied with interest that it sounded cool, and what kind of spell was it? And Delin rolled her eyes. She ordered Lenly to find a large stone, which would be one of the main tools, and to find other tools for carving. The boy immediately ran off somewhere. Twenty minutes later, an axe, a scythe, a saw, a flat knife, a round knife, a triangular knife, a hammer, a jade knife, an oblique knife, and a huge rock appeared on the lawn. Lindley explained breathlessly to the astonished Delin that he had borrowed all this stuff from Yale, who had everything for all occasions. She laughed and handed him a flat knife and told him to cut into the stone, but not to think about what he was cutting. Just cut. It's good that I used to be interested in stone carving, he thought, and began to scrape and chisel at the stone. After a while, he fell down wet and completely exhausted and whined that he couldn't hack with just a flat knife. It was too hard and inefficient. He shouted at Delin that she had promised to improve his earth elemental magic, not this. Actually, carving stone requires the use of all the tools you brought. It's because the stone is very hard, she replied mysteriously. Delin walked over to the boy and silently took the flat knife from him. The magic of the earth element is connected to the earth from birth. If you feel your element well, you can control its structure, Delan taught him. She stretched out her hand with the knife and began to concentrate. Lenly, you should try to feel it too. And then suddenly the knife began to shine with green light. It was clear that the knife was gaining magical power unknown to Lenly. Delan closed her eyes. Follow the veins of the stone, she whispered, and brought the knife to the stone, which began to break up into layers. Follow its veins. She continued to move the knife along the stone, which was already splitting. At one point, the stone split with a bang, and a dragon sculpture of unprecedented beauty emerged. Even the hardest stone can be broken, she shouted. To say that Lenly was shocked to see this is an understatement, and she explained that if Lenly had too many tools, it would affect his perception of himself as a magician. But out of all the tools, she can only use a flat knife. It's called the flat knife flow. Lenly was amazed and told her that he was shocked that Delin could turn a stone into such a sculpture with an ordinary knife. Delin reminded him that this spell had been lost 5,000 years ago, and thanks to it, Lenly had a chance to become a high-level magician in 10 years. She was proud of herself at that moment. Delin was a really good mage and one of the top five. I didn't even know she was so artistic, thought Lenly. And then, like a child, he started fantasizing about how he could sell this beautiful statue if he could move it off the moon. Because he needed money. Delin was angry. She shouted that when she used to make statues, all the rich people wanted to buy them. But she wouldn't let anyone near her house. Lenly reminded her that education is not free. Delin freaked out and shouted at him to sell his own work, not someone else's perfect work, and flew off. My works are hidden in the basement. Five thousand years have passed, and I don't remember where the basement is, lied the furious Delin. Lindley did not pay attention to his mentor's psychosis. He twirled the knife in his hands and thought about something. He closed his eyes and remembered Delin's words that the element of Earth gives you a special gift, a better sense of it. Just use the knife. He extended his hand with the knife and concentrated, and the knife began to glow again. Let me try and see everything from the inside, whispered the boy as he pointed the knife at the stone. He managed to fall into deep meditation and concentration under his feet. 
he felt the inexplicable viscosity of the earth, as if he were standing on a mire, and the guy saw a stone from the inside. There was a whole galaxy. The earth looked like a galaxy, with lights that were in some kind of liquid. It was something incredible. He whispered that he was following a stream there is a crack. Lenly continued to travel around the stone. Everything is working out just like Dellen said. Lenly was happy. He was cutting through the stones without any effort. Honestly, you understood everything very quickly, the girl whispered in his ear. I can feel the earth element. Lenly was amazed and happy. Keep practicing. The girl told him again and blindfolded him, and he cut and cut those stones without touching them. You are learning very quickly. With this progress, in three months you will be a second-level magician, said the girl. Only the second? The boy was surprised. And he worked harder. Dellen looked at him and thought that the boy had learned complex movements very quickly, and it was very difficult to find someone like him. And he didn't realize that an ordinary person needs to train for a very long time to reach the second level. Lindley returned to his friends in the room and told them what had happened to John. Yale listened for a long time and remained silent, then asked if there was really going to be a duel with Jean over Delia. Lenley confirmed it, and he began to think of a plan of action. All the residents of dormitory number 109 were thinking. While everyone was worrying, Lenley knew for sure that he could become a second-level magician in a short period of three months. Finally, Yale let it slip that the problem was that Lenley hadn't had much practice, so he probably wouldn't be able to beat Jean. What if I become a second-level magician? Lenley asked Yale. All the boys in the room turned to him and asked how he imagined that. Yale irritably started shouting at him that there were only three weeks left before the battle, which was very short. Lenley was shocked. For some reason, no one had told him this before. But in fact, he thought, it's good that he has learned everything and trained with the unsurpassed Dellen. Yale exhaled and opened a huge suitcase and started taking out strange things. A ring that reduces magic damage, a helmet that blocks magic, a necklace that reduces the time it takes to read a spell, he announced the items. These things cost about a thousand gold coins. You can take any of them and you won't lose, Yale offered him. Lenley smiled and thanked Yale for his offer, but Yale said with a glare that he always uses these things to win. And Lenley is too cruel to him. And he began to cry like a little child. You see, I want to beat Jean alone and with my own strength, Lenley explained to him. The boy with the glasses said that according to the Academy's Book of Rules, Part 7, Rule Number 24.461, it does not say that magic must be used. As far as I remember, you're very good with a sword, the boy with the glasses continued to say. Lenley will be able to attack with a sword, but Jean is definitely not expecting it. So it will be hard to say who will win. Ha 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 ha, I like that idea, Dellen burst out laughing. Warriors and mages differ only in their elements. There is a winner and a loser in battle. No one cares how you won, so I recommend you use the flat blade technique, she said quietly. You know, you're right. Then I will use this, and he showed the flat blade to Yale, to all the boys. Yale laughed and told him not to embarrass himself. He had promised Lenla a sword, but not to use any knife. But out of curiosity, he asked how he was going to use it. Lindley pulled out a knife and began to cut through the wall with great effort, just like he had done when he was training on the lawn. The boys froze in shock. He was meditating and cutting without stopping. Everyone was watching him with bated breath. None of them had ever seen anything like this. What is that sound? asked the boy with the glasses. Yale couldn't calm down and couldn't understand how you could attack with a knife like that. And it would work. Lindley was so excited that he cut through half the room. Everyone was horrified to see that the house started to fall apart. In an instant, the stones fell out, where a huge hole appeared. Meanwhile, in his dorm room, Trey was practicing his favorite flight technique. He breathed deeply and slowly for an hour straight, ignoring everything around him. Breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out. He was snoring all over the room. His training was going perfectly. Suddenly, someone entered his room without knocking. Trey did not notice the visitor. The guest began to cough intelligently. Trey, you're such a hard worker, the red-haired man shouted and came closer. The red-haired man continued to ask questions. He asked Trey if he would be the first one to leave them and go to the seventh level. 
Trey finally heard someone in the room and reluctantly came out of his meditation. Fernet, what are you doing here? he asked. Fernet happily told him that there was a very good student in the fire element class this term. The red-haired Fernet sat down next to Trey and continued to talk. He said that he and he had been classmates for many years, and now they were teaching students. Trey told him that he was worrying in vain in this situation. And then Fernet could not stand it and exploded, saying that if that was the case, then they would meet in the academic arena. He was a rather unbalanced person. Trey thought at that moment that none of his students looked special, although there was one. Meanwhile, Baby the mouse had finally eaten her chicken leg and was lying in a fluffy ball under the blanket. Sad. She got out from under it and started jumping around the room. She thought it was so strange that no one was in the dormitory. Bede ran to the flip calendar and flipped the page over and saw that it said that today was an unusual day. A crowd was gathering in the competition arena of the Magic Academy. The boys came closer to her. This is where new students can compete with each other, but only freshmen take part, one of them explained. Yale stood there and silently calculated something. The guys asked him what he was doing. He replied that he had calculated that if they sold tickets to the competition at a price of 110 gold coins, then... Then we can make a lot of money. How could you all not think of that? He shouted. Lindley was invited to the magic arena. The host told him to put his hand on a stone to automatically divide them into magic groups. At that moment, Lindley angrily remembered Gene and his firepower in the last battle. He put his hand on the stone with determination and courage, and it lit up. The host controlled the whole process. The host loudly announced that the competitor, Lenly, belonged to group number 32. Then Yale and Renard came up to Lenly and told him that they would not allow him to compete alone. But the presenter said that they didn't have to compete yet, and everyone was looking at the magic circle of the stone. Suddenly, Renard noticed that only Georg had not joined them. Yale explained that even though their elements were different, they would still fight together. Georg adjusted his glasses and replied that such fights were not his style. He was an intellectual and fought only with his mind. And then the crowd of spectators began to whisper that a student of the fire element was coming. Everyone stepped aside. Through the crowd, Jean walked with authority and confidence with his blonde friend, who was constantly serving him. He met eyes with Lenly, hatred for each other sparking between them. They were both completely motivated. Gene gritted his teeth as he was surprised that Lenly had come. I thought you weren't coming, Lenly cut him off. Jean noticed with satisfaction how the crowd was looking at him and shouted, If there was no one stronger than him, why was everyone looking at him? He could warm up the audience. He walked with a wide stride, respectfully and slowly, and the crowd parted even more. And then he had a brilliant idea. He started releasing fire around him to make it look more beautiful, and the crowd recoiled in fright. Renard shouted at him why he was doing this, but John pompously replied that he was just warming up because the power of the fire element was too high and he had nothing to do with it. Yale looked on in amazement at Jean's antics and said that he did not see anything special in fire magic and was not afraid of it. Suddenly, Renard began to smell something burning. Everyone turned to Renard and saw that Yale's clothes were on fire. Yale started running and screaming in panic, waving his arms and begging everyone to put it out. Jean muttered to himself that he was an ignorant, pathetic student. And then Jean noticed a light at Lenly's feet. The thought crossed his mind that maybe it was because of it that his magic hadn't worked on Lenly. Dulin also noticed the light at the boy's feet and she thought that it must be the magic of the wind and earth creating a protective wall. And no one else can do this but her student. Dylan was excited. Jean walked up to the stone to test his strength. It lit up. He shouted out to the crowd that they would all be disqualified with their level of magic before they even met him. Jean's first fight will be against Lin Lei, the host announced. Jean shouted with satisfaction to get ready to leave the arena. Lin Lei snapped back and promised to defeat Jun even faster. Everything was going according to his plan, so he should shut his bad mouth. Jean did not calm down and promised to meet in a fight in which Lin Lei would regret everything. Delia was watching all this from a distance. She thought to herself that the battle would start soon. 
and she heard that Lenly would be participating in it. And then she heard someone calling her name. She turned around, and it was Teacher Trey, and he quickly spoke to her, saying that he would be very happy if she took part in the competition. With her abilities, it would be quite easy, and she would reach the final. Delia was embarrassed by this proposal, and blushed. She didn't like the increased interest in herself, even though she was very beautiful. But Trey was dragging her to the registration. He had already decided everything for her. Delia stopped him and admitted that she was afraid to fight in public. Trey was not expecting such an answer at all, and was surprised to hear it. She sincerely apologized to the teacher and was upset. Trey reassured her that everything was fine. Then he asked her if she knew who else was going to be fighting today. Suddenly something hit his head. It was Baby the Mouse and she flew away screaming hysterically that no one could stop her from seeing her Lenly fight. The competition begins! The first group of contestants is Renard and Rayson, announced the host. Renard spitefully muttered that he was Jean's sycophant, and the crowd screamed. People shouted and demanded that Renard drag Raisin out. No one liked this upstart. Renard stood on one of the arena's towers and announced that he was in the second class of the fire element, so he would attack. Rayson, an impudent blonde, said that Renard's appearance showed that he had never fought anyone. He was trying to mentally disrupt Renard and make him angry. And Rayson shouted a first-level spell, Tongues of Flame, and launched a furious column of fire in Renard's direction. The boy with the glasses shouted at Renard that these idiots are used to street fighting. Be careful. Everyone else froze and watched the battle. The fire began to form a huge circle around Renard's body, and he became instantly very hot. In about ten seconds, the fire engulfed him completely. He looked like a pillar of fire. The guys were looking at him with bated breath. Delon was frozen, and the crowd of students stood in complete shock. And then a miracle began to happen. Renard stretched out his arms, and everyone around him realized that something was about to happen. Jean looked at him in amazement and shouted that Renard had some kind of magical protection. Rayson just stared and couldn't believe his eyes. And then Renard broke out of the fire with all his might and grabbed Rayson by the scruff of the neck and shouted that he had opened up and was ambushed by him. Was he a seasoned warrior? Renard pulled Rayson off the ground, and they flew into the air and quickly spun around in a single combat. From the outside, they looked like one. Renard shouted a first-level spell, Blue Fire! A blue pillar of fire began to come out of his hands. He slammed it into Rayson's body, and the fire engulfed him from all sides. Raisin lost consciousness from the force of the blue fire and began to fall rapidly from the air to the ground. The competition host shouted that Raisin was down. Georg shouted loudly that Renard had done the job. Meanwhile, the match director, the magical judge, entered the arena and solemnly announced that Renard had won the first group, the second class of fire. Exhausted, Renard stood in the arena and bowed in all directions, saying thank you. Thank you, thank you. His face was covered in soot and his clothes were burnt in places. Lenly asked Ellen what she had seen and what she thought about it. The girl replied that the boys were still first-level mages, and maybe even lower, unfortunately. She explained that before a fight, mages must always put on magical protection. It is their advantage over warriors. Renard had just used it, and Rayson hadn't even noticed. Lenly was amazed to think to himself that his neighbors were not so weak, but actually very strong magicians. Jean, who was watching the battle, said that it was a good fight, but Renard had used an anti-fire spell beforehand, so Rayson's loss was so stupid. Jean walked over to the guy standing on the sidelines and pointed out to Renard that he didn't look like an ordinary newcomer. It was the result of special training. He sarcastically invited the boys to become his new fans, but he promised that he would finish them off first. But if they wanted to become the best, they had to follow him. Renard shouted to him that maybe they would let him join the dormitory 109. Jean lost his temper and shouted back at him that they really thought they were worth it. Jean laughed out loud and viciously promised that later they would see the difference between them. And then the host announced the next fight. It was between Lin Lei, the wind and earth elemental, and Jean, the fire elemental. The crowd was instantly quiet, and there was absolute silence. 
Delia whispered happily. Finally, these two will fight. Oh, it's this unusual student, Trey muttered. Not even a dual element, but you're just a regular fake. Gene snorted as he stood in his stance. He thought that Lenley had dodged the fireball last time, so he had to double it. And he shouted a first-level spell, fireball. Lenley also began to unleash his magic. Incredible wind currents began to spin around him. Trey looked at Lenley and felt scared. He was surprised that Lenley really knew this spell. Lenley shouted out one of his favorite first-level spells, Glide, and he was instantly in the air. Windblade was the next spell Lenley shouted, and the wind began to glow. Gene watched with interest and began to think about his plan of action. He decided to humiliate Lenley and shouted that his wind attack was just rubbish compared to his fireball. Compressed Windblade Lenley shouted again and slammed his power into Gene. He was so concentrated that he didn't listen to Gene's nonsense. When wind meets fire, all it can do is run away, John shouted at him and launched his fire in his direction again. Damn, a simple level one spell is so powerful, Lenley thought in his mind. Dellen intervened and explained to him that although it sounded stupid, he needed to use the wind to fight, because the lower level earth elemental magic consisted of several defensive spells. Dellen quickly flew over and explained to him that if he used only magic in the battle, he would be at a disadvantage. But if Lenly used the wind element only to run away, it would be difficult to defeat Jean. At this point, Jean teased Lenla by shouting at him to use the wind blade if he planned to continue fighting him, and he fired his fire again. Lenla turned to Dellen and asked him hesitantly if he could really use a flat blade to defeat Jean. Dillon slyly replied that he should think of Gene as a stone and winked at him. And open him up? The boyfriend asked sarcastically. She closed her eyes and told him that every time he launched his fireball, he should think of a crack in the stone. If you see it, your flat blade. Then she whispered that you have to keep in mind that it's not a stone after all. The enemy will move, so you have to concentrate. Lindley remembered what the stone he had split with his flat blade on the lawn during training looked like, and concentrated. A pattern between the stones, he whispered, remembering the dots of fire and lines of fire he had seen in the middle of the stone. The boy concentrated, stretched his arms forward, generated the magic of a flat blade, and confidently launched it. Jean was horrified to see this. How could Lenley's wind blade pass through the firewall and attack him? He could clearly see Linley's flat blade easily and silently cutting through his firewall. For a moment, Gene lost control of the situation, but after gathering his strength, he sent a huge pillar of fire at Lin Lei. This guy Gene is really well trained. He stopped Lin Lei's combo right away, whispered Deline. The fierce battle continued. Gene growled furiously that Lin Lei had only hit him because he was safe, so don't let him get too comfortable. But he fired again with even greater force. Dylan watched and said with satisfaction that the battle was all about timing and opportunity. Lenley was thrown high into the sky by the fire attack. Lenley shouted that he would use the flat swing again and projected the blade magic again. When you think you've won, you've lost, Jean hissed with a wild smile of a madman. Jean held his hands out and loudly ordered Lenlina not to attack him, showing that he was not going to do anything. The guys in the crowd of spectators were watching the fight and one of them said that knowing John, he wouldn't get into a fight until he was sure of his actions, and that was very suspicious. Dellen said that although Lenley knew the spell well, he was using it again for some reason, and called him completely overconfident. But Lenley continued to move with the flat blade. Lenley began to confidently enter Jean's circle of fire, but Jean stood still. But Jean, letting the boy get as close as possible, immediately shouted the spell, Fireball and let him taste it, and he fired a strong fire directly into Lenley's body. The crowd screamed in terror. Everyone screamed, students, teachers, friends, and only Dellen watched attentively and remained silent. Jean launched another fireball spell, a first-level fire element, and struck again with fire, shouting that he would defeat him. Lenley's wounds began to bleed profusely. Dellen saw everything and thought that even though he had been hit by the fireball, he couldn't have lost that much blood. She had a bad feeling about it. Meanwhile, in Wushan village, Lenley Horton's younger brother came to Nog and told him that his nose was bleeding. 
His father was shocked. Jean shouted at Lenly that he had lost. He was 100% sure of it. But then something incredible happened. Lenly began to roar like a dragon. Blood dripped from his mouth. He screamed so loudly that it seemed as if the dragon was behind him. The crowd was screaming with fear. Lenly was very hot. Jean looked at him and wondered why he did not fall down but was still crying. He had just hit him with the fireball. He could not understand anything. But Lenly, bleeding like a beast, began to attack Jean again. And he shouted that if he was not afraid to die, he would help him. But it was too late. Lenly was gaining momentum. Gathering the remnants of his strength, Lenly stabbed Jean with his magic flat blade, and the sound of the explosion was incredible. The force of the blow hit Jean's body and was so strong that it completely paralyzed him. And instantly they both fell exhausted to the ground with a thud. There was a ringing silence around them. Five minutes later, when Jean regained consciousness, he whispered that it was impossible, because he had attacked with a fireball. Dylan looked at Lenly's bloody face and flew over to ask him what kind of element it was, and what happened to the mouse. The mouse was also screaming and covered in blood. Bibby seemed to have gone mad. She started flying over the crowd of students and bouncing off their heads with her paws. Dylan looked at her in amazement and wondered what had happened to Bebe. Had the resonance made her like this? Holy meteor shower weakened version, Dylan shouted the spell, and she hit the mouse with her staff to stop its flight path. Dylan thought that even the contract mouse was involved in the battle, which meant that Lenly could not fully control his power. She looked at the boy and couldn't quite tell if it was really the dragon's power in him or if he had enough in his body. Yvonne exclaimed in amazement that Lin Lei was indeed very strong. Trey was of the same opinion. Suddenly, the restless John, having fully regained his senses, shouted that although Lin Lei had these strange spells, his fire element magic could, and he again insidiously launched the fireball at the guy. It covered his whole body. But miraculously, the fire did not burn the boy's body. In response, Lin Lei also launched his magic towards Jean. It was a high-level magic of the water element ice barrier. But at that moment, the tournament manager ran up to them and actually stopped everything because the guys were too exhausted to continue. He said that both of them had exhausted their limits. In fact, they both surpassed the first level of skill, especially your power. It has exceeded all our expectations, but it is not the kind of magic that can be learnt in the academy, said the steward of Lenly. Dellen looked at them and thought. It was good that the manager had suppressed Linley's power, but I think they don't know much about dragon blood. But then a red-haired teacher started running through the crowd, shouting furiously that Linley had used abnormal magic and should be disqualified. Jean was his student and a fan. And that's why Jean is the winner in this battle. The redhead continued to shout, but the manager asked him that he was right in general, but if there is a force that cannot be defeated by magic, and it does not count as a victory, then what is the point of the academy? And he continued that if a participant loses without the help of magic, will he have the courage to tell people? He was angry with the redhead and disliked him. The referee announced to the crowd that he was calling a draw in this fight and raised both hands of the exhausted opponents. The crowd roared. Everyone was shouting that Lin Lei should win. That's right. What's a draw if Lin Lei wins? No one was happy with the referee's result. This is not fair, thought Lenly. He was very tired and disappointed. And he closed his eyes. He felt very bad. But he kept hearing only his name in the crowd. Night fell, the city slept, and so did the residents of the 109 dormitory. Finally, Lenly could sleep after such hard training and a tough battle. Together with his mouse, they slept cuddled under a warm blanket. They both needed to rest. It was clear that the boy was having nightmares. He cried out and woke up dreaming of Jean. Delan, who was guarding him, told him he was completely safe and patted him gently on the head. Then the match, Lenly shouted. He could not calm down and was in a state of half-sleep. Dylan began to tell him that after the referee had called a draw, Lenly had passed out, so they took him to the dormitory to rest. Jean was also knocked out, most likely because their strength had dropped and he was also taken to the Academy's medical center. After their fight, the next matches became boring and Renard, his roommate, won, Deline explained. That's how it was, the boy vaguely replied. But Dellen was not satisfied. 
and asked Len Lee quietly if he remembered that first meeting in the hall when he was tested, because some strange things happened at the match. That means he could be a dragon blood warrior. Dellen finished her conversation. Judging by his aura, he's definitely at least a second-level knight. Dellen was still worried. Lenly looked carefully at his hands and thought, maybe this was his true power that he knew about. After a little thought, the boy shook his head and replied that it was not possible. Dellen looked at him pitifully. She really felt sorry for him, and she asked him why he was saying that. And Lenly explained to her that his father had once told him that he couldn't be a dragon blood knight. He had told him very clearly, the boy repeated, recalling past events. He was 100% sure of his father's words. He asked him not to tell him this again, and he lay down on the bed again, upset. The boy explained that because he was not a dragon-blooded warrior, he had entered this academy to at least become a strong mage and revive the power of his family, and that was what motivated him to become stronger. Dellen listened to him and thought, he was only twelve and already carrying such a responsibility. But that's why he would be stronger than the others, he would succeed. The dormitory was a bustling nightlife. Yale went to collect money for bets on Lenley's fight. Everyone thought he would win, and Yale had his hands full of bags of gold coins. He was dancing with joy. Delia was sitting in her diary writing down Lenley's fight today. It was very interesting to her and so she decided to write down his strategy. Jean was resting in his room at the time. Raisin reassured him that it wasn't a loss, it was just a draw. But Jean told him that where he did not win, it meant that he lost. Meanwhile, in the village of Wushan, Nog stood in the middle of the Baruch family's shrine. He was loudly calling out to the five saints of the Baruch family and asking them to help him because he was in trouble. He asked them to give their power to this boy. In front of him, Linley's half-conscious younger brother, Horton, lay silently in a basket. Suddenly, an unknown force lifted the little boy's body and he glowed. Horton opened his blue eyes and the silhouette of a dragon flashed in his pupils. And his body abruptly fell right into his father's arms. This is exactly what Hillman saw when he entered the sanctuary. He asked Nog if the ceremony was over. But at that moment, Horton began to cough loudly. He said it was very difficult for him to breathe. Hillman asked what was wrong with the boy's eyes. For a minute they looked unusual. Nog explained that Horton's blood was rebelling, as if it had lost control. His blood and his son's blood had come into full resonance. Nog exclaimed with joy that it was dragon blood. He had finally manifested the blood of a dragon. And it worked. Hillman couldn't believe his ears, he asked again. If this is in Horton's blood, then the density of his blood is incredible. Nog turned to him grimly and asked Hillman to promise him something. He asked him to protect Horton and Lin Lei until they were grown up, to protect them, so that they could make their family great someday. He quietly handed the baby into Hillman's arms and silently left the sanctuary. Hillman ran after Nog, asking him what he was going to do. Nog stopped. His face was red, but his eyes were burning. He really looked like a dragon. He said quietly that he was going to do what he should have done a long time ago and let Hillman not even think of stopping him. One difficult year had passed. Lindley sat in the middle of his dormitory room, meditating and practicing, stones flying around him. He became much older. He tried to concentrate as hard as he could, and he succeeded. Dylan was watching him sitting on the windowsill. Beeb the mouse was sleeping sweetly. Lindley was already fourteen years old. He asked Dellen if his mind power was already the same as that of a third-level magician. She smiled and replied that, of course, thanks to her training, to increase his mind power, he learnt a flat blade. The speed of increasing his mind power is faster than an ordinary person, although it's six times faster. The boy interrupted her by saying that if his father knew this, he would be happy. Dellen was offended and demanded that she was the one to thank. But he didn't hear her, he was thinking about his father. And then he heard someone calling him through the window. Lenly and Bibi also looked out the window with interest. There stood John, who was also older and fifteen years old. In his usual way, he called Lin Lei a miserable coward. And he shouted for Lenly to come out and fight him if he didn't have the guts. John hadn't changed a bit. He hysterically demanded only one fight. But he really wanted to fight again. 
It didn't matter to him whether he won or lost. He would accept the result as it was. Gene still could not accept his defeat. After listening to him, Lenly shouted that he was here to learn magic, not to fight an idiot like Gene. Stepping away from the window, Lenly cast the second-level Earth Elemental spell, Broken Stone, and the window was instantly blocked with stones. The boy learned to do incredible household things, at which Gene shouted so that Lenly would not think that some window would prevent him from hearing him. He decided not to back down this time. And at that moment, everyone in the room heard Yale shouting, That guy! and running down the corridor. Yale was not shouting in his own voice that he would be Lin Lei's representative in the new battle. The whole dormitory could hear him. He ran to the kitchen and started gathering all the knives. Renard tried to calm him down, explaining that Lenly would not be able to defeat him with these knives. Yale finally stopped and thoughtfully said that it was true, because he had heard that Jean had become much stronger this year. Even the high school students did not want to fight him. He firmly believed that only Lin Lei could beat Jean, and he began to ask Lin Lei to agree to fight, because this Jean would go crazy. Let him go, the boy replied. He didn't care. Yale began to cry loudly like a child. He really wanted this rematch to take place, because he was a true admirer of Lenly's magical power. Lenly was calmly pouring himself a cup of tea in the kitchen, listening to Yale's screaming when he noticed an unusual medallion on the table with a dragon on it. He asked the boys where it came from. Henry told him that a middle-aged knight had come by this morning looking for Lenly, but he was training at the time. The knight did not want to disturb him, left the medallion, and left. Lenly understood. He cast the first-level wind elemental spell, Glide, and immediately flew out the window he had sealed, which shattered into pieces. Jean was still standing under that window, still annoyingly. And when he saw Lenly, he was happy, thinking that the boy had finally come out to fight him. But Lenly flew silently past him with an indifferent face. Surprised, Jean began to shout after him that he had no right to run away like that. And he jumped after him, grumbling under his breath that if he knew the sixth-level soaring technique, he wouldn't have to jump like a fool every time. Meanwhile, Captain Hillman, the leader of the Wushan village guards, stood in the forest clearing waiting patiently for someone for hours. And it was the mysterious dragon medallion that Lenly had found that drew him to the clearing like a magnet. Lenly landed and ran up to Captain Hillman, and they hugged each other. Hillman looked at the boy in awe and said that he had grown up a lot and looked like a grown man. The boy blushed. He was very fond of his uncle, who was his second father, and asked how their family was doing and if anything had happened to them. Hillman happily told him that his younger brother Horton had successfully passed the dragon blood test. Lenly was amazed and very happy and asked if it was really dragon blood. Yes, little Horton has dragon blood, Hillman confirmed. He added that because of this, his father decided to send him to O'Brien Academy, to which the boy joyfully exclaimed that it was the best place to train because it was a school for nobles. Lindley remembered Yale telling him that studying at O'Brien Academy was very expensive, but also very prestigious, and it was the best academy in its field. Hillman, sensing questions, continued to tell him that because of the cost of Horton's education, they had to sell some of their belongings. On his father's orders, Hillman sold the stone dragon heads that hung on the front door, but they did not fetch a very high price, but still managed to save up at least some money for Horton's education. Seeing the worry in Lenly's eyes, Hillman asked him not to worry, because there is always a way out. At the same time, he thought that he still could not tell the boy about his father, because he was on the road. But in his heart, he hoped that everything was going well with Nog. But then Yale appeared out of nowhere, and he heard the whole conversation. He started a dialogue and said that in addition to tuition fees, he also needed money for household expenses and bills and that he would need a sword and equipment for Horton's training. Hillman's eyes rounded. He hadn't even thought about it, and he blurted out that he would probably go to work for the O'Brien Empire to earn some money and solve this problem. Lindley listened and watched them both, and suggested that Hillman stay for a few days to rest. He had something in mind. Saying that he had something to do, he ran off in an unknown direction. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then replied the puzzled Hillman. Yale ran after the boy, 
and when he caught up with him, he asked if he needed any money. He offered to lend him some. Lenly refused and thanked him sincerely. He really had a reliable and good friend. Yale looked at Lenly's face and knew he had made up his mind. The guy asked Yale to help him make a deal with Gene to have the fight that Gene wanted and demanded so much. Not for the first time. It was beginning to get dark, and the academy building and the dormitories around it were beautifully illuminated by lights. It was a quiet and warm summer evening. Meanwhile, in the woods not far from the academy, Lenly and Jean stood on a clearing. It was clear that they had already agreed on something. Jean said with satisfaction that he thought Lenly would never come, because he would be afraid. But only 10,000 gold coins, although it was a lot of money, did not mean that he could not afford it. Lenly listened to him calmly, but asked him not to forget about the agreement of the battle. John slyly asked him if he really thought he could beat him. Two people were running through the forest, a girl and a boy. The girl asked the boy if he had heard that Jean and Lenly were going to fight again. He replied that of course he had, and that he would not miss it for anything. It was on this night that the second match was scheduled, the rematch of the year. All of Lenly's friends were already standing in the bushes, eagerly anticipating the fight. There were two people in the academic arena. Lenly and Jean. The fight was about to begin. Jean hissed at Lenly in his own style that the last time he surprised me with his stupid spells, and he shouted the spell, Fire Fairy, answer my call, and fire began to flow out of his body in a continuous stream. Jean looked at Lenly and noticed that he was extremely calm, and thought that he would probably use that strange spell again, like the last time. Jean completely surrounded himself with fire. It rose and fell in the air and looked like a huge fireball. But he kept a close eye on Lenly. He recognized in his heart that the boy had great strength. Henry observed that he had never seen Jean so cautious, to which Renard replied that he looked like a scared cat in the fire. Everyone giggled. And then a woman's voice said that Jean was still afraid of Len Lay's strange power. It was Delia, and she greeted them sweetly. The boys were dumbfounded and an intriguing spectacle began in the arena. Jean rose up into the air and released continuous streams of fire from his two hands. He was shouting that he could actually use ranged attacks to defeat Lenly. Lenly calmly listened to him and watched. He was silent and calm. Even in the air, Jean could see that he was already planning something, and his calmness and self-confidence faded away in the moment. He became insanely nervous because he knew how strong his opponent was. Lindley began his wind elemental magic. He shouted the familiar spell Flat Blade. Deline was also watching and smiling with satisfaction. Because Lindley was once again using her favorite wind blade to cut the stones to make them look like meteors, and this guy had a knack for it. It flashed through Jean's mind that Lindley had thought of combining two elemental spells into one. He immediately put up a fire shield in front of him, but he was no longer sure that it would withstand this double force. But the force of the blade's impact was so strong that Jean was hit so hard that he spun several circles in the air. Burn, you devil! Jean yelled, throwing a new portion of spared fire. But Lenly had already cast the wind elemental spell, Glide, and managed to slip between Jean's flames. Delia looked at him with admiration and said that Lenly's glide was getting better and better every time. Even the flames could not keep up with him. Lenly didn't let Jean collect his thoughts and cast the next spell, Broken Stones and Wind Blade, and threw a pile of stones towards Jean. Such was his cunning plan. But at the same time, Jean still thought what would that pile of rocks do to him. They wouldn't break through his super wall. But he shouted at Lenly that he could only fly in circles like a fly and was afraid to come closer. At this point, Renard, who had been watching the fight closely, said that John's fire was strong, but it was suppressed by Lenly's stones. Yale began to shout that Jean was playing a shameless game, his flames not keeping pace with Lenly's slide. That is why he is luring him to fight in close combat. But Jean provoked Lenly by saying that people with the wind element can only run away. This was also part of Jean's plan. Lindley suddenly flew up to Jean's face for a second and looked into his eyes as if he were looking into his soul. And he cheerfully shouted that if Jean wanted to fight in close combat, he would keep his distance. 
Jean looked him in the eye and managed to scream out that this was the price Lenly had to pay for his arrogance. He was already angry enough. He immediately fired a fireball right into Lenly's face. But Lenly didn't flinch and shouted out that he had to use the power of the earth to fight his fucking fire. So he threw all his small stones right into the fire. He laughed out loud that his flames had already passed this pile of stones. What a surprise. But Lenly said, Then to fight he will bring hundreds of thousands of stones. And the stones instantly became many times larger. A thousand stones, ten thousand stones, the power of the earth element. If you want to fight in close combat, go ahead. And he threw all these stones right at Jean. Jean shouted back at him that if he was using the power of the mind to increase the number of stones, then he would just add some fireballs and destroy them. And he started to launch thousands of fireballs which flew like balloons. There were incredibly many of them. Delia asked the boys if Lenly had really agreed to fight in close combat. The guys didn't hear her. It's against the principles of combat, Renard shouted at her. Yale started shouting at Lenly, started playing by the enemy's rules. The boys and Delia did not understand what was happening. Lenly's plan remained a complete mystery to them. Dellen watched and thought about it, and it turned out that a duel between the elements of earth and fire was very interesting. But Lenly summoning stones from one position? This is a disadvantage. And then Baby the Mouse suddenly appeared. She screamed hysterically. Who dared to attack her favorite boss? Dellen tried to stop her, but she rushed to the arena to help. In the end, Yale caught her by the tail and told her that her master was having a completely fair fight, so she shouldn't run out there and interfere. Bebe finally calmed down after hearing this. She told Yale that he shouldn't think he was so good that he could take her by the tail and stuck out her tongue. She also began to watch the battle patiently. Jean was throwing his fireballs like a fool and even managed to shout that Lenly had lost all his stones and his earth magic was of low potential. He provoked the boy as best he could, getting excited. But he kept teasing him that he had used up all his magic and now he couldn't dodge. Lenly cheerfully replied that he was wrong, and here was his counter-strike. He threw a terrible number of stones in Jean's direction. There were so many of them. They came in a continuous stream. No one had ever seen anything like it. The crowd in the bushes gasped. Lenly had managed to tell Jean that he had been holding back his magic until now, to see how much damage he could do to him. Now it was his turn to attack for real. But Jean wasn't one to be intimidated, and he asked sarcastically if Lenly had the power to do it. A storm of rubble! Rotational lift! Lenly suddenly shouted the spell, and millions of small, sharp stones hit Jean's body with all their might, breaking through his super defenses. At that moment, Jean fell helplessly on the gravel. His cap flew off to the unknown, and he lay there unmoving. The crowd cheered. Jean could not get up, but he could speak. He asked Lin Lei if he still had any strength left. Lin Lei replied that he had to use a lot of strength to break through his fire. The defeated Jean continued to lie there silently and powerlessly, looking at the sky, which was all he could do at that moment. He was not wearing any clothes. Everything was torn to rags. His body was covered with soot and scratches. But at least he was alive. And then Jean shouted to Lenly, Catch! And he threw him his crystal personal card. The gold I promised you is all on this magic crystal card. You can go and get it yourself. I lost. He smiled. Lenly deftly caught the card and looked at it happily. He had never seen so much money. And he had managed to earn it for little Horton. His dream had come true. But in a moment he became serious and told Jean that he was a great opponent. He had learnt a lot from him in this fight. But if Jean wanted to consider this match a training match, he wouldn't take the money. After listening to him, Jean shouted that Lenly could not cancel the deal, and that he shouldn't forget that he still hated him. Jean finally stood up through the strength and pain, taking off the rest of his rags, and continued to tell Lenly to keep the ten thousand because when he became stronger he would find him and they would fight again. And he limped back to the dormitory. Dylan came at him with a hiss. She muttered that first ranked attacks, then melee. Then allow an attack, the guy was testing himself, wasn't he? But she chirped contentedly that Lenly knew how to combine the elements of earth and wind, 
and he had perfect control of his blade, so he had no opponents in his year of training. Lenly told her that thank goodness no one had looked at him for a while when he wasn't working at his best. Dellen burst out laughing. Because then all the snotty spectators from the whole academy started coming out of the bushes, shouting at him that it was great and he was so naive. They asked him to teach them the art of fighting and magic. Bebe the mouse ran happily to his boss, and Yale collected money for the betting on the fight. Jean hobbled to the top of a small hill and stood looking at the horizon and the starry sky. Everything finally calmed down inside him. He thought that so little time had passed, and Lenley had only used magic to surpass him. He didn't even have to think of a strategy. He was infinitely saddened by this because he was no longer the best. Lenley sat on the steps of the house and looked at the crystal card with interest, because the ten thousand warmed his heart. Just then, Bibi started to take the card away from him and decided that she was going to buy thousands of chicken legs and eat to her heart's content. But Lenly took the card out of her hands. The guy thought 10,000 was a lot of money, but how would it help his family? But it was not enough to solve all the issues, he concluded. What am I going to do with it? Lenly said out loud. Yale, who was drinking coffee nearby, replied that he, for example, really liked sculptures. Then you need to think of other ways to make money, Lenley replied. Yale replied that this year Lenley had been practicing the flat blade spell and should have made a lot of sculptures. Yale thought about it and offered to take them away and sell them at a very favorable price. He even knew how to do it. But Lenley stormed out and flatly refused. He explained that his skill was not very good. Dellen listened to their conversation and thought that with his level of skill, he should be ashamed of himself. Even if the sculpture was bought for a few gold pieces, it would not be enough. If a sculpture doesn't cost hundreds of thousands, it means it's not worthy, Lenley explained gloomily. Then I didn't offer anything, Yale reassured him. But Lenley's mood was extremely nasty. The boys went outside and saw Captain Hillman walking towards them. Yale realized that they would have a conversation for two, so he greeted him and said goodbye. Hillman said that he had to go home to take care of a lot of things, so he came to say goodbye to Lenley. Lenley took a crystal card out of his pocket and smilingly handed it to him, asking him to take it. Hillman did not understand what was happening. Looking at it, he saw that there were 10,000 gold pieces. His eyes rounded. Lenley explained that it wasn't much, but he would find ways to make money. Captain Hillman exclaimed that the boy was a real magician, he was incredibly excited about the card, but he admitted that he had never held so much money in his hands in his whole life and asked where the boy had got it. Lenley explained that he had earned it in a fair fight and that he had nothing to worry about, but he was embarrassed because he was not used to being praised so much. I am Hillman. I will not let young Master Lenley down, the captain exclaimed, putting his hands on his shoulders. Master Nog, Linley has really grown up thought Hillman as he addressed Nog in his mind. Captain Hillman turned and walked away. All his life he had had the opportunity to watch Lin Lei grow up, and no one knew when their next meeting would be. Earning this will be a big problem. I won't be able to earn money by fighting every day, the guy thought. And then Yale, who was standing around the corner, as if hearing his thoughts, asked him what he was thinking. Have you been eavesdropping on me again? Lenley snapped. Yale began to calm him down, apologizing, and explained that he was there to help Lenley, like a true friend. Meanwhile, Hillman walked through the forest and thought that he probably wouldn't tell Lin Lei the whole truth about his father for a while. Yale whispered something in Lin Lei's ear and they went to the wind classroom. When they entered the classroom, they saw their teacher, Trey, and their classmates. Lenley approached the teacher and said that he wanted to train on the Magic Beast mountain range. Trey was furious. You've just started your third year, he shouted. He couldn't calm down and stop shouting at Lenley, and the rest of the class froze in horror. Because Lenley is reckless, one of the students shouted. He's only been in his third year for a short time, and he wants to go this far. Training on the Magic Beast Mountain Range is only allowed for fifth-year students before the final exams, explained Trey, who was strongly against it. But that's Lenley himself one of the students exclaimed again. 
Everyone at the Academy loved Linley for his kind heart and extraordinary abilities. No wonder he thinks he's so experienced that he can reach the spine of the magical beasts, someone else said. And then two unknown men entered the classroom. One of them looked at Lenly and asked if he was the one who had defeated the strong Gene in the last battle. But Trey could not calm down. He shouted that the purpose of the Academy was to train future mages of the kingdom, not dead men. Lenly tried to calm everyone down by assuring them that he would not die there and would definitely come back alive. Meanwhile, Trey calmed down a bit and asked him if he knew exactly what the Magic Beast Mountain Range was. He looked at Lenly with a scorching look, and he began to tell the whole class that even the most advanced magician could not return from this place. These mountains are inhabited by magical beasts that fight each other. Cruel monsters destroy the weak to become stronger. Many people died there. In some places, you can find monsters of the 8th and ninth level. Sometimes even monsters of the saint level live there. But he gritted his teeth, saying that in short, Lenly could not even hope to get permission from him to go on this trip, because he was too young and inexperienced. So Lenly decided to convince him by showing him something. He shouted the water element spell, Icicle, and the air temperature in the classroom immediately turned sub-zero. Immediately a professor came into the classroom and saw a winter landscape with icicles and snow. Frost on all the walls and students. He asked Trey, Who is that guy? Pointing to Lenly. Lenly was standing on his desk, and icicles had grown all over the classroom, and the walls were covered in ice, the temperature dropping quite rapidly. Trey stammered and tried to explain to the professor that Lenly wanted something that was beyond his capabilities as a third year student, and he refused him. The professor told him that he hadn't done anything wrong, but he had been told something. The professor looked at the boy and exclaimed that it must be Lin Lei. He remembered him from last year's match. He went on to explain that he had been following him, but had accidentally overheard their conversation. And he opened the academic newspaper with the headline, Genius Defeated Genius, on the front page. It's the latest breaking news, and in addition to the headlines, every page has a detailed analysis of the fight. Even the senior-level viewer could see that after Dixie, Lenly is one of the most talented people, he continued. Dellen mockingly asked Lenly if he was really still lagging behind Dixie, but Lenly was embarrassed and explained that he didn't even know that everyone knew. Lenly timidly explained to the professor that he had just used the icicle to check something out. But the professor attacked Trey, accusing him of being less prepared than his students. He announced to everyone that Lenly was definitely an extraordinary third-level wizard. And if he is in such a hurry to go to the mountain, range of magical beasts, he must have some serious reasons for it. The boy hesitated, and Dellen whispered with a giggle that there were many magical beasts living there, whose skins were worth hundreds of thousands of coins. I was the one who suggested you go there to work, and you can also practice there. But you can't answer them like that, can you? She laughed at the boy. Dylan mumbled that there were beasts that cost hundreds of gold, and there were some that cost thousands, but they were not very smart. He could handle them, and she could be there to help him. Something happened in my family, the boy finally answered the professor, but I am strong enough to survive on the mountain range of magical beasts. The professor asked him again and warned him not to be too confident. Boy, if something happens, no one will be able to help you. Do you still want to go there? Yes, Lenly answered firmly, and the professor agreed. He turned to the class and announced that he accepted Lenly's request and allowed him to go to the Magic Beast Mountain Range. The Magical Beast Mountain Range was a series of mountains with sharp peaks and impregnable foothills, and it was not easy to enter. The mountains were young and tall, covered with dense forest. No one knew for sure the number of animal and plant species that inhabited them, their levels and ranks. Those who returned from there were considered real heroes. As the day came to an end and the night fell, in the courtyard of dormitory number 109 stood several beautiful tall sculptures that Lenly had carved with a flat blade over the course of a year. Suddenly, several silhouettes of strangers jumped over the railing of the dormitory balcony and it was impossible to see their faces in the darkness. They were running through the bedroom where Georg was sleeping, snoring sweetly. Near the stairs to the second floor, they all froze and pressed against the wall. 
because they heard the rustling of tree leaves. Then they slipped past Renard, who was sleeping dreamily. Then they saw Lenly in his room, sleeping soundly, hugging Bebe the mouse. On the table in Lenly's room was a sculpture of a dragon's head that he had been working on for the last few weeks. And it was wonderful, very similar to the real thing. The strangers put it quietly into a sack. One of the strangers whispered in a very familiar voice that he had finally found it. The other stranger asked him that this was actually his dormitory, and when would he stop partying here? The mask was off. It was Yale. What's wrong with setting a relay race? I'm bored, Yale replied. He ordered everyone to quickly pick up the other sculptures and get out of here before the rest of the people woke up. Yale slyly whispered that it was because Lenley had not allowed him to sell these amazing sculptures during the day. They quietly and unobtrusively loaded all the sculptures onto the trolley. One of them asked if we could take them to the Prowl Gallery tomorrow. Yes, this gallery specializes in auctions, Yale replied. Early in the morning, the strangers arrived with the trolley in the part of town where the Prowl Gallery was located. There were two men standing in the gallery. One of them greeted the Count and told him that there would be a lot of work today. The old Count was looking at an exhibit and said that it was a very beautiful work, but he did not see any soul in it. The man began to convince him, saying that this was not true, that every detail in this work was worked out to the smallest detail, and asked him not to criticize it. Meanwhile, Yale and his boys were bringing in a large wooden box, afraid of accidentally smashing it against something. The man aggressively started shouting at Yale, demanding that he watch his language, and asked if he even knew who he was in front of. But Yale did not care. He was never afraid of anyone. Yale looked at him calmly and asked him if he was not just a count. The man accompanying the count began to shout, but the count waved his hand to silence him. And then the count finally got the dragon head sculpture out of the box, and he was completely delighted to see it. The Count began to examine every detail of it. He was a great connoisseur of art and knew his way around. His wealth allowed him to buy worthy pieces for his own collection. It was his life's work. When he finished the inspection, he told Yale that it was not enough. The guy started shouting that you know what you are trying to do. The Count put his hand on his shoulder and calmly said that the fact that he could express his emotions in his product was very good. Looking at Yale's strong reaction, he continued to examine the dragon's head in detail and asked why the dragon's scales were so dense. A round knife is usually used for this purpose and a flat knife for the top layer. Even if you are careful, it is still impossible to achieve such softness, said the Count, moving his hand over the sculpture. Finally, the Count asked how much Yale wanted for it. The boy began to think quickly. If he told him two hundred gold coins, would he be willing to let him go? Instead, the Count wondered how the boy had used only one carving tool. But it's impossible. The curves of the stone and their rises. How is it possible with just one round knife? This was the first time he had ever seen anything like this in his life, and by such a young artist. After a little thought and calculation, the Count offered Yale two thousand gold pieces, if only he would not go to the auction. These words brought tears to Yale's eyes. He had expected to sell the sculpture for ten times less. The Count looked at him silently and thought that perhaps two thousand was not enough. That's why the boy was crying. But he blurted out that he was willing to pay three thousand, and that was a reasonable price for this work. Wild delight, surprise, and happiness gripped Yale, and he quickly handed the statue to its new owner before he changed his mind. He couldn't stand it and burst into tears, explaining that every time a young craftsman finds a way to make money, he cries with happiness. Although our Lin Lei is little known now, he will become a great master someday, and then you will sell his sculpture for a lot of money. Ten times more expensive, he exclaimed. The Count calmly replied that although this sculpture is interesting, the path to greatness is not so easy, boy. But he was shocked that Lin Lei was only fourteen years old and had the skills of an old master of venerable age. Meanwhile, at the Magic Academy, several unidentified men came to Trey's classroom unannounced. They apologized for distracting him from his training and said their boss wanted to see Lenly. Trey was shocked by their visit. He said that the boy was not here. The strangers started shouting that they had an emergency. 
And then the professor appeared, and the men rushed to him, asking him to take them to Lin Lei. They had a very urgent matter. But the professor explained that Lin Lei was most likely on the mountain range of magical beasts, and that he was not really at the Magic Academy. Meanwhile, Lin Lei had reached the mountain range, and it was a very difficult journey. He had been walking for two days. Looking at the ridge, he exclaimed with satisfaction that the third-ranked dual elemental magician Lin Lei was starting his training on the Magic Beast mountain range. And then it suddenly started to rain. Lenly and Bibi decided to use magic to protect themselves from the rain. Neither of them wanted to get wet and get sick. The boy cheerfully cast the wind element spell Windshield, and they both found themselves under a magical green protective dome. But then Delon appeared and began to scold him, saying that it turns out you can use magic for all sorts of things. And it's so convenient. Lenly asked her guiltily. Isn't she afraid of the rain or something? Delon kept going and said that when Lenly climbed the mountain range of magical beasts, he would become the lowest link in the food chain. Therefore, he should actually use his powers very wisely and not play around. The boy sincerely apologized to her for his mischief and continued walking quickly. But suddenly he noticed that everything around him looked strange and depressing. The forest was dark, it was cold and damp, and there was a smoke in the air. Delan did not stop talking and monotonously lectured the boy that instead of training and earning money, he should think about how to stay alive because his magical power and even his breath could save his life. She could not calm down because she sincerely loved the boy like a little brother. Beeb's mouse started flying forward, and Lenly warned her that she would only be able to see 30 meters ahead at most, so she shouldn't run too far. But Bebe started running very fast. The boy started chasing after her and couldn't catch up. He started shouting at her to stop her, but she was already picking up speed. It became clear to everyone that something was happening up ahead. Lenly suddenly realized that she had really found something. Kneeling down and touching the ground with his hand, he began to summon the wind. He quickly said a wind detection spell. Detecting wind, green wind, find the magic aura. Dylan flew over to him and said that this wind spell looks quite useful. What did he detect? And then Lenly saw a level one magical beast. It was a bubble rabbit, about 60 meters away from them. Dylan whispered that Lenly had used the right spell, and that he should always be aware of his surroundings, because there were other magical creatures around, so he had to be vigilant. Lenly looked closely, and a little further away he saw another magical beast a second-level earth scorpion. The boy asked Delling how he could defeat these two beasts. Deling also looked at the beasts carefully and whispered that something was wrong. Suddenly she shouted out to Lin Lei to watch very carefully, because this is earth detection magic. And she told him to feel the earth giving him information about the enemy. And Lin Lei concentrated and felt with his whole body the battle that was taking place in the southwest direction. The girl continued that now Lenly would not be able to use the detection spell as easily as breathing, because his rank would not be enough, so he had to focus on survival. Let's go see the battle. And they quickly left. Finally, when they got closer, they saw three unfamiliar warriors fighting with swords in the air. All three of them were fighting a fifth-level crystal foot and mouth disease magical beast. They were two fourth-level warriors, Marte and Cover and a fifth-level warrior, Dashta. Together, they unanimously cast a level-5 spell windshield to protect the team. And after it worked, all three of them skillfully jumped on the back of the foot-and-mouth disease and put their weapons into it, and together they managed to kill it. And the beast fell dead to the ground with a roar. The warriors shouted furiously about their victory and were very pleased. After skillfully cutting open the body of the foot-and-mouth disease, they took out a single magic crystal. Dulin quickly told Lenly not to interfere in the affairs of the people of the mountain range. If it did not concern them, he should just leave quietly. She explained to him that it was a fifth-level magician and two warriors, and it was clear that they made a great team, because they managed to kill a fifth-level beast. Then one of the warriors suddenly called Lenly's name. The boy looked back and was very surprised and asked Delon how he knew him. She explained that he was just very close to them, and now he had been spotted by the enemy's revealing wind. The stranger called out his name again and waved to him, 
Julenli looked at him in surprise and did not know what to say. It's me, Dashta, from the wind element. We studied together, the stranger suddenly exclaimed. And Lenly finally remembered his thesis class and how classes two, three, four, and five always sat together. And Dasht was indeed sitting behind him. Dasht cheerfully exclaimed that his partners were there, and they were now taking the crystal out of the body of the magic beast, and pointed to his companions. Finally, Lenly was able to squeeze something out of himself, which is not surprising since Dashte is wearing the cloak of the Magic Academy. These two are Cover and Marte. They are my training mates. He introduced his friends to Dashti. And this is a friend of mine from the Academy. He recently became famous there. And now he's at the same level as Dixie. Introduced him to Dashti's friends. The guys replied that he was at Dixie's level, which was very, very cool. Dashte exclaimed that if Lenly joined them, they would become many times stronger. And together, they would be able to kill magical beasts without any problems. And if they were lucky enough to kill a level 7 beast, they could definitely get several tens of thousands of gold coins, which was a huge amount of money. He urged Linlay to join them. Linlay couldn't believe his ears and kept asking him if it was really possible to find a level 7 magic beast. Suddenly an arrow whistled in the air, dashed his body instantly tensed. His eyes turned glassy and the arrow instantly passed through his chest. Blood poured out of his mouth and he tried to say something. It's an ambush, be careful, Dasht whispered his last words. Linley was terrified, holding Dashte's bloody body in his arms, with an arrow sticking out of it. He was bleeding to death. Dashte was silent, his face was pale, his eyes were wide open and his body was limp. Only the wind played with his hair. The boys were instantly startled by the horrific scene they saw and shouted, Who did this? Marte shouted with all his might that the murderer should show himself to him immediately. He challenged him to a fight. It all happened in an instant. Lenly was out of his mind and furious with anger. Delon was trying to calm him down. What the hell? The boy shouted across the clearing. Meanwhile, Delon began to examine the arrow carefully. And after examining it, she said that it was 100% spelled with speed and accuracy, which meant that the mage who had shot it was definitely a fifth-level mage, and his advantage is precisely in surprise and location, so Lenly can't beat him now. According to my calculations, the next attack will be, whispered Deline. Just then, Marte started attacking the bush, shouting for the stranger to come out now. And at that moment, the next arrow silently hit Marte's body. Delon started shouting for Lenly to get out of there right now. This person has sixth level skills. You can't fight him. Suddenly, someone in the bushes said, There are two more left. The one with the red scarf is a good target. Lenly had a red scarf tied around his neck. And at that moment, he finally realized that it was getting really dangerous. And then several arrows hit the trees that grew on the sides where Lenly was standing. Finally, a stranger came out of the bushes. He had a mask on his face, and he began to search the corpses of the boys in disgust, looking for trophies. But he was indignant out loud that the two still managed to escape. He found a bag of magic crystals on Dashti's body, but there were very few of them. Suddenly, the bushes near the stranger stirred, and he broke away from his search and became alert. The silhouette of a strange man suddenly appeared in front of him. It was Dixie. He was fifteen years old, considered the most talented, hardy, and outstanding student at the Magic Academy. The boy was dressed in expensive armor decorated with gold. His staff was of unprecedented beauty. You attacked those who had just climbed the mountain range. How brave and shameless, Dixie said. The stranger shouted two more spells in a rage. Speed! Accuracy! That kind of trash doesn't need to know my name, Dixie shouted back at him. And in return, Dixie shouted the spell, Thunderstorm. The stranger thought in confusion. Is this magic intended not only to stop arrows, but also to attack? The spell struck the stranger's body with such force that he was thrown hundreds of meters into the forest. Dixie calmly looked at the result of his magic without even blinking an eye. He was absolutely confident in his strength and abilities. Linley and Bibi, who were standing on the sidelines, watched the battle with delight. Dixie asked if the archer chasing him was really Lin Lei. He took out a note from his pocket and read it again. It said that my classmate Lin Lei 
who will be at the Magic Beast Mountain Range at the same time as you if you meet him, be sure to help him. It was signed by Delia, who was Dixie's own sister. Dixie couldn't understand why his younger sister was so worried about this boy. He had never heard her make such a request, but he was surprised by her behavior. Delia's brother was looking into the thick of the forest and thinking that with such power, he was not worthy to be like me. But his decision was not so bad, knowing that he could not defeat me. He ran away. That was smart. I have to see what this dual element mage is going to do on the mountain range of magical beasts, Dixie thought. Lenly was making his way through the dense forest when he heard a rustling sound, and a pile of stones flew at him, hitting his body painfully. Earth scorpions, Lenly exclaimed, surprised. Huge earth scorpions appeared in front of them on the lawn. Dylan quickly caught up with him and explained that the earth scorpions were very weak, and that Lenly's appearance made them run away. They really scattered when they saw the boy, and Lenly noticed the corpse of a man. Magic Beast Mountain Range? What kind of a scary place is this? whispered the shocked boy. Dellen flew over and examined the body as well, and explained to him that the wound on the dead man's body was small, and it looked like he had been stabbed right through the heart. He was a strong warrior, a killer. This is the mountain range of magical beasts. Here you either kill beasts for a long time and a lot, or kill one person and earn a lot of easy money. What do you choose? she asked Lenly. But then she exploded and started shouting that Lenly was a big idiot after all. And that coolness was not his style. You finally need to realize that this is not a place where you can trust people. Even if a person looks friendly, they might be hiding something, the girl said. Lenly irritably told her not to worry, and he would finish his training. After all, he is Lin Le Baruch. On this ridge of magical beasts, the boy faced the brutal murder of his classmate. He finally realized that if he wanted to survive, he had to become stronger. Now he is more careful than ever. Lindley shouted the magic spell Wind of Detection loudly again, and suddenly it revealed a level three magical beast, a boar. This boar will be good practice for me, he thought, but then he was surprised to see that the boar was chasing someone. It was the silhouette of a girl, running away from him with all her might. Looking closely, he noticed that the girl was wearing a red headscarf, and her clothes were torn. Suddenly, the girl tripped over a stone and fell to the ground screaming in pain. Lenly rushed to her aid, but the boar had already caught up with her and was about to attack. With all his strength, the boy kicked the boar's body, but their strengths were unequal. But he still managed to knock the boar down and knock it over for a while, and then the boar found the strength to strike the boy back, but Lenly managed to dodge it. The girl quickly recovered from her fright and ran towards Lenly. The boy asked her if she was okay and how she felt. She hid behind his back and trembled all over. The wild boar stood up on its feet, its red eyes filled with rage, and it growled loudly. Lenly did not hesitate and shouted out the wind elemental spell, Glide. Grabbing the girl's hand, Lenly began to glide along the wind stream with her to fly away from the boar as far and high as possible. This beast is of the earth element, so I will pay him back with earth spells. The boy quickly came up with an idea, and Lenly shouted out the earth element spell Earthquake, and stones flew at the boar's body. The boar began to scream furiously throughout the forest. Then Lenly shouted the wind elemental support spell Tornado, and the boar was quickly spun around in the wind. The third spell that Lenly shouted was the Pursuit. At that moment, even Bibi the mouse rushed to his aid. Unable to withstand the force of all the spells, the boar's body fell to the ground with a thud and Baby began to kick it with all her might like a ball, bouncing all over its body. Not bad. Your opponent was a level three beast, Dellen summed up, having watched the whole fight the whole time. You're so strong, the stranger shouted and rushed to hug him. Lenly recoiled from her in fright, because he was not used to talking to girls. It was just a third level bore, he answered the girl proudly. The girl was completely delighted with him and explained that her partners had met this boar, but unfortunately it killed them all, and then Lenly appeared and defeated it quickly and easily. Only I survived, but I got lost in this forest, she explained. That's the reason, thought Lenly. But I can survive here alone, please let me, she continued, 
To come with you, the girl exclaimed loudly. Linley calmly replied that she could do as she pleased. Thank you, the girl cried out and threw her arms around him again. Dellen was watching this conversation from the sidelines. All the emotions were visible on her face. She was clicking her tongue and rolling her eyes. It was clear that she did not quite like the stranger. Hey, don't you think she's a bit suspicious? Why would a girl like that go to such a dangerous place? She asked the boy nervously. You're getting paranoid, Dellen. Lenly laughed. Even though this is a mountain range of magical beasts, not all people can be cold-blooded. Today I helped someone, and tomorrow someone will help me, he explained to Dellen. Dellen thought that he had swapped her for some stranger, but he was right. But for some reason she felt very bad about it. But in any case, be careful, boy, she said. Mmm, and Dellen does not like it? The boy noticed, looking at Dellen's unusual behavior. And then the strange girl offered to cook some food. She wanted to thank everyone and was very hungry. Everyone agreed, so Lenly made a fire and cut the boar into pieces of meat. And after a while, the fragrant meat was roasting, the aroma of which spread throughout the forest. I love roast pork, squeaked Beeb the mouse happily, for she was very hungry, for she had not eaten all this time. The stranger girl also ate the meat with great appetite. She was also very hungry. Are you hungry? Lenly asked her again. Yes, when my boys died protecting me, I ran for a long time and I didn't eat anything during that time, she answered. You are safe now. I will protect you, Lenly promised her. And then she noticed a small crystal in the piece of meat she was eating, and it began to glow. The boy looked at the crystal carefully and said that he thought it was a third-level crystal, so it probably wouldn't be very expensive and he should continue hunting animals. He went on to say that he had heard that there were no level seven or eight beasts in the outskirts of this forest, but he thought that was a complete lie. As long as they don't meet them, everything will be fine, Lenly reassured the frightened girl. How wonderful, she replied with delight, looking at the boy with joyful eyes. When night came, everyone went to bed. The girl sat down next to Lenly and hugged him. She was very cold. The boy thought she was really helpless, but he could not understand Dellen who thought she was suspicious. The night passed calmly and without incident, and finally dawn came. Everyone was still sleeping very soundly. But no one felt that terrible magical beasts were quietly creeping up on the sleeping Lenly. The girl woke up and opened her eyes, and for a moment she was numb from what she saw. Linlay wolves, wolves, she began to shout with all her might. The wolves surrounded her from all sides near the tree where she was sleeping, and suddenly, someone grabbed her clothes and pulled her up into the tree. It was Lenly, because he and Bibi had spotted the wolves earlier. Stay in this tree and don't come down, he told the girl. The boy began to say an earth elemental magic spell, and a glow instantly appeared in his hands. Then he shouted a fifth level spell, earth armor, and struck at the wolves, Bibi fearlessly following him. The power of a fifth level spell should have been enough to defeat these air wolves. How can you use a fifth-level spell when you are only a third level? Bebe asked him, surprised. Dylan flew over to them and said that Yale had just influenced the boy's strength. Did you notice that, Dylan? Lenly asked her in amazement. And Lenly remembered that once in the dormitory, Yale had explained that they all had limited powers, but there were stronger spells they could use, showing them a book with magic spells. But that can't be right, the whole class shouted at him. Doesn't work like a business if you can't do wholesale, then do small wholesale, Yale explained to everyone. He meant that you can simplify a high-level spell by turning it into a low-level spell. For example, if it is supposed to cover the whole body, you can make it cover only a part of it. If the spell had a large radius of damage, then now the radius will be smaller, Yale continued to explain. I managed to get the senior students' notebooks after I study them all, I will be able to use simplified magic. Each book will cost a hundred gold pieces, Yale announced. The class began to get indignant. Yale laughed and said that he would give Lin Lei a free book on the earth element because he was the face of their business. And thus Lin Lei was able to learn simplified spells of a higher level of magic. Although it was not a very high quality, it was still strong enough. Dellen listened to him carefully and said that Lenly's armor was supposed to look like a stone suit, but in fact, 
only a few parts of his body had stone protection, and thank God it was only airwolves and not someone stronger. I thought you were still angry and not talking to me, the boy replied to her. Snotty, Dellen shouted back at him. She jumped into the air and loudly announced to everyone that it was too early for them to relax. But the boy suddenly heard something unusual and said that something was affecting his wind. Was it the wind wolves again? After thinking about it, he came to the conclusion that these wind wolves could use the vortex through their claws, almost without standing on the ground. That's why they were not noticed by the surveillance. I'm not the same Lenly from Wushan Village anymore. Watch Delin. I'm going to teach these wind wolves a lesson. Babe the mouse started shouting that she could see a whole pack of wind wolves. And then Lenly shouted the spell Earthshaking and told everyone to run fast. A pack of terrifying wind wolves was coming towards them, each one several times bigger than an ordinary person. They were red in color, had terrible fangs, and were very aggressive. Wind blade! Lenly shouted a spell, channeling magic into the bodies of the wind wolves, and an incredible stream of magic immediately rose into the air, spinning everything around. Lenly also rose into the air and began to spin in a somersault, increasing his magical power. When confronting ordinary wind wolves, the best defense is to climb a tree. But if you are attacked by a flat blade of a wind wolf, then trees are cut like paper, he concluded. Dylan exclaimed in amazement that he could not dodge the wind wolf's blade with a slide, only if he was really going to die. You can try with your last strength. The boy instantly concentrated on his mind power and shouted the spell, Earth Armor, Full Power and his body was completely covered with a stone suit. This strong spell finally released its fierce power, and Lenly, wearing an unusual stone suit, flew high into the sky. Dylan shouted at the top of her voice to the boy that he was in mortal danger, and that he must have released all his spell power. She was amazed to see Lenly kick the wind wolf high into the sky with one kick. It was definitely a level five spell. At this time, Lenly decided to end the Wind Wolves before the spell lost its power. He was more interested in testing it and comparing the results, and the Wind Wolves did not have time to attack him. Suddenly, Bebe the mouse flew past him with a squeal and crashed loudly into the stones behind him, and Lenly was frightened to realize that she had accidentally fallen under the spell. And then the Wind Wolves began to run away in an unknown direction, howling and whining. Lenly could not understand why they were afraid. The air was pierced by the hysterical scream of a strange girl, and Lenly remembered with a start that she was still sitting in the tree where he had left her. Turning to her, he saw that she had climbed high up on a tree branch and was screaming for help with all her might, and all the wolves who had fled from him were gathered at the foot of the tree. They were growling and scratching, trying to get to her somehow. Lenly ran towards her, shouting to her not to be afraid. He knew that in a moment she would fall right into their laps, for the wolves had already begun to gnaw at the tree trunk and shake it with their strong paws. The girl was happy to see Lenly rushing to her rescue. The boy shouted at her to stay still. He was going to save her. Dellen watched in irritation and muttered that he was trying to save her even in danger, and she didn't like it. And the moment the boy approached the wolves, the worst thing happened. His stone armor began to crumble into small stones right in front of everyone, and the wolves certainly noticed it. Lenly only had time to think, why the hell did this happen at that moment? Dellen was terrified. Her heart sank inside her, and she thought that it was really dissipating, probably because of the damage caused by the wind blades. With half a meter to go, the wolves opened their mouths and prepared to tear Lenly to pieces. Lenly was screaming and flying straight at them, completely unprotected. Suddenly, the idea of using the gravity field spell which would make all the attackers feel like they were under tremendous pressure, flashed through his mind, and he quickly cast it. Dellen shouted to him that he had remembered and used the gravity field in time. It was a great job. And instantly, all the wind wolves around them fell to the ground and began to howl loudly, as if they were being pushed to the ground by something invisible. They couldn't even move. Lenly quickly got to his feet and thought that in another moment, he would probably be dead. At that moment, Dellen told him that using such spells in an emergency was the best method, but using the gravity field was very exhausting, 
and therefore Lenly could not hold on to the power of these spells for long. They had to be finished eventually. Lenly heard everything she said, and shouted that while they were on the ground he had to kill them quickly. Raising his hands in the middle of his body, he shouted a new powerful spell. Area attack! A pink glow appeared in his hands, and he concentrated all his strength and struck at the wolves lying down. A terrifying explosion of pink fire immediately followed. A moment later, when the smoke cleared, Delon and Lenly saw the bodies of the dead wind wolves all around them. Delon exclaimed to the boy, who was amazed by the battle, that this was a great job, and that Lenly was most likely an expert. She was very pleased with her student. The boy listened to her in silence. He was very exhausted. His face had cuts, his clothes were torn and dirty. All he wanted was to rest for a little while, just a minute. It was the first time in his life that he had fought so many magical beasts at once. But despite his fatigue, he was pleased with himself. And then he heard a familiar voice again. It was the still screaming stranger girl, who continued to hang on the tree with her last strength. Lenly finally calmly took her down from the damn tree. The girl happily began to admire him for being able to defeat so many treacherous wolves and save her. And then she added that he could get one magic crystal from each wolf's body, and he would finally become rich. But the boy had a modest nature, and he answered her hesitantly, saying that he was not that strong and that the battle had taken a lot of his strength. He was tired. With a sigh, Lenly bowed his head. His thoughts began to spin, and he felt that he was going to faint. Delon, frightened for her student, began to fly to his aid. Suddenly, a knife blade flashed in the air. Delon ran screaming to Lenly. Everything happened in a split second. The boy was staring at the glint of his metal like a fascinated man. And in that moment, the blade plunged straight into Lenly's chest. It was held by a strange girl, her eyes glittering with malice and predation. Her recent smile changed to a savage snarl, her face spattered with the boy's blood. She hissed to him that she would like to play with him longer, but her powers scared her, and all she could say to him was, I'm sorry. A fountain of red blood immediately spurted from Lenly's chest, and he began to faint. The little murderer burst out laughing. At that moment, the words that this girl had said, that she had lost all her partners and asked him to stay with them because she could not survive alone, ran through his mind. And Lenly, looking at her animal face and the bloody knife, whispered, Did she really kill her friends? The little animal replied that it was true and he had finally realized it, but he would not receive a prize for this guess. And she started laughing all over the clearing. The boy was lying on the ground with his eyes wide open, and Delon rushed over to him, trying to do something to save him. But at that moment, something incredible began to happen. Lenly's body glowed with a purple glow, and he began to rise from the ground into the air. The boy came to his senses a little and began to think that he was dying right now. He could not believe himself. The little murderer looked at him furiously, shouting at him what a bastard he was. She rushed towards him with a knife to finish him off, and then Baby the Mouse appeared in the air in front of her. Her eyes were glowing red, and the same purple glow shone around her body. The mouse screamed furiously and rushed at the girl. She could only think, why was it so small and so strong? Suddenly, the silhouette of a stranger appeared in the air. He deflected the mouse's attack, and it flew tumbling towards Lenly's body. The killer girl knew him. She screamed at him, Why the hell are you here to take my prey? It's all mine. And the stranger shouted at her that she was number 13 and now owed him. Delon could only exclaim with the impression that they were from the same group. Delon rushed to Lenly, who had fallen back to the ground in a heap of blood, and begged him to use his magic. She reminded him of the first time she had guided him in using magic, and promised to use her magic to stop his bleeding. Delon was crying out loud. Holding his head up, Delon tried to bring him back to consciousness, telling him that she would help him, but that he had to face his enemies on his own, and they were right in front of him. At this point, the killer girl promised number four thirty percent of the loot if he would just finish Lenly. Delon kept screaming and lifting the boy's body. Bibi, who had regained consciousness, also tried to bring him back to life. All hell broke loose in the clearing. And then a stranger pulled out a dagger, 
and ran up to Lenley and began to cut his shirt and skin off his chest. From the terrible pain, the boy instantly regained consciousness. Lenley grabbed his hand, which was holding the bloody dagger. The boy stood up with pain and shouted to Dellen that he was fine and not to worry about him. Dellen almost cried with happiness. Meanwhile, the little assassin saw Lenley's resurrection and shouted at number four to kill him as soon as possible. Number four, with a beastly face, provoked Lenley by shouting at him to show him a trick, then threatened him by saying that Lenley had no idea how many people like him he had killed on the Magic Beast mountain range. He used all the arguments he knew. Lenley looked at him silently, standing firmly on his feet. As he looked at the stranger, he thought that by all indications, he was a warrior and this meant that the fight would not be easy. Gathering the rest of his strength and enduring the pain of his wound, he concentrated and launched a gravity field spell at number four, and magic began to pour out of his hands in a pink glow. It completely knocked the bewildered stranger off his feet. He did not expect Lenly to have any strength left. His legs began to become soft and sink to the ground. The stranger did not understand what was happening. He felt an unaccountable weight all over his clumsy body, as if some invisible rock was pushing him down to the ground. At one point he broke down and fell, sprawled on the ground like a crushed spider. Number four stubbornly tried to get up. It was obvious that he was unfamiliar with this type of magic. He could not understand what was happening to his body and legs. The intense pressure made it difficult for him to breathe. He muttered that he did not understand why this spell was so strong. But he was still trying to get up, and using all his strength, he began to get to his feet. And then the stranger decided that he had to solve the situation with cunning. Looking at Lenly, he hissed that this magic was stupid, and even under its weight he would still be able to attack Lenly. But Lenly instantly noticed the plan, and rushed over to the enemy with Bibe, who was in a belligerent mood, to prevent him from using anything against them. They were preemptively defeated. They knew that he was not a novice magician who could be trifled with, but Lin Lei Baruch. The guy started attacking the stranger with all his might. These mysterious people were members of the same group, and it was because of them that Lin Lei almost died. But at the right moment, using earth element magic healing, Lin Lei and Baby counterattacked the stranger. The mouse bit into number four's arm like a furious beast, shouting Squirtle. It growled with glowing eyes and dug its teeth deeper and deeper. The stranger shouted in a voice that was not his own, and after a minute of struggling with the mouse, he jumped away from it, covered in blood. And everyone saw that Bibi the mouse was no longer so adorable, because she was holding the stranger's hand in her teeth. She shouted to Lenly that she had torn it off in one bite, so he should start praising her. Lenly replied with amazement that she had done a great job, thinking to himself, that the mouse had become a real beast. The stranger was lying on the ground nearby, going crazy with pain. The killer girl, shouting, Retreat! ran over to number four and began to pick him up to escape. She finally realized that the enemy was a very powerful magician. At the same time, she feared for her own life. She finally lifted him up and dragged him into the forest. Linley became dizzy and fell to the ground exhausted, completely unconscious, unresponsive to the sounds and events around him. He whispered to Dellen lying face down on the ground that because he believed a strange girl he almost died, maybe he really deserved to die. Dellen flew over to him and sat down. She stroked the boy's head and told him that having such a difficult experience was the best training, and he had dealt with it himself, and that it had made him much stronger. Lenly was lying down and couldn't even roll over onto his back. He tried to move but the pain pierced his entire body. The wound was deep and serious. Dellen looked at his agony and said that most healing spells use the water element. Earth magic can only compress the magic, and once its power is weakened, the pain will become three times as strong. Meanwhile, in the dormitory number 109 of the Magic Academy, Adelia was sitting on a mortar. The girl was upset about something. She was thinking of her older brother, who had gone to the Magical Beast Mountain Range a month earlier and had not been heard from since. She knew nothing about the tragedy that had happened there, but she was waiting for him. Next to her in the room were the other residents of the dormitory. Yale and the boys were discussing Lenly with each other. B 
because it was the first time they had not seen him for so long since they had met him. Everyone was overwhelmed by an inexplicable sadness. Yale was also in a bad mood. He told the boys that since he stole Lenly's sculptures and sold them at the Prue Gallery, the people from the gallery were always following him around, and it was really pissing him off. So he was also looking forward to his friend's return to continue his successful new business. But it was clear from the look on the guys' faces that they didn't share Yale's views that he had stolen other people's work. He snapped at them, saying that they didn't know anything about it, and that making money was also the job of a real magician. The boys began to convince him that Lenley had gone to the mountain ridge to make money because he didn't want to sell the sculpture. One of them shouted out to him that he knew Yale was being a bit of a jerk and didn't do it just to solve his friend's problems. The boy with the glasses was surprised that Yale had sold someone else's thing and still had the money, and Lenley didn't know anything about it. Yale snapped back that he was keeping the money for Lenley, and that was that. Delia listened to them with half an ear to the ground, thinking about Lenly and the fact that he was in a dangerous place, worried about him because she liked him. She remembered the request she had given to her brother and was sad again. Meanwhile, on the mountain ridge, a strange sound attracted Lenly's attention, and with the last of his strength he raised his head and saw that a magical boar had come to the river to drink. He and Baby the Mouse looked at each other in silence. With both of them concentrating their remaining magical powers, Lenly quietly set a wind element spell, and magic began to appear in his hands. Then he whispered, Earth thorns, and in an instant sharp spikes grew in front of the magical boar, and they dug into its hooves and all over its body, sharp as sharpened iron, painfully digging into its blood. With a frantic scream, the magic boar escaped from the trap and began to run away. Beeb the mouse screamed and asked Lenly to let her go so that she could deal with the intruder. But Lenly stopped her, explaining that it was his training and a test of his remaining strength and body. At some point Lenly felt relieved of the pain and jumped to his feet and shouted the wind element spell. He did an enchanting flip in the air and launched magic from his river. It caught up with the magical boar and hit the animal painfully. The boar reeled as if it had been cut alive. Its body floated in the air and spun in a flip. In an instant, Lenly flew up to the boar and stabbed it in the face with his dagger. And immediately everyone saw a colorful stone fall out of it. Babe the mouse began to squeal with delight. Lenly picked up the bag of stones that stranger number four had lost and began to count all the stones, which were now all his. Then the mouse started spitting out different stones, and the boy remembered that it had also defeated the assassin and now had its own collection of stones. And since the mouse was his, so were the stones. Looking at his furry friend, Lenly finally realized that Bebe's strength had increased after the fight with boy number four, and that's why her skills had become impressive, and she had even grown in size. Deline, who was nearby, explained to the boy that when he was seriously injured and unconscious, and his wound had not yet healed. Other assassins dressed in black came and attacked them, but the mouse managed to grow up and killed them easily. It was really amazing. Dubé was happily holding the bag with her own stones in her mouth, and Lenly bent down to her and said that now you can't say that Bibi is a simple animal, or you can get into big trouble. And he laughed out loud, and they all began to count Bibi's treasures and Lenly's wealth together. There were only seven magic crystals in the bag, six of the middle class and one of the highest class. Then they began to count the crystals that had been obtained from the bodies of the magical beasts and counted five six-level crystals, twenty-six fifth-level crystals, and seventy-one fourth-level crystals, a total of one hundred and two crystals. Everyone was overjoyed, but Bebe the Mouse was the most excited squealing the loudest. Suddenly something grabbed her tail and started pulling. It was Delon secretly holding it to calm it down. Immediately, the mouse started screaming to Lenly to save her, because an invisible force was pulling her tail. Deline laughed and told her that she had just become an improved mouse, but not to get too excited. Everyone around her started laughing too, but the mouse was too scared to hear her. 
so she threw herself on Lenly's shoulders and screamed that she must have been attacked by a ghost and needed to be rescued immediately. Lenly couldn't say anything to her because he couldn't stop laughing. When everyone had calmed down a bit, Dellen told the boy that he had collected a lot of magic crystals, and if they exchanged them for money, they would get about 30,000 gold coins, which should be enough for him. Then she looked at him carefully and asked him if he missed his classmates since he had left the academy almost a month ago. Lenly replied that he did, but he turned to the mountain range and continued that he had heard from the boys that it had a heart, and since he had come so far, he had to go to it and see what this mysterious place was. Lenly stood with the mouse on his shoulder and looked thoughtfully at the mountain range, which looked like a stone dragon from a distance. For some reason, it reminded him of the dragon Velo Chi, who had destroyed the village of Wushan. At this moment, Bebe the mouse had an incredible idea that she should probably train as well, because she wanted to fight high-level beasts, because the fifth and sixth levels were too easy for her. The boy looked at her in surprise silently, and then took off together in a leap. They were both flying, gliding effortlessly through the air, their wind magic synchronized and perfect. Lenly got to his feet in flight and began to glide through the air as if on skates, and only the rustling of his feet could be heard as if on ice. After a while, he and Bebe stopped at the bottom of a ridge. Not far from them stood a familiar man looking at them in surprise. Lenly could not believe his eyes. It was the same man who had been there before the fight with Dasht. Before he could even say anything, the man interrupted him and introduced himself. It was indeed Marte, dashed his partner. Bibe quietly asked Lenly if he was the same warrior who had run away. Delin, who was already there, said that running away in that situation was a wise decision and that this man here proved that he was quite resilient. Marty was very happy to see familiar faces and said that Lenly was indeed a high-level magician. But none of them noticed Marte's amazed look as he stared at the heavy bag of crystals that was tied to Lenly's belt. The man began to speak quickly, without attracting attention, saying that since they hadn't seen each other for so long and were still alive and well, they should celebrate. He waved his hand into the bushes and said that he had recently killed a wild boar, so Lenly should definitely check out his cooking skills. And he skillfully pulled out his dagger in front of everyone and began to cut the carcass, easily cutting off piece by piece. Bebe the mouse professionally remarked that his technique looked very advanced, and probably not worse than Lenly's. Marte made a fire, and after a while the clearing was filled with the delicious smell of roasting meat. He took the best piece of meat and offered it to Lenly. The boy's stomach turned with hunger, but he remembered that his little friend was hungry too, and gave it to Bebe. The mouse looked at the roasted boar leg with delight. It was incredibly hungry and at one point shoved the whole thing into its mouth, spitting out only the bone. Marte's jaw dropped at what he saw. He had never seen anything like it. Bebe noticed Marte's shocked look and asked him what was wrong. Had he never seen a mouse eat? Marte could not say a word. A minute later he turned to Lenly and asked him what his plan was and which way they were all going to go. Lenly calmly and confidently replied that he was the only one training on this mountain range and that was why they were leaving. For some reason, the boy did not want to continue his journey with his new friend. Marte, unable to contain his surprise and anger, began to shout at him that this was a mountain range of magical beasts, and it was very dangerous. Lenly watched him shouting in amazement. Marte, noticing this, continued a little calmer, saying that lately he couldn't even sleep well because he was so scared. But if Lenly was a magician, he would be his helper, and so the boy would feel safer. Beb the mouse looked at Marte with a suspicious look and thought that this guy was some kind of trash, because for some reason he thought he was too cool to accompany her boss. But to everyone's surprise, Lenly told Martha that he was happy to continue his journey with him. Bibi almost burst into tears at this point. She rushed to Lenly, shouting that she wasn't cool and good enough for him. At that moment, Delin's hand caught her unnoticed by the tail again. Marte was overjoyed at Lenly's words, jumping up and praising him, and what a good person he was and that he would finally be able to sleep at night. 
Doolin stood aside holding the mouse by the tail and listened to their conversation. She was not happy about it all, and thought, What is Lenly doing? Does one death of his classmate make him think that he is now responsible for Marte? But Lenly silently turned around and walked towards the mountain range, and everyone followed him, and again, no one noticed Marty's evil and cunning look at the boy's back. They had been walking for more than an hour, and then Marte shouted to Lenly, asking if he was thinking of going back. Bebe, the mouse sitting on the boy's shoulder, glared at him, jealously guarding her beloved boss, and Marte was making her very nervous. We've been here long enough, Marty continued to say to Lenly. The guy continued to walk silently. Marty's face was angry at this silence, and he thought that Lin Lei was always on the alert. He had no chance. Baby flashed him an unkind look again. She had been looking at him suspiciously the whole way. That damn mouse is always following me, Marte continued to think. Suddenly, Lenly stopped and said something was wrong with the wind element. Lenly shouted loudly that something was wrong somewhere over there, pointing his staff in an unknown direction. Mouse Babe took off and flew in that direction, and Lenly shouted after her to be careful because there might be an ambush. The boy did not feel at that moment that Marte had pulled out his dagger and a long metal chain behind him. The man looked at him angrily and thought that the boy had finally let down his defenses and let go of the shadow mouse. The gods were finally on his side, screaming, not to be blamed because there is only survivor and earnings on the mountain ridge. Marte rushed at Lenly attacking with dagger and chain. But Lenly seemed to be expecting this attack and turned his whole body towards Marte, grabbing the hilt of Marte's dagger with his hand. The boy shouted at him that the fox had finally given himself away. He punched the man in the face, twisting his dagger with his other hand. Marte lost his balance in surprise. For some reason, Lenly remembered his training at the Magic Academy, where he had learned to develop and control the power of the earth element and he remembered training with Delon on the mountain ridge, where they had developed his wind element. With full concentration, he engaged Marty in battle. Using his two powers of earth and wind, he began to attack the man, landing accurate blows to his face and body. Marty seemed to have no chance to respond to these attacks. His developed face began to bleed. He tried to avoid Lenly's accurate blows, but nothing but screams came out of him. Attacking him again and again, Lenly shouted at him. Why did he want to hurt him? For a moment, both men stopped, and Marte replied that didn't the young magician realize how many valuables he was carrying? But taking advantage of this pause, Marte shouted that he was good at close combat and launched an iron chain with a metal spiked ball at the end of it at the lance. Luckily, the cannonball flew a couple of centimeters away from Lenly's head, and he was able to duck in time. At this point, Marty got as close to the guy as possible and was about to attack again, believing that the advantage in this battle had gone to his side. But Lenly skillfully dodged his upcoming punch with the words, Let me show you a real fighting technique, and hit Marte in the face with all his might, knocking him down. The man was not expecting such a skillful attack. He thought that it was time to use an earth elemental spell, and shouted the spell, Earth Shaking and in an instant the ground under his feet shook as if an earthquake had broken out, and all the stones lying nearby were thrown into the air. Marte began to sway. He did not understand what was happening. The man exclaimed, What the hell is this magician's skill? He was really impressed and did not expect such a turn of events. Lindley lifted all the stones into the air, stood firmly on his feet and shouted, this is because he is Lin Le Baruch of the Dragon Blood Warrior family. His words echoed throughout the mountain range. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain range, a boy stood on a hill that looked quite peaceful. It was Dixie, the most famous and talented magician at the Magic Academy. He was standing there looking absolutely peaceful, as if he were meditating. Suddenly, Dixie turned round and shouted to someone, How long are you going to hide from me? Instantly, the mountains shook and stones began to fall, and unknown men in black cloaks began to fly up the hill. Dixie rolled his eyes and said, Idiot. Not a single muscle in his face moved in fear. One of them growled that Dixie knew this area was a haven for dark killers, but he had dared to come here anyway. So today was their lucky day. 
and they began to roar towards the boy. And then the unthinkable happened. Dixie began to cast a sixth-level lightning elemental spell. He shouted, Thunder rising, and everything went dark. Thunder roared, and lightning began to sparkle. The lightning struck all the black assassins, and they instantly fell to the ground. Dixie thought that he had managed to clear some of the obstacles and that this should help Lin Lei. All the assassins were lying motionless on the ground, and the air was electrifying over their bodies. Some of them barely managed to say that Dixie was a real bastard because only one spell had defeated them. Suddenly, the leader of the Dark Assassins began to rise from the crowd, kneeling down and asking Dixie menacingly, Is his mind power at the seventh level? Dixie calmly answered him that when he entered the Magic Academy, his mental power was already thirty-six times greater than that of an ordinary person. So if the assassin were to evaluate his abilities by such ordinary standards, he might suddenly become suicidal. The black leader hissed angrily at him that it was true that he had underestimated the boy. You made a big mistake when you didn't kill me right away, the black leader shouted, and suddenly rose into the air. It became clear to Dixie that his strength was many times greater than that of the other black warriors. And with a wild laugh and fire, he flew even higher into the air. Dixie was honestly amazed at his strength. Hanging in the flames, the black leader shouted that even if he died, he would take Dixie with him. Suddenly, the boy heard a frantic, unknown roar, and looking closely, he saw a huge, unknown monster that was also engulfed in fire. The boy was seriously frightened. The thought flashed through his mind that he had been too safe. He was surrounded by scary, giant, magical beasts on all sides, roaring at the top of their lungs. Dixie looked at them and thought that there were too many of them, and they were all above level five. He couldn't escape, but he could increase his energy level and prepare a big electric beam. Maybe that would scare them all, and they would run away. He concentrated and a huge electric ball appeared in his hands. He raised it as high as possible above him, so that all the magical animals around him could see it. And a miracle happened. The frightened animals began to run away quickly. Dixie thought with satisfaction that even the animals could correctly assess the situation. Their escape was the best decision for them, and now he could save his magic powers. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain range, Lenly stood in a clearing with the dead Marte and his chain lying at his feet. Lenly angrily told the corpse that if it hadn't been for his craving for money and the attack, they could both have come back alive. Dellen flew up to him and began to look at the dead Marty and said that in this place either you kill or they will kill you, Lenly, you are good. Ew Lenly answered her that he was very careful in Marte and did not attack him when there was no suitable chance, so I gave him this chance. And Dellen exclaimed that now she understood why Lenly had sent Bibi in front of the mouse. The boy continued in frustration, that before he came to the mountain ridge he did not know how cruel the human heart could be. He was very depressed. His thoughts were interrupted by Bebe's mouse flying past them and hitting a tree with all its might. Lenly and Delen were numb from what they saw. Suddenly everyone heard the trees crack and saw the fire start. After a moment of silence, everyone was amazed to see a huge fire dragon. It was the Velo Chi dragon. It had come from the direction where Dixie was. Velo Chi dragons were one of the high-level magic beasts. When Bebe the Mouse was trying to expose Marty's treacherous intentions by pretending to go on a scouting trip, she came across this Velo Chi dragon in the forest. Delen stared at the dragon in awe and managed to shout to Lenly that it was a seventh-level beast, and even though it had grown stronger, he still couldn't defeat it. But Lenly didn't hear her. He had a new plan in mind. At the other end of the mountain range, Dixie stood looking at the pile of dead black assassins. He said out loud that thank goodness it was only a bunch of Velo Chi dragons, he would have been very unlucky if a level 9 beast had appeared here, and he was happy to remember that the black assassins must have had very valuable items. He searched the bodies of the black assassins and found a whole bunch of magic crystals. Looking at them, he thought that the mountain range was a dubious place and it was abnormal and illogical for thieves to gather here. And he would probably have to find out the reason behind it. At that moment, a thought dawned on him. Hadn't all the magical beasts flown towards Lenly? 
Would he be able to escape from them in time? Meanwhile, Lenly recalled the events in Wushan Village, where the mysterious magician rode a similar dragon called Velo Ki. Those events and the destruction they caused left a great wound in Lin Lei's heart. He heard Deline's words and understood what she was saying. But he said to himself, although her words were true, he did not want to cowardly run away. He wanted to finally avenge his village of Wushan. Suddenly, Bibi's legs began to stretch out and turn into claws. She screamed out in a frightened voice for the first time to Lenly Boss. Lenly was amazed to hear her shout out, Can she really talk with her voice? At that moment, the mouse's tail also began to stretch. She screamed with fright as if she were being cut. The boy rushed to her and shouted, What's happening to her? Bebe began to grow in size, her ears stretched out like a rabbit's. Her legs and body grew before our eyes. There was nothing to remind him that he had once been a little ball of wool. Mao shouted to him that she could feel the power overwhelming her. She had become as big as Lenly, and she shouted the fire breath spell at the top of her lungs. Dylan watched and said that the mouse had evolved. They should have known this was possible even before they hired her. At that moment, Baby began to fearlessly attack the Velo Chi dragon. She flew high up into the sky to match its height and slammed her body into its head. Everyone heard this fierce, fearless attack. Surprised by the attack, the dragon saw who was attacking him and started to turn around to hit the mouse with its tail. Lenly just managed to shout to her to watch out for his tail. Bibi masterfully avoided the blow because she was still much smaller than him, and shouted to Lenly that she seemed to be faster than his tail. So she bit him desperately, tearing out a piece of his body, and the dragon began to chase her and try to catch it with his paws. Mouse shouted that the dragon's skin was hard and thick, and her attack barely scratched it. Lenly exclaimed to her that he had never thought Bibi was such a strong and fearless animal. But he knew that she could not cope with the dragon, who was already angry and he shouted that he would help her. Dylan tried to stop him, explaining that the dragon did not see him as a real rival, because there was a reason for that. She really knew a lot in this life, because this battle was only between animals, and she believed that Lenly could not take part in it. Baby continued to attack the dragon, and the dragon tried to catch her. Lenly was amazed to see that the dragon's entire body was bitten by the evolved Bebe, and blood was flowing through the broken scales of the dragon's skin. Bebe continued to chase and bite him persistently. Suddenly, Bebe didn't notice that the dragon managed to turn its tail and hit her with all its strength. She lost consciousness, and her body started to fall down. Lenly saw the mouse falling and ran over and caught her body in his arms. She was unconscious. He began to shake her to bring her to life, but she was lying still. Finally, Bibi opened her eyes and squeaked out that she was fine, but that she saw many small spinning stars around her. Lenly noticed that her body had started to shrink back to its normal size. Delon explained that she had reverted back to her previous state and that after the attack she was simply unable to fight anymore. Lenly's anger knew no bounds. He looked at the dragon furiously and realized that it was he who had done this to her pet, and he shouted that since Bebe had regained consciousness, he was not stupid enough to fight. Looking at him, Delon thought that Lenly was going to fight the Velo Ki dragon, but she didn't believe he could do it after Bebe's injury. But the boy didn't think so. He really went to fight the dragon. She looked at the boy and thought, what an amazing transformation. Baby the mouse was no ordinary beast. She hadn't seen Lenly happier since she came here. But she was wrong about the boy not being able to beat him. After the fight, Lenly and Bibi the mouse lay on the lawn and rested. She told him that the dragon's tail was very hard, it hurt a lot, and if it didn't shrink again, she would have crushed it all by herself. Lenly reassured her that the tail would have killed him for sure. Lenly cheerfully asked the mouse how she felt after fighting the seventh level beast. And does it still want to fight beasts of the eighth and ninth levels? She replied that he shouldn't laugh at her like that, because this time she had used her speed to fight, and if they had fought a higher level before, the dragon would not have been such a difficult opponent. Lenly reassured her that one day she would be the strongest. And then Lenly heard Delon calling out loudly to him, and she was flying towards him. He exploded and started shouting that he was here, unable to bear it. 
He took off into the sky and raced to meet her using his glide. They flew to a cliff. Dylan hovered above him. Lenly finally reached a small hill and behind it was a huge canyon. He stopped at the edge of it and looked at it with Bibi the mouse in amazement. Lindley asked Dellen what it was. She replied that she didn't know. But it was very interesting, because she could feel the wind blowing from there. The boy looked into the depths of the canyon and said that thank God the Veloci dragon hadn't followed him to this place. Otherwise, it would have been difficult to escape. Dellen interrupted him and shouted that it didn't matter. Look at the bottom of the canyon. By the way, she said businesslike. This reminded her of the time when Lenly was chased by a low-level beast and almost died when he fell off a cliff. Lenly told her irritably that he was too weak then. Beb the mouse was furious again. She hadn't seen Dellen in person, but only felt her presence. So she wondered why she heard someone talking to her beloved boss, but she didn't see anyone. She scolded Lin Lei that he had become so strong or met her. Dellen sharply told her to stop being so impudent. Bibe heard these words and was frightened and threw herself into Lenly's arms, screaming that this invisible person was bullying her again. Then Dellen lost her patience and shouted that since the mouse had become Lenly's contact animal, she would show her full form. And Dellen materialized, her body clearly visible. She loudly shouted that she was daring Cowart, Lenly's master, and poking the mouse in the face with her finger, she added that she had better remember that. Lenly laughed and Bebe sat there with square eyes from what she saw. She loudly said, Daring Kovskvirlart. For some reason she called her that. None of them paid attention to Bibi's emotions anymore, and Lenly thoughtfully said that there was definitely something in this canyon. Dellen replied that she couldn't go down to the bottom because the ring he was wearing prevented her from moving farther away. He decided to use the wind detector to try to see what was at the bottom of the hole. He concentrated and launched the magic of the detecting wind, closing his eyes and trying to see the unknown. But the signal he sent was swallowed up by the abyss. He felt nothing. Lenly loudly told Dellen that it seemed that this fog was blocking his magic detection, but with his powers, he could easily get through it. Dellen was going to fly with him. Dellen said to him that now he should definitely go down and see what was so interesting, and it was definitely there so let's go down and see. Lenly began to doubt that he might not be able to cope with this descent. It was not very easy. But Dellen had already tugged on his arm, and he was off kicking and screaming down the hill. They were both flying at breakneck speed and screaming as if they were being cut, their voices echoing off the canyon walls. The mouse was also screaming loudly. Suddenly, Lenly had the idea to use the element of wind and started shouting spells to stop his rapid fall. He thought that it would be dangerous for him, because he had never been good at these spells. But he had to do something, so he shouted out the hovering technique. A green magical glow appeared around him and his body began to pause and balance slightly. Dellen smiled and flew over to him, poking a finger into his shoulder and asking if it was really a spell. Lenly screamed for her to leave him alone, because he couldn't fully control his balance anyway. He was screaming like a little child and Dellen started laughing. He barely caught his balance and started to hover in the air, exhaling. He explained that he had never been good at this spell, so he was using a simplified version of it that Yale had taught him. All he could do now was fly up or down. Deline started to praise him for using a simplified version of the spell, but Lenly was doing great because he had learnt a lot of spells. She was even a little jealous of him. The boy shouted another spell, Soar! And he began to float in the air with confidence. Dellen was still trying to control him so that he wouldn't fall. The frightened mouse hung silently on his trousers. They all went down the canyon together. And Lenly was surprised to find that it was deep. And the deeper they went, the wider it got for some reason. He asked Dellen if she had ever been here before. She told him that she had never been here before. But she thought that this place was probably dangerous and that we should be on our guard. At that moment, Lenly heard a strange sound. It's some kind of animal, he whispered in amazement. Dylan also listened and said that this sound was not a low-level sound. Even Velo Key dragons are weak compared to this sound. She became alert and began to peer into the darkness. 
The guy who had come down and recalled what low-level and high-level beasts looked like also recalled the face of a Velo Chi dragon. Delon asked him to be quiet so as not to disturb the animals. Lenly told her that at his level, a collision with any beast would most likely be very dangerous. And then he noticed an unusual blue light coming from somewhere at the bottom of the canyon. Delon said it was because of this light that she wanted to come down here because she had seen it before. Suddenly, Lenly saw some grass flashing in front of his eyes, glowing with this blue light. He reached out to touch it in amazement. Everyone was staring at it in awe. Lenly joyfully exclaimed that it was the Blue Heart Herb. He remembered learning it in his medicine class at the academy, but he did not know what exactly it was and how this herb would change his fate in the future. Delin had never seen it before and asked Lenly what it was used for. He replied that he did not know. Delin thought about it, remembered something, and let it slip that as far as she knew it was a rare herb, something like a good ingredient for medicine. So she suggested that he pick more of it, just in case. Lenly plucked the first bush with its roots and began to examine it closely. He noticed that the herb was very cold and remembered that it was indeed described in a medical book. But he continued to pick it wherever he saw it, carefully putting it in a bag. Suddenly Bebe the mouse started sniffing, smelling a strange smell, and shouted to everyone to be careful of the beast. Animals have always had a much stronger sense of smell than humans. At that moment, Lenly reached behind another bush of grass and a huge snake's mouth opened in front of him. The damn bush was growing right in front of it. The snake began to crawl out quickly, and everyone realized that its head alone was three times bigger than Lenly's. It was aiming to swallow the boy whole. Lenly quickly thought of something and shouted the world sword spell. A huge magic sword appeared in his hand. The guy was already completely in the snake's mouth. He made the first stroke of the sword against the snake's teeth and realized that this would be the only effective method in this situation. Being completely in the snake's mouth, Lenly kept chopping and chopping with his sword, realizing that it was about to swallow him. The snake wriggled in pain and could not understand what was happening and why it could not close its mouth. But unfortunately, the cuts that the boy made with his sword did not do much damage to the snake. It was not enough to give it a chance to escape. He was too small an opponent. Lenly knew this, but he kept hacking because there was no other way out. And finally, after about ten minutes, he was able to get out of the snake's mouth and jump away. Bibi the mouse rushed to him, shouting with joy that she thought it was over and her boss was eaten. Delon happily exclaimed that it was a good and dangerous job, but the guy really scared her and it was good that he reacted so quickly. Then she explained that this snake was a level 7 beast, and on its hard scales, these cuts were just unfortunate scratches. This snake preys on magicians who come to collect medicinal herbs, but it is a little wounded right now, so it will first assess Lenly's capabilities before attacking, so it is best to stay away. Lenly listened carefully to the girl. Suddenly, everyone heard a loud hiss. They turned around and saw up to a dozen of the same snakes, which had already spotted their prey and were crawling towards them. Delen shouted to the boy to run as fast as he could. Otherwise, it would be too late, because the snakes had already spotted him. And Lenly began to fly as fast as he could down the canyon. But the snakes were fast, too, and they chased him and almost caught up with him. Lenly shouted a wind elemental spell to increase his strength to the maximum. Lenly ran as fast as he could. The spell really made him run faster. But the snakes were unfortunately not far behind. And then he saw some giant black birds circling over his head. He recognized them. They were dragon hawks, dragon beasts, his teacher had once mentioned them. They were the weakest of the dragon species, but stronger than ordinary beasts. Delon, who was flying behind him, shouted that they were just like dragon beasts and moved in groups, so even a seventh-level warrior would not have an advantage in front. The dragon hawks were flying towards Lenly. Their appearance was terrifying. They had the body of a dragon and the head of a huge hawk. They flew past Lenly without touching him, and then flew towards the snakes. A couple of seconds later, Lenly, Bibe, and Delon, along with the mouse, flew out of the canyon screaming. They landed on their feet on a nearby meadow and finally caught their breath. Delon noted that they had made a good escape from both the snakes and the dragon hawks. Lenly replied that he was very tired, but they had found the blue heart herb 
and it was just cool. In a flash, a dragonhawk flew out from behind him. Baby the mouse shouted that they had caught up with them after all. Lindley turned back to the monster and thought that the wind element magic was not fast enough. And he started to launch a new magic. Delon screamed. What was he going to do? The guy shouted the spell Yellow Earth Giant loudly, and there was a huge roar. The ground started to move. A huge yellow earth giant, ten times bigger than Lenly, rose out of the ground. It began to roar towards the dragon hawk. The dragon hawk rushed straight at him and rammed his beak into the monster. Lenly shouted the next spell, blocking grip. Delon shouted that this monster would not last long and B.B. the mouse shouted that she would not stand aside. Only Lenly knew that he only had one shot. Beeb the mouse and Lenly looked at each other and, concentrating in unison, rushed straight for the dragon hawk's spine. After all, the mouse was a level five beast, and Lenly was a level five dual elemental mage and a level four warrior. They had the perfect tandem, and it should work. Flying up to the dragon hawk, they hit it with all their might and the dragon hawk roared in pain, making everyone's ears ring. With a single blow, B.B. and Lenly managed to cut the dragon hawk's backbone in half, and it fell to the ground with a thud. The boy and the mouse shouted in unison with joy. They had done something incredible, defeating such a monster. Beb the mouse looked into Lenly's eyes and said with a smile that the monster was dead. Lenly told her that it was a good job. They laughed again. Delon looked at the battle and its outcome with delight and said, One man and one beast, not a bad match. She was incredibly pleased with her apprentice and her contract beast. Lindley looked at the girl tiredly and told her not to laugh at him. And now that the danger was over, he wanted to rest for a while. He didn't think there would be so many high-level monsters in the canyon. It took too much strength for such a small boy. Meanwhile, Bebe the mouse was jumping and screaming with joy and after about five minutes she returned to her previous form, becoming a small and fluffy mouse. But it was today that she realized that she really liked wrestling. She wanted to do it again and again. Meanwhile, Delon told Lenly that until he became a seventh-level mage, he would be able to make jade earth armor and would no longer be afraid of the monsters. She knew how to give advice in time when it was already over. To which Lenly replied that this option would be true for being here on the mountain range, but for his family. For his family, he continued, he needed to get at least level eight or nine. He looked up at the girl and asked if he could achieve that. She remained silent. Delin was also silent. The boy thought that there were not many eighth-level mages in Yulan, and his family had only five fourth-level mages. Finally... Delon told him that after what she had seen on this trip, she thought Lenly would do well, and smiled. She knew what a capable and brave boy he was, and she was proud of him again. She looked at him and continued to think that Lenly had come to this mountain range as a third level. After all the fighting, he was now a fifth level, so he would be able to use spells more skillfully than other fifth-level mages, and he had found the blue heart herb and had accumulated many magic crystals. It wasn't so bad, she thought as she looked at her student. So, throughout his journey on the Magic Beast mountain range, Lenly had met many Magic Beasts of different levels, namely a level 3 wild boar that was found outside the ring zone of the mountain range, a level 4 wind wolf which usually lives near the ring zone and is not very active at night, a level 7 green tattooed python, which is a high-level beast that lives in the depths of the canyon and a level six dragon hawk that can move in groups and is good at attacking from the air. On his way back, Lenly met many magical stars, but they were weaker and weaker. When he flew with everyone else to the outer ring zone, the beasts he encountered on his way were not a threat at all. They were all flying quickly through the mountainous abundance. Stopping on one of the hills, he looked down and saw that four strangers were fighting a huge boar, and the battle was not entirely victorious. Lenly and his mouse baby quietly climbed up to the top of the tree, something telling him that he should keep a close eye on this particular fight. He looked closely at the boar and wondered if it was the same bloodthirsty boar he had seen before. But there were four strangers, so it shouldn't have been a problem to defeat it. Indeed, it was a bloodthirsty boar of the fifth level, which aggressively attacked all four warriors. 
One of Callan's warriors recognized Lenly. Another red-haired warrior named Tony shouted at him that how could a fifth-level monster live in the outer ring zone, where there could be fourth- and third-level beasts? Kalan, a tall, statuesque warrior in metal armor, snapped at Tony, saying that he didn't know, and that he should concentrate on the fight and stop whining. He attacked the boar again. The third warrior was a blonde girl named Alice, who wore a beautiful pink girl's dress and a pink hat with a wide brim. Kalan shouted to her to hurry up and get in. The wind blew and her hat came off revealing her unusually pretty face, big blue eyes, and blonde long curls. She shouted out to Kaelin that it wouldn't work. Lenly continued to look at the warriors from the hill in amazement, realizing that the fight could end badly, and the boar would tear the beauty apart. Lenly decided to help and shouted an earth elemental magic spell. Earth spikes, the boy added, and immediately huge thorns grew between the girl and the boar, which also grew under its belly. Alice fell back in surprise and looked at this trash with wide eyes. The boar howled in pain as the spikes mercilessly dug into his body. Lindley did not stop. The next spell he cast was flat blade and a familiar blade materialized out of thin air. Meanwhile, the boar fell dead from its injuries, and Lindley deftly jumped on its head and began to cut with the flat blade. The warriors stared at the scene in surprise. Lindley skillfully wielded the blade cutting piece by piece from the boar's body. He was stubbornly looking for the magic crystal. But he could not find it. But he knew for sure that it was somewhere and that Lenly would not go anywhere without it, even if he had to chop the boar into small pieces. And finally, he found it. The crystal of the bloodthirsty boar. It was quite large and orange in color. Lenly was happy because he was beginning to think that the boar was defective. He proudly put it in the bag on his belt. He was very pleased with the result of his work. He looked up and saw all the warriors standing there, staring at him in silence. It was obvious that they were really deeply impressed. None of them could say a word. Lindley turned without a word and walked cheerfully back to his men. Suddenly Kalin came to his senses and shouted at him to stop for a second. The boy stopped and turned around, and Kalin ran up to him and introduced himself explaining that if it wasn't for Lenly's help, Alice would have died, and thanked him sincerely. Alice was still sitting on the ground, shocked. It seemed that she had become even more beautiful. In a moment she also came to her senses and stood up. She looked even more beautiful than before the fight. She also began to thank Lenly sincerely for her rescue, and introduced herself. Her name was Alice Staff, an earth elemental mage. Lenly looked at her silently and listened. He calmly explained to everyone that he was just passing by and noticed their fight and decided to help. Just then, Delen flew up and jealously told him that she now understood why he had saved them and looked angrily at Alice. She really disliked all the girls who were close to her pet. Alice, who could not see her, thought the boy was strange because he was talking to someone. Galan continued to say that he couldn't believe that on their first day on the mountain range they had encountered a level 5 beast. It was just bad luck. He hadn't thought that the off-peak area of the mountain range would be so dangerous. All three of them were really surprised by this. Lindley explained to them in a business-like manner that the dangers of the mountain abundance zone were not only from magical high-level beasts, but also from bandits. The warriors were terrified and each of them thought to themselves how lucky they were not to have met them. Kaelin explained to the boy that they had decided to come here on their own, but it must have been very thoughtful. He asked Len Lee to help him get out of the ridge because he doubted the safety of going out on his own, and all three of them took turns asking Len Lee to get them out of there. They were really scared of the recent events. Len Lee exhaled and promised to help them. For some reason... Delin and Bibe the mouse were not happy about this. They definitely did not like warriors. The mouse jumped up to Lenly and whispered angrily in his ear, How could he? Delin mumbled that it wouldn't be that difficult. The warriors thanked Lenly and turned back to the road leading home. Now there was a whole troop of them. They were all happily returning home and rejoicing that everyone was safe and sound. As Lenly walked along, he thought that perhaps because of his strong aura, the low-level beasts would not attack them. Their journey to the Magic Star Mountain range was over. 
After a while, they all reached the capital of the Feng Lai Kingdom, a city also called Feng Lai. When they reached the luxurious mansion of the Kalan family, they saw a gray-haired man greeting them, and he exclaimed joyfully that it was good that everyone had returned safely. It was Kalin's father. His son rushed to him and explained that they had met the wizard Lenly on their way, and that it was only because of him that they were safe and sound. The father was also amazed by this story. Lenly listened to their conversation calmly, and Alice quietly approached him and explained that Kalan came from a family famous for its warriors. But Lenly did not need them, he told her so. Gillan's father called a servant and took a bag from his hands and addressed Lenly, asking him to accept one hundred gold coins as a token of gratitude for saving his son and his friends. The boy silently took the pouch of money, turned around and left. Everyone looked at him in surprise. Kalan called after him, but Lenly did not even turn round. Kalan and his father entered the palace of their family, whose nickname was Debs. His father menacingly ordered him to kneel down. Putting his sword on his son's shoulders, he said that Kalan was now almost grown up and almost the leader of the Debs family. But did he not know that? The mountainous abundance of magical beasts was a dangerous place. He continued that he had made a big mistake. If he acted without thinking, he would destroy the whole family in the future, after he took over the leadership of the family. The boy was really upset by his actions. Finally, the story returns to the Magic Academy, where all of Lenly's friends from Dormitory 109 were standing around. They stood there talking about everything, and suddenly one of them saw a familiar silhouette and shouted, Lin Lei, what are you doing? The silhouette came closer and everyone saw a smiling boy with a mouse on his shoulder. Linley shouted happily that it was really him, and he had finally returned. The boys were overjoyed and rushed over to Lenley, shouting with joy that he was finally back alive. They hugged him and jumped on his back. Everyone loved Lenley and really missed him. Yale started shouting that they needed to celebrate right away. Lenley laughed and offered to pay for everything. The boys loudly supported this idea. Some of them were surprised to hear that Lenley was going to buy everyone a meal. They couldn't understand how he had the money. Lenley cheerfully told them that he had received many things from the mountain range of abundance, and the boys began to shout with delight that there was going to be a party. Because even in his absence, he was earning money here at the academy. Yale proudly announced to him that he had sold all his sculptures for a great price, and now the Prules Gallery had sent him an invitation letter. This was a high honor for him. Lenley was overwhelmed and could not say a word. He asked if it was really an invitation from the gallery. Maybe Yale was confused, but he laughed and promised to give it to him later. And after a while, a real student party began in Dormitory 109, in honor of the return of the famous Lenley, with the party shouted from every window of the dormitory. In the middle of the dormitory, gorgeous tables were set up, and there was a lot of food. Fruits, vegetables, lots of meat and drinks. Everything was chic and adult. And then, when everyone was full and drunk, they decided it was time for fireworks in honor of their friend. And they decided to use fire magic to create a firework effect. It was a really magical party. After some time of partying, when everyone had gone to bed, Yale sat with Lenley on the balcony. Eve proudly handed him an invitation to the Prule Gallery. Lenley snatched it up and asked him again if it was really an invitation to the Prule Gallery. He couldn't believe his eyes and thought Yale was joking. Yale went on to explain in detail that the Prule Gallery had recognized Yale's sculpture-making skills. The invitation asked him to present his work in the gallery's exhibition hall. Since the people from the Prule Gallery came to the Academy, the news of his invitation spread to all corners. Lenley was now more famous than ever. It can't be true, whispered Lenley. He could not believe his ears. Now it's time for bed, good night, said Yale, and immediately fell to the floor and snored loudly. Lenley turned to Dellen and asked her if she was ever scared of the world. It's dangerous on the mountain range, but in Feng Lai, the levels are used to differentiate between each other, and life here is more difficult than on the mountain range. The society is a strange version of the mountain range. Dellen could not understand what he was talking about. 
She asked if he was afraid of the competition. Lenly calmly told her that he was not afraid of them because if you don't try hard, you will be excluded. The next day, when everyone was finally getting up, Lenly and Yale went to the Prue Gallery. They were greeted with joy. The experts praised Lenly and said that he was a super talent for them. Yale stopped this flow of affection and told a man named Austin to stop wasting his time. Austin laughed and turned to Lenly and handed him a card and explained that it was a magic crystal card that was produced especially for them by the gold banks of the Four Kingdoms handing it over. He explained that it now meant that Lenly was an expert in sculpture. Lenly looked at the map with interest. Austin went on to say that he would need to use Lenly's fingerprint to identify him, and then he could use it. The boy asked if he was really an expert on sculptures now. Everyone around him laughed out loud. Yale told him that he was going back to the Magic Academy. Would Lenly also go with him? The boy refused. At that moment, he decided to go home to Woshan Village. He flew up into the sky and set off with Baby the Mouse using wind magic. As Lenly was flying, he suddenly asked the mouse if he was happy to be back in Wushan village. And why was he then in the ruins of their ancestral hall? The mouse answered him that she could only remember a voice telling her to go there. She could only eat stones from birth, but Lenly gave her a chicken leg of all people in this world. He was the only one who was so kind to her. An hour later, they were both standing on the doorstep of Lenly's house. The boy called out loudly to his father, but the house was unusually quiet and they both went from room to room to look for Nog. They went from room to room, calling out loudly for Nog. Suddenly, a familiar voice called Lenly's name. It was Captain Hillman. Lenly happily asked him where his father had gone. Hillman broke out in a cold sweat and thought that he could not tell the little boy why his father had left Wushan, so he replied that his father had gone to work. Lenly happily exclaimed to him that now he could earn money himself and to tell Hillman to tell his father that he didn't have to work anymore. Suddenly, someone started banging loudly on the door of the house, and all three of them rushed to open it. When they opened the door, they were all surprised to see Nog, who was bloody and barely standing up and falling to his knees, coughing. The boys rushed to him, screaming. Nog's body was covered in wounds. Hillman did not understand what had happened or why he had returned. They dragged Nog into the house and sat him on a chair. He was completely unconscious. Blood was running down his arms and staining all his clothes. Lenly rushed to bring him to life, constantly calling out to him. Hillman's hands were shaking. Nog finally regained consciousness and said, Lenly, listen to me carefully. It was obvious how hard he was struggling to say every word. Everyone froze. The father continued his story with difficulty, saying that he had left Wushan village to finally find out who the real killers of his mother and wife Lena were. Lenly's eyes grew bigger and bigger. At that moment, Lenly vaguely recalled the image of his mother in the portrait. His father continued that this time he had learnt something. She really had been murdered. Nog finally admitted that he had lied to his son, saying that his mother had died in childbirth. Now I know for sure that the killer has a spider mark on his arm, and he is our enemy. Nog exhaled with his last breath. Tears stood in Lenly's eyes, and he repeated the words, The enemy who killed his mother. He didn't remember his mother. He had only seen her portrait all his life and listened to his father's stories about her, but he loved her with all his heart and missed her incredibly. Hillman regained consciousness and asked Nog if he had finally found him, and why was he covered in wounds. Nog laughed softly at his words. Hillman exploded that what he had found out was no laughing matter. If he went too far, he could definitely die. Nog quietly replied that he had not been afraid of death for a long time. Lenly felt dizzy. He turned round and ran for the exit of the house, eager for revenge. All his life he had believed that his poor mother was dead, but now the thought of her murder was tearing him apart. Nog, who had seen his son, quickly ordered Captain Hillman to keep an eye on Lenly. His heart felt something was wrong. But your wounds, Nog, Hillman exclaimed, rushing to him. They don't matter because all that matters now is the lives of my children, Horton and Lenly, Nog exclaimed fiercely. And he asked Hillman again, not to let his son get bogged down in the thirst for revenge for him. Lenly is not strong enough to defeat the enemy, but his main goal is to find the ancient relic of the Dragonblood family, the Killer Blade. 
The whereabouts of the blade are currently unknown. They couldn't even protect it. He really hoped that Lenly would be able to find and return the blade. Hillman had promised him that he would. Nog sat in the chair covered in blood. The floor beside him was also covered in blood. He whispered that as long as he was alive, Hillman had to tell Lenly. There are still some things that need to be explored, and he needs to dig deeper. In the meantime, Lenly was flying as fast as he could, with only anger and revenge for his mother's murder in his mind. He didn't notice a large stone in his path and stumbled into the water of a nearby lake. The cold water immediately brought him to his senses, and the boy came up to think why this had happened. He did not want to see his father like this. Dylan, who had barely caught up with him, calmed him down, saying, Doesn't he know what to do in this situation? You need to become stronger and understand your enemy. Right now, you probably won't be able to defeat a sixth-level warrior. How are you going to take revenge? Dellen asked him. The boy silently plunged into the water, saying that he understood everything. Suddenly, he heard familiar voices calling out to him from the shore. When Lenly emerged from the water, he saw familiar faces. They were the boys from Wushan village with whom he had grown up since childhood. Carter, Garen, and the others were all calling out to him. Some of them asked if he remembered them. Lenly climbed out of the water to his friends, and they all rushed to hug him. And a million questions came pouring in. Had he seen more dragons than Veloki? Will he be able to defeat them now? How is his training at the academy going? Lenly was a real star in his village where everyone sincerely loved him and rejoiced at his success. The boy laughed, hugged, and was silent. Then he silently stepped away from the crowd and cast a spell of earth magic, and immediately the earth was enveloped in a green glow. The crowd was quiet and frozen, and then he began to wrestle with the boy in the tiger's skin, whom he had laid on his shoulders. The crowd roared with delight. Captain Hillman, who had come over, saw the fight and was shocked. He then shouted at the children and ordered them to give Lenly time to rest and to return to their daily training. He rushed over to the boy thinking he was a bit out of it, but Lenly assured him that he was fine. Lenly looked at Captain Hillman's frightened face and reassured him that he was calm and perfectly fine. Hillman looked at him in awe and said that the boy had really grown up and become much more mature. Then he mentioned Nog's request and continued that now that Lenly knew about the Baruch family's problems, his father had asked him to tell him that he really hoped Lenly would be able to find the Baruch family relic. Lenly repeated the word killer blade in surprise and tried to imagine what it might look like. Hillman began to explain that the killer blade had been passed down from generation to generation in the Baruch family for 500 years. It represents the pride of the family, and with it, the abilities of the dragon blood become much better. Lenly listened to him carefully and promised to help his father and find him, and asked Hillman to keep an eye on Nog as he intended to return to the academy. Lenly turned and took to the air, a plan already in his head. Meanwhile, at the Wellen Academy, which was located in Fung Lai Village and was not as cool as the Magic Academy, but it was also famous. The beautiful Alice was sitting in her room, reading her cards. Lenly was very much in her heart, and for some reason she had a feeling of anxiety for him. She laid the cards out again and again, but they always came up with terrible bad luck waiting for Lenly. Throwing the deck of cards on the floor, Alice stared at one point in despair. She was upset. She turned her gaze to the cards and kept thinking, why did this person keep coming up, and what could he be hiding? It was the first time she had ever understood anything about cards. Suddenly a voice came from behind her. It was Kaylin, and he asked if she was thinking about that guy Lenly again. The girl jumped in surprise. Turning around, she took a breath and told him that she was just thinking about Lenly, who had saved her, and that she hadn't thanked him properly for saving her. Kaylin looked at her suspiciously, and it was clear that he did not like what she was thinking. He abruptly came over and took Alice by the shoulders and told her that according to the schedule, her and Lenly's holidays would be at different times, so the chance of their meeting was very small, and he demanded that Alice pay more attention to him, because he would become stronger than Lenly. It was obvious that he was very annoyed. Alice asked him boldly, who was he to try to control her? She didn't like Callan's behavior. Meanwhile, 
Lenly continued his journey to the Magic Academy. When he looked up, he saw a signpost and thought that he must have arrived, but it said that it was Feng Lai. But for some reason, his thoughts were filled with the image of a beautiful girl, Alice, and her face kept popping up in his memory. He couldn't understand why he kept thinking of her when he was supposed to be looking for the killer's blade. Suddenly he remembered that Alice had said that her home was near the gates of Feng Lai, and he decided that since he was here, he might as well check it out. Lenly looked carefully towards the city gates in search of a house and saw that there was indeed one. He approached the door and knocked. The door opened and a man came out. Lenly asked if Alice lived here, and the man replied that she did, but that she had gone to study at the academy. Lenly turned and left a little disappointed. Bebe the mouse kept asking him why he was upset and why he was silent and ignoring her. But Lenly remained silent. Suddenly he heard a familiar voice behind him, and everything turned inside him. It was the silhouette of a girl, running towards him and calling out. It was Alice, and it seemed that she had become even more beautiful since they hadn't seen each other. The girl could not hide how happy she was to see Lenly. She couldn't believe her eyes that it was really Lenly, and asked him if it was true that he was looking for her. Lenly was also shocked to see her again, and replied that there was no school today at Wellen Academy. Alice honestly told him that she was skipping classes because she was always thinking about meeting him. Who knew that she would actually see him? It was such a stroke of luck. And she laughed. Lenly stood there, staring at her. Thinking how beautiful and sweet she was, what could he say? He began to stammer and mumble that he had something important to say to her. Something like, but then Alice interrupted him and asked if he believed in fate. The dumbfounded Lenly blurted out that God had prepared this meeting for them. This behavior was atypical for him. Alice laughed loudly and resonantly and took him by the hand and pulled him somewhere. She wanted to show him something. As they flew away, she asked Lenly if he knew that this was the place where the magic of the earth element was superimposed, which can create space and she pointed at the ground with her finger. This means that he can create his own space by drawing a circle of symbols on the ground. And if there are two identical symbols, only two people can enter it. I think it's a vow ring, Lenly muttered. That's right, let's draw it, suggested Alice cheerfully. Our magic symbol? Lenly asked her again. He was very surprised to see her and to hear her suggestion. She went on to explain that when two people create a vow ring, they must both have a high level of synchronicity with each other to complete what they have started. The higher the level, the harder it would be to break the spell. And they began to draw symbols on the ground. When they finished drawing, Alice loudly exclaimed that this was now Alice and Lenly's territory, and their bodies were enveloped in a ring of magic that turned into a dome. We are completely synchronized, Aaliyah shouted joyfully. Lenly could not say a word. They held hands and watched this miraculous performance in silence. Kalan was watching from a distance, shocked by what he saw, and whispered that he would not let this go. He was really angry. Lenly and Alice said goodbye, and the boy returned to the Magic Academy. The first day of his studies began. Outside, the air elemental teacher began training. All the students in the new school year moved to the next class where they studied magic from the third to the fifth level. The teacher announced that everyone should try to fly above the ground using their mental power of the air element and a magic symbol. First of all, they had to purify their hearts, and if they learned this once, they would be able to follow the wind. All the students began to puff and try to rise into the air. The teacher's attention was drawn to Lenly, who skillfully hung in the air and took out a book and began to read with Bibi, the mouse. The teacher looked at him in amazement and thought that this Lenly, his technique of using hovering was close to the sixth level, and maybe even higher. He was extremely surprised. Meanwhile, Lenly was carefully reading the encyclopedia of plants that he had borrowed from the library of the academy. He read that he could use the blue heart herb to become a dragon blood warrior. He thought that it was no wonder that it was very rare, and that the herb he had collected would not be good enough. The boy thought about it. Delon, who was watching him, said that of course if he wanted to become a dragon blood warrior, 
he would need at least seven bundles. Lenly listened to her and replied that this meant that it was time for him to go back to the mountains. Suddenly, Delia flew up to the boy and said that Lenly was very good at hovering. Lenly was a little frightened by her unexpected appearance and asked Delia, What did she say? And the girl replied that she was very eager to know what had happened in the mountains. Lenly began to tell her in a gloomy tone. Lenly told her everything he had encountered in the mountains, about all the animals and the fights he had had with them, and how he had met Alice and her friends. The girl listened attentively, without interrupting him. The boy closed his book and finished his story. But Delia's face showed that something was wrong. He asked her again what was wrong. She looked at him with her beautiful eyes and replied that she was trying to imagine what this Alice looked like. Delia was upset about something. Lenly quickly recalled the image of the beautiful Alice and promised Delia that he would introduce her to her next time, saying that he thought she was very nice. At that moment, the magic of floating disappeared and they fell painfully to the ground. Bib and Delen watched them from afar. The mouse rolled her eyes and said that she thought her boss had been behaving very strangely lately and that this girl was a bit strange too. Delen smiled mysteriously and told her that she was experiencing a complicated love triangle and really hoped that it wouldn't affect Lenly's training. She didn't like this at all and it wasn't part of the plan. Linley stood in his dorm room and put on his armor. His second trip to the Magic Beast mountain range was about to begin. Mouse was also going to fight with a businesslike appearance. The boys in Yale wished him good luck and promised to keep an eye out for information about the whereabouts of the killer's blade. Lenly thanked them sincerely, and Beeb the Mouse stuffed the chicken legs one by one, thinking that he should have taken more. As the journey began, Lenly flew and remembered Delon's words telling him that his mental power had already reached the seventh level of magic, but his magical power was still at the sixth level. He also remembered that the beasts from the canyon were in packs, and although the chance of victory was not great, it was still greater than the last time. So who is a knight of dragon blood? There are two ways to use dragon blood to become a dragon blood warrior. The first is to determine the amount of dragon blood in one's body, and the second is to drink the blood of a living dragon to activate the knight's blood. The blood of a living dragon is very strong. Even getting it on the skin of the body can be harmful, not to mention drinking it. But there is a solution to this problem, and it was the blue heart herb. It had to be mixed with the dragon's blood. But one bush was not enough. The more blood you needed to drink, the more herb you needed. The test showed that Lenly's dragon blood was not enough to become a dragon blood warrior, so he needed the blue heart herb to train and become a dragon blood knight. Lenly was determined before his journey that he would try something to become a full fledged dragon blood knight. After a short period of time, they all landed on a mountainous abundance of magical beasts near the familiar Misty Canyon where he had found the grass last time. Dylan summarized that usually people don't return to the Misty Canyon a second time, but her Lenly had come back for another adventure. Lenly blurted out that he would do it for his family and jumped into the canyon. While Lenly was flying, he decided to prepare himself some improved armor and cast the seventh level spell, Earth Armor, of Jade Level. And the spirit of the boy's elemental aura began to take the form of a drop of water which meant that Lenly was beginning to become a seventh-level mage. Dylan watched him and said that his armor looked much better this time, not like the last time when it was just a pile of stones. Suddenly, Baby the Mouse spotted the flock of dragonhawks from the last time. But on this journey, the dragonhawks could not do anything to Lenly. His jade armor completely protected him from the birds. The mouse flew happily on Lenly's shoulder and demanded to have the same armor, because he saw how useful it was. The boy laughed at the little warrior. After flying for a while, they both noticed the blue heart grass growing ahead. Baby the mouse took a closer look and said that the grass was growing in a clearing, right next to where a dragon was sleeping. Dylan flew over and advised him not to use his magic for the time being, because if he fought a level 8 beast, his jade armor would not help, but rather disturb the beast. Suddenly, Bibi exclaimed that she was taking over. Lenly could not understand what she was talking about, 
The mouse magically transformed into a beast mouse and crawled on the dragon's belly to collect the magic blue heart herb. She did this as quietly as possible, and the dragon continued to sleep. Suddenly a twig cracked under her paws and the dragon woke up. Baby cuddled into the grass with a whole pile of grass in her paws. Delene and Lenly whispered to her to take her time, and at that moment she thought of pretending to be dead. She lay there, not moving, pretending to be rotten, thinking that she was just a shadow mouse running by, hoping not to be eaten. The dragon looked at her in surprise. But her plan was to concentrate and gather all her strength, and to use her strong animal paws to jump high towards the frightened Lenly and Delen. And she succeeded. Lenly rushed to hug her and praised her for being so clever. Mouse replied in a businesslike manner that the dragon was a complete idiot, and that as long as she was in the business, all problems were solved very easily. The boy looked at the pile of grass and was really happy to have such a prey. And then, he told everyone that there were mysterious killers in this mountainous abundance, an unreasonable weakness of elemental magic. This mysterious canyon became more and more interesting to them. And with the words, Let's check it out, Lenly rushed to the bottom of the canyon. As he flew, he wondered what else was in the depths of this mysterious canyon. After a while, he landed smoothly on a rock, which meant that he had finally mastered the hovering technique. Suddenly, Bebe the mouse froze as he saw something in the dark depths of the canyon. It was a Vilochi underground dragon, a level 8 beast that lives only in the depths of the canyon. These dragons are bigger than ordinary Vilochi dragons, and although it is an 8th level beast, its mind is not that weak compared to a human. Dealing swore that it was a Velo Key underground dragon, 100%. Lenly exclaimed to her that he now understood that more and more dragons were hiding at the bottom, so it was no wonder she hadn't seen them before. Lenly told the girl that if they were earth dragons, he could maneuver himself out of the way. He shouted the wind elemental spell, flight and displacement. He followed it up with wind detection to help him see better ahead. Delen noticed that his wind magic had attracted another dragon. It was an eighth-level metal-winged dragon, blue in color. Bebe the mouse screamed in panic that the dragons were attacking from all sides, and they were even scarier and stronger than before. Linley noticed that his speed was no longer enough, and turned to Delen and asked what other spells could help him escape. Let me think, Delen exclaimed to him, excited. You're being chased by three eighth-level beasts, and you're a seventh-level mage. Lenly realized that he had to do something right now, and cast the Earth Armor spell, Jade Level. And instantly he was back in his suit. Suddenly the metal winged dragon struck him on the armor, but despite the force of the blow, his Earth Armor prevented it from being fatal. Suddenly, Delen saw a light up ahead, and realized that it must be a cave, and ordered everyone to hide there. Seeing the metal winged dragon continue to chase Lenly, she loudly warned him that his armor had been damaged by the previous attack and might not be able to withstand the next one. Lenly flew with all his might, thinking that he would definitely survive if he got out through her. As Delen flew closer, she noticed that the entrance to the cave was sealed with magic, probably to keep the dragons out, she thought. Meanwhile, Lenly was running for his life, chased by a metal-winged dragon. But the dragon managed to hit Lenly before he entered, and the boy fell bitterly on the stones. Raising his head, he asked if Bibi was okay. The mouse was stuck between the stones and begged to be pulled out. Lenly looked at the entrance to the cave and asked where it led and why it was sealed. Suddenly they both heard strange sounds. Someone laughed and shouted Sardius. It was a level nine beast, the purple tattooed bear. Three hundred years ago, the metal winged dragon had scratched out his eyes and made him blind and now the bear was threatening to kill him at last. Dylan listened to the bear and did not believe that it could speak. Suddenly it started to cry out, Oh no! And Lenly saw Dylan quickly hide in the ring hanging around his neck. He wondered what she was doing. Dylan sat frightened in the ring with her feet together, shrunken a thousand times. She explained to Lenly that it was a saint-level beast that could talk and fly. Its magical powers were so strong that he would definitely notice it so she was hiding in the ring for her own safety. While they were talking, Baby the Mouse was sneaking up on the bear to bite his ear. Delen stopped this fearless individual. 
Lenly looked at the bear and thought that St. Lavelle animals should look different. Meanwhile, the bear was saying that after all these years, he would finally get his revenge. Who would have thought you were locked here in a place filled with power? Lenly couldn't understand who he was talking to, but he looked more closely into the darkness. Suddenly a level nine armored serpent dragon flew out of the darkness. He shouted at the bear that he was a cursed animal, and how dare he laugh at him. His sighs amazed everyone. Suddenly his eyes stopped on Lenly, and he noticed him hiding behind a pile of rocks. But for some reason he did nothing. Lenly thought that the dragon had ignored him, perhaps because of the enemy standing in front of him. At that moment the bear stood on its hind legs, making it look even bigger and scarier, with growths on its paws like a dragon. The dragon looked at him and exclaimed, Sardius, you used to be so proud, but that was a long time ago. And he too stood on his hind legs. The bear replied that he had now overtaken him and had finally reached the saintly level. And then in front of Lenly's eyes, the purple tattooed bear rushed at the armored snake. The force with which they rushed at each other made everything around them shake. With a roar and a crash, they joined together and began to roll across the stone plateau. Lenly covered his ears because he was deafened by the sound. The two beasts stood on their hind legs and roared at each other. Both of them were enormous. You have no more strength to fight back. Give up now, one of them shouted. It was impossible to make out who was shouting in this tangle. And then the bear grabbed the dragon's tail, and it jerked and a good chunk of it came off. The dragon screamed in pain. This is your weak spot, the bear growled, and indeed the dragon's tail was the most vulnerable part of it. From the bite and the tugging, the dragon instantly dropped a part of its tail like a lizard. It seemed to be a defensive reaction. Vedmita carried it victoriously over his head. But knowledgeable people said that dragons usually do not use this tail maneuver until the very last moment. They do it only when they want to kill the enemy with them. When the dragon's tail was shed, dragon scales rose on its back. This meant that something was wrong. The bear looked and thought for a moment. It was indeed armor made of blades. This armored dragon's crest could cut through everything with absolute ease. The dragon turned its back on the bear and flew past it as close as possible, slicing through the bear's body with its blades. Lenly stared at the two monsters in amazement and now listened to the bear's scream of pain. The decisive moment was coming. One maneuver and that was it. Who would win? But both monsters instantly fell with a roar and there was no winner. Only a huge mountain of bloody bodies now lay silent. There was a deafening silence. They were lying right at the boy's feet. Suddenly, Delon shouted to Lenly that this was a chance to find out if he could become a dragon blood warrior. This opportunity must not be missed. Next to the bodies was a mangled dragon's tail. When he finally woke up from his stupor and heard her talking about dragon blood, he realized that he had gathered enough blue heart herb, and this was his chance to become a dragon blood warrior right now. He quickly flew up to the dragon's head, but it turned out that the dragon was still alive and instantly opened its mouth when it saw the boy. Delin shouted at him to be careful. Delin was just a disembodied soul with very limited energy, but she flew up to the dragon's head and used her powers to restrain it a little. Beeb the mouse shouted for Lenly to put on the jade armor immediately, but Lenly shouted loudly that it was too late and he would not have time to do it. Bibi the mouse immediately transformed into a beast and shouted, Boss, I'm coming to help you, and rushed to her beloved master. She fearlessly and with all her might hit the dragon's head with her whole body, and he started screaming out of surprise and pain. But of course their strengths were not equal, and the dragon threw Bibe away with one paw. Even with such wounds as his, he was still strong. Bebe lay unconscious on the stones. Lenly, who was not far away, felt a wild pain in his head, all because he was bound to the mouse by a contract. He also screamed in pain. And in that moment of pain, Lenly stopped feeling Baby's mouse. The boy's eyes were instantly bloodshot. There was a lump in his throat and his temples were pounding. He loved his little friend, his assistant, with all his heart. So in a rage, he shouted at the dragon, drawing attention to himself. Lenly wanted revenge right now. Lenly ran as fast as he could towards the dragon. Delin was flying behind him and shouting that he was crazy. It was a level nine armored dragon. And even when wounded, it was very strong. Lenly would not be able to resist it. 
but the boy did not hear her. He was out for revenge. The boy took to the air and began to circle the dragon, confusing it as it tried to follow him. Everyone saw that Lenly was preparing to cast one of his spells. He was fully concentrated, and the stones at his feet began to rise into the air. Lenly shouted, Flat Blade! And the spell began to work, illuminating everything around him with a pink light. He flew up to the dragon and began to slash at everything he could with all his anger, gritting his teeth. Lenly skillfully and coolly cut through the dragon's body, making large and small cuts with his flat blade. Delin looked at him with horror in her eyes. The dragon was screaming like a mongrel lizard. The boy shouted, Let Bay Bay go! and began to attack mercilessly again, no longer feeling anything around him but his anger. He immediately shouted out the following spell. Earth thorns! Sharp stone spikes began to grow out of the ground, piercing the dragon's entire body, and he began to scream in pain. Suddenly, Lenly managed to fly very close to the dragon's mount, and using all his fencing and magic powers, slashed a flat blade across its throat. The blood hit the guy right in the face, and he choked on some of it, but he didn't even notice. He kept on cutting. The boy, shouting that he wanted to take revenge for Bebe, rushed at the dragon with all his anger. But the dragon noticed him and turned around with his whole body and grabbed his body in its claws. It brought him too close to its snout, and the boy saw his whole life flash before his eyes, and Lenly thought that it was probably the end. But the boy looked heroically into the eyes of his enemy. It seemed that he was made of anger and revenge. And then the dragon roared, and he fell dead. Lenly fell from his claws, a terrible roar, and his last breath were heard all around. Lenly's face was covered with the dragon's blood, and he could not understand what had happened to the dragon. Delin shouted that Lenly had defeated the dragon. Even though he was injured, he shouldn't forget that it was still a level nine beast. Lenly sat there and couldn't get up. He was in terrible pain inside and couldn't breathe properly. He started coughing and choking. And then Delin had an idea and shouted to him that he was sick because he had drunk the dragon's blood, and now he had to eat the blue heart herbs. Lenly took the herbs out of the bag with the last of his strength and began to chew them. There was no other option. Suddenly he felt that he was getting worse. All the blood in his body began to boil. He could not understand what was wrong with him and why it was not working. Dylan explained to him that after he drank the dragon's blood, his own blood began to boil and that was why he was in so much pain. The boy started screaming in agony. The girl also could not understand what was wrong. Either the herb did not work, or the dragon's blood was too strong. Something was wrong. And suddenly, in front of everyone's eyes, a dragon's tail began to grow on Lenly's body. His skin began to be covered with dragon scales, and horns began to grow on his head, like a real dragon. The boy began the process of dragonization. He fell to his knees in pain, screaming an animalistic cry, blood flowing from his mouth. Delin quickly put her hands on Lenly's hot head and shouted that he must hold on because she was using magic to keep the dragon's blood out. And then suddenly she heard Lenly mumbling something, and she was frightened, thinking that he had gone mad. But in fact, Lenly was reading the Dragon Blood Secret Manual, or to be more precise, he was reading the hidden part of the manual that mentioned how to activate the power of dragon blood. Suddenly, Lenly began to scream as if he was being cut, and Delin was very frightened and flew to the side. The boy was lying on the lawn, screaming in a voice that was not his own, his body twisting in different directions. This scream woke up Baby the Mouse, and she started calling out to her boss, but she couldn't understand what was happening. She flew over to Lenly and started shaking him, saying that she was fine now and asking him to regain consciousness. But Lenly did not respond. Suddenly his body began to be covered with scales and thorns again, and he sat up. Mouse told him in surprise that he smelled like a dragon. Lenly's head was covered with spikes like a crest right in front of Bibi's eyes. His eyes glowed with fire, like a dragon's. Finally the mouse realized that its boss was transforming into a dragon, and had already passed the first and second stages. And now, the third stage had come. Lenly stood upright. His skin was blue and covered with scales, his height had doubled, and his clothes were bursting at the seams, and dragon spikes were growing all over his body. 
Finally, Lenly looked at his blue-scaled hands and saw that he now had the body of a dragon. He could not believe his eyes. Dilin looked at him with the mouse and said that this was really the power of a dragon. She had no idea that the Baruch family members had the power to turn into dragons. She was very surprised and saw it live for the first time in her life. Meanwhile, Lenly tried to fly up into the air, but his strength left him and he fell back to the ground. Meanwhile, Baby the Mouse also began to transform into the form of a beast. She flew up to her beloved boss, and Lenly opened his eyes and whispered happily that it was so good that she was alive. She honestly admitted to him that for a moment she thought she was going to die, and told him that the passage to the cave was open, and began to load Lenly on her back to pull him out. Dylan watched in amazement as the mouse flew up with Lenly and carried him and thought that this mouse had recently survived the attack of a level 9 armored serpent and was able to survive. It was strange and impossible. She began to put her thoughts together and thought that maybe this shadow mouse was related to the man from the dark forest in the northern region of Yulan. Maybe she was his creation. Then Delling thought that Lenly's transformation was a definite success. It seemed that Lenly's ancestors were much stronger than her. Seeing a dragon blood descendant and a mutated shadow mouse in front of her, Delon couldn't put it all together. She looked at the two of them and thought that as long as they were together, something else would probably happen in the future. It seemed to her that the Yulan continent would definitely be turbulent. Meanwhile, Alice stood in the yard of the house. She was in a great mood, looking as charming as ever, and singing songs. Suddenly, she heard their butler calling her. She turned around and saw him running towards her, frightened. He was shouting that something was wrong with her father and that she should go and see him as soon as possible. The girl ran to the house and saw her old father sitting in a chair, with a strange man hovering over him, shouting at him that he was in debt, and if he didn't pay it off, he would become his slave. At once the stranger looked round and saw the beautiful Alice. He smiled lustfully and blurted out that he had not known the old man had such a beautiful daughter and they would probably take her with them as collateral. Help! Alice's mind raced. The girl realized what was happening to her, and quickly ran to the riverbank. She sat there crying and mentally calling out to Lenly, asking him to help her, because she needed him so much right now. She asked him to come back as soon as possible. Why is it that when I need you so much, you're not even around? Alice cried bitterly. A familiar voice sounded behind her. She turned round and saw a familiar hand holding out a bag of gold. The familiar voice said, Take this gold as a token of my attention. The Debs family will cover all your debts. It was Kalin, standing in front of the sun in all his glory, confident and handsome. He came closer to the surprised Alice and told her that no matter what trouble she got into, he would always be there for her. At this moment, Alice remembered her card readings and thought that maybe the cards had shown her betrothed to be Callan instead of Lenly. Meanwhile, the story moves back to Lenly. At the bottom of a mysterious foggy canyon, in a cave under a boulder, there was something truly magical. Dylan flew around and looked closely, and she came to the conclusion that there seemed to be a very strong, magical seal. In the center was a sword of unprecedented beauty, glowing with a purple glow. Delin looked at it and made her guesses. Who put this sword there? Who put the seal on it? Maybe it was to hold a level 9 dragon? She was silent, and after a minute she let out that this magic seal was very complicated. Even a level 9 armored serpent didn't need such a strong seal. Suddenly, a beast mouse landed beside her, carrying Lenly, who had already regained consciousness. Delin rushed over to him and asked him if he had seen this amazing sword and magic seal. She told him in a business-like manner that she did not know why this powerful seal was there, but that this sword was very valuable. Lenly looked at the sword and replied that it must have been someone very powerful who put the seal there. Dealing could not stand it, and nervously shouted that this was why she had to take it back. And did Lenly realize how high the price was? It doesn't have an owner anyway. But Lenly reminded her that he was looking for the blade of the Baruch family murderer. Delin didn't want to hear anything. She argued that this particular sword must have cost several thousand gold coins to create and that it was priceless. The aura of this long sword was very unusual. 
and it was most likely one of the four blades of the higher realms from the continuum of hell. She was very determined. Lenly listened to her hysteria in shock and replied that he knew nothing about the four realms or the continuum. Dealing rolled her eyes and clicked her tongue. After taking in more air, she began to explain that on the Yulan continent, Lenly was one of the strongest in his nation, so it was time to teach him something else about existence. There are four higher realms of existence, the continuum of life, the divine continuum, the lower continuum, and the continuum of hell. After the saintly level is God, after the divine level are the lords, and above the lords are the four super deities. Whether we are talking about a shining lord or a shadow cult lord, they are just lords. Although they have advantages, they still need the strength of faith of their followers. Super deities are different. They don't need followers. Lenly listened to her and pretended to understand everything. The boy interrupted Delon by saying that he wanted to try to use the power of transformation into a dragon, namely dragonization. He was very curious about what he had become. Lenly approached the mysterious sword and took it by the hilt and began to pull it. He noticed that a strange, strong aura was emanating from the sword, and finally the sword was in Lenly's hands. The boy happily showed Delon that he had got it and thought that after he touched it, the sword seemed to come to life. And then he recognized the sword. It was the flexible blade. It was the one his teacher had told him about at the academy. Delin was extremely happy that the boy had got the sword. It was a really great treasure. She boastfully called herself the lucky star of Len Lee. The boy reminded her that he almost died with such luck. The girl abruptly ordered everyone to fly out of the cave she thought the passage might close again. And everyone flew to the exit of the cave. After the magic stopped supporting the seal, the rocks of the cave entrance really closed. When everything was quiet, a strange man suddenly appeared from the ruins. He had his blue hair tied in a ponytail, a handsome face and a golden robe, and he was holding three puppies. The stranger said, I'm finally free. He looked around carefully and asked himself if this was really the continent of Yulin, and he exclaimed with joy that it was amazing. The puppies were also looking at everything with interest. Suddenly they said to him, Daddy, we are hungry. The stranger pulled them down and said that there must be many small dragons around, which should be enough to feed them. And immediately the little puppies grew into six-eyed lions with wings, and a transformation took place. They pounced on the dragon's body and began to eat it. The stranger looked at them with satisfaction and exclaimed, Eat, my children. We still have a lot of work to do. I believe that this time we will be more lucky than five thousand years ago. Meanwhile, in the heart of the Yulon continent, a magnificent castle with towers rose up. In the room by the window, a well-dressed man stood when another stranger came up to him and reported that their people from the Mountain Fortune had sent a letter saying that someone had entered the forbidden zone of the Misty Canyon and killed a level nine armored serpent. The head of the Feng Lai Kingdom, Clyde, was standing by the window. He asked without turning around, Who did this? This means that the magic seal has been broken. The speaker answered frightened that no one knew anything. The chairman attacked him, shouting why he was still standing there. He took him by the scruff of the neck and said, Go check on those who have recently entered the room and threw him out of the room. The head of the kingdom was very angry, which meant that the creature that was hidden there was now free, and it was urgent to find it. It was the first of January, which meant that the Yulan Festival, the biggest holiday on the whole continent, was about to begin. There would be a festive ceremony at the Shining Church on that day. People came from different places to take part in the celebration at the Shining Hall, in the west of Feng Lai. Lenly was among the crowd along with Baby the Mouse, who was dreaming of eating fried chicken legs today. Lenly noticed that the busy city was completely different from life in the mountainous countryside. He wandered among the people, looking at everything around him. It was his first time at this festival, and everything was really beautiful and colorful. Delon flew alongside him and kept chattering about how there would be many noble families here today, most likely to attend and they all needed grant protection. Lenly would even be able to see the kings of the Holy Alliance. Suddenly a crowd of people shouted, pointing towards the boy. Ghost! 
Bebe also started screaming that something had touched her face, and it was definitely a ghost in broad daylight. Lenly whispered to Dellen that she had flown into the flag fabric, and everyone thought they were seeing a ghost. But she had already flown into the ring and was sitting quietly. Lenly was making fun of her. Dellen got out of it and told him that she wasn't scared, but that there were saint-level fighters in the crowd, and they could sense her, so she would stay in the ring for a while to avoid getting caught. Lenly thought about what she said. The guy had stopped. The knights protecting the Shining Church had passed him. She could afford it. And Lenly was already thinking that he needed to become stronger as soon as possible, because his abilities were not enough now. And then the crowd gasped. Everyone saw a living bishop. The bishop, dressed in white robes, was riding in a gorgeous white chariot, accompanied by knights also dressed in white. Lindley watched and asked himself, This must be the leader of the Shining Church. Why did he get goosebumps? Suddenly, Baby the Mouse started to screech in his ear. She saw Alice in the crowd. Lenly looked closely, and it was indeed her, dressed as always beautifully. Alice was standing there watching the procession. He approached her and called out to her. The girl could not believe her eyes and asked him if he had returned from the mountainous abundance. But Lenly was silent, because for some reason he saw Kaelin behind her. The boy was very surprised. Kaelin asked him angrily that he might be a follower of the Shining Church and had come to take part in the ceremony. Lenly did not answer. The boy calmly told Kaelin that he was not an ordinary follower and that he wanted to talk to Alice alone and asked him to leave them. Kaelin started to get angry and rude, telling Lenly that he was talking to him, a low-class boy alone. Lenly asked him again what he had said. The boy gritted his teeth in anger. He pushed Kaelin in the chest. He started shouting how dare he start a fight during the festival. Alice rushed to break them up. She looked at Lenly with sad eyes and said she would talk to him. Taking the boy by the arm, they left. But Bebe the mouse showed her tongue to the clan, and Kaelin shouted at her to get out of here and called her a rat. But Kalan started to chase her again, calling her a rat. But the mouse was hard to catch up with, and she called him an idiot and offered to run after her. Alice and Lenly came out to the clearing, and it was hard for both of them to start this conversation. The girl started first, stammering and telling him that at first she really liked Lenly, but now that she had been with him, she realized that a lot of their relationship was incompatible. She continued that in her heart, Lenly was a real hero who had come down from heaven, but she realized that this would not be enough. Callan, for example, could easily solve her father's gambling debts at the expense of her family and future, Alice said. Lenly asked her if this was the only reason she thought Kalen was a better match for her. Alice burst into tears and said yes. Lindley sadly replied that he understood. He silently turned and walked away from her. Alice shouted after him, asking if they could still be friends. Lenley was cold with nervousness, but he nodded his head in silence. Alice stood there and cried her eyes out, feeling sorry for herself and for Lenley. After saying goodbye, Lenly returned to the Magic Academy to dormitory number 109. All the boys of the dormitory were watching their conversation, and they were also crying. Yale told them all that he had just found out Lenly's heart was broken, but he thought he was calm. Lenly sat by a stone and meditated for a very long time. Suddenly the boy took out his flat blade and began to carve something with it. The boys gasped. Is he making sculptures? exclaimed Yale. Lenly continued to carve something, moving the knife easily. His thoughts were all about Alice. The guy was really hurt by their last conversation. He was in love with her. Twenty minutes later, a sculpture was already visible from the huge boulder. Lenly carved five images of the girl, showing her in different emotions. The boys were amazed by her beauty. Yale said he could see that he was feeling very sick. The botanist was impressed by her appearance and the time spent and the third guy shouted that it was supernatural skill. Meanwhile, Lenly was finishing his sculpture thinking that this year was just like a dream, and now he was finally starting to wake up from it. He looked at his creation and decided to call it waking up from a dream. He felt lousy at heart. The sculpture was completed. Dellen flew around it in awe and looked at it carefully, and Bebe the mouse was also shocked. Dylan flew up to him and told him that he had reached the level of a master in working with stone. 
She understood that the story with Alice had hurt him, but she reminded him that he shouldn't forget that they had many important tasks to do. Linley looked at her with tear-dry eyes as if he had really woken up. He exclaimed that, indeed, he must become the pride of the Baruch family and avenge his mother. He turned around and walked to the dormitory, his friends who had been following him scattered to avoid him. Lenly went into his room and saw that all three of his friends were sitting at the table, each of them doing something. It looked rather strange. The boy kept thinking about something, and he said out loud the words of the poem, Ask the world what love is. He is very sick. Yale continued to read the poem after him and said, Moonlight in front of the bed. Relationships are like dreams. Lenly looked at his friend in silence. He thought that his friends were still worried about him. He had to think of something to get out of this situation. So he pulled out a flexible blade and hit the table. It split into pieces. Hitting Yale in the head, Lenly cheerfully exclaimed that his ability to read poetry was amazing, so he wanted to fight him, and he showed everyone his cool sword. Yale laughed and said he was ready to help Lenly with this pain, and was even ready to take the blows. The nerd exclaimed that it was so rare for the four of them to get together, but it was so cool. Instantly, Lenly became gloomy, and told them that he wanted to tell everyone something. And the boy blurted out that he was going to apply for early graduation and leave the magical academy. The room was silent, and all the guys were so impressed they couldn't say a word. After a while, all the students and teachers gathered in the magic arena of the academy to test Lenley's abilities and consider his application. Lenley stood in the middle of the arena, and the examiner asked him if he was using this reason to graduate so early and take the seventh-level mage test. Lenley answered yes. He was confident in his abilities. The crowd of students began to whisper, all saying that it was impossible for him to reach the seventh level in two years. No one believed that he could graduate early, and only Lenley was confident. The teacher looked at him carefully and told him to show him a seventh-level spell for evaluation. Lenley used a seventh-level flight technique and quietly and smoothly flew into the sky. He performed a perfect aerial coup. His flying technique was much more advanced than when he was on the mountainous abundance of magical beasts. He had reached the point where he could safely move in the air. The wind elemental teacher was watching him fly, and he was amazed that Lenley's technique was better than his. The examiner asked him to show him something else from the seventh level. Lenley quickly flipped in the air, flew over to him and tore off his hat, and the examiner came to his senses without it. He said that everything was fine, if he could take even his hat without being noticed. It proved that his abilities had reached the seventh level of a magician. The examiner went to the middle of the arena and loudly told everyone that according to the rules of the academy, Lenley had passed the exam and qualified as a dual element mage and had officially graduated from the academy. The crowd roared with joy. It was unheard of. Lenley stood there, feeling very proud of himself. He had worked hard to become a seventh-level mage in such a short time. His friends rushed to congratulate him. Only Jean stood there thinking that from the first day of training, he knew that this guy was no ordinary guy. In fact, he was one of the fastest students to reach the seventh level before us. Jean was not very happy about these events, because he was Lenley's eternal competitor. He continued to think that Lenley had improved too quickly, and even if he tried to catch up with him, it would be difficult because he was only at level six. Delia stood next to him and Jean told her that he thought there was nothing left to learn at the academy, so he would probably prepare for graduation as well and return to his family. Duryufu. All students moved to celebrate at the large and luxurious hotel of Yale Dawson's family. That night, everyone said goodbye to him. He was graduating, which meant that he would be separated from everyone. Yale set up gorgeous tables that were bursting with the best food and drinks and told him that, although he was leaving the academy, he asked him not to forget about the Dawson conglomerate's invitation. Lenley thanked him sincerely for everything he had done for him. Beeb the Mouse was sitting and eating chicken legs, and Yale put a whole plate in front of her. Dellen was sitting not far from her, and she was sincerely jealous that she could eat unlike her. Meanwhile, Yale hugged Lenley and exclaimed that Lenley had finally become better than him, and now he had a live advert. 
The boy laughed back because he was always thinking about money. Suddenly a servant came into the room and handed him a letter addressed to Lenley. The boy opened the envelope and was horrified to see what he read. The letter said that his father Nog continued to search for his wife's killer. The evidence he found became clearer and clearer. And then, a group with a spider tag started hunting him down, and he was unable to escape. Master Nog was dead, read a shocked Lenley, his pupils dilating. This letter was from Captain Hillman, where he also wrote that while they were searching for the killer, they were constantly surrounded by some mysterious people. He was lucky to come back alive, but he was badly injured. All he could do was write this letter about Nog's father. Yale asked him in shock what he was going to do now. Suddenly, the servant came in again and reported that special guests had arrived. They were the defenders of the Shining Church, and they brought a group of knights to the hotel. By the way, the leader of the cardinals was higher in rank than even the king. Yale looked out the window and saw the knights and asked Lenly why the cardinals were here to see him. The servant replied that they were looking for Lenly. The boy turned to Lenly and explained that the leader of the cardinals had come to them. But Yale was the young head of the Dawson conglomerate, and he could not intervene in his position. Lenly understood and went downstairs to see them. In the hotel lobby, Knight stood in two rows, and in the center of the sofa sat a cardinal in gorgeous white clothes. The boys came down and Yale said helpfully, Welcome, leader of the cardinals. Lenly remained silent and looked at him. The cardinal looked at them carefully and said that the boys could call him Guillermo. The knights who were here came from the temple. Dellen had managed to hide in the ring and whispered to Lenly that the cardinal and the bishop were the leaders of the cardinals. And to become a leader, one must not only be famous, but must have the power of a magician of at least the ninth level. But the knights of the seventh level accompanying him were not weak either. The cardinal continued to speak. He had heard that a student had graduated from the Magic Academy and had become a dual elemental mage at the age of seventeen, and he was curious about what he looked like, but now he saw that Lenly was unsurpassed. Lenly, since you are a resident of the Holy Alliance lands and a citizen of these lands with excellent results in magic, I, as the head of the Cardinals, am proud of you. So I'm asking you, would you like to join the Holy Alliance? Guillermo said loudly. Lindley asked himself in surprise. Was he really being invited to join the Union? He could not believe his own ears. Yale quietly told Lenley that this was an unexpected but pleasant offer, because even eighth-level mages may not receive such an honor in their entire lives. What does Lenley think about this? The boy thought to himself. If he joined the Holy Alliance now, then all his actions would be restricted by the cardinals, and how would he be able to investigate the murder of his parents? He looked into the cardinal's eyes and asked if he could wait a few years for an answer, because he felt that his courage was not great enough to bear such responsibility. The cardinal could not believe what he was hearing, had Lenly really rejected his offer. This had never happened before. Yale was shocked by what he had heard and was gasping in amazement. The cardinal thought that if they didn't keep such a talented young man, and if he ever opposed the church, it would be a huge problem. And he said, If you join us, then we will allow you to join any of the kingdoms under the rule of the Holy Alliance and grant you the title of Duke. His voice was already too loud. Yale could not understand how Lenly could refuse such wonderful conditions. Lenly calmly asked for some time to make this important decision. The knights and the cardinal gasped aloud. He's turned it down again. The cardinal began to lose his temper and hissed that it was not easy for him to show such leniency in this case. To which Lenly calmly replied that he promised not to join any of the four empires, or the Dark Alliance, until he had made a decision and informed them of it. The cardinal was surprised and laughed. This was the kind of conversation he liked. He asked Lenly to remember his words, because he would be waiting for news from him. And all the knights left with him. Yale who was holding on with the last of his strength, fell to the floor. He was almost unconscious. He was scared to death. Lenly's friends, who were listening to the whole conversation, said that it seemed to be very important for the cardinal to get Lenly to join the Holy Union. Lenly listened to them and thought about it. 
Then he explained to the boys that the most important thing for him today was to find someone who had a spider tattoo, and nothing else. The guy was very determined. He is the enemy of my family, and there is nothing more important to me than revenge, exclaimed an excited Lenly. Although Lenly had graduated from the academy, he still had some business to take care of at the academy before returning to Wushan Village. In addition to his affairs, he trained hard, knowing that it was a necessity for him. He was standing on his head in the middle of dorm room 109, with a golden glow on the floor. It was gravity field training. Standing on his hands made him stronger. Yale suddenly burst into his room shouting that he had some news. Suddenly he fell down. He tried to get up, but nothing worked. He shouted, Did Lenly turn up the gravity field? His magic is even stronger and his heart is going to stop. Lenly turned off the gravity field and Yale finally stood up. He began to quickly tell me that he had just found out that the killer blade was in the hands of one of the Fung Lai kingdoms, namely, the Lucas family. Lenly could not believe what he was hearing. The guy shouted at him that if he wanted to take the blade, would he get in trouble? Yale replied that it would be difficult, but... But I've prepared a carriage for you. There's no point in sitting around thinking. And he showed a beautiful carriage with Bebe the mouse already riding on it. Lenly quickly got into it without hesitation. As they rode along, Yale told him the details that the Lucas family is quite old and has thousands of years of history, and that they are not the richest in the kingdom of Fung Lai, but they have a very strong influence on the nobility. He also heard that the head of the Lucas family is a stubborn old man who collects weapons. The boys continued to ride, talking through the forest. So far, their journey had been uneventful. Suddenly, their carriage stopped. The horses could not take a step. Yale began to get nervous and told Lenly that he would fix the situation. A tall, middle-aged woman with red hair and a scar on her face stepped out to meet the carriage. Her clothes were different from those worn on the Yulan mainland, and she was accompanied by two men. Is this a normal way to invite someone? If you want to see Lenly, ask me, Yale shouted at her. The woman laughed out loud at his audacity and replied that if that was the case, she had no choice but to move Yale. So the two men pushed Yale to the ground and twisted his arms. But Lenly could not allow this to happen and pulled out his flexible sword. Noticing that these men had a dark power, he shouted the spell, Purple Blood. And the battle began. Lenly bravely threw himself into the uneven carnage and began to attack, but the men were not weak either. The woman watched them in silence. She stood with her foot on Yale's back and said what a strange weapon Lenly had. Although she was about to make her move, her mission was to capture the boy. Meanwhile, a frightened Ellen caught up with Lenly and whispered that if he fought, he would not win. There will be no winner. The fight is not equal. And there's Yale under the sword of that mimic, so don't rush, she finished. Lenly stopped for a drink and shouted to the woman if she would let his friend go if he went with her. Yale shouted that he should not go with her. She told him that of course they don't touch Lenly's friends. And she removed her foot from Yale. Lenly silently left with the three of them. Yale was desperate, so he unharnessed his horse and decided that it would be faster to go without the carriage. Jumping on his horse, he went to get reinforcements to rescue Lenly. Meanwhile... The three strangers silently led Lenly through the oppressive forest. Delon, who they did not see, flew alongside the boy and made guesses. She thought that these strangers came from the Dark Alliance. Lenly listened to her in surprise. Lenly remembered yesterday's arrival of the Holy Alliance. Today, the Dark Alliance came. But they were opponents. Delon, meanwhile, tracked the road and said that they would be in the mountain abundance after a while. And then when they passed the south of the mountain abundance, they would enter the Alliance territory. Suddenly the strangers stopped, and the woman shouted out to someone to stop hiding and come out to meet her. A group of hermits came out to meet them, and the leader of the group calmly told her that Lenly had joined the Holy Alliance. So why would the Dark Alliance dare to kidnap him? The Alliance seems to be showing a lot of disrespect for the Shining Church. Lenly listened in surprise to his words, which were not true. Delon said that there was some strange drama going on. The woman replied in disappointment that who knew that the Shining Church would get here so quickly? It seems that Lenly is really important to this bunch of hermits. 
The leader of the Shining Church deserters calmly told her to let Lenly go, as they would have no chance of winning. There were indeed many more of them. Delin, taking advantage of the fact that she could not be seen or heard, hissed in the woman's ear that she had achieved her goals. The old man had unknown skills, and those four were level seven and above. She advised her to fight and giggled. The woman soberly assessed the situation and asked the old man if they let Lenly go. Would they be able to leave in one piece? He nodded silently. And she and her gang took to the sky and shouted to Lenly that if he wanted to join the Dark Alliance at any time, their doors would always be open to him. And she quickly ran away. Babe the Mouse also laughed at the strangers for calling Lenly strangely while running away. The leader asked him if he was all right. The mouse saw a mouse on his shoulder, but it didn't look like him. Lenly looked at the leader and thought that he had kind eyes and did not have the same pressure as the cardinals. The leader invited him to go with them to the capital. At that moment, Baby whispered to him, Weren't they going to visit the Lucas family? If they went home, what would happen to the blade? And at that moment, everyone heard the sound of horses and turned around to see Yale with a whole crowd of people. He had ridden with the whole Dawson family army because he loved and protected his friends so much. But he saw that he was too late. The leader told Lenly that he hoped the boy understood that the Shining Church would always be his shield, and said goodbye. Lenly thanked him sincerely. Yale exhaled and exclaimed that he now understood that help had come from the church, and suggested that everyone rest. But Lenly refused. Then they continued their journey. After a while, everyone saw the house of the Lucas family. They were immediately met by a servant, who greeted them and invited them to follow him and led them into the house. Lenly was now the youngest seventh-level magician in the Yulon continent, and Yale was the young head of the Dawson family. So they were not stopped when they wanted to meet Patriarch Jabs. Upon entering the luxurious room, they saw an elderly man who welcomed them to his home. He introduced himself as Jebs, the patriarch of the Lucas family, and invited them to sit down. Bib the mouse angrily offered to scratch the patriarch's face, but Lenly stopped her. He told the patriarch that they had a favor to ask of him. The patriarch listened attentively and said, You want the killer's blade? He seemed to know everything. Lenly exclaimed that that was right. The Baruch family has a 5,000-year history and their trophy killer's blade was lost. Their whole family was trying to find it. So could you. The patriarch stopped him again. He explained that collecting weapons was his hobby, and the assassin's blade was one of his favorite items in the collection, and he had even been offered a large sum of money, but he had not sold it. Lenly exclaimed that he was ready to buy it for a good price. The patriarch took a sip of tea and said, Six hundred thousand. The boys almost lost their minds from what they heard. Lenly mentally repeated this crazy figure, and Dellen said that it was still quite cheap for such a thing. The guy sharply replied that even if he sold all his crystals, he could earn a few thousand, but he didn't have that kind of money. Yale thought that if he offered such a sum, Lenly would not take it. He knew his friend's temper. And then an idea came to Lenly's mind, and he shouted to Lenly that he had a sculpture that could be sold. He couldn't believe his ears. Are you talking about the same one? Yale asked him, surprised. Yes, the one I created in memory of my feelings for Alice, and I decided to sell it. Yale Lenly replied decisively. Yale asked him again, like a fool, if he was sure he wanted to sell it. Meanwhile, Dellen said that it would be really better. After all, she would not remind you of that pain every time you looked at her. And at the same time, everyone would see the flat blade technique. Lenly turned to Jebs and said loudly that he had found a way to pay the full amount and he would hand over the money as soon as possible. Aid Lenly asked him not to sell the blade to anyone during this time. Jebs nobly assured him that even if he was offered two million gold coins, he would not sell it. Lenly thanked him profusely. He ran with Yale and asked him on the way if he could help him contact the curator of the Pruel Gallery. Yale contacted the gallery curator who was overjoyed that Lenly had agreed to sell one of his sculptures. He exclaimed that as soon as he looked at it, he felt deep feelings because it conveyed so many emotions. It will be sold for a great price. Yale looked at him and thought that his feelings were just thoughts of money. 
The curator told Lenley that for such a sculpture the gallery would not even charge him to participate in the auction that was about to begin for it, and he even came up with a place for it to stand. Meanwhile, in the garden, Debs, Alice, and Kalen spent time together sitting by the pool and kicking the water. Kalen suggested that they should celebrate their wedding next year at the Yulon Festival. He continued to persuade her by telling her that the next year would be the 10,000th year of the Yulan calendar, and it was perfect for a wedding celebration, and she cheerfully agreed. Kalen added that he had recently heard about a famous sculptor and suggested that they go to an auction together. They started to get ready to go to the Prue Gallery, the most famous sculpture gallery in Yulan. Alice put on a beautiful long pink dress and styled her hair, and Kylan put on a weekend suit. When he arrived at the gallery, he was surprised by the large number of people. Suddenly Alice's eyes were drawn to the familiar silhouettes in a sculpture standing nearby. She began to look closely. As she got closer, she was horrified to see a sculpture depicting herself in five emotions. The sculpture was called Awakening from a Dream, and the author was Lenly. Strange men stood next to her, and one of them told her that the author of this sculpture was named Len Lee. He was a graduate of the Magic Academy. He was only 17 years old, but he was already a seventh-level magician and a genius of the entire Yulan continent, and maybe the greatest in its history. The girl could not make a sound from the impression. She remembered Len Lee and realized that this was their last story and burst into tears. Kalan, who came up later, saw the sculpture and turned blue with anger and began to send curses in Lenly's direction. Suddenly, his father approached them and said that he had heard that a beautiful sculpture was exhibited in this gallery and the whole family had come to admire it, but he hadn't thought that Alice would be there. Kalan came over and whispered about the situation. The boy emotionally exclaimed that this sculpture would make a mockery of their family and asked his father to destroy it. The father assured him that he knew what to do. He told his son to bring men with blades to disfigure it, and the boy brought them ten minutes later. The father ordered them to destroy the sculpture by pointing to Lenly's creation, and in front of everyone's eyes, a crowd of unknown men rushed to the sculpture to destroy it. All the spectators raised their eyes and screamed, and the sculpture was surrounded by masked men with blades. But then someone from the crowd cast a stopping magic that hit the bodies of the men and threw them all away from the sculpture. It was the king of the kingdom, he shouted. How dare they do this outrage on the territory of his kingdom? Call the guards and seize them, he ordered. Colin looked on in horror and realized that the blame would now fall on their family. Meanwhile, the king ordered the auction of the sculpture to begin. His father reassured him that he would support Kalan at the auction. The boy thanked him, but believed that it would be no problem for their family to get it, and then they would destroy it. A large crowd gathered in the lobby of the Prule Gallery, where a beautiful large sculpture of Lenly stood in the center. Everyone stood and admired it until it became someone's property. The king went up to the VIP area where he was greeted by Maya, the curator of the gallery, and thanked him for keeping this beautiful sculpture intact. He asked the curator which of these people was Lenly, but Maya replied that Lenly was in the VIP room, and he would call him in a moment, but the king demanded to see the famous guy in person. Maya took the king to the room and called Lenly to greet the king. Lenly was very sad. He didn't like to sell his sculptures in which he put his emotions and soul, and this time the sculpture meant his first feelings. He went out and bowed and greeted the king. The king looked at him in surprise and asked him if he was the youngest seventh-level dual elemental magician. You are so young and promising. Do you want to join Feng Lai's royal army? The king asked Lenly. But again, Lenly declined the invitation because he wanted to think about it before answering. Beeb the mouse thought that her boss had gone mad. He had rejected the king's offer. The king coughed in surprise and explained that no one had ever turned down his personal invitations before. To fill the awkward pause, he turned to Yale and asked how his father was doing. Yale bowed and thanked him for his interest, and said that thanks to the king, his father was doing well. Suddenly the front door opened and Cardinal Guillermo himself came in, dressed in gorgeous white clothes. The Mayan curator greeted him and thanked him for coming on time, showing him that the king was already here. 
Cardinal Guillermo looked at the crowd and said with satisfaction that he had brought a lot of nobility to the auction today, so the awakening from sleep would go for a good price. Everyone was in a good mood. The curator gave both of them the auction plates and told them that the auction would start soon and invited them to the VIP boxes. The crowd of visitors buzzed with delight as they looked at the sculpture, some saying it was a work of art, others that it was beautiful. The king and the cardinal were standing on the balcony talking. In the middle of the crowd stood an angry Callan, who, seeing such distinguished guests, was furious that Lenly was so highly praised. His father kept calming him down and saying that he would support him. He took him to the room to prepare for the auction. The auctioneer stood at the podium and announced the opening of the auction. He also announced the bid for the sculpture Awakening from Sleep at one million gold with each bid step being at least 100,000. He banged the wooden gavel and shouted, The auction has begun! The initial bid of a million was too high for most of the guests, and everyone whispered among themselves. Alice continued to cry the whole time, and Kalen calmed her down and promised not to let her and his family be embarrassed. Kalan made the first bid, and it was one and a half million. Kalan was bursting with anger. The host named their family and announced his bet. Yale snuck in and told Lenly that he had seen Alice in the room with the clansmen. He was a sneaky spy. The bets began to rise. They announced one million seven hundred, then two million gold. Lenly watched the auction from the VIP balcony. Some chubby lady shouted out two and a half million, and the room began to buzz loudly. The king, who was sitting next to Lenly, yawned and said that everything was very boring. Then he said quietly, Let me make the auction interesting and ordered the auctioneer to hold up a sign and shouted five million. The whole room turned to the square-eyed man on the balcony and gasped. Everyone realized that the auction was going to be unusual. The king turned to Lenly again. This time he offered him to be his right or left hand. The boy apologized again and asked for time to think. The king no longer knew how to convince him. The host of the rally began to speak. Five million times, five million times two, and was about to knock a third time, but... And then Kalen shouted eight million. It seemed that he was going to burst. The king looked at the guy who had interrupted his great bet. The crowd began to make noise and shout. For many of those who were there, it was a lot of money. Kalan was wickedly happy, because now he could end the competition with Lenly once and for all. His father called it out loud as a sacrifice they had to make. Lenly noticed Kalan's bet. Bibe shouted next to him that with eight million she could buy a lot of chicken legs and eat chicken every day. Kellen was sure that no one could beat his bet, so he shouted for everyone to go home. Yale, like a sly snake, suggested that Lenly hang up the bet to outbid Kalen and make him scared. But Lenly forbade him. He wanted to sell the sculpture for more money. The host announced Kalen's bid and started the countdown. He declared that eight million was an unprecedented price and asked for the sake of argument if there were any other bids. The crowd remained silent and he began his countdown. Eight million once, eight million twice. Suddenly someone in the crowd shouted out, Ten million! The presenter almost had a heart attack. A woman's voice loudly repeated, Ten million! It was Delia. She had also come to the auction and announced her bid with determination. All the auction participants turned around and looked at her in surprise, whispering. Someone asked if a young girl could bid. Someone asked what family she was from. Kaleen shouted in surprise, and Alice, who was next to him, gasped. They were very surprised by her. He shouted hysterically, Eleven million! But his father stopped him and explained that their family could not afford more than that. Alice stared at Delia's figure and couldn't understand who she was. Who could bet ten million? As soon as Delia placed her bet, everyone knew who she was, and her manager noticed and asked her to go back into the room. Lenly stared at her figure, and it seemed painfully familiar. Suddenly, a black-haired young man with a 99 sign appeared in the crowd and exclaimed that the sculpture was incredible, and he was betting 11 million. The cardinal almost fell off the balcony in surprise. He recognized the stranger. The king noticed the cardinal's reaction and began to peer into the crowd, looking for the one who had surprised him so much. And when he saw the young man, he also whispered in surprise, "'Why is he here?' The boy stood on his heels in the middle of the crowd and showed his sign as a sign of confirmation of the bet. He was wearing a fox coat, 
and a long, beautiful coat. He was young and handsome. The cardinal and the king exclaimed with one voice, The sleepwalker, he is here. Surprise mixed with fear on their faces. The boy said out loud with satisfaction that the sculpture was now his. He loved the process, the furore, and the result. The king could not calm down, he thought. Hadn't the sleepwalker disappeared? Why did he reappear? He was really afraid of something. They both looked at him closely and decided not to stay any longer so that the sleepwalker would not notice them. The king apologized and took his leave. Lenly was surprised by their behavior. The auctioneer frantically shouted out the bid eleven million times, eleven million two. Deline was paying attention and couldn't understand who had outbid her. She saw Lunatic and said, Of course. Her auctioneer asked her if she would hurt the feelings of the guy standing in the mortar if she continued. Grandpa Sue, don't worry. Give this note to that man, he will read it and understand, Dellen said as she handed over the note. She held the sign up high and said loudly, Twelve million? The crowd started screaming, as if everyone was going to have a heart attack from the surprise and the amount of the bet. The lunatic read the note, laughed and said that it was okay. Since it was such a big deal, he wouldn't go against her. Three. The host hit the gavel, confirming the bet. The crowd sobered up a little from the thud. The sculpture was finally sold. The presenter announced that the Leon family had won with a bid of twelve million, and Delia began to descend the stairs in victory. Yale shouted out that it was Delia, and Lenly's surprise was overwhelming. He looked at her and did not understand why, and then Kaylin's father came up to her. It was clear that he wanted to ask her manager something. He turned to Mr. Sue and asked if this lady was a member of the Leon family. But at that moment, Alice jumped up and started screaming. How could she do this, knowing how important the sculpture is to her? Why did you fight me? Alice couldn't calm down. Delia leaned over to her and said quietly, looking at her, that she didn't understand why Lenly liked Alice so much. It's none of your business, Alice told her. She could not control herself and rushed to Delia. But Delia turned away from her, reminding her that since they had broken up, they were now people from different worlds, and that she should remember that and walked away from her proudly. Lindley looked at the figure of the sleepwalker from the balcony and could not understand who he was. The sleepwalker said loudly and with satisfaction that even though he was leaving, he had seen many interesting things, and it was worth it. He left the gallery cheerfully. Lindley quickly got his money and ran as fast as he could to Jabs and burst in and called out to him. The latter was sitting motionless at his desk. With the words, I'm here, you remember our agreement. Here's your 600,000. The guy poured a pile of money onto his desk. For the killer's blade, right? Jebs asked him again. Yes, that's right. Count the money, Lenley replied. Jebs said he had one more condition. He pulled out a polished stone tile and asked Lenley to carve a signature. His request was quite remarkable. Lenley pulled out his flat blade and in no time, his signature was on the tile. Jebs stammered that he was blind and did not know that Lenley was a brilliant sculptor and apologized. The guy turned around and left with the blade. Bib the mouse asked to be allowed to sign it herself next time, and Jabs looked at the signature on the plate with satisfaction. Lenly walked away, looking at the blade and thinking that he had finally returned the family heirloom and fulfilled his father's request. Meanwhile, events were unfolding in the village of Wushan. The soldiers who were training outside noticed a group of people coming straight at them, and they pointed it out to the surprised Captain Hillman. A whole cavalry of knights was approaching them. They were coming right at them. But it was impossible to see who was riding. Suddenly, a familiar voice shouted, Uncle Hillman, I'm back! It was a jubilant Lenly. Hillman whispered in surprise. Lenly, what is it? What's going on? Seeing Hillman's astonished look, Lenly explained that the cardinals had sent these cavalrymen to protect him and asked them to come inside to talk to him. They entered the Baruch family home where every corner reminded Lenley of his joyful childhood. Then they went into the Hall of Fame. On the shelf where all the busts of deceased relatives stood, there was now a bust of Nog. Lenley knelt down and put the box containing the killer's blade on the floor and said that he had come back and brought it, so its loss was no longer a disgrace to their family. Hillman was amazed. 
He asked him loudly how he had found the blade and why he had a bunch of cavalry with him. What did you do to achieve all this? His mind was exploding. Lenly silently handed him his certificate. Hillman read it in surprise and asked him that the seven stars were proof of seventh level magic, which was the level of a two elemental magician. So did you graduate already, Lenly? You're only 17 years old, and you already have a seventh level dual elemental mage certificate. Your father would be so proud of you. It's an honor for the whole Baruch family. You're a great boy. Your father would be proud of you. Hillman could not calm down. But what is this cavalry? Does this mean you've joined the Shining Church? Asked the captain. Lenley stood up and began to explain to him that after his graduation, the cardinal came to him and offered him to join the Shining Church. But he refused. Then he received invitations from various forces who hoped that Lenley would join them. The Dark Alliance also sent people after him. And after the auction, the king of Feng Lai also wanted him to join the army. The cardinals sent cavalry to protect him on the way to Wushan village, so they didn't have to worry about other forces luring him away. Lenley concluded his story. So you've been through so much in such a short time. Wait, did you say that the king also invited you? Hillman asked again. Yes, but I want to talk about something else now. I want to know how my father died and who the enemy of the family is. The boy burst into tears and shouted for the captain to tell him everything. And Hillman began his story. It all started with an investigation into the cause of his mother's death. He and Nog found out that the year Lenley's mother was kidnapped, she was not killed immediately. The man with the spider mark was only ordered to kidnap her. The cause of her death remained a mystery, the captain said. When they decided to continue their investigation, the man with the spider mark found them and followed them around. But Master Nog knew about the properties of the spider tattoo, and it meant that they would not have escaped together. A fierce fight broke out between the unknown man and Nog, and at the end of the fight, Nog shouted at Hillman to run away. Hillman refused to leave, but Nog ordered him to do as he was told. The captain guiltily explained that he really wanted to stay and help his father, but he forced him to escape, and with tears he apologized to Lenly and added menacingly, but he had found the man who had killed his mother and father. It is the younger brother of the head of the Fung Lai kingdom, Luke Patterson. The younger brother of King Clyde? Lenly's surprise was overwhelming. So the king has invited me to join them, and his younger brother is the murderer of my parents? Lenly exploded, his eyes filled with rage. I will never forgive this, he hissed, and his fists clenched like dragon claws. I'll have my revenge. He shouted at the top of his lungs and his blood began to boil in his veins. Hillman tried to calm him down because he couldn't let the dragon's blood get out of control. He continued to tell him that because he and Nog were wearing ordinary clothes, the man with the spider tattoo could not recognize who they were. The man interrupted him and quietly asked him to help him with something. Hillman told him that he could ask for anything, because he had sworn to Nog that he would help him get revenge but Lenly asked him to give the killer's blade to his younger brother, Horton. But Horton is still training for the O'Brien Empire, Hillman replied in surprise. But Lenly didn't hear him and gave him a magic crystal card and explained that there was money on it, and it should be enough for both of them for a while. And I'll be fine on my own, Lenly concluded. Then come on, I'll show you something. Hillman answered him sadly and left the room. They went into a dilapidated room, and Hillman took out an urn among the stones, and began to say that it contained Nog's ashes. When he left them, he did not tell anyone about it. For some time, he had been secretly keeping these ashes. And now that Lenly had returned, the boy had to decide what to do with them, and he gave it to Lenly. Lenly took it in his hands and walked silently to a flowering Sakura tree, where he scattered his father's ashes at its roots and covered them with earth. The boy put up a memorial sign where he had engraved his father's name and surname with his own hand. He cried bitterly. He told Hillman that he would mourn his father for seven days, and Hillman left in silence. The cavalry approached the boy and asked if they could now return to the Shining Church, because Cardinal Guillermo was waiting for them. The boy let them go, as he did not want to meet anyone during the mourning period, and continued to sit by the tombstone. The cavalry sent a letter to the cardinal about Nog's death and Lenly's mourning. 
The cardinal was shocked when he read the letter. At the same time, King Feng Lai also received a letter about Nog's death and ordered everyone to gather for the funeral in Wuxian village. His servant could not understand why he would go to the old poor family. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Delin was sitting on the bed. She felt that something had happened to Lenly and couldn't sleep. She quickly got dressed and ordered the carriage to be ready. It was already late at night outside. Delin sat in the carriage and thought bitterly why God was punishing Lenly by sending him trouble all the time. He must be strong. The news of Nog's death spread throughout Wushan village, and people were shocked and desperate. Lenly, when he was in mourning, remembered how he and his father were in the ancestral hall. At that time, his father had tested him for dragon blood and told him their family's secret, and Lenly remembered everything in detail. When Lenly was in mourning, he spent the night in a small building near the Sakura tree with his father's grave. He found a tattered book there, and at night he read the secret dragon blood training manual and began to train. Reading and repeating all kinds of spells, he could feel the dragon's blood in his veins. After training for seven days, he became much stronger and felt like a dragon 100%. He also learned to control the blood in his body and to dragonize properly. Lenly had perfected his skills. Bibi the mouse looked at him with delight and said that after the transformation, Lenly's dragon-like smell became even stronger. And then Delin finally appeared, and she slyly asked the boy how he planned his revenge. But it was her advice that he asked for. Beb suggested that she should deal with Patterson herself for Lenly, and then it would all be over. But the boy replied that there was no need to hurry because Patterson was the younger brother of the king, and it would most likely be difficult to deal with him. And given his abilities, it would be difficult to fight him. Delin noticed that Lenly began to speak like an adult thinking person. Delin, after analyzing all the circumstances, said that it was not a good idea to ask someone for help. But the Shining Church appreciated Lenly, and so it would not be a big problem to get close to Patterson. Having dealt with the king, the boy could easily get close to Patterson. But he had to be very careful. Lenly stood in the form of a dragon and said that everything was right. The main thing was to get close to Patterson. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. Lenly was surprised to think that it was already midnight, and who could come, and he was completely dragonized. Quickly returning to his previous form, he opened the door and saw Delia there. He was very surprised. Delia looked into his eyes and finally calmed down. Lenly was alive and well. She told him that she had heard that Noga's father had died, but seeing him alive finally calmed her down. Lenly thanked her for her emotions and asked if she needed anything. Delia smiled and said that she could just come and see him, but there was something else. And she began to say that there were only eight months left until the end of the decade, according to the Yulan calendar. There is always a festival on the first day of the year on the Yulan mainland, and Leon's family orders her to return to her family before the festival starts. The kingdom of Yulan is very far away from the Holy Union, and this journey will probably take about a year, and tomorrow she will go to her family, Delia whispered sadly. So we probably won't be able to see each other for a long time, maybe never. Delia broke down in tears. Lenly was shocked by her story. They both stood there in silence, and the room was completely silent. Well, then I guess I'll go, she said quietly. Lenly asked her if he could hug her before she left. Dylan was silent, so he silently walked over to her and hugged her. She was an important person to him, and had done many good things for him. The girl was touched and thanked Lenly for everything, and she became a little happy. But Babba the Mouse hissed that no one could touch her boss. Dellen turned around and quietly walked across the courtyard to her carriage. The boy stood there and silently watched her go. He was distracted from his sad thoughts by Bebe, who shouted that she wanted to cuddle with him too. The guy threw a towel at her and told her to go to bed. He was in a bad mood. After seven days of mourning, Lenly returned to the Shining Church with the cavalry. Guillermo personally came out to meet him and asked him if he had thought about joining them. Lenly hesitated for a moment and told him that he was still very young, but he planned to, uh, to serve the king, he said with all his might. Guillermo was surprised and said that the capital of the kingdom and the Shining Church was Feng Lai, and the king obeys the orders of the Shining Church, 
which means that the boy refuses an invitation to a high position and chooses a lower one. Lenly told him that he understood, but the cardinal thought to himself that it didn't matter. The main thing was that Lenly had decided to join the Shining Church. V put his hands on his shoulders and kindly told him that this was a very important decision, and that he was now considered part of their church, and asked if Lenly had learnt any spells above the seventh level. Lenly replied that he had not learnt such spells, but had learnt the technique of flying through the principles of magic at the academy. Guillermo replied that the technique was not that complicated, and that the fact that he had learnt it by hovering was also good, but he reassured him and promised to get books on air and earth magic. The boy was amazed because it would be a great gift. He told the cardinal that he had once read a description of the power of the wind element in a book that said that the power of magic increases with level, especially single-target spells, and that it was the best of the elements, the ninth-level spell Wasteland Destruction, and the forbidden spell Spatial Rift proving it. He thanked Lord Guillermo, and Delon, who was sitting in the ring, squeaked out that Lenly was very lucky. Guillermo smiled and told him to wait until they returned to Fenlai, and he would immediately order Clyde to make Lenly a marquee and provide him with a large house. As he was getting dressed, Guillermo added that Lenly should concentrate on his training and not think about trifles, and then in fifty years the Shining Church would have another strong saint-level magician. Lenly listened to him and thought that fifty years was a very long time. He would not be able to avenge his father and find out his mother's whereabouts. Meanwhile, in the palace hall of Feng Lai City, all the residents and nobles had gathered, and King Clyde stood in the middle of the stage. He announced to everyone that today the king had important news for everyone. And Clyde announced that from now on, the youngest dual elemental mage in all of Yulin would be Lenly, and he would now serve their country. Lenly knelt before him on one knee. He was very handsome and dressed in a festive outfit. The king put a sword on his shoulder and announced that Lenly Baruch was promoted to the rank of Marquis. Babe the Mouse, who was hiding under the cloak, looked at the sword in shock and grumbled, How dare the king put a sword on her boss? Lenly reassured her that it was just a ceremony. The king loudly thanked Lenly for his service to the kingdom and appointed him court magician, which he was very happy about. Lenly thanked him sincerely and the room was silent. And then the king noticed that his servants were whispering, and he asked them what their problems were, or if anyone might not like his decision. Everyone fell silent in an instant. He turned to Lenly again, telling him that he could not return to Dawson's conglomerate, and that he had prepared a nice quiet house for him. Lenly again thanked him sincerely. Suddenly, someone's luxurious carriage pulled up outside the castle. A stranger came into the hall and said, Who is this Lenly, whom my brother has made a marquis? and Lenly saw King Patterson's brother. He realized that this was the king's younger brother and the murderer of his unfortunate parents. Beeb the Mouse also heard all this and understood everything, and screaming, she ran towards Patterson and Lenly barely managed to stop her, but because she was invisible to him, only some unknown wind blew past Pattinson. It's not time yet, Lenly whispered quietly to her, holding the hysterical girl by the tail and he went to get into his new carriage. After a while, he arrived at the magnificent small castle that the king had given him as a new marquee. On the threshold of the castle, Maid stood and greeted him. Bebe looked and wondered how big the castle was. It looks like Clyde spoils you a lot. Delon giggled from her ring. Lenly told her that the things in front of him belonged to his enemy, and he would not forget his goals. Suddenly, he saw Kaelin's father. He came over and greeted him. The man began to congratulate the boy and told him what a coincidence it was that their family mansion was also on the same street and not far from Lenly's house, and that he should definitely come and visit them. Lenly was very surprised that the Deb's mansion was so close by. Kalen's father continued that Lenly's house was much bigger than theirs, and that the king used to stay here all the time. The man looked at the boy and thought that he hadn't seen him for a long time, and he had really changed a lot. After Lenly was given the title of Marquis, he became a title higher than the Debs family. Suddenly, Lenly's surprised gaze fell behind Bernard's back, and he was amazed to see the figure of Alice standing there, looking at him in surprise. 
noticing that he had become completely different. Just then, Kalen approached and realized that the enemies had crossed paths again. Bibe couldn't stand it any longer and started shouting that he was an ungrateful brute, because he had forgotten how he had been rescued in the mountains and how dare he say such things about her boss. But Kalen didn't hear her, but he noticed how angrily she was glaring at him. Lenly turned to Bernard and said that he was leaving now and would not bother him again. And he turned and left. Alice looked at his back and thought sadly that Lenly had not said a word to her. The guy returned to his new luxurious home. For a while, his life would now be here. He decided to start training again and started by restoring the gravity field and doing handstands. I must train more in the gravity field and then my skills will grow thought Lenly as he stood on his hands and broke out in a sweat. Suddenly, Dellen said that someone was in the room. Who is it? Lenly shouted. A frightened maid was standing in the doorway, holding a tray of tea and fruit, and she dropped everything in her fright. When she regained her composure, she greeted him with a bow and explained that she was doing her job and brought him something to eat. Lenly was surprised to pick up the fallen apple. He had completely forgotten that he now had a servant. Well, if there's nothing else important, then don't bother me and you can go, replied Lenly to the maid. And screaming, the Bibe went outside to train. Lenly flew out the window. He took out his new sword and continued to train hard to learn how to manifest his purple dragon blood faster. He swung that sword like a madman, increasing his speed each time. And the sound of its slashing could be heard in the air. Then he began to chop stones with all his might, which were scattered into the rubble around him. He paused for a moment and shifted his grip on his sword, thinking that purple blood was an unusual weapon. Depending on its aura, the blade could really become flexible or hard as stone. And then he noticed a figure behind the lantern. It was the frightened maid again, afraid to speak a word. She stammered and said that the cardinals had come to see the master, and they wanted to see him. Lenly was surprised because he had not expected them, and his training was interrupted again. Angry, he left leaving the maid to collect her emotions. When he entered the room, he saw Guillermo sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. When he saw him, he said that he had heard that he had done well in recent days. Lenly looked at him in surprise because he hadn't expected to see him here, and Guillermo continued that he was either training or making sculptures, and he missed that kind of leisure time and was even jealous of him. He went on to say that although art has a high price, a person's value is determined by their abilities. The Debs family, who live not far away, are richer than he is, but also weaker. So he ordered his guard to open the wooden box he was holding. The guard obeyed the order, and Lenly saw two huge golden books in the box. Guillermo commented on his surprise, for he had said that he would give him books on higher-level spells. These two books are on the elements of fire and earth, and they are yours now. They are real tomes of higher-level magic, Guillermo replied. Lenly couldn't get over his shock. He thought this would be great. Spells and spellcasting techniques are very important, and even with great mental strength, it is impossible to cast a high-level spell without knowledge. Guillermo looked at the boy with satisfaction and wished him success in improving his skills. The boy got down on one knee and thanked the cardinal for such a valuable gift to which the cardinal laughed and explained that marquises do not kneel. The cardinal left the large group of soldiers and went about his business. Delan emerged from the ring and enthused that, now that Lenly's wonderful books were available, it wouldn't take long to learn some powerful new spells. We're even closer to our goal, the girl kept saying. Lenly told her that it was true, but she shouldn't lose her focus because Patterson was the king's younger brother, and he wouldn't get away with killing him. At this point, Bibi the Mouse started to scream because she heard that Patterson was going to visit Lenly. Lenly took her in his arms and calmed her down, explaining that Patterson was in charge of the king's finances and was just paying a visit for show. Suddenly, an unknown blast wave hit Lenly's body. He could not understand who was next to him. He ran outside and could not understand what was happening. Lenly saw smoke where the cardinal's soldiers had been standing and couldn't believe that the cavalry, which consisted of fifth-level mages, had been defeated by someone so easily. Dylan shouted at the boy to stay away from the smoke and close his eyes. He was some kind of unusual guy. 
and Lenly decided to dive into the water of the pond next to the house. While he was bubbling in the water, he wondered what this strange smoke was and what kind of magic it was. The whole sky above the lake was covered with black smoke, and the unfamiliar warriors were already here. Suddenly one of the black warriors appeared in the smoke. He had a skeletal face and his whole outfit was black. Lenly was lying at the bottom of the lake and saw it all. He counted five strangers in black, but he did not know who they were because he had never seen them. He remembered that the church guards who were guarding him were level five, but they could not do anything against the strangers. Dylan emerged from the ring and explained to him that the knights were most likely killed by hypnosis magic, and so they were unable to use the battle aura to protect themselves from the smoke in time. Lenly thought that he had to be very careful. After all, he would meet the same fate as the guards. Meanwhile, one of the strangers shouted that he should kill Lenly at any cost. Hearing this, Lenly decided to join the battle, but to take the form of a dragon. His dragonization began. Turning into a dragon, he flew out of the lake with a roar. The strangers did not expect to see a dragon here. The boy caught up with one of the strangers and struck the first blow. Being in the body of a dragon, his striking power increased several times. His hands, which had turned into dragon claws, tore the strangers apart one by one, his incredible fury helping him to keep up his pace. Watching the black strangers fall one by one, he deliberately tore his arm open. The last of the five strangers looked at the whole trash and couldn't believe how this was possible. The information they had been given about Lenly was a lie. Lenly stopped in midair for a moment, and it was clear that a new plan of action was ready. One of the black warriors shouted the blade spell, and they instantly received weapons. Lenly also wasted no time in casting a spell of jade armor, just in case. He looked at the strangers and thought that most of them were level eight warriors, so his armor should be enough for the fight. With the spell Purple Blood, he activated the action of the flexible sword, and it glowed with purple light. He took off to attack the last three warriors swiftly slicing and piercing their bodies in mid-air. He moved with ease in the air, delivering deadly blows, and the warriors fell to the ground one by one. The last warrior looked at his companions and shouted in horror that indeed this sword was very sharp and fast. Lenly noticed him and started his hunt again. Delin whispered in his ear, to strengthen the purple blood vata. Lenly needed to use the dragon blood aura but activating the dragon blood aura was not as fast as activating the wind element magic. The last warrior flew into the air and shouted that Lenly was stronger than they thought, and since he had joined the Shining Church, he must be eliminated. Flying as close to the boy as possible, he shouted shine. Lenly looked into his eyes in surprise and thought it must be the magic of hypnosis, and the boy began to fall helplessly, losing his height. The black warrior was laughing with satisfaction to the whole sky. It seemed to him that everything had worked out. And then something incredible happened that surprised them both. Fury the Mouse flew up into the sky and bit into the Black Warrior's stomach, who was not expecting such a surprise. Before the attack, she transformed into a Beast Mouse. And thanks to her master and his dragon blood, she was the strongest Beast Mouse on the continent. The Black Warrior fell helplessly to the ground, dying, and managed to say that this was impossible that he, a level 8 warrior, could not defend himself against a level 4 shadow mouse. After recovering from the battle, everyone heard someone approaching. Dylan could see that it was the allies of the guards, and they certainly didn't expect Lenly to deal with the Dark Alliance assassins alone, she said. Lenly quickly shouted redragonization and slashed at his arm again. The guards had already approached Lenly and asked if he was okay. Guillermo was walking quickly behind them, and he turned and asked if Lenly was injured. Guillermo explained that he was running errands and heard some strange loud noises coming from the area. Lenly showed his wounds on his arms and said that they were not critical and thanked him for his concern. There were two long, deep cuts on his arms. Guillermo looked at them and began to tell him information about the killers. Looking at their corpses, he explained that they were level eight killers. And he thought to himself, how could Lenly have defeated and killed them if he was a seventh-level dual elemental mage, and it was impossible for him to do so? Guillermo really didn't understand it, but he didn't question the boy either. 
he told Lenly that he would send someone to clean the yard of his house. Babe the Mouse looked at Lenly pitifully and asked him why he had cut his hand. She adored her master. Nellin quietly reassured her and said that the boy had done it most likely to hide the truth about his abilities. And it was true because until the time came to show everyone his power of purple blood and dragon blood, but to avoid unwanted problems, you have to hide your abilities, especially when your opponent is Patterson, Lenly answered them both. Meanwhile, other events were unfolding in the Shining Church. An unknown gray-haired cardinal said, So you're saying that Lenly has defeated all the assassins of the Dark Alliance? Guillermo stood in front of the stranger and bowed and replied that it was true, Father, and that Lenly's abilities were enough to allow him to finish the fight with only minor injuries. The father was surprised to hear that the people of the Dark Cult were taken care of, but Lenly was left with injuries. He then asked Guillermo again, that the Shadow Clan knew that Lenly was a seventh-level two-element mage, and do you think they would have attacked him if they had known that? Guillermo answered that the assassins who attacked Lenly were not weak. They were good at dark hypnosis magic. Lenly's skills are great, and he is working hard. In fifty years he will become a saint-level magician. But it is hard to say anything now if he becomes one of them. I hope Lenly can get better training and better protection, I think he should train with Lord Lao, Guillermo said politely. Lao? asked the Holy Father in surprise. Ask Lao himself first, he said, thinking that Lao has legendary power for the entire Yulan continent. And this is a good candidate. Everything will be done right away. Guillermo bowed and left. Father stood there motionless and thought, Did Len Li really single-handedly deal with the Shadow Clan assassins? Baruch. The Baruch family was one of the four families of warriors, dragon blood warriors. Meanwhile, Lenly was sitting in the middle of his kinata, in great pain. His wounds from the purple blood were very painful and were not healing well. Baby the mouse brought him some medicine and reported to the procession bowing. Lenly sat and thought that Guillermo knew he was attacked, and he wouldn't have sent anyone if they weren't important to him. He must have suspected something. So the guy decided to pay a visit to the cardinal and got into a carriage and drove away. He wanted to play a little trick on the cardinal. When he arrived, the cardinal came out to meet him with a smile. He was really glad to see him. Linley noticed a very thin and strange old man next to him and asked who he was. Guillermo introduced the old man as a devotee of the Shining Lao Church. Babe the Mouse was very surprised to hear that this was the legendary Lao, and he was even thinner than the other ascetics. And then Lao jumped towards Lenly and grabbed his hand with lightning speed. It happened so fast that the guy didn't even have time to blink. It was very strange because Lenly was a strong warrior. But he could not say thank you and was so easily grabbed by some weak old man. What are you going to do? The boy shouted. And Lao silently ran his finger over his wound. In an instant it healed and disappeared. And Lenly's eyes became square. Lao bowed to him and quietly said that he had healed his wounds. He was truly legendary. Grandpa asked if he was really Lenly. Guillermo said he was very talented. Lenly confirmed that he was. And then Lao suddenly said that he would not train him. Everyone around him looked at him in surprise. After all, he only trains people with a good heart and a pure soul, but he... And looked deep into Lenly's soul with his eyes. And he went on to say that his desire to kill was too strong. Listening to him... Lenly thought that this old man was very insightful, because he never forgot about avenging his parents. He's always thinking about how to kill Patterson, and that must be what's making him so eager to kill. And the guy said that if that was the case, he was going home, and he left in silence. Shocked, Guillermo apologized to Lau for the boy's behavior, explaining that he was only seventeen and asking him to forgive him as well. Lau replied that it was okay. It meant that Lenly could be independent in making his own decisions. But he went on to tell him that people like Lenly were becoming a terrible weapon for the Shining Church, and that in the future he might become a praetor of the church tribunal, so Lao's training would not be suitable for him. But the old man added that Guillermo shouldn't worry about finding a teacher. A strong personality will find his way to success, because Guillermo is also a ninth-level archmage, and he can achieve success on his own, rather than from his guidance. Meanwhile, Lenly finally got home and lay exhausted on his bed trying to sleep. 
the mouse also lying next to him. Someone knocked on his door again, and when he opened it, he saw a maid bringing several invitations from the Debs family and asking him to look at them. The boy was quite surprised. Linley read the invitation carefully and thought about something. Baby the mouse grumbled that she hated the old man and asked Lenny not to go. Linley thought about the invitation. He had received quite a few of them, and he couldn't just throw them away, so he decided to dress more formally and go. He put on his new outfit and decided to go. Half an hour later, Lenley was already at the gates of the Debs' house. Bernard came out to meet him personally and greeted him with a warm greeting. Lindley stood there, dressed nicely and sincerely thanked Bernard for the last invitation. Bernard said that accepting Lenley's invitation was a great honor for their family, and he thought to himself angrily that Lenley had dressed as a marquis to emphasize that he was now a marquis. And in accordance with the rules of etiquette, he bowed and invited them in. Dellen sarcastically said that Bernard was trying to get closer to Lenley, and although he didn't like him, he had invited him in today, and she thought that Bernard would suffer emotionally for a long time. They all went into the hall together, and suddenly two people started to come down the stairs, Alice and Kalen. In the crowd of guests, everyone began to whisper how beautiful they were, but finally the heroes of the occasion came into view. Alice, who had been looking down at her feet, looked up and was amazed to see Lenley and thought, Is it really him? She thought he wouldn't come, like the previous times. Lindley also followed the pair of eyes in surprise, focusing his gaze on the girl. The girl looked down bitterly, her good mood seemingly blown away, her heart feeling very bad, as she walked down the stairs with Kaylin by her side. She thought that Lenley was now training with the support of the Shining Church because everyone was talking about him. She was bitterly sorry for everything. Because of his sculpture, the Debs family had never fully accepted her. But the boy was really great and she had really loved him once. And the party began. The waiters were scurrying around with drinks and food, and all the guests were chatting away. Lenley was really bored. Mouse Baby was constantly whining about chicken legs that didn't exist, and he sat down on the sofa and took a little nap. Suddenly his nap was interrupted by an unfamiliar voice calling out to him, and the boy opened his eyes to see a familiar face. Duke Patterson was leaning over him. So you're Lenley, we've met before, how's the party going? Duke blurted out. The guy almost shouted out loud that he was the enemy of their family. Frightened, Dellen managed to shout out to Lenley that it wasn't time yet. Surprised, Duke looked at the furious Lenley and could not understand what was happening to him. Lenley, having stopped in time, decided to play a trick and offered Duke a drink of wine and handed him a glass. Patterson cheerfully raised his glass and said, To your health and quickly drank it. Then he asked the young man if he liked parties like this. Lenley replied that he didn't. Then he quickly added that the party was okay, but he wasn't used to them yet. Duke leaned over and quietly told him not to go anywhere after the party because he wanted to discuss something with him. After a while, Lenley quietly went outside, waiting for Patterson, who for some reason was not there. Suddenly, a hunchbacked servant came up to him and told him that Duke was waiting for him and asked him to follow him. Lindley followed him and after a while asked where he was being taken. The hunchbacked servant came to a shed and explained that Duke had told him to go around the back so that no one would see them and knocked on the door, saying that they had already arrived. Patterson opened the door and invited Lanley in. He pulled out his knife, just in case, and told Lindley not to worry about anything because he just didn't want anyone to know they were meeting. Baby the Mouse said in his ear, frightened that the man looked quite cruel. They went into a spacious room with a table and two chairs in the middle and a fireplace burning. It looked like a secret meeting room, and Duke said not to worry. He told Bernard to prepare the room, but he didn't tell him who he was going to meet with, and the servant who accompanied him was dead so no one would know. Noticing the boy's surprised eyes, Duke explained that there was no other way out, because their homes were dangerous, with so many eyes, so it was not the best place to talk. Indeed, all my activities are hidden from the eyes of the Shining Church, thought Lenley. Patterson put a crystal card on the table and said, There's ten million here. And he explained that since he had become responsible for the kingdom's finances, he had been smuggling. 
and all this time he had been hiding it well. But recently, recently the scale of the contraband being smuggled by a certain family was a little bit big, and it looks like Clyde has noticed. What do I have to do with smuggling? asked a surprised Lenly. He had everything to do with it, because he knew his brother would stop it without hesitation, Duke explained. Baby and Dellen could not understand Lenly's attitude to this, either. I need you to tell the young master of the Dawson conglomerate to come and cover me and the team at the right time, because I know you're good friends, Patterson shouted. Lenly asked him in surprise if he was talking about Yale. At the same time, he thought that this bastard wanted to do something to Yale. Duke replied that he was talking about Yale, and if Lenly helped him, the ten million was his. The guy gritted his teeth in anger. But Patterson continued to say that even if Clyde did reveal him, he would do nothing because of the power of the Dawson conglomerate, and even the Shining Church would not dare to do anything to Yale because of some smuggling. Lindley's patience was shattered and he shouted the spell Dragon Transformation and quickly transformed into a dragon. Patterson's tongue was taken away except for the words, Dragon. He could not say anything. It seemed that he was numb. Lindley straightened up to his full height and faced his sworn enemy. He was determined. So you're a dragon-blooded warrior? Patterson muttered in fright, still not believing what he had seen, and then started running for the door. But Lenly threw Duke away from her with one flick of his long tail, and he fell to the floor with a thud. The boy angrily approached Patterson and put his clawed hands on his throat. Patterson, do you have any idea how much I hate you? Lenly hissed, looking him straight in the eye. What are you really, a spy? Please, spare me. I won't tell anyone. Duke screamed, breaking out in a cold sweat as Lenly squeezed his throat tighter and tighter. Lenly continued to tell him calmly that he had one chance, but that Duke had to answer his questions. Baby the Mouse screamed that no one would be spared. Twelve or thirteen years ago, did you give the order to capture the woman? Lenly asked, bending down even lower. Patterson had no idea what he was talking about. But he repeated the words, twelve or thirteen years after the boy and tried to remember something. After a minute, he started shouting that he couldn't remember anything from those years. But Lenly persisted in reminding him that it was a woman who had just given birth to a child and was walking to the hotel from a shining church. And he began to describe the appearance of his young mother, whom he knew only from her last portrait. Patterson shrieked that he really couldn't remember anything, but in his mind he remembered the incident long ago, and that it was a terrible secret and he couldn't tell. Dellen, who was hanging next to the boy, said that he shouldn't believe him, because it was clear from his reaction that Duke knew something. Lindley closed his hands around Patterson's throat with all his might, and he began to plead and shout out that he remembered everything. The guy took his hands away, and Duke coughed and begged him not to kill him because he would tell everything. Lindley graciously promised him. Patterson began to tell him that the incident actually happened about twelve or thirteen years ago. He went to the Shining Church with some of Fung Lai's nobles and saw the woman Lenly had described and sent someone to capture her. You bastard! Lenly shouted. But Patterson started shouting that he hadn't planned anything but was following orders about her. Lenly asked, shocked, whose orders were these? From my brother, the current king of Fen Lai Clyde, Duke said quietly. And at that moment, Lenly remembered Clyde in all his mannerisms and beauty. The boy was shocked. Duke continued that as far as he knew. Clyde valued Lenly's mother very much. And he told him that if anyone found out about this incident, he would die. Deline listened intently and told Lenly that he was probably telling the truth because she could feel the vibrations of his soul. Patterson rushed to Lenly and fell to his knees, asking him to spare him as he had promised, for he had told the whole truth. Lenly calmly told him that he would keep his promise and not kill him. Patterson breathed a sigh of relief. He turned around and started running towards the door, laughing as if he had gone mad. Lenly turned to the mouse and shouted, Baby! And the mouse flew out after Patterson, screaming that it understood. When Baby flew out into the street, she transformed into a beast caught up with Patterson and killed him in cold blood. I promise not to kill you, but I didn't speak for my partner, Lenly said quietly. Delin was disturbed and said that this murder was a little confusing to her. 
Because Duke Patterson's status is very important, and if Clyde finds out why he died, then Lenly will be exposed. Well, then let's make him disappear, Lenly shouted and began to transform again. He shouted a loud spell of the wind element destroying wind and lifted Patterson's corpse into the air, where the wind began to accelerate, which tore Duke's body into microscopic pieces. Then, Lenly shouted a wind elemental flight technique spell and began to fly away, explaining to the frightened baby that they had to hurry back to the party so that no one would notice their absence. Mouse reminded him that his clothes were torn to shreds after the transformation, so he had to change in time. Lenly agreed with her. Meanwhile, in the castle of the Fung Lai Kingdom, the king called all the guests to the celebration of that day. Standing in front of all the guests in a magnificent suit, Clyde said that at first he didn't want to alarm anyone, but because of the disappearance of his younger brother Patterson, he was forced to gather everyone. The investigation showed that Duke last appeared at the party at the Debs' house, and the last people who could see him were four, namely Bernard, Lenly, and two other nobles. All of them stood before Clyde's eyes. Dellen whispered to the boy not to worry, because Patterson had told them about his relationship with the others, so no one would think anything of him. And even if Clyde wanted to punish him, he would need the approval of the church. Clyde glared at everyone and shouted that he wanted to know who had seen Patterson last. Bernard began to shout hysterically that he had left the party very early and knew nothing about it. It was obvious that he was very nervous. The man was thinking about that night. After Lenly had left, Bernard went into the barn, where the light was on and the door was open for some reason. Near the door he saw Patterson's ring, which he looked at for a long time. He wondered how it could be that its owner was not there, and how it could have slipped off his finger. Terrible thoughts came into his head. He thought that Clyde must have found out about their ore smuggling, and that's why he had disappeared. Everyone took turns assuring the king that none of them knew anything about the night's incident. Clyde looked at Bernard sternly and told him not to be so nervous he would not blame an innocent man. While the case was being investigated, he learned that Patterson was smuggling, and he was doing it with a noble family. One was managing his finances, and the other was one of his courtiers, and they dared to steal the wealth of the Fung Lai kingdom behind his back, and he was not going to put up with it. Clyde was very angry. Bernard fell to his knees in despair and shouted that he was loyal and devoted to the kingdom, and that this was rather a mistake. Clyde listened to him calmly, and added that he promised not to accuse anyone unreasonably. But Bernard, and the king looked him in the eye angrily. He continued that he would not let this go, and he would find out who had betrayed the kingdom. The king had guessed it all. Dellen quietly warned Lenly to be careful, because if Clyde punished Bernard, he might be next. But at that time, the boy began to secretly create magic to be on the safe side. He whispered a seventh-level elemental invocation. The king announced to everyone that to decide whether the Debs family was guilty, he invited witnesses, and two entered the room. They were the servants Lanmour and Lance, who had served Bernard for many years. They began to testify. One of them said that Lord Patterson and Bernard thought that the king had found out about their smuggling and wanted to get protection in the Dawson conglomerate. Another servant added that he had heard that Duke Patterson had secretly met with someone during a party in honor of the Debs family's engagement. The king asked in surprise, Is it the Dawson conglomerate? Then it turns out that the person Patterson met was on good terms with the Dawson conglomerate? The two noblemen standing with Lenly and Bernard were very surprised by what they heard and saw. Clyde asked Bernard menacingly why he was reacting like that. If he hadn't done anything, why be so nervous? Is the power of the Dawson conglomerate so strong that it can influence his courtiers? And of all those present here, only Lenly remains absolutely calm. The king finished his monologue, pointing to the boy. Lenly stood there thinking that he was actually in a cold sweat and it was a challenge to stay calm. Bebe the mouse quietly asked him if the king was scolding him or praising him. Bernard became hysterical, fell to his knees again and shouted that the king could not blame his family, who had been loyal to the kingdom for many years, because of some incomprehensible servants he demanded fair justice.
The king came up to him and said that to find out whether the Debs family was really loyal to him, they would use evidence. But he would give them a chance, or at least not punish his family right now. And then he shouted for the guards to seize Bernard and his Debs family heirs and put them in the Blackwater's prison. And he handed over the investigation into the Debs family's clan smuggling case to Prime Minister Merritt. Prime Minister Merritt stood by and looked at the king in surprise. Clyde exclaimed that everyone was free to go. Blinley got into his carriage and drove away. And in about five minutes he saw the Debs house, with the king's guard standing outside. The boy looked at them carefully and the servant noticed and asked if he should stop. But Lenley ordered him to go home. Meanwhile, the king's guards entered Debsey's house, and Caelan and Alice came out to meet them, and the soldiers made them kneel and ordered them to be silent. Alice whispered, What's going on? And they took her fiancé away. Alice fell helplessly on the bed in tears and cried bitterly. The maid who ran to her mistress asked if she needed anything. She asked if she knew what had happened to her family. The maid replied that Alice had to believe no matter what. Alice asked her how she could save him. She replied that she had an idea. In the meantime, the chief guard announced that the king had his own orders, according to which the Debs family was suspected of smuggling water jade spheres, so the head of the family and his heir were immediately sent to the Blackwater's prison. Hearing all this, Alice fell into a stupor and her eyes filled with tears. The guards grabbed Callan and began to take him out of the house. He shouted to Uncle Nimitz and Alice to save him. That night, the news of the Debs family's suspicions and smuggling of water jade spheres spread throughout Fung Lai, and even the boy selling newspapers shouted as if it were the news of the year. One of the newspapers was read by Alice's maid, and she read about the terrible incident. Callan's Uncle Nimitz decided to go to Prime Minister Merritt. When he arrived, he began to prove that their family had been slandered. He pulled out a magic crystal card and said that he wanted to give him a small gift to help him deliver justice. The VIP asked him pitifully what he thought about it. Looking at the card in his hands, Merritt ordered the card to be placed on the table and said that he had seen a very beautiful girl at Debs's house and her name was Alice, right? Could he talk to her alone? Merritt asked his uncle. The uncle whispered in amazement that this was Kaylin's fiance but he thought that if it would save his brother and nephew, it didn't matter. Nimitz returned home in silence, and a frightened Alice came out to meet him. Her uncle told her about the Prime Minister's wishes, and she surprisingly told him that she was Callan's fiancé and why she should go there. Nimitz told her that Callan's life was now in her hands. But in the late afternoon, the girl decided that she had to go to the Prime Minister. She put on her coat and left thinking on the way that her fiancé's life really depended on her. After a while, Alice approached the Prime Minister's house, and he personally came out to her and said, My beauty, you came after all. Alice was trembling inside. Merritt walked towards her, saying, Beautiful girl, welcome to my home. But suddenly Alice pulled out her little dagger and hid it quietly in the fabric of her skirt. The Prime Minister told her that he had been waiting for her, and invited her to sit down. Alice replied sharply that her fiancé, Kalen, had been wrongly convicted and that the Debs family had nothing to do with smuggling. Merritt pretended not to hear her and offered her some red wine, saying it was the best wine in the kingdom and poured her a glass. Alice stormed out, very unnerved by Merritt's behavior, and asked what he wanted in return for the release of the Debs family. The Prime Minister coldly replied that he wanted Alice to break off her engagement to Kalan. The girl's hair stood on end. And in return, you will become my wife, Merritt continued to say. No way. The girl exploded, and she lunged at him with a dagger but only managed to cut his cloak. The man coughed and replied that she really thought she could hurt him with a knife. Alice, don't overestimate yourself. The girl quickly cast an earth elemental spell and hit the prime minister with it. The next spell Alice cast was rubble, and a pile of sharp gravel flew towards Merritt but unfortunately did not do much damage to him. He laughed and called her magic very simple and unable to harm him. He grabbed the girl's hands and started shouting that she had no choice but to accept his offer because she had no choice. He started shaking her, and then he added something to make sure she didn't forget about his relationship with Lenly. Merritt was very angry at her refusal. Really, Lenly? Alice thought in surprise. The boy was now the most famous person close to the king, 
Suddenly, the Prime Minister sat down heavily. The rubble still hurt him and said that Alice shouldn't be angry with him. He was just laughing at her a little. Everything inside the girl exploded from such impudence. Well, if that's the case, then I'm leaving, she exclaimed and turned around and left. Merritt threw his legs up on the table, drank the wine down his throat and cursed. Damn, Lenly. The girl returned to the Deb's house without incident. Once at home, she recalled her conversation with the maid when she told her that she had a plan to free the owners of the house. She called the maid in and asked her about her plan. She told her that she needed to ask the most famous person in Feng Lai, Lenly, for help. Meanwhile in Lenly's house, Bibi the mouse was eating the twentieth chicken leg of the day and wailing that her boss was working very hard, meditating and training, but she slyly whispered that if his training ended, so would her legs. Lenly, in the body of a dragon, was training hard and learning new fighting tricks. He turned around and struck a tree with his claws and broke the branch on which Bebe was sitting, who almost choked to death from fright. Dellen asked him to take a break. The boy asked her if he had a chance of defeating Clyde with his abilities if he fought him. The girl reminded him that Clyde was a ninth-ranked warrior, and there was a big difference between them, even if they were. And then they heard the maid screaming again hysterically shouting that a girl named Alice had come to see them. She saw the dragon's hand on Lenly's arm, which he did not have time to hide. And with that, the dragon fainted. Lenly shouted re-dragonization and the dragon's scales and claws disappeared. In the guest room of the house, Alice was sitting in an armchair, praying for some reason. Lenly came in and exclaimed that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. The girl ran to him in tears. The boy did not expect such a reaction from her. She fell on her knees in front of him and began to beg him to help. Lenly, please, you have to help the Debs family. Intercede with the king and prove that they are innocent, I beg you. Alice fell to the floor and cried bitterly. Lenly was shocked and silent, and Beeb the Mouse began to get angry that Alice had insulted her boss earlier, and now she was begging for help. Lenly asked Alice if she could prove their innocence. And why do you think they are not guilty in that case? He asked the girl. Alice looked at him in shock. She hadn't expected such a question and thought that maybe Lenly didn't want to help the Debs family. And she told him that she knew she shouldn't have come and asked for help because it must have hurt him. She thought that Lenly would not want to help this family and she ran out the door in tears. Suddenly the boy shouted at her to stop. He said that he had no right to decide whether the Debs family was guilty or not. But since she had come here, he was not going to stand by and watch. There's just a limit to what I can do, and I can't promise you that I'm going to save them, Lenly continued. But I will get ready and meet the king, and you go home, the boy finished. And tears of joy flowed down Alice's cheeks, and she quickly left. B, the mouse started shouting how her boss was going to help Alice. If she were in his place, she would just throw her out. Dellen couldn't stand this screaming and caught her by the tail and said that it looked like Lenly had become a real man and his childhood was over. Lenly thought to himself that he had agreed to help for his own reasons. He needed to find out the circumstances of his parents' disappearance, and he needed to take every chance he could to get close to Clyde. Dellen went on to say that he couldn't fight Clyde yet, because he wasn't at that level yet. This made the boy gloomy. He told the servant to get the carriage ready and went to visit King Clyde. Arriving at the king's house, Lenly found him in the library, choosing books. The servant came in and majestically announced that Lenly had arrived. The king ordered him to come in and gave him an evil smile. Lenly entered the library and greeted him. The king told him that he rarely came to see him. What does the best magician in the palace need? Clyde asked him. Lenly asked him instead if his men had really captured Bernard and Callan from the Debs family because of smuggling. But he blurted out that he was asking the king to let them go. Clyde looked at him in surprise and remained silent. The king thought that the Debs family had a lot of power and influence, because recently some nobles had come and testified in their defense. If you want to speak in their defense, so be it. But I heard that you have a bad relationship with Kalen and Alice. Lenly replied that it was a long time ago, but the king reminded him that Kalan was a very narrow-minded person and very vindictive. So he was surprised that Lenly, knowing this, wanted to help him in some way. 
He asked him if he really thought that he would care about someone like Colin, who had a narrow-minded outlook. The king laughed out loud and replied that it was true. Callan was just an old acquaintance of his. But because of Lenly's behavior, he not only had no regard for him, but hated him. Comparing Callan to his father, the son is much worse, and he called his servant over. He ordered him to tell Merritt to investigate the case honestly. The servant received the order and silently left the library. Then he looked at Lenly and said, If Kalen Debs is guilty, they will not escape punishment. Lenly stood silently and listened to him. So far, he was satisfied with this development. He thanked him for his help, said goodbye, and went home. On the way, he told Bebe the mouse that the Debs family was definitely involved in smuggling, and if Callan was released, he could be arrested again when they were discovered, and compared to the other members of the Debs family, Callan would definitely get the worst of it. When he reached his house, he saw his frantic maid running to meet him again, shouting that they had a guest. She blurted out that the guest was wearing a cardinal's badge. Lenly entered the guest room and saw a familiar silhouette. Is it Guillermo? He thought in surprise. The guest turned around when he heard footsteps behind him. He happily said that Lenly had finally returned. Lenly looked at him in surprise. Who are you, uncle? Lenly asked him again. The guest told him that they had recently met at an auction. Lindley strained his memory and began to mentally go through all the guests at the auction. And there were many of them. And why did he remember Delia's face among them all? And he thought that they hadn't seen each other for so long. He wondered how she was doing. The guest called him by name again. And Lindley instantly remembered that it was this man who had bid eleven million for his sculpture at the auction. Suddenly, Delin who was wearing a ring around his neck, whispered to him to be careful. She added that he was no ordinary guy. His training pace was unusually fast, not to mention very violent. When she was still alive, this guy had reached the saintly level, and no one wanted to oppose him. Their secret conversation was interrupted by a visitor who said he was surprised that Lenly remembered him, and he was very happy about it, and introduced himself. His name was Cesar. Dylan whispered that this guy looked thirty years old, but in fact he was about six thousand years old. Caesar said that he really liked his sculptures, and that if it wasn't for Delia, he would have bought Awakening from a dream, and that's why he had a question for Lenly. Delia whispered to Lenly again that this guy was a very powerful man in Yulan, and that he had to be very careful not to make him angry. Lenly tensed up at these words. Suddenly Caesar hesitated and it was clear that he wanted to ask something difficult. And he blurted out when Lenly and Dellen would be getting married, and he even brought them a gift for the occasion. Lenly was speechless at this turn of events. Where did you hear that? shouted Lenly, who did not like gossip out of nothing. Cesar asked in surprise if Mademoiselle Dellen was not his fiancée. It was clear that he was as surprised as Lenly. He explained that he had come to this conclusion from the note he had read, and that there was no mistake. This infuriated Lenly even more. This girl from the Leon family spent so much effort begging for the sculpture awakening from sleep. Caesar explained the situation. Lenly asked him how he got the note. Cesar hesitated and replied that he couldn't tell him about it, even if he wanted to. Well, then I guess I won't be able to give you this gift, Caesar said. Lenly mentally began to reassure himself that this conversation was not so terrible. Cesar placed the magnificent brooch on the table in front of him. Lenly looked at it and asked if it was from the Shining Church, and if it was from the church. The boy took the brooch and explained that a long time ago he had killed the leader of the cardinals and had taken this brooch for himself, and it was quite useful. Lenly was surprised to think that Cesar had killed the leader of the cardinals and taken his brooch, which meant that Cesar's power was enormous and should not be underestimated. The guest laughed and exclaimed that he hadn't done that for a long time. Lenly calmly replied that he was very impressed with his strength and power, and was very surprised that Cesar could sit there and not be afraid of anything. Then Lenly slyly asked him what the real reason for his visit was because he thought it was really about the brooch. Cesar replied that it was true, that the boy was very attentive and not only a good sculptor, and he was very pleased to see that he was talking to him boldly and was not afraid. But his wish was that Lenly would actually create a sculpture for him, 
and he would be happy to repay Lenly. Lenly couldn't understand the meaning of the word debt. His mind raced with thoughts. Could he ask Clyde to kill him? Or could he ask him not to kill him, but to kidnap him and interrogate him? The boy understood that the king had to be alive to find the truth. Lenly's thoughts were interrupted by Caesar, who said that he would also have a condition for Lenly. And he added that he wanted Lenly to create a sculpture of him killing someone in the process, because it would look really cool. Lenly's eyes rounded. At this point, Delin whispered to Lenly to be very careful, because Caesar is also called the King of Killers. Meanwhile, the boy could not understand and asked Caesar about it. The mysterious man suggested that he watch him closely. For example, if I were going to kill you, Caesar exclaimed, and instantly red fire engulfed his body. His eyes turned red and he looked like a wolf. The picture was very scary. His hands with long claws reached out to strangle the boy, and fangs grew in his mouth. And Caesar screamed like a beast. Instantly, everything quieted down and he calmly pointed to his hands and said that it was the killing aura spell. Lenly stood there numb. And he calmly explained to him that it was his killing aura, and asked him to create a sculpture of him using it when he killed, to which Lenly said that he remembered what he had seen, but that the result of the sculpture would probably not be the same as in awakening from a dream. Cesar reacted calmly and explained that since the sculpture would be made by Lenly's hands, he didn't think it would be a problem. But then if it is, you can pick up your sculpture in about a month, Lenly told him. Caesar replied with satisfaction that he was in no hurry, and since his request would be fulfilled, he also wanted to repay Lenly with something, and asked what he needed. Lenly told him that he had a request for Caesar. Well, tell me, Caesar looked at him slyly. At that moment, Lenly thought that Patterson was dead, and he knew that King Clyde had stolen and killed his mother. And although his strength would not be enough to kill him, Caesar's strength would be just right. And Lenly asked Caesar to steal someone, and he explained that he had to kidnap the king of the Holy Alliance. Would he agree to do it? Beb the mouse shouted at him. Was he really going to do it? Delin was also shocked by what she heard. Caesar asked the king in surprise, and he explained that he could help. But then what would Lenly do about it? I'll kill him, shouted the furious Lenly loudly. Caesar sat down on the sofa in shock and replied that in that case he would not be able to help him kill the king. But he explained to Lenly that what he was going to do would affect the whole kingdom and the Shining Church would not give him permission to do it. This sculpture would be a betrayal of the church and it's not worth it, so think about what else I can do for you, Caesar said. Lenly was disappointed that Caesar was probably not going to help them and asked the boy what he was going to do. So he asked Caesar if he knew of a way for a seventh-level magician to defeat a ninth-level warrior. He thought about it and answered that it would be very difficult. And then he exclaimed that there was a way. He remembered what happened eight hundred years ago. Lindley looked at him and thought that it was no wonder they called him the King of Assassins. He knew so much. Poison, Caesar shouted. Dalen burst out laughing. It's only poison. I thought he had a proper plan, she laughed. And then, for some reason, Lenly's maid, who was present in the room according to etiquette, put in her five cents and asked if the king had any tasters. Then, realizing what she had done, the girl clutched at the wall in fear. Caesar continued that Lenly underestimated such a thing as poison. The poison I'm talking about is especially good when applied to warriors. If a warrior is a saint, after taking this poison, he cannot use any abilities and skills. And most importantly, there is no antidote to this poison, Caesar explained. Delin and Lenly listened with bated breath, and she said that Clyde was a ninth-ranked archmage. If they could poison him, they would finally get their revenge. Lenly asked if Caesar had the poison. He replied that he didn't have the ingredients, but that his organization had the right formula. The guy asked how he could get this formula. Caesar told him that it would take at least twelve months to produce the formula, and that Lenly's sculpture would be ready by then, but that the poison itself required two rare ingredients and was very expensive, so no one was making it. But Lenly did not care about the complexity of the process. They came to an agreement and shook hands. Lenly promised to send Caesar the sculpture in a month, 
and Caesar promised to send a messenger with the formula. And satisfied, Caesar said goodbye and left Lenly. The boy stood watching him. First of all, Lenly decided to punish the ill-mannered maid and ordered her to fry chicken legs for everyone. Everyone was silently wondering if Lenly and Caesar's new plan would work. The boy went back to his training to improve his high-level magic. He used meditation techniques and earth channels to improve his spells. Suddenly the images of his father bleeding to death and the happy King Clyde came to his mind. And the meditation he was in exploded around him, scattering stones all around him. The boy fell to his knees from the explosion and began to cough heavily, and again remembered his father. When Delin saw this, she told him that he shouldn't think about other things during meditation, because it could be dangerous. She asked him if he was being affected by the feeling of revenge. Lenly took a stone in his palm and squeezed it, and replied that every time he thought about Caesar's plan for revenge, his feelings could not be calmed. The day of revenge is getting closer every day so he needs to learn high-level spells as soon as possible. They both startled at the sound of a crash. It was a maid running to call out to Lenly. On the way, she fell twice, getting up and running again. Lenly rolled his eyes and shouted at her. Will she do this every time? The maid frightened him and told him that a very strange old man was standing at the door of the house. Lenly went outside and saw the strange old man, and he thought he was a little drunk. It was Uncle Nimitz who rushed over to the boy and told him that Lord Lanley had helped the Deb's family, and that he was now one of them. The boy recoiled and muttered that he was ashamed of him, that he was strange. Bebe suggested that he ignore the old man altogether. The old man came closer to Lenley and introduced himself as the younger brother of the leader of the Deb's family, Nimitz. Do you need anything? Lenley asked him. Nimitz replied that he was very grateful for Cullen's rescue and turned and said that Callan would thank him personally. Alice and Callan were standing behind him. Kilan hissed in anger that he would rather be in prison than apologize. Nimitz stopped him and ordered him to thank him. Lindley asked him again what he wanted, because he had a lot of work to do, so let him speak. Nimitz bowed and said that they were asking him to help them get through this family's loss, and if they got out of these problems, they would never have to worry about it again and handed Lenly a small gift. The boy took the gift, thanked him, and left. At the same time, Nimitz thought that the crystal magic card he gave as a gift had a huge amount of money on it, which corresponded to Lenly's status. Alice watched all this and thought sadly that after saving Kaelin, Lenly had not even looked at her once. Lenly reached his house and sat down to rest. He was twirling Nimitz's gift in his hands. He was too lazy to open it, so he used magic to read the old man's letter of gratitude that was in the box. B. the mouse exclaimed that Nimitz was a cunning fox, because he thought that if he brought Alice with him, her boss would help them, and asked Lenly what he was going to do next. Lenly told him that he was going for a walk and left. After a while, he came to the stone mines. He had noticed them long ago because there was a beautiful stone with a wonderful structure. Mouse asked him if he wanted to make a sculpture out of it. The boy confirmed his guess. After saying a spell, he picked up a huge block of marble and easily cut it off. Pulling out his flat blade, he remembered Cesar's request to feel his aura of killing. And the boy began to work with the stone. His blows scattered small gravel around, and Lenly became excited. He used the flat blade technique and the marble cut like butter, turning into a shape. As Lenly worked, he kept remembering the moment when Caesar tried to kill him, his face, his hands, and the beast in his eyes. He was so engrossed and absorbed in the memories that he actually began to feel the aura of Caesar's murder. When he carved Caesar's face, for a moment Lenly even felt his animal strength. After a few hours of frantic work, the statue of Caesar at the moment of his murder was ready. It was in no way inferior to his previous work, for its realism was simply amazing. It seemed that in a moment, it would come to life and finish the murder he had begun. Dylan examined it carefully and said that she thought it was different from the sculpture, Awakening from Sleep, but it was very beautiful. Beeb the Mouse asked what Lenly would call it. I know what I'm going to name it, exclaimed Lenly, looking at the sculpture's face. The King of Assassins, Lenly shouted, and indeed there was no other name. 
he ordered several servants to bring the sculpture to his house. The five servants brought horses and loaded the sculpture onto a chariot. Dellen asked him if he remembered that the Debs family trial was two days away and if he would go to see it. Lindley's face showed that he had indeed forgotten, but he said that he would go and see it. But he didn't know where the meeting would be held, to which Deline replied that it would probably be held in the courtyard of Shornavoda. She went on to say that the Blackwater Courtyard is famous for its prison. It is a special place of trial for those prisoners who are held there, and if the trial is held for nobles, then this session will be held there. Two days passed, and the trial of the Debs family did indeed take place in the courtyard of Blackwater. All the nobles of the kingdom had already gathered there. The meeting was chaired by the Prime Minister, who ordered the guards to bring Bernard into the hall. After about five minutes, they brought Bernard in. The man was very emaciated and chained. He had aged twenty years. Everyone gasped when Bernard came in, and the room was silent with the impression of what they had seen. Birrit announced to everyone that he would be conducting the trial by order of the king, and asked for silence. Beeb the Mouse looked carefully at the crowd and whispered to Lenly to look in one corner and pointed with her paw. Lenly turned around and saw Kylan and Alice. The girl was crying bitterly, and Kylan had tears in his eyes as well. Merritt announced to the audience that the investigation had shown that a heinous crime had been committed by the Debs family, and ordered Bernard to be brought closer. The guards grabbed the man and pushed him, and Bernard lost his footing and fell to the floor. Lindley took out a piece of paper and began to write a note, then asked B.B. the mouse to take the letter to Alice. B.B. rolled her eyes because she didn't like her very much, but she silently took the letter and delivered it to Alice in three jumps. The surprised girl looked at it and remembered that this animal was always with Lenly. Alice held the letter in her hands in amazement, opening it. She read that Lenly would be waiting for her outside at the exit. She quickly turned around and ran out of the building. Lindley was indeed waiting for her outside. She asked why he was looking for her and if he had a plan. Lindley handed her the box that Uncle Nimitz had given him the day before and said that there was not much he could do for the Debs family. There is too much evidence against this family for Alice to smuggle. The girl was shocked by his words. She did not expect to hear this. The king would not let them go, even if he said a few kind words about them. So he thought it was better to give the gift back to the Debs family. The boy turned around and went to his crew. Alice sobbed bitter tears. She realized that if Lenly could not help them, it was probably the end. In tears, she shouted out to him loudly, Would they ever meet again? Lindley turned round a little and replied that perhaps someday, Miss Debs, and opened the door of his carriage. The boy got into the carriage. Even Dellen was surprised by everything she saw on the street and asked if he would really be so cruel to her. She is Kalan's fiancé after all, so let's leave it at that, Lindley answered her gloomily. The guy drove to his house in silence. His mood was just vile. When he entered, he took off his cloak. Suddenly he saw an unfamiliar shadow in the room, and quickly thinking that it was a stranger, he pulled his sword out of its sheath. The unknown shadow also drew his sword, and Lenly heard it ring and saw its glitter. He swung and slashed at the darkness, and then he felt someone grab his sword and he saw and heard a familiar face. Lenly, is this how you meet me? Mr. Caesar? Lenly said in surprise, finally recognizing the stranger. The guy switched on the light in the room and it was indeed Caesar holding his sword in his hand. When did you come in? Lenly asked him. Caesar smiled and replied happily that he hadn't seen him for a month and missed him so much. And he laughed merrily. When Dellen saw Caesar, she was frightened and sniffed at Lenly's ring. She was still afraid that he would see her. Oh, that's very unexpected, Lenly replied thinking that Cesar was really much stronger than him because it was not surprising to be unseen while he was hiding in the house. I brought you what you wanted most, and I hid it in a safe place. Cesar smiled and took a piece of paper from his mouth. He handed it to Lenly and explained that it was a formula for the most unpredictable poison, with no antidote. Lenly looked at him in amazement. Cesar said that he had also come for his sculpture. Lenly took the piece of paper and said it was ready. He went to the window and opened it, saying that the sculpture was outside. 
Cesar looked out of the window and saw something big and tall in a scaffolding that was covered with a cloth. The boys went out into the yard, and Cesar approached and curiously tore the cover off the sculpture. He exclaimed in amazement that it was absolutely beautiful, a killer aura, an unsurpassed killer aura. Turning to Lenly, he happily exclaimed that he was really a master of his craft, and she was unsurpassed. He held in his hand the treasured recipe for the irresistible poison, and he was one step closer to taking his revenge. Meanwhile, Caesar asked him what the name of the sculpture was. The King of Assassins, Lenly answered. Caesar was happy. He demanded to have it right away. Caesar ordered it to be loaded and politely began to say goodbye. He wanted to get her to his house as soon as possible. Lenly nodded and waved to him silently. Their agreement was perfectly fulfilled. Finally, he began to read the note carefully, and after reading it several times, he was surprised to come to the conclusion that something was wrong with it. It contained the following list of ingredients, namely soy sauce, salt, vinegar, bells. The boy mumbled, What does salt sauce and vinegar have to do with it? Suddenly, Beb the Mouse shouted that Caesar had brought the shopping list, and the formula for the poison was written on the other side. She pointed her finger at the leaflet. Lenly turned the leaf over and saw a different list. It was a list of the following herbs, misty grass, cloud mushroom, and blue heart grass, along with other familiar herbs. Lenly said that the bloodshed potion is from these eight medicinal herbs. They have six herbs, especially a lot of blue heart herb. Only misty grass and cloud mushroom are missing. He thought about it. A few days passed. It was a beautiful morning and suddenly the figure of a guy wearing flying goggles appeared in the sky, flying with the help of wings, and he exclaimed, This guy has a nice house! And then he continued to talk to himself, saying that as far as he remembered, Delia was looking for him. So didn't he have any curiosity about her? Maybe he had hidden her? You used your wings to fly? You're a mage. You've studied to do that. Yale jumped in surprise at the sound of Lenly's familiar voice. Oh, my boy! The visitor shouted happily. It was Yale. At last you have come. Lenly rushed to hug his old friend. I came as soon as I got your letter. Yale laughed and hugged him too. How was your life? Yale asked him and they walked to the house. Lenly took the postcard and started to write something quickly. Lenly gave the leaf to Yale and explained that he really needed these medicinal herbs, namely fog herb and cloud mushroom, and he knew they were not easy to find but he really needed his help and asked him to look for them in the conglomerate. Don't worry, I'll get it, Yale reassured him and started looking around the room as if looking for someone. Then he stood up and silently started looking in all the nooks and crannies. He looked in chests, pots, cabinets, and then asked Lenly where he had hidden Delia. Delia? She went back to her family because she said she had some business there, replied the surprised Lenly. What a horror, Yale exclaimed. For some reason, he really thought she was here. You will stop it, Lenly snapped at him. Yale threw him a look that said, never mind, and he flew away. Lenly stood in the courtyard and watched him fly away with his mechanical wings, smiling. The image of Delia came to him, and the details of their last meeting, and the way he had hugged her goodbye. He remembered the academy, and how Delia had sat beside him like a goddess. His memories were interrupted by the sound of Delia's voice calling him. The girl was already screaming in his ear, and he jumped in fright. Delia, don't scare me like that, don't scare me like that, he shouted at her nervously. Our little Lenly is not a child anymore. When he thinks about Delia, his face turns completely red, she scolded him. If I were younger, I would have taken Lenly for myself, but it's a pity I'm five thousand years old. Lenly snapped back at her telling her not to laugh at him, because he had more important things to do and didn't have time to think about other things. That's right. You can't relax at such an important time. That's what I'm telling you, Dellen replied. Dilling's face became serious, and she put her finger to Lenly's face and said seriously that Lenly should listen to her carefully. He should get the secret dragon blood manual and start training. The boy took out a familiar book. It was the dragon blood secret manual and the book was shining with green light. He began the familiar process of dragonization. His body was already used to it because he trained every day to be covered in the dragon blood battle aura. But this time, something went wrong. 
The blue glow of the dragon blood aura began to spin for some reason, and he was in great pain. He could not understand what was happening. It felt like it was going to explode. It was incredibly painful. Suddenly a dark gas that enveloped his entire body sharply anesthetized him. The boy looked at his hands covered with scales and claws in surprise and could not understand what was wrong. He struck with all his might with the magic of dragon blood, which released an incredible explosive force that had not been there before. Delin whispered in astonishment, This is a seventh level power, isn't it? This meant that through his intense training, Lenly had finally achieved his cherished goal of becoming a seventh level magician. Bibi the mouse told him that the dragon aura was stronger than in his previous transformations, and he didn't even smell like a human. Bibi, you're right, my body doesn't look like a human anymore. Lenly was as impressed as the others. I can turn into a dragon instantly now, Delin. Does that mean he has a better chance of defeating Clyde? The girl answered that he was now a seventh level warrior, which meant that after the transformation, he would have the strength of a novice of the ninth level. She went on to explain that the more he trained as a dragon blood warrior, the harder it would be for him, because he was one of the most gifted she had ever seen. But no matter what happens, there is no need to rush into it. The power of a ninth level novice, especially with your transformation, comes from the armored Razorback Serpent. So Lenly's armor and speed are probably the best on the continent, Delin said. Suddenly, a crazy maid dressed as a dragon appeared and reported that the king had sent servants to deliver an invitation to meet him. Lindley was surprised and finished redragonizing, wondering why he suddenly wanted to see him. Lindley the mouse jumped up to the maid and asked her why she was standing there looking like a dragon. I thought that maybe the lord would not recognize me in this form, she answered the mouse. The mouse laughed and explained that even it recognized her. I've done something wrong again and she ran home in tears. Lindley quickly got dressed and went to the king, wondering what had happened. When he got to the king's castle, he saw the king in his library. The king greeted him with joy. After a while, the boy returned home, lay down on his bed and began to think. He could not understand why the king had sent his invitation. He had the impression that it was somehow for convenience. Bep the mouse climbed into the box that Lindley had brought from the king, looking for something tasty. She started chewing on something, then spat it out and said it was something very disgusting. It was a cloud mushroom, Lenly answered. The boy kept lying there wondering what the king's plan was. He could not figure it out. Lenly remembered their meeting in the library. After greeting him, the king invited him to sit down. The boy sat down and asked the king why he had invited him. Clyde told him that someone had given him something, but he thought it would be more useful to Lenly than to him and put a small box in front of the boy. The king opened it pompously, and Lenly looked into it with interest. Delin, who was sitting in the ring, whispered that it was a cloud mushroom. She asked the boy why Clyde had given him the cloud mushroom. Had he found out about their plan? He had to be very careful. My king, the cloud mushroom is a very valuable medicine. Why are you giving it to me? Asked King Lenly, thinking that this is very bad and means that he knows about their plan then let him not be offended by what he is going to do. Clyde told him that Lenly is the most powerful in Feng Lai, and the cloud mushroom is very useful for training, so he thinks it should be given to him. Lenly thought that the king was not very suspicious. Perhaps he was just trying to appease him. He sincerely thanked Clyde for such a valuable gift. The king continued to praise him sweetly, saying that he was the most talented person in their country and he didn't have to thank him for such a small thing. Lenly took the box and turned around and left. Suddenly Clyde asked him behind him if he wanted to see Merritt's wife, and her incredible beauty. The guy lay on the bed and said to himself that, after all, he didn't have to work since Clyde had given him the ingredient he needed, so he shouldn't complain that he was going to kill him. Meanwhile, someone knocked on the door, a messenger stood behind it, and he handed the maid a letter. Beeb, the mouse scolded. Where is her crazy dragon costume? Lenly looked closely at the seal on the envelope. It looked like the seal of the Leon house, and this letter was most likely from Delia. He started to read it, and Delin flew over to watch as usual. But the boy turned away and closed the letter from her. She exploded and shouted, Why is he closing it from her? The festival in Yulan is coming up, and Delia just sent me an invitation, Lenly replied. 
Don't lie, I clearly saw that she wrote how much she missed you. Delia cut him off. And Lenly jumped high into the sky. Babe the mouse watched him with delight, saying that her boss's speed was getting faster and faster every time. Suddenly, she noticed a stranger sneaking into the house. She was furious, thinking that this person was too bold and was chasing her beloved boss. At that moment, something popped into her head. Baby started screaming that an unknown weapon was being thrown at her. As she screamed, something flew into her mouth. She crunched it, and it turned out to be a fried chicken leg. While she was distracted and chewing on it, someone unknown grabbed her from behind and said in a familiar voice that Lenly would never let you touch his animal. I finally have this chance. Bay, with a chicken leg in her mouth, turned round and saw Yale standing in front of her. She almost choked on her surprise. Why are you staring at me? Yale asked him. And he touched his fluffy nose with his finger as he had always wanted to do. Linley was practicing his karate moves at the time. And he was jumping around the garden with Kai's screams and didn't see what happened in the bushes. Bibi was so frightened that she clutched Yale's arm with her teeth and the boy howled in pain, and tears came to his eyes, so he put his hand over his mouth to keep from screaming. Lenley finally saw the pair and landed noisily near them. Yale started shushing him and whispering to him not to make such a noise. He was afraid of something. Bibi continued to gnaw painfully on his hand. At that moment, they heard someone walking around the garden calling out to Yale. It was two servants who were anxiously looking for him. They asked Lenley's servants if they had seen their master. Then both went to another part of the garden, constantly calling out to Yale. The boy came out of the bush and whispered happily that they had finally left. He pointed at Baby and begged Lenly to take his mad mouse away, because he had no strength left to endure this pain. Lenly laughed and took his angry friend off his hand and asked him if he had come because he had any news about his request. Yes, this time I have brought you some foggy herb, Yale whispered to him mysteriously and handed him the tube of herb. Cool, Lenly exclaimed, looking at the valuable gift. Yale explained that it was a very rare herb and that was why he had stolen it. If his servants found him, they would definitely take it away. By the way, why do you need this misty herb? Yale asked him. Lenly answered gloomily that he could not tell him this secret yet. Don't worry, no matter what you do, the guys from dormitory number 109 will always help you. Yale reassured his friend. Linley thanked him sincerely. He always knew that Yale was a very loyal and true friend. Yale told him that the Yulon Festival was about to start and suggested that they go for a walk, adding slyly that maybe they would meet some rich ladies. Linley laughed and agreed, and the two went to Feng Lai's annual city celebration, having a good time talking about things along the way. Recently, Linley had been thinking about his revenge. He was always on his guard with King Clyde's men, for fear that he would start to suspect something. But with Yale by his side, he could relax a little. After a while, the boys reached the gates of Feng Lai, where they could see that the celebration of the annual festival was beginning. On the wall of the city, the king's servants were hanging a huge notice, and they came closer to read it. It was a court decision regarding a smuggled ring worth 50 million gold pieces. It said that the Debs family had been fined 80 million gold pieces, and that the head of the family, Bernard, had committed suicide. Suddenly the wind blew and one of the servants flew down the ladder, unable to resist, and people began to rush to pick him up. Lenly was so impressed by what he had read that he didn't even notice his fall. Then he heard a familiar shout and turned around to see servants twisting Yale and dragging him to the city gates, shouting that they had finally found him because he had escaped from a family meeting and their head of the house was now furious. Yale fought them off, shouting that he had been caught. Lenley looked on in amazement. Yale shouted his goodbye to Lenley from afar. See you again, Lenley shouted to him. Baby the mouse said that his hand tasted better than chicken legs, so she hoped that Yale would come back more often. The boy walked around the fair alone for a while and decided to go home. He went into his room and began to put all eight ingredients on the table to create a super poison. All the ingredients for the blood potion are here the boy said out loud, looking at everything on the table. He read the paper again and concluded that the formula was not that complicated. Dellen, watching him, said that Clyde's guards were always with him, so if he went to the castle and poisoned it, the guards would catch him immediately. 
The boy sat down on a chair in disappointment and wondered how he could get close to the king. Only when he was alone would he be able to kill him. Meanwhile, a letter from Delia fell out of his pocket in which she wrote that she really wanted to invite him to their home, the Leon family. But because she was sick, she could not do it yet. But as soon as she was better, she would definitely visit him because she did not know whether the boy would come to the Yulin festival. That's right, illness. If I'm sick, it'll work, Lenly exclaimed, remembering the content of the letter. Everyone looked at him in surprise, and the boy explained that he could fake an illness based on how the Shining Church was worried about him. Clyde would definitely come to visit him, and then I'll have a chance to kill him, he shouted. Baby the Mouse also shouted that she wanted to hit him first. No, Lenly answered her sharply. You don't have to strike first. When I ask the king about my mother, I will strike my own revenge. Lenly explained loudly to everyone. The boy went outside and sat down in the middle of the garden to meditate. His two maids were hanging out the laundry nearby and talking to each other about their master's training again. Suddenly, they heard Lenly coughing loudly and then choking. The girls looked at each other because they had never heard their master cough like that before. Lenly's coughing became louder. He coughed again and again, and then they heard him vomit. Lenly kept covering his mouth and could do nothing, and then the maid saw that their master had fallen unconscious. They started screaming in horror. They ran to him and saw Lenly unconscious with blood all over him. Pip the mouse saw this and rushed to his aid. The maids began to revive Lenly and lift him up, asking why he had fainted. Dylan tugged on the mouse and asked if it had forgotten what Lenly had said and she told him not to scream in the whole yard. Suddenly she felt Lenly's hand grab her tail, and she ran to him in fright, screaming that she didn't understand. Leaning down to look at the boy's face, she saw him open one eye and whispered to her not to scream, because he had eaten something that made him vomit. Bebe squeaked out happily that her boss was just pretending. Meanwhile, the maids called the servants' boys and began to carry the boy into the house. Lenly was still unconscious. The news that Lenly had fainted and fallen ill from physical exertion spread throughout the country. It reached the cardinal, who was surprised to hear the news and to see the boy bedridden. Caesar also heard the news and could not understand how it happened that Lenly was ill. A servant came into the king's library and told him that he had received news that Lenly had fainted. The king was surprised and said that Lenly was the star of their land and he thought he should visit him. Lenly lay in his bed and pretended that he was not ill. The first visitor to Lenly who fell ill was Cardinal Guillermo. The cardinal came into his room and told him that young people should not be in such a hurry to succeed, that if Lenly had been struck by a battle aura, it would not have been worth it, and that he could not have healed his wounds even with his shining magic. Lenly thanked him for his concern and explained that he was not in the right shape to deal with martial aura right now. Deline whispered to the boy that if Guillermo was here, it meant the king was on his way. If these two meet here, there will be problems in his plan, Lenly thought. The boy began to imitate a violent cough, and then vomited everything he had right onto the cardinal's cloak. Knowing his rhinestones and squeamishness, he apologized because he couldn't help himself. The cardinal involuntarily grimaced. This meant that Lenly's plan was working. Guillermo quickly began to run for the door shouting as he went that he had left Lenly some medicine to cure his internal wounds, and he needed to take it, adding that he would not be disturbed again and slamming the door. Lenly cheerfully shouted after him that he was very sorry for everything and could see him off. Then he explained to his friends that bleeding poison is useless in the face of magic, so they had to come up with something to make Guillermo leave. The cardinal ran outside frightened and met the king and the prime minister who were just coming up the stairs. Guillermo told them without stopping that Lenly's wounds were very serious, so they shouldn't linger, and ran on past the astonished nobles. Lenly and Delin looked out the window. The boy said with satisfaction that the king was finally here. Guillermo had finally left, and now it was time for the business between him and the king. Because he would have been a great nuisance, the boy continued. The king and the prime minister came into the room, and Clyde said that he had heard about Lenly's serious wounds. But did they bother him much? Lenly sat on the bed and happily thanked the king for his concern and said that his wounds were not so critical 
and offered him some wine that Merritt had given him the day before, which he had not yet tasted. And since the Prime Minister had also come with the King, he would be happy to drink with the three of them. Before all the visits, Lenly secretly added the poison he had made to the bottle of wine he had been given. He thought, looking at the bottle, that the poison was in and there was no turning back. He would kill the king today. Pouring the wine into the glasses, Lenly handed them to the surprised king and prime minister. The prime minister told him that he was very wounded, so he probably shouldn't drink that wine. But that's okay. The doctor said a glass of wine would improve my blood circulation. Lenly replied and thanked them both for their visit. Lenly was the first to empty his glass. The king and the prime minister looked at him and confidently drank theirs. Very good wine, by the way, the king said, looking at the prime minister. Suddenly, Lenly began to cough heavily. He fell to the floor and coughed up blood. The king suggested that he rest, but the prime minister said that they had warned him that it was too early to drink alcohol. Lenly, sitting on the floor, told Clyde that he had a serious conversation with the king. A serious conversation? The king asked him again and was surprised. Lenly started to rise and said that the king knew that he was from the Baruch family of dragon blood warriors. That's right, one of the four warriors, the dragon blooded warrior Baruch, is famous in legend. I don't remember much about my mother, but my father had high standards for me, Lenly continued. The prime minister looked closely at the bent boy and exclaimed in surprise, What was he going to do? The boy straightened up and exclaimed that his father was Nog Baruch and he had been killed by the king's younger brother, the Duke of Patterson. Who would have thought that he would have told me this, the king thought in amazement. And now I have made the Duke of Patterson disappear, exclaimed Lenly, his eyes glittering with revenge. Clyde gathered his strength and said that he would never have thought he would hear such an incredible story today. And Lenly noticed that there were only two eighth-level guards with the king. And then Clyde shouted for his guards to grab Lenly. He knew that the boy could defeat only one of them because he was a seventh-level wizard and he could not defeat two. The guards immediately drew their swords and pointed them at the boy and began to attack. Beb the mouse, who had not left his master's side, began to growl wildly. It instantly began to transform into a huge beast. It rushed at one of the guards, who was surprised to fight it off. A fight broke out. Baby aggressively attacked and tore the guard's armor. Her size was much larger than in previous times. After a while, she tore the guard to pieces, then tore the second guard, and they fell to the floor with a thud. The mouse instantly shrank in size and jumped onto the shoulder of the surprised Lenly. Well done, Bibi. The boy patted his pet on the head. Clyde looked at his dead soldiers in surprise. He stood there thinking that he would never have thought that this little animal Lenly was so strong, because against his eighth-level warriors, the mouse had no chance and its speed was too fast. Your Highness, it is useless to resist, shouted Lenly to the king. Your resistance will mean death, he added. How dare you speak to the king in such a tone? The prime minister attacked the boy. Lenly Barak, if you decide to rebel, you and your family will become criminals, and then I will condemn you all. Lenly immediately jumped up and struck him in the garden with his hand, knocking him unconscious for a moment. Then with another punch, he used an arm bar to knock Merritt to the floor, where he lay lifeless. Bube the mouse jumped on his body and exclaimed with satisfaction, Weakling, it looks like you've turned against me after all, King Lenly said calmly. I can pretend that all this did not happen and I will let you go. Don't forget everything I have done for you, Clyde had already started to shout at him. You've been good to me, but what about my mother, thought Lenly as he watched him tantrum. Clyde realized that he needed to buy some time and replied that his mother hadn't died in childbirth. Lenly asked the king if he had forgotten what had happened twelve years earlier. What? the king asked him irritably. You let Patterson's men kidnap my mother. Patterson told me everything. So it was your mother? Clyde's surprise was overwhelming and cold sweat covered his face. At that moment, Lenly remembered the image of his poor mother and shouted whether she was alive or dead. He wanted an answer. Meanwhile, other events were unfolding in King Clyde's castle. Since Clyde was a magician and also had his own magical animal that was bound to him by a contract, it was the Ice Snow Lion. And when Clyde was in danger, he would start to feel it all. Suddenly, 
The servants who were tending to the sleeping lion noticed that it had woken up and started to growl. The five black guards of the royal castle instantly realized that the king was in danger, and they had to rush to his aid, because the lion had behaved like this ten years earlier. One of the guards rushed to the servant and shouted, Where is the king now? The king has gone to Lenly, the frightened servant replied. The guard quickly unlocked the lock on the lion's neck with his key and set him free. He ordered everyone to follow the snow lion who had already rushed out of the castle. Meanwhile, in Lenly's house, events were unfolding even more tragically. Lenly shouted to the king, Where is his mother? He demanded to know. The frightened Clyde replied that he had given her to another man, whom Lanley could not defeat. But I can tell you for sure that your mother is dead, Clyde shouted, and the room was quiet for a moment. Bibe, Dellen, and Lenly stood there in absolute shock at what they had just heard, all of them speechless for a moment. I am the one who really stole your mother and gave her to that lord. But he often does and will do this. And in the end, all these women will end up with the same thing. Death, Clyde said loudly. Linley was furious at this, and with the words, I will kill you, he rushed towards the hated king. But Clyde laughed and shouted at him that he was too naive. He was not afraid at all, because he was waiting for his salvation. Linley drew his flexible sword and stabbed him in the stomach with all his might. The furious Clyde shouted to everyone that none of them could kill him. The king began to use the magic and glow that he had, which was many times greater than Lenley's, and shouted again that Lin Lei could not kill him because he had overestimated himself. Lenley looked at him and thought it couldn't be, because he had seen Clyde drink the poisoned wine and there was no way he could use his magic powers. The boy stabbed him in the stomach with his flexible sword and the sword's yellow glow was spreading, while Clyde laughed out loud so loud that his laughter echoed off the walls. Delon shouted to Lenly that she thought the king's power was clearly not coming from him, but from the magic scroll. She was 100% sure of this. She explained that the energy of the scroll was not infinite. Lenly's attacks were depleting it, and when it was exhausted, only then could Clyde be killed. Lenly said he understood. The fierce battle gained momentum. Lenly's anger and desire for revenge gave him fierce strength and increased his magic. He struck again and again. Shouting out all the high-level spells, he directed them at the king's body. And although they were very strong, Clyde stood firmly on his feet and repelled everything. He was a ninth-level magician after all. Small cuts appeared on the king's body and blood flowed from his lips, he thought that Lenly should have known that his armor would not be penetrated. But the boy was stubborn and still did not give up. He was a worthy opponent. Finally, Lenly shouted his spell, Dragon Blood Warrior, and began to cover himself in claws and scales, transforming into his most fearsome dragon. With the words, I don't care what kind of magic armor you have, I'll break through it sooner or later. He charged at the king with a real dragon's cry. You owe me the lives of my parents and now it's time to pay back your debts. Lenly shouted, flying straight at the king, completely draconized. The king had only just managed to take out the scroll and unfolded it in front of Lenly, as if it were a shield, his clothes already torn and in rags. He shouted at the top of his lungs, Scroll power! And a terrible magic roared through the room like an explosion. Lenly's opponent was still a ninth-level warrior and even after Clyde drank the poisoned wine, the forces that protected him were powerful enough to push the dragon blood warrior away. In this deadly battle, the enormous powers of dragon blood and the magic scroll clashed. The opponents were facing each other closely, and the degree of this battle was high. Suddenly, Clyde asked Lenly if he had really poisoned the wine, and how can a warrior use such dirty tricks in battle? Why should I play fair if my opponent is a real scoundrel? Lenly shouted back at him, and launched more and more magical pillars of fire. Clyde desperately deflected these attacks with his hands, preventing them from reaching his body, while thinking that he would not be able to continue for so long because the Guardian of Destiny would be destroyed by this boy. He had only a tenth of his strength and needed to make it until the arrival of the Snow Lion, and only then would he be able to solve this problem. Lenly desperately used his dragon blood power Everything he had trained for all these long weeks was coming to bear. He shouted out a new spell again, which generated the image of a yellow dragon in the air. 
It was the first time, and even the boy was surprised by this result of magic. How can this be, Clyde thought, frightened. He had never seen anything like this in his entire life. Lenly loudly ordered Bibi the mouse to turn into a beast and join the battle, and by the look on the king's face, he was not ready for it. And so Clyde used the magic of the magic scroll again, the only one of his magic that gave a strong counter to Lenly's magic. Dylan, who was watching the battle intently, shouted to Lenly that the king's defenses were about to be broken. Today I will take your life, Clyde shouted, and everyone saw the silhouettes of unknown black warriors in the sky. But it was clear that it was the king's reinforcements. In addition to the black warriors, a snow lion appeared in the sky, and Lenly did not expect to have more opponents and was very surprised. But the boy realized that it was the king's personal protection animal, and that the beast would be too strong because it was protecting the head of the kingdom. Meanwhile, Baby had completed her transformation into a beast and was ready for battle. She began to attack the snow lion fearlessly, taking advantage of her faster speed and her much smaller size. Clyde, who had been knocked down by Lenly's attack and was sitting on the ground in a state of disarray, was overjoyed that his protector, the snow lion, had arrived in time. Laughing, he shouted to Lenly, Did he really think he could defeat and kill him so easily? The king was 100% sure of victory. I will avenge my parents, and no matter how many people come to your defense, you will pay for everything, Lenly shouted back at him. But the self-confident king shouted to the snow lion to stop Lenly and shouted the spell, Ice Shards. And huge, sharp pieces of ice flew from the lion's mouth at Lenly. A common bastard dares to go against a dragon, said the king, furious. But he took out his flexible sword again and began to attack the lion who was protecting his master with his body. Lenly timed the moment when the lion flew away from the king, and he was left unprotected for a second. Lenly, who was in constant control of both of them at that moment, shouted, Clyde! He flew up and reached out with his clawed hands to grab the king by the throat. Clyde was paralyzed with fear and surprise. But the black guards, who also took part in the battle, noticed this and launched a defensive attack on Lenly, covering Clyde with their bodies. It was an unequal battle, five black guards against one boy, Lenly. The chief of the black guards managed to apologize to the king that they were a little late and all rushed into the battle. But they still started fighting in time, and the king shouted to them to stop Lenly at any cost because he had to retreat. His scroll power had really weakened. Delon shouted to the boy to hurry up, because soon the other royal guards of the Shining Church would arrive and then they would not have a chance. Lenly found Bibi's mouse and shouted that no matter what, they will attack Clyde. Bibi was only waiting for her master's order. After the transformation, she was incredibly large, and her strength was equal to Lenly's. The guards looked at Lenly and were shocked to see a real human dragon in front of them. The head of the guards shouted at Lenly to look at his huge sword and shouted the spell, Aura of Battle, and swung straight at the boy. He was very angry and surprised at the same time. His eyes were red and his face looked like a bare skull. But he hadn't taken into account his opponent's abilities. And Lenly used wind elemental magic to fly high into the air. And now he was a flying dragon. The head of the guards was amazed at the boy's speed in the air and began to realize that he had underestimated him. He was not only a knight, but a warrior and a high-ranking magician at the same time. Having taken a favorable position in the sky, Lenly began to strike the head of the guards with magic, knocking him down. At the same time as Lenly, Bibi the mouse began to attack King Clyde from the other side, who was not expecting this attack because he was watching Lenly. But the snow lion didn't give up either, and covering his master, he hit Baby's body with his paw. The mouse tried to avoid this blow, but the snow lion still wounded her mortally. The pain of the wound activated Bebe's powers even more, and she became huge, reaching the size of a lion, and she hovered right in front of his eyes. Continuing to take advantage of the fact that she was more mobile, Bebe chased all over the sky, drawing all of the snow lion's attention to herself. Meanwhile, Clyde watched the fight between Lenly and the guard, and for some reason thought that they would not last long. Lenly had already fought five guards, and using the wind blade, he shouted to everyone that no one should think of running away from him. He worked so well with the blade that he did not even let the guards catch their breath. 
After throwing all the wounded guards to the ground, Lenly hovered over the frightened king, and the climax of his revenge came as Clyde stood before him, frightened and defenseless. He hissed at him that today he would avenge his father and mother. The king began to beg him to listen to him. He really understood that the boy could do it. I'm going to finish you off, Lenly yelled as he flew closer and set the air on fire. The distance between them was no more than one meter. The king couldn't even stand up from fear. Lenly was hovering over him in the air. Clyde had never seen a more terrifying dragon in his life, and in just one more moment it would be over. Suddenly a bright light struck Lenly's face, and he could not understand where it was coming from, and he heard someone say the genius of the Baruch family is not a liar after all, and saw a hand launching the shine. Then Lenly heard someone shout the spell Holy Spear of Light, and the radiance appeared again, hitting Lenly's body with terrible force. Dellen just got up to shout at him to be careful with this guy. She could feel something was wrong, and Lenly saw a strange man in front of him, wearing white clothes and an unusual hat decorated with gold, holding a huge golden sword with a red stone. The stranger said that despite his young age, he already had the power of a ninth level. A dragon blood knight, one of the four supreme warriors. The boy was surprised and amazed at the same time. He thought, who is this guy? And what kind of a terrible power is this? Suddenly, Baby the Mouse jumped up to Lenly and explained that it was the Pope of the Shining Church of Hadens himself, and she was as shocked as Lenly. King Clyde fell to his knees in joy before the stranger and shouted, Your Highness, you have finally come! It was obvious that he had been waiting for this stranger, and he was instantly relieved. This Pope Haydens was followed by the cardinals and judges of the church's tribunal, all of whom came dressed alike, their faces covered with ritual masks. Cardinal Guillermo was among them, and he took off his mask in surprise and thought, looking at the boy. Was it really Lenly? He couldn't stand it and shouted, Lenly! The boy was still in the body of a dragon and also recognized Guillermo. The cardinal looked at his body in amazement and could not believe that he was seeing it. He saw the dragon's tail, claws, body covered with scales, and could not believe it. Meanwhile, Lenly shouted to everyone present that they were all going to hell and that Clyde had to die today. Nothing stopped him, not the people present, not their strength, not their numbers. Father Haydens calmly and evenly told him that this was madness and ordered him to end it all and surrender to the Shining Church. But the boy did not hear anyone. He was driven by rage and revenge. He shouted the spell, The Power of Dragon Blood, and rushed towards the king. Guillermo was in shock, thinking, Is it true that Lenly's power has reached such incredible strength? Lenly shouted and sharply rose to the sky and activated the power of dragon blood to the fullest. King Clyde froze and watched him as if he were dug in, wild fear filling his whole body. Suddenly, Pope Hayden shouted the spell Purifying Light and launched a purifying magic through his golden sword. The magic was so strong that its power hit everyone around him. Dellen was shouting at Lenly to stop immediately because he couldn't resist saint-level magic, but he didn't hear her. He flew with all his might straight towards the purifying light. He had no choice but to try and finish the job at any cost. As he entered the stream of light, he felt his face burn so badly that the dragon's scales began to tear off his body, and he screamed in pain and rage. But he began to feel that his strength and magic began to leave him. The only thing that was in his head at that moment was a little more, damn it, my revenge. His consciousness was also leaving and from a great height in front of everyone, the guy's body began to fall straight to the ground. Papa Hayden stood calmly and watched the results of his work. Clyde's face was shining with happiness, and at the same time covered with anger. He looked at Lenly's fall and thought that at last he had lost, the one who thought he could kill him. The frightened mouse Bibi, in the body of a beast, ran to her boss and tried to understand how he was doing, constantly shaking him and asking questions. Lenly lay on his side and looked at her silently. When he came to, Lenly told her that Papa Haydens was here, which meant that the last chance for revenge was gone. The boy was almost in tears. Then he told the mouse to run away quickly, if he was convicted. At least she would be free and could help defeat the bastard. 
But if she was caught, there would be no hope. Baby shouted loudly that she would not leave him. Linley started to try to pick himself up and said louder, telling her to listen to him and run away. B.B. did not even want to listen. Then he couldn't help but shout at her, telling her to run away immediately, or he wouldn't be able to forgive her even after he died. Lenley's face was terrible with anger. With the words, I'll be waiting for you. Baby the mouse turned around and flew away. Well, now I have nothing to lose. I will sacrifice everything I have for revenge, coughing, Lenley said, slowly getting to his feet. Clyde, even if I die, I'll take you to hell with me. Lenley shouted and shouted a new spell, Blood Violet! But unfortunately, he couldn't finish his attack, as Pope Hayden's cast the spell Sphere of Holy Light, and launched his holy magic to counteract Lenley's, and it was many times stronger, and absorbed the Blood Violet. And then it was over, and there was complete silence. He ordered the guards to grab Lenley and take him away. They took him to a secret room in the prison and chained him to the wall kneeling on his knees, exhausted and covered in blood. Meanwhile, Pope Hayden's returned to the city with the cardinals, and all the townspeople gathered to meet him, as he enjoyed great authority among the inhabitants. At this time, Yale was sitting at his desk in his house, doing his favorite thing, counting the money he had earned. Suddenly, a servant ran into his room and shouted excitedly that he had news from Feng Lai. Yale replied thoughtfully that he was very busy, but the servant continued that the news was about Lenley. Yale was startled and stared at him in amazement. He told the servant to tell him what he had heard, and the boy began to tell him that some unknown demon had broken into Lenley's house that night, and that King Clyde was also in the house at that moment. Yale exploded and grabbed the boy by the scruff of the neck, shouting that he wanted details. The boy went on to say that he had learnt that the demon had a purple blade. The demon had killed half of the king's cavalry with one stroke of this purple blade, and that was dozens of men. Yale thought about it and remembered that only his favorite friend Lenley had a purple blade, and at that moment, he heard the familiar squealing behind him. Squeal, squeal! He turned round to see Baby the Mouse flying into their room at breakneck speed. Yale was surprised to think that something must have happened. Is that you, Baby? Lenley asked, looking at the little animal which was hiding behind the chest and shining its eyes, and ordered the servant to leave immediately. Babe the mouse couldn't say a word, just looked at him with unhappy eyes and cried bitterly. At that moment Yale understood and shouted to the whole room, Is Lenley in trouble? The power of the shining church was so vast on the continent that it also had its own prison, where it tried accusations and pronounced sentences. None of the inhabitants ever knew what was going on behind the walls of the church's main castle and in its dungeons. The church's prison was an underground basement that went down whole floors to hide everything that happened there from prying eyes. Lenley was kept in one of these cells. Lenley was shackled and mentally broken. Delin flew out of his ring and asked him if he regretted what had happened. The boy replied that he had hoped to restore the family's honor and avenge his brothers. But as soon as Hayden's appeared, he realized he had lost. Dellen stroked his head and reassured him that Hayden's would not kill him. If he wanted to, he would have done it. You are very gifted, and Hayden's will not make a decision to kill you until the last moment. So don't give up, Dellen continued to say. The boy was crying bitterly, unable to say a word as his tears dripped onto the grimy stones of the cell. Even if he doesn't kill me, I won't be able to get to Clyde, so how can I take revenge? Dellen asked, sobbing. How can I call myself a dragon-blooded warrior if I can't even avenge my family? He continued, his bitter words echoing off the cell walls. Meanwhile, Pope Hayden's was sitting on his throne in a shining hall that was so beautiful and luxurious that it fully lived up to its name. Cardinal Guillermo was approaching him. Guillermo began his conversation by saying that he had no idea that Lenley was a demon. Hayden's corrected him that the boy was not a demon, but a warrior of dragon blood. The cardinal was surprised by this and replied that the Baruch family was a family of dragon-blooded warriors, but no new warrior had been born for thousands of years. Lenley is extremely gifted, and if he could serve the church, it would be in their best interests, the Pope continued. But people think that he is a demon, and they have other people to deal with, Hayden said, and then stopped talking. Guillermo guessed who he was talking about, but he asked if he meant Clyde. 
The Pope remained silent and thought back to the last events of the battle, and thought that Lenly obviously hated Clyde, and he wondered what the reason for their enmity was. He ordered Guillermo to tell the king to come and see him immediately. Haydens was determined to find out the cause of the conflict. Even though the Shining Church spread only within the kingdom, the Pope's rank was higher than the king's, which meant that if the Pope called for Clyde, he would certainly have to come to him. And the king came a few hours later, and after greeting him, he asked if the reason for the summons was probably because of recent events. And would they execute Lenly? Pope Haydens invited the king to walk to the huge balcony on the tower, from which he could see the whole kingdom, as if in the palm of his hand. They looked at the beauty in silence, and Hayden said that in order for the Shining Church to reach more countries, it needed talented people. If I had to choose between the King and Lenly, who do you think I would choose? asked Clyde Pope. And the King realized at that moment that Haydens probably wanted to let Lenly go after all. Pope continued that ordinary people believed that the King was attacked by an unknown demon, and none of them know that the real attacker is Lenly. The king heard this and burst out saying that Lenly was indeed very gifted, and whether he was a warrior or a mage, he had talent. But it was decided that he could not be used. Clyde was silent, but then he shouted again, asking the pope to remember how twelve years ago he had given him a very beautiful woman. Haydens was startled and asked what he meant. The king explained that the woman was Lenly's mother, and that if he was allowed to live, sooner or later he would learn about what had happened in the church. Do you think, Your Holiness, that after all this Lenly will remain faithful to the church? The king asked Hayden slyly. The Pope was in complete shock. He could not believe such a coincidence. Finally, he said that if it was as the king said, they had lost a genius. At that moment, Cardinal Guillermo came into the room, and when he heard the end of the conversation, he asked the king how he could convince Lenly. Pope Haydens replied that there was no need for that, and asked Guillermo if he had checked the boy's mother. Guillermo became sad and replied that indeed twelve years ago it was the same woman, and she was dead. And then Haydens told them both his plan. On the twenty-eighth of this month, the brilliant aura of the Shining Church would be at its peak, and on that very day they would perform a divine gift ceremony for Lenly. At the same time, they will be able to make sure that Lenly will be loyal to the Shining Sovereign and unable to resist. Guillermo muttered in surprise, divine gift. The ceremony which was performed to impose the divine gift required a lot of power and magic. After receiving the divine gift, Lenly's abilities would be suppressed and difficult for him to use. If you do that, then Lenly's talent will be useless, Guillermo exclaimed in shock, to which Pope Haydens calmly replied that it was useless to challenge his shining church. He had already made his decision. Meanwhile, at the walls of the king's castle, because of the recent attack on it, the number of guards was increased fivefold. There was just darkness. Bibiche the mouse was watching all this army from above. She cursed to herself at the number of soldiers and wondered how her boss was doing. The king ordered his soldiers not to let anyone suspicious come near the castle entrance. Bibi the mouse sat quietly on the top of the tower and watched everyone. She whispered to her boss not to worry because she would help him take revenge not only on Clyde, but also on Hayden's, and quickly flew away in an unknown direction. Meanwhile, an unknown man was climbing the stairs to the castle gate. He was accompanied by two warriors of the ninth level, who dutifully accompanied him. It was the president of the Dawson-Monroe-Dawson conglomerate, who was small and overweight, and could barely climb the stairs. When his servants offered to help him, he replied that he would make it up there himself for his son's sake. After passing through several halls of the castle, Monroe finally saw Pope Haydens and Cardinal Guillermo standing on the balcony discussing their next steps. Haydens heard someone's footsteps and looked over, and surprised to see Dawson quickly began to greet him, to which he also bowed and said hello to the Holy Father. Monroe Dawson barely made it to them complaining that he was too fat to climb the stairs and walk such distances. Cardinal Guillermo asked him in surprise if Yale was really his son. Dawson croaked and laughed, and told Guillermo that his son was indeed Yale. And couldn't you see how much they looked alike? Papa Haydens invited Monroe to sit down and finally tell him what business he had here. 
Dawson began to say in a business-like tone that he had come to the Fang Lai Festival. But he had learned that his son's friend had been arrested, and as a father he thought he could resolve this unclear situation. What was the name of this friend? Haydens asked. Monroe explained that he had heard about this guy from his son Yale, and that he was a great sculptor and a brilliant magician. And his name is Lin Lei, Monroe added with a heavy exhale. He was really exhausted from this short journey. Papa Haydens remained silent, looking off into the distance, and Guillermo asked the prisoner's name again, because he could not believe his ears. Dawson went on to say that he had not come here to look for trouble, because he thought the young men were very intemperate. But he knew that Lenly had tried to kill King Clyde, but he had survived, and he was sure that Pope Haydens would not be too worried about it, so he asked him to help him in this matter and to release Lenly. Haydens remained silent and thought about how powerful this Lenly was, and he did not like it. He sharply told Dawson that he couldn't do that and that he could let anyone go but not Lenly. Monroe jumped in surprise. Haydens continued that it was not about his attitude towards Monroe, but that Lenly had killed the men from the church tribunal of the Osenio disciples. Dawson listened to all this and thought that the vile Haydens was now blaming everything on Osenio. But the fact that his conglomerate Dawson pays the highest taxes and Haydens knows it, and still doesn't want to let him go, means that Lenly is really a very important person to him. Monroe was getting annoyed. He didn't like being turned down. And he told them both that the Osano are the kind of people who kill without batting an eye, and that makes it difficult. Guillermo intervened, apologizing and explaining that the Shining Church had not yet sentenced Lenly to death. Dawson was disappointed that nothing had happened this time, and began to say goodbye, saying that if that was the case, he would return to the city square and wait for the thousandth Yulin festival. Bowing, he barely left. And finally turning around, he added that he hoped to see Lenly alive, and smiled slyly. Pope Haydens repeated under his breath that after the 28th, no matter what the old man thought, it would be all for naught, for Lenly would be part of the Shining Church. In the cell, Lenly lay on the floor he hadn't eaten in days. Dellen spun around him and persuaded him to eat, explaining that it was necessary for his wounds to heal. But the boy just stared at the plate of food in silence. He became thin and powerless. His face was exhausted and covered with wounds. Lenly had never been so helpless. Dellen kept telling him in his ear that his arm hadn't healed, his legs couldn't support his body, and he could barely move, and if he let it go, it would get worse. The girl took out her staff, which was about the size of a spoon, and was about to feed it to Lenly, lamenting that who would have thought that her staff would be useful in such a place but she did not spare anything for Lenly. The boy got up and said that he was wondering why he had lost. Who knew that King Clyde would have a scroll of a saintly level? He was morally crushed. Lenly was surprised that even the king's chief cardinal probably did not have a holy protective scroll, mentioning the cardinal. The fact was that it was not so easy to create this magical scroll. It was more difficult to create than a spell, let alone a holy level one. This scroll was a complicated thing, and therefore very rare. Lenly fell to the floor again and sobbed like a little child, saying, I can't believe it. Dellen continued to persuade him to eat so that he would have the strength to follow the plan. She stroked his head tenderly and wiped his tears away, saying that if he didn't see, they still hadn't lost. Her support was important to him because he was all alone. It was the 28th of the month, the day of the Yulan Festival. And it was on this day that the gift-giving ceremony was to take place in the castle church, the halls of which were already decorated with thousands of candles. Lenly was sitting there staring at the same spot when he heard someone unlocking the cell door. The door opened and he saw one of the cardinals who told him that Lord Lenly, His Holiness, was ready to heal his wounds. He listened in amazement and wondered if Haydens had decided not to kill him. He could not understand anything. The cardinal took Lenly's hand and led him away, and Dellen, who was flying next to him, also did not understand what was happening. Then they saw an unknown group of people standing in a circle for some reason. As Lenly got closer, he realized that this was definitely not a place for healing, because he saw the Pope, cardinals, ascetics, and a magic altar. 
but he had never seen all of this before. He looked around and understood only one thing. He didn't need all this to kill him. And he didn't understand why he was here anyway. But the boy was sure of one thing. It was Hayden's who was up to no good with him. Papa Hayden's turned to the boy and said in a majestic way that, although Lenly had behaved wrongly, the Shining Church had decided to give him a second chance, and they would heal all his wounds. Dylan, who had been hiding in the ring around Lenly's neck, whispered to him that something was wrong. She could sense many level nine people. Lenly quietly replied that he had counted at least twenty strange people. Then he began to list everyone he saw. The weakest man was at least on the ninth level. There were eight hermits and a holy emperor, all standing in a circle in the oxygram. Dellen, hearing this, began to shout that they had not gathered for treatment, but to invoke the power of the sovereign. Lenly could not understand what she was talking about. One of the cardinals approached Pope Hayden's and said that the time had come. Hayden's grimly ordered the ceremony to begin. He stepped onto the golden chalice that towered over the oxogram and said loudly, Thank you to the Sovereign of Light for giving them such power. And the bowl began to shine around its perimeter. Eight hermits standing in a circle began to pray loudly in an unknown language. Their eyes began to glow. The scene was frightening and ominous. Lindley looked at it and became more and more afraid, whispering to the Sovereign of Light. Suddenly his body began to rise into the air. He could not understand how it was possible if he had not said any spell. His legs were trembling. Then the boy's body turned horizontally and he seemed to be floating in the air. Jets of light came out around him. Meanwhile, the castle of the Shining Church began to glow from the outside, so that all the people of Feng Lai could see the light coming straight from the columns and shining brightly against the dark sky. Pope Hayden's eyes began to glow with an ominous light. He looked like a demon and shouted loudly that the Sovereign of Light loves the people of this world, so we must also show our loyalty. Now I ask the Sovereign of Light to purify this sinful soul, Hayden shouted, and reached out with his hand, and began to use magic to turn Lenly's body around. The boy was completely terrified and did not understand what was happening. The only thing he felt was that a sound began to fill his head, and for some reason he thought that his wounds were healing. Dellen was shouting at him with all her might to hold on and not let the light force control his power, but the boy could no longer hear her. At that moment, Haydens used hypnosis magic and ordered Lenly to serve the sovereign. Lenly's eyes became glassy, and he monotonously repeated the same word, serve. Dellen shouted at him to wake up immediately. And at that moment, Lenly came to and screamed the word, no. Everything exploded around him and a roar echoed throughout the room. The boy's body was completely covered with light. He began to glow like a lantern, and the ring around his neck glowed with a blue light. The amazed Papa Haydens could not understand what had gone wrong. Some unknown force was resisting him. He chaotically began to shout out spells one after another, but nothing worked. The right was out of his control, and it was the first time this had ever happened to him. Lenly fell to the ground. Haydens did not understand how this could happen and for some reason the boy fell. As he was falling, he thought that he must have been woken up by a wave of power. At the same time, Dellen was screaming that it was incredible that Lenly hadn't been brainwashed. Lenly finally opened his eyes and asked her if it was really her. Dellen explained to him that she wasn't sure, but the wave of power could have come from the writhing dragon's ring. It was a terrifying power. Who would have thought that this ring had such incredible power? The girl was amazed by what she saw. Even she did not fully know that this could be so. Lenly gathered all his strength, coughing, and finally got to his feet. Angry, Papa Haydens ordered the church deacon to take him back to prison. But Lenly decided to use the magic of the wind element to make his escape. He decided to take advantage of his temporary freedom. Guillermo watched him in surprise and exclaimed, Does he really think he can escape from here? Dylan also rushed to the boy, shouting that he shouldn't be so stupid, because there were so many mages and warriors around, and he had no chance. But Lenly did not listen to anyone. He released his wind magic, and the wind began to whirl around him. Suddenly he thought better of it and stopped, saying quietly that he had decided to go back to the prison with the cardinal. They put him in chains again and added more just in case. 
He stood there silent, thinking only that the moment would come when he would take revenge on everyone. Meanwhile, the events moved to Lenly's old friend Delia. The girl was standing in her garden, reading a book in her head. At that time, a servant came to her and reported that the incident with Lenly's attack on King Clyde was likely to be true. The girl did not expect to hear such a confirmation of the events that had spread throughout the country. She thought sadly of Lenly, and her heart and soul grew anxious for her friend. Delia ordered the servant to quickly prepare the carriage for the urgent journey to Feng Lai. Suddenly, she was stopped by her brother, who asked her in surprise where she was going. He nervously reminded her that the family ritual would begin in a few days, so there could be no traveling. Delia tearfully explained to him that her friend was in trouble and she really wanted to help him, and asked him to support her in this. Delia's brother was worried. He was really worried about his sister, and did not want to let her go anywhere. But he told her that if this friend was really that important to her, he would let her go, because their family, the Leon family, never abandoned a friend in need. My brother, you are the best, Delia shouted and hugged him. They were good friends and always understood each other. The boy was ashamed. Meanwhile, the events were already unfolding in the Dawson conglomerate, the richest family in the entire kingdom. Monroe Dawson and his son Yale were sitting at a huge table. There were counting machines on the table, and Yale was trying to calculate the family's income for the previous day. His father was laughing at him for taking all day every time, but he should be much faster. But Yale was in a bad mood. Someone knocked on the door and a servant came in to report that an unknown man in white clothes had brought a letter. Monroe silently opened it and began to read it. His face instantly turned white, and Yale noticed his father's change and began to shout what the damn letter was about. His father looked up at him with frightened eyes and said quietly, Everything is very bad, son. The boy snatched the letter and began to read it. The letter was indeed from the Shining Church and it said that Haydens was going to execute Lenly. Yale's hands shook. It can't be. How dare they do this, Yale shouted, so furious that his father could barely hold on to his chair. I will come and rescue him, Yale, who always helped his friend, decided firmly. I'm going to find this Hayden screaming. Yale flew out of the room. Monroe ordered the servants to catch him, but Yale was always faster than them. Suddenly Yale stopped and looked back and asked old Dawson if there was absolutely nothing the Dawson conglomerate could do. Lenly is very important to him. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. I really can't help you, son, said his father sadly, who was also shocked by the news. He rushed over to comfort his son, who was crying like a little child. Meanwhile, in the prison of the Shining Church, Lenly stood chained and silent. He did not want to eat or drink until he heard someone approaching the door and he asked if it was Guillermo. It was indeed Cardinal Guillermo, who came with a plate of good food and fruit. Putting the plate in front of the boy, he sadly said that this food was the only thing he could do for Lenly before his execution. Lenly did not understand what he was saying and asked him what it meant. Guillermo sadly told him that the day after tomorrow he would be executed by order of the church, and he was very sorry that he could not save him. At first, Dellen and Lenly were surprised and shocked by the news. A minute later, when Lenly realized what he had said, he thought that it meant he would be executed after all. Lenly thanked Guillermo for the news and said that if it wasn't for his news, he would have hoped to survive. The guy was just crushed. At that time, the Thousandth Yulan Festival was taking place in the main square of Feng Lai. Delia was driving the carriage as fast as she could and after a while she asked the servant if they were already in the city. He respectfully replied that yes, they had arrived. But he added that he had heard that Lenly was being held in the prison of the Shining Church. So what will you do now? Delia replied firmly that she was going to meet with the leader of the Cardinals and try to get a meeting with Lenly. In the meantime, a crowd of boys stood near her carriage looking as if they had also come to the celebration. But it was not so. They were Lenly's friends from the Magic Academy, Reynold and George, who, having received a letter with bad news from Yale, hurried as fast as they could to Feng Lai, where Yale was already waiting for them. Yale saw them from a distance and came up to the boys, glad that they had arrived so quickly. 
Reynold rushed over to him and asked if it was true what the letter said about Lenly being executed. George also asked why the head of the church wanted Lenly dead so badly. Isn't he a rare talent for Feng Lai? Yale gloomily replied that the reason was that Lenly had tried to kill King Clyde. The boys were numb to this news. After a moment, they started shouting, Is it true? Yale started shouting at them, but there were plenty of unwanted ears around to keep them quiet. Suddenly, B.B. the mouse, who was sitting on Yale's shoulder, started to squeak, squeal, and all three of them turned around and saw the familiar silhouette of a girl walking in a wedding dress. Yale looked closely and whispered that it was the same girl Lenly liked so much. Her name was Alice. All three of them looked at her in amazement. It was indeed Alice. She was walking alongside Callan through the streets of the city in a festive wedding dress. Today was their wedding day right on Fung Lai Square. She was fabulously beautiful, but her eyes were too sad for such a celebration. Reynold began to grumble that this girl had left Lenly to marry a rich man. Now all three of them recognized her. Yale mysteriously said that Alice and Kaylin's wedding ceremony was taking place outside. Bebe. The mouse looked at him and asked if he had a plan. The couple walked through the crowd of Fung Lai residents all of whom were cheering them on on their big day. People were throwing coins and confetti at them, shouting wishes for long life and love. Suddenly, Kalen's father, Bernard, approached Yale. The news of his suicide was false, and the king released him at Lenly's request. He came up to Yale and greeted him happily. Yale also greeted him politely, and noticing Bernard's glance towards the boys, he introduced them as his brothers from the Magic Academy, Renard, Dustin from the O'Brien Empire and Gerg Walsh from the Yulin Empire. Kalan, who had approached them, said in a low voice that this meant that this family had a thousand-year history with the O'Brien Empire, and they were all friends of Lenly, right? Then he added that it was his wedding day. So what the hell were they all doing here? He was irritated by the uninvited guests. Georg listened to him and thought intelligently that this Kalan was so clingy. Yale's patience with him snapped in a second, and he started shouting that of course he was here for their crazy wedding, and it was a pity that a flower like Kalen was mired in cow shit. He couldn't stand it. Who are you calling cow shit if you want to fight? Go ahead. I'm not afraid of you. Kalan shouted back at him. The intelligent Georg could not resist, and also started shouting at the bride, asking her if she remembered who had spent his time and energy to make the sculpture called Awakening from Sleep. The girl's face turned as white as a wall. She remembered everything perfectly and never forgot. Georg kept shouting that it was Lenly who had saved Kalin's father, not anyone else. Kalin shouted back that every time he opened his mouth, everyone heard Lenly this. Lenly this. Everyone's sick of his bloody Lenly, but today he is the hero of the day. Yale went up to the girl and asked her if she knew that Lenny was going to be here today. Suddenly, the ground began to move under their feet and the cobblestones covering the square began to rise and split. Everyone fell silent and looked at it in amazement. What's happening? Yale finally exclaimed. Protect Alice, he shouted to everyone, knowing that something terrible was about to happen. A second later, he heard a wild roar behind him, and looking back, he saw a giant monkey with huge fangs, walking and smashing everything in its path. It screamed at the frightened crowd that they were all stupid people and so weak. The townspeople ran scattered dodging the debris flying from all sides. What weak creatures you are, you are worthless. Destroying you all will make the king very happy, the monster shouted. It was the purple gold mane baboon, a terrifying creature of the highest level. Yale couldn't believe his eyes. The baboon lifted the house off the ground with one paw and picked it up like an apple. The boy could not understand why the animals were attacking the church. He shouted, George, Reynard, boys! covering his face from the debris. The boys ran up to him, shouting that they had to fight together. They were determined. Yale asked them in surprise if they really had to fight. He wanted to offer them the Dawson Conglomerate's warehouse, which was nearby, and go and get his family's cavalry to protect them. Yale was a good businessman, not a warrior. At this trashy moment, everyone heard a familiar voice ask Grandpa Shio, What's going on here? and the boys saw Delia standing with her servant, who was shielding her from the stones. He was urging her to hurry up and run away. 
Delia suggested that he use the magic of the wind element to try to escape. But the servant was against it, saying that there was rubble around and it would be dangerous to fly. Suddenly, she saw a piece of stone hit her right in the head, and Delia shrank back in fear, thinking it was the end. But at that moment, something unknown knocked the stone away, and she saw a familiar animal on her shoulder. Is it you? I remember you. You're Lenly's little partner. Did you get caught? Delin shouted to Bibi, the mouse sitting on her shoulder. Bibi squeaked squeal, which meant everything was right. Then let's go find Lenly. She answered Bibi happily and patted her head. But at that moment, the servant shouted to her that other animals seemed to have appeared in the square. We have to hurry and find shelter, Delia shouted, and they all started running. Other magical beasts did appear in the sky. A buffalo, lizards, and something else. They were flying and destroying everything in their path, and Armageddon had begun. The king's guards, who were on the watchtowers, were panicking. They saw that the number of beasts was increasing but they did not understand how to fight back and how it was possible. One of the guards reported to the captain that he saw a huge ape coming straight at them, destroying everything and crushing people. Prepare the magic cannons, the captain of the royal guard ordered the Salites menacingly. The cannons, which were embedded in the walls of the tower, simultaneously fired at the monkey. They hit the target, the monkey's body, but were not fatal. One of the guards shouted that he saw another beast, and it was a saint-level dragon. Captains, we can't hold out much longer. The soldiers shouted as they looked at the huge golden dragon that was heading straight for them and had already started killing the soldiers in the front line. It was a high-level tyrant serpent of golden color and simply crazy huge size. It was shouting at everyone in sight that they were all a pathetic bunch of weaklings. Meanwhile, Lenly, who was in his cell, heard loud noises coming from the street and couldn't understand what they were. His shackles prevented him from even looking out the window. Delen also did not understand anything. She said that her observation magic was also blocked by the Shining Church. Linley could only hear someone outside giving orders to get ready for battle. And someone else was shouting that it was a Shining Church and that its defenses were very strong. The boy finally realized that the Shining Church was being attacked. His body was chained to the wall and he could only listen to what was happening outside. This is not normal. Why are these attacks targeting the Shining Church, he asked Delia. Meanwhile, a purple-eyed, golden-skinned monkey came close to the church building and grabbed one of its walls with its big paw. The wall was covered with cracks, and the guards who tried to pierce it with their spears were half the size of this paw. Instantly, other magical beasts joined the monkey, and they all began to attack the castle of the Shining Church, breaking its walls with ease. Stop, you bastards! shouted the angry and frightened Papa Haydens, who ran out to meet them. If you all don't stop, then don't complain about my cruelty. He tried to scare the creatures, and he started shouting magic spells. And for some reason the magic buffalo and the purple-eyed monkey stopped right in front of his balcony, and the Pope thought that something must have worked. The purple-eyed, golden-skinned monkey laughed loudly in Hayden's face. Suddenly, Pope heard a voice behind him say, I'm sorry to interrupt your festival. He turned around and saw his worst nightmare. It was the king of the Dalen Magic Beast Mountain Range, hanging in the air, holding three unknown beasts in his arms. Hayden's was simply speechless. He thought that he would faint from what he saw, and the cardinal standing behind him stammered, Is it really him? Dalen introduced himself and added that he was the king of monsters. The boy was young and handsome, had long blue hair adorned with precious stones, and was dressed in very expensive, luxurious clothes. Haydens shouted to him, Who are they? And do they have any problems or complaints about the Shining Church? He could not understand the reasons for the attack. Dalen smiled and calmly replied that he had come to inform him that Hayden should look for a new capital for the Shining Church, and laughed. One of his animals jumped up and down happily, and exclaimed that the castle was now theirs. Hayden's quickly thought what was this inexplicable insolence towards him, and what was the story with this strange fellow. As soon as he tests his abilities, he's going to give him a beating. What lesson is he thinking of, my master? squeaked one of Dalin's animals. The boy sighed and said that he was not here to ask to leave Feng Lai, and if the church refused, then... 
You will all have a happy ending, and waved his hand towards the purple-eyed, golden-skinned monkey, which was standing there growling incessantly. And in front of everyone's eyes, the monkey slammed its paws with all its might on the table of the church tower, leaving a huge hole in it. How can this be? The shining church is protected by magic, thought the shocked Haydens, watching the monkey easily smash through the walls of their sanctuary. The ape spread out and began to shake the tower like a pear, as if it was just playing with it. Lenly, who was sitting in the cell of this particular tower, felt the hogo shaking, but could not understand what it was. Huge cracks appeared on the walls of the cell, and stones began to fall out of the walls. Dellen and Lenly watched in shock. What the hell is going on outside, he thought irritably, and at that moment all the stones fell out of one of the walls, and the sunlight showed a huge hole in it. Dellen screamed in fright. They both stared at the hole and were silent. Suddenly Dellen shouted that the protective magic of the Shining Church was broken. She clapped her hands in joy. My boy, this is your chance. Use it to get through the walls but your chains, Dellen cried, tears streaming down her face. Linley finally realized the meaning of her words and gathered all his strength and shouted, Dragonization, and that was enough to break all the chains that bound his body. He transformed into a dragon and flew out through the hole to freedom. Dellen joyfully flew after him. She was incredibly happy that her boy was free. Lenly landed at the foot of the castle and shouted, Dedragonization, and returned to his previous body. At the foot of the castle, he encountered a frightened soldier, and using his air blade, he stabbed him, ripping off his clothes at the same time. He changed his clothes as he was wearing only rags. He looked at the square in front of him and saw a huge bear, a bloody anthropomorphic lion, and a winged thundering white tiger. He could not understand why there were so many saint-level magical beasts in one place. Meanwhile, he heard a familiar beeping sound behind him and the words, Boss, boss. Lenly turned around and saw Bibi the mouse running at him at breakneck speed with tears in her eyes. She fell on his shoulder and sobbed loudly. Her joy was overwhelming. Lenly was also happy to see her because he loved her with all his heart and told her she looked very good. They hugged for a few minutes, and suddenly Delia appeared in front of Lenly's eyes. She threw her arms around his neck and hugged him, shouting, Lenly, I'm so glad you're okay. Lenly was shocked by this meeting. He did not expect to see Delia here. He asked her what she was doing here. The girl, seeing his surprise, explained that she had learnt that Lenly would be executed by the Shining Church, and so she came here as quickly as she could, thinking that her family's influence would help her to see the head of the church and that she would be able to... The boyfriend interrupted her, saying that it was too dangerous for her and he was not worth it. Don't say that. You are my best friend, and for you I would do it, no matter what the cost, Delia exclaimed, because it was the truth. Suddenly behind them, one of the castle towers of the Shining Church broke in half from cracks and damage. Bibba the Mouse shouted to them both that they had to get out of here because there were many saintly beasts here, and they were standing there talking. Oh, really? We have to get out of here first because this stone is going to fall on us, shouted Lenly and pulled Delia's hand and they ran. The tower fell with a great crash, and indeed a huge boulder broke off and rolled straight down to the bottom of the three. Its speed was much faster than the fugitives, and Lenly decided to use magic to speed up. He shouted a wind elemental magic spell and a green glow enveloped the three of them. The wind elemental magic lifted them into the air and accelerated their escape, flying at breakneck speed as they ran away from the stone block. Delia was flying and thinking that their speed was insane. Her wind elemental magic was much lower. They were flying over a part of the church's castle that had not yet been destroyed, when Delia pointed to two figures standing there with her ring. Lindley saw Pope Haydens and a man he didn't know with blue hair and animals on his hands. Meanwhile, Haydens and Dalen could not agree on anything. Papa asked him if he was even human. Dalen laughed out loud. He told him that how could he be such an inferior race? People are just food for them, monsters. A purple-eyed, golden-skinned monkey who could speak beautifully entered their dialogue. She told Haydens that if their King Dalen wanted him to disappear, they could all easily do it. So hurry up and run for your lives, you lowly creatures. What? Hayden shouted at her, furious. He was very much annoyed with the situation and all these imposters. 
He kept wondering if magical beasts could turn into humans. Could it be that there was something more divine than the god of war of the O'Brien Empire, his eminence in Yulan, and the king of the Forest of Darkness? One of the cardinals standing behind Hayden's started to explain to him that overcoming the saint level, the divine level, the divine level beast was... But Hayden stopped him saying that he knew everything, and he addressed Dalen with the following words, Mighty King, I am the Holy Pope Hayden. What are your demands? Dalen answered him that his name was not important to him, but that his church people needed to do something. Run all together to the north, he shouted so loudly that his voice echoed off all the walls. And you will only stop running when I decide that my domain is large enough. Dalen finished his sentence. Papa Haydens was furious at his insolence and started shouting at him that how dare he talk to him like that, and what made him think they would drop everything and run. At that moment, he thought, what difference does it make if this guy is serious or not? Let him try to repel his attack first, and then we can talk, because he only knows how to bark and he doesn't bite. I think one hit will be enough for him. And he shouted out the spell, Holy Light Strike, and fierce fire came out of his hands. But Dalen stood still and did not even move. Haydens thought that he was strange. He was not going to run away from such fire. Who did he think he was? Salen walked through the fire, came up to Haydens and grabbed his hand, telling him not to worry. He would not take over the entire territory of the Holy Union. Hayden stared at him with his eyes and could not say a word. Only most of it, understand. Dalen shouted right in his face and reminded him that his enemy, the Dark Alliance, had already taken it over as well. And at that moment, the cute animals turned into six-eyed lions with wings. Dalen squeezed Hayden's hand so hard that he could hear his bones cracking. And all he could think was that he was definitely not human. And a minute later, Dalen pressed Hayden's entire body into the ground with one hand. All of this was being watched by Lenly and Delia, who were sitting on top of the destroyed tower. Lenly said, If this guy is telling the truth, then it means that almost half of the Magical Beast Abundance mountain range, twelve kingdoms and thirty-two duchies are in danger. This fellow's strength is incredible. He attacked the Holy Alliance and the Dark Alliance at the same time, said an impressed Lenly quietly. In the face of such a strong opponent, Holy Father Haydens could only order his soldiers and cardinals to retreat, and they all began to leave their castle, which began to collapse before their eyes. To say that Haydens was angry is an understatement. Rage and hatred were tearing him apart inside, and he did not know what to do now. The Holy Church had been in Feng Lai for thousands of years. Thus, a stranger named Dailene was able to seize the Shining Church in just a few hours, destroying it to a great extent. Linley told Delia that while the city was in such chaos, it was time to get out of there. So they began to quietly descend from the ruins, with Bebe following them, asking where they would go. Lenly explained to her that they were going back to his house, which was given to him by the king, and where he was captured because he hadn't finished something there. Delia and the mouse looked at each other. Suddenly, they were attacked by a red wolf that appeared out of nowhere and Lenly only had time to shout the wind elemental spell, Earth Thorns, to fight it off, because it came so fast and there was no more than one meter between them. Lenly looked at the wolf in fright and thought that all these animals were so strong that he would not be able to kill any of them with one punch. So he decided to summon the purple blood by shouting the necessary spell just in case. The purple blood was a contact weapon. Its parts joined together as soon as it was summoned, and when it received Lenly's power, its glow was restored and the flexible sword began to glow purple. The purple blood spell was quickly activated, and Lenly stabbed the red wolf with the flexible sword, with all his might at the head of the red wolf, which had already been weakened by the previous Earththorn spell. And that was enough? The wolf's body fell on the ground without any signs of life? Lenly managed to defeat it. The guy was happily twirling his sword in his hands and muttering that his mate was back in business. Delon ran up to him and began to apologize for some reason, thinking that the wolf's appearance was her fault. The guy reassured her and explained that everything was fine, she should follow him and he would protect her. And then everyone heard a terrible roar. Two more towers of the castle of the Shining Church collapsed. Lenly shouted, Faster! 
and they ran as fast as they could from that place. Meanwhile, Monroe Dawson grabbed his always restless son, Yale, and fastened him to the horse in the usual way to prevent him from running away. All their servants had been trained to do the same, as they had always caught their young master. Yale resisted and shouted at the top of his lungs that he had to save his friend Lenly, who was locked in a cell in the Shining Church, and it was not fair to tie him up. Suddenly, he heard a familiar voice calling him. He saw his Lenly, Delia, and B.B. the mouse. The boy ran to him laughing and exclaimed that he had been saved thanks to Yale. Yale's happiness was overwhelming, and he shouted to Lenly with tears in his eyes and asked if he was okay. I knew Lenly would come back safe and sound, Yale continued to shout. Meanwhile, B.B., the mouse who had come to him first, looked at the tied-up Yale in surprise and asked what was wrong. Yale began to shout to the servants to let him go, because he would not run to the Shining Church. There was no need to do so anymore. Lenly, who had already reached him, quickly cut the ropes with his dagger, and Yale fell off his horse with a thud. Delia saw the other boys and started shouting that Georg and Renard were there. The boys, who were running towards Yale and Lenly, shouted and welcomed him back. When they finally got off their horses, they were reunited and embraced and it was clear that their happiness was overwhelming, as they cried and could not believe that they had escaped death and that they had finally found each other. It seemed that Lenly was the most excited about his friends. He shouted that everyone was there and he was safe, and it was so great. Yale's father, Monroe Dawson, was finally able to say, when the first joyful shouts of reunion died down, that it was really the same Lenly. It was not safe in Feng Lai now and he had just escaped from the Shining Church and suggested that he come with them. Lenly also looked at the joyful fat man and realized that indeed his father was Yale. Monroe explained to Lenly that the Dawson conglomerate had their own army to protect them. So, he thought that would be the best option for Lenly. Lenly thought about it and told him that he only had one request. Yale started to shout that of course he could say his request because they had lots of soldiers and their horses were also in armor. I want you to help me take Delia back to her family, Lenly shouted. Delia looked at him in surprise. Yale shouted out to him, Does this mean he hasn't given up and is going to finish his plan? That's right, Lenly replied, laughing. What was he going to do, and could I come with him? Lenly asked Yale. At that moment, Lenly was thinking that as long as the magical beasts were attacking Feng Lai, the Shining Church should take care of it and this was the perfect opportunity for him to finally kill King Clyde. But he told Yale that he didn't want to involve everyone in this matter, and he trusted him completely to take Delia back to his family. Delia broke down in tears, explaining that Lenly had almost died the last time and begging him not to leave them. Lenly hugged her and told her not to worry about him because he would come back. Then he turned to the boys and said that it was dangerous here, and they had to leave quickly and he would meet them later. Renard and Georg whispered to Yale in surprise, asking what kind of relationship Lenly and Delia were in, and how long ago it had started. Yale did not understand, and said that he did not even know what was going on in Lenly's mind. And Lenly, using the magic of the wind element, quickly flew into the sky with Bibe the mouse. On his way, he looked at the city of Feng Lai, which was gradually being destroyed by magical beasts, taking it without mercy. Dylan, who was also watching the work of the beasts, did not even notice that his unknown boyfriend flew over him. After a while, Lenly reached his house, which was partially destroyed after the recent events. Beeb asked him why they had come back here, because soon there would be nothing left of it but ruins. I want to pick up some things that I used to make poison, and they are still in the house, Lenly explained to her. Entering the house, Lenly went to the cupboard where the magic ingredients were kept. He opened it and started looking for something. Zundelin, who had taken off her ring, began to advise him to take the blue heart herb and magic crystals. Lenly looked down at his clothes and exclaimed that he was wearing a priest's clothes and would be too visible. Suddenly, the head of a hysterical maid appeared and said that she had already prepared clothes for her master. Lenly was surprised to see her and asked her what she was doing here. She replied that everyone had left, and she had nowhere to go and bowed politely. 
Lenly smiled at her devotion and held out something in his hand. It was a magic crystal, and he explained that it was worth more than 50,000 gold pieces and told her to use it to live a decent life. The girl stood there in shock, looking at the crystal, which sparkled brightly. Then Lenly told her to take whatever she wanted from the house and leave Feng Lai because it was too dangerous. The girl came to her senses at these gifts and asked her master to keep her safe and bowed. Lin Li changed into his clothes, which were familiar and comfortable to him. Bibi asked him why there were no clothes for magical animals, because she would like to have some. Suddenly, they heard an incredible scream outside, a man screaming so loudly that his hair stood on end. Lin Li ran outside with Bibi and saw a terrible scene. One of the magical foot-and-mouth disease beasts had stepped on Colin, and he was screaming in pain. Alice was running down the entrance path to Lenly's house in her wedding dress, shouting, Help! A huge green foot-and-mouth disease was chasing her. Lenly ran to the window with the mouse and saw her, and everything broke down inside. The foot-and-mouth disease was getting closer and closer to the girl, and the situation was becoming critical. The girl ran to the metal gate that led directly to the house, but it was closed. She desperately started shouting for someone to open it, but there was no one in the yard. All the servants had run away the day before. She began to desperately cast the earth element spell and shout the necessary incantations. But a huge green lizard, thirty times bigger than her, was already hovering over her, and she was numb with fear when she saw it. The girl fell to her knees because her legs could no longer hold her, and she was hysterical. Could her life end like this, she thought. Lenely looked at this with horror and managed to think that Alice's level of magic would not help against this foot-and-mouth disease. Everything happened at lightning speed. In a couple of seconds, Lenly was already at her side. He stood between Alice and the monster and stretched his hand out to its face and began to direct his magic directly into its face. He shouted the spell, Earth Spikes, and slammed the spikes into the green foot-and-mouth's face and body. And then he launched the gravitational field spell, realizing that most likely other attack spells would not work in this case, as the beast was very large. He used his hand to cast the gravitational field magic again on the green foot and mouth disease's body and began to press it down. Alice, who hadn't expected to see this, sat there in complete shock. Lenly's training was paying off, and he began to increase the pressure of the gravitational field having previously calculated the lizard's volume. And finally, in a minute, the green monster lay dead and crushed, as if it had been under a press. Mouse Bibi looked at the magical beast and something touched her. She said that this poor creature was crushed. Foot and mouth disease was lying down and smoke was coming out of its body. Are you all right? asked the frightened, numb Alice Lenly. Finally, the girl came to and began to cry and say that she was very sorry for behaving like that and that Lenly had saved her over and over again. Lenly calmly told her that he did it because it was within his power. Suddenly they heard a man screaming. They looked around and saw Maya's curator, who had made his way through the stones, calling to Lenly. Lenly looked at him in surprise, and the Mayan curator shouted that it was very dangerous in Feng Lai, and he needed to go with them. Dylan looked at him in surprise, and began to say that looking at his behavior, she thought that, Lenly interrupted her and replied that he could see everything. Most likely Haydens was keeping all the details of the incident with King Clyde a secret from everyone. Lenly turned to Maya's handler and said that he had a friend and asked him to take care of her and get her out of the city for her safety. Maya told him that he always knew that Lenly would save Feng Lai and its people and that Lenly's friends were his friends, so he would definitely make sure that the girl was safe. Lenly thanked him sincerely for his help. The boy stood there and watched Maya and Alice as they mounted their horses and rode away from the town. Alice looked at him with tears in her eyes. She was scared and afraid of the unknown. They rode with the Mayans past the city of Fenglai, which was almost half destroyed, and in the middle of which were the huge ruins of the Castle of the Shining Church, where the terrible beasts could be seen continuing their terrible work. Lenly activated his wind magic and took to the sky and began his flight. But suddenly, he heard Bebe squeaking behind him, and he looked back to see his girlfriend with huge bundles behind her, flying away and shouting for him to wait. I've gathered everything I need, 
she shouted cheerfully. Lenly stopped and opened her bundles and saw the crystal potion map and other items. Oh, you brought everything, rejoiced Lenly. He patted Baby on the head and praised her for being a great girl. What are you going to do now, my boy? Dellen asked him. We're going to that castle, Lenly told everyone loudly and pointed in the direction of the king's castle. And we will take revenge, he was determined. Dellen and Bibi the mouse looked at him in surprise. So after the magical beasts attacked the Shining Church, they came to the kingdom of Feng Lai. There were many beasts of all kinds and ranks, fulfilling the task of their master, Dalen, and ruthlessly destroying everything in their path. Meanwhile, in the king's castle in the dungeon, Clyde was running to his golden treasure chest. He quickly descended the stairs with a torch and thought that the Shining Church had fallen and his kingdom of Feng Lai would not last long either. Opening the heavy door of the vault, he saw the heart of his castle, piles of gold, silver, and precious stones. It was the treasury of the kingdom. Clyde looked at his riches and thought that all this would be a great burden for him, and that only a few crystal cards would help him. He took a few crystal cards and a lot of money, and put them in his ring for safekeeping. When he went out into the courtyard of his castle, he saw the remnants of his army. The leader of the army bowed to him and told him that the soldiers and horses were ready to go. The commander went to the king and whispered quietly in his ear that he had obeyed his orders and gave the crystal maps to Prince Shack and Prince Carey, who had already left the castle. Clyde was just broken, looking at his city. He muttered that everything was overrun by magical beasts. The king turned to the group and said that if they all left together, they would attract unnecessary attention. But if they left separately, they would most likely have a chance to survive. Clyde told Kaiser that he, as the leader of the squad, would go with him. He agreed and bowed. They mounted their horses and set off on a dangerous journey. Lenly flew headlong past the ruins of the city. He saw the dragon tearing apart the houses around him. The whole castle has been taken over by the beasts, he exclaimed to the amazed Bebe. They flew to the partially surviving tower of the castle and quickly flew to the top. The boy stopped and looked around to get a better look at everything and make a plan of action, as he had little time. Bibe spotted a group of the king's soldiers and quickly pointed Lenly in their direction. Lenly looked closely at their silhouettes and recognized one of them as King Clyde. And revenge filled his heart. Bibi was about to attack, but Lenly stopped her and explained that there was no need to hurry because there was still poison in King Clyde's body and that they should wait until they were close enough to attack them. Meanwhile, the group came even closer to them. That's it, our time has come! Lenly shouted and quickly jumped down from the tower to the squad, dragonizing at the same time. The head of the squad, Kaiser, noticed the flying stranger and quickly ordered everyone to protect the king. And the soldiers surrounded the horse with the king around the perimeter and took out all their weapons. Lenly approached them almost closely. Using his magic, the boy easily scattered all the soldiers guarding Clyde like pears. Finally, Clyde, who had been looking at the stranger all this time, recognized him and exclaimed, Is that Lenly? Lenly looked at him with hatred in his eyes and silently confirmed that he was right, because it was him, his nightmare. Meanwhile, Kieser, taking advantage of the fact that Lenly was as close to the king as possible, launched unknown magic into his body. But the boy noticed his insidious intentions and used the magic of the air blade in time and easily repelled his attack. Last time the head of the Shining Church saved you, and now we'll see who will help you. Lenly shouted to the frightened Clyde, who had fallen to the ground and could not get up. With these words he rose high into the sky and raised his hands, which turned into dragon paws, and saying one spell after another, began to strike Clyde with them. The boy screamed as he struck. He was red as if burnt, his eyes burning with incredible flames. He shouted out his powerful spell Dragon Aura, and dozens of spears immediately flew towards Clyde, wriggling as if alive. Kaiser commanded his soldiers to protect the king. The entire guard was made up of warriors of the seventh level and above, so they were not to be underestimated. Linley looked at them and realized their enormous strength and numbers, and it made him very annoyed. He activated his purple blood blade, which glowed in his claws. With a shout of, Get out of the way! He rushed right into the thick of the warriors, slashing at everything around him. 
He succeeded in this battle against all odds, and one by one the soldiers were defeated, Lenly going further and further into their midst. Slowly, scattering everyone around, he got closer to King Clyde, and the latter, realizing the situation before his eyes, began to shout, Help! Suddenly something incredible happened. A huge sword came out of the ground with a huge roar. Lenly had never seen anything like it in his life. The sword was more than a man's height. Kaiser ran up to it and used magic to pull it out of the stone. And at that moment, when Lenly launched his purple blade towards the king, Kaiser stabbed his sword right in the path of the blade's magic. Let's see who can stop me now, thought the furious Lenly. Kaiser rushed to the king and begged him to get out of there. In another situation, I would not have been able to defeat this guy. But with this sword, I have a great chance. Kaiser thought to himself while holding the sword. He lifted the sword with force and threw it into the air with a shout, and it flew towards Lenly with yellow flames. Following him, Kaiser shouted the spell, Shape Change, and the sword split into three swords like a trident. Seeing this trident, Lenly did not abandon his idea to attack the king and rushed at him with his blade. But the trident met his blade and hit him very hard. Due to the fierce clash of swords, Lenly's blade did not cause any serious injuries to King Clyde. However, the trident still managed to wound Lenly, pulling off some scales from his body, but the boy did not even notice. The collision of these swords sent a fierce explosive force into the king's side, and the ring he had on his finger, on which he had placed the crystal cards, flew off his hand. Damn it, my ring, the king shouted. Get it back no matter what the cost, Clyde shouted. Geezer heard his order and rushed to find the ring. Would he really risk his life for that ring? Thought Lenly. B.B. the mouse noticed that the ring must be very important to the king if he wanted it so badly. So she had to stop him. So she rushed across Kaiser's path to snatch it. Don't even think about it! Kaiser shouted at her as he ran as fast as he could to meet her. He hadn't taken her agility into account, and B.B. succeeded, snatching the ring right out from under his nose. Quickly returning to Lenly, she began to show off her booty. He looked at the unknown ring in his palm and Delin, who had come out of her hiding place, said in amazement what it was. Lenly, it's an interdimensional ring. She was incredibly surprised to see the find. The guy looked at it carefully. He had never seen such a thing and did not understand what it was for. This ring can recognize its owner by blood, so only King Clyde can own it. So no one else can open it, Delin explained to everyone. The only way to open it is for its owner to die, and then sprinkle his blood on the ring, Delin continued. Lenly understood the first time and stood up to continue his revenge. That's what I'll do, he growled, his eyes filled with vengeance once again. The rest of the warriors covered King Clyde, and Kaiser stood in front, sword in hand, protecting the head of the kingdom. Lenly again activated his purple blade, which had the ability to increase its length and also swung it in the air, the traces of which created the image of a purple dragon in the sky. He was determinedly alert, knowing that he would not have another opportunity to avenge his parents. The boy approached Clyde at a distance of no more than one meter, and Clyde began to scream with fear like a child. He hissed that even killing him ten times over would not be enough to avenge his parents' deaths, and Lenly looked his enemy straight in the eye. Suddenly, they both heard a furious roar and looked around to see a huge bear already on its way to attack them. The magical bear saw something in Lenly and quickly moved towards him. Lenly left Clyde for a moment and began to fight off the bear with his purple blade. He attacked the bear again and again, striking it furiously, but without any result, as if the bear was armored. Dilin recognized the bear. It was a purple tattooed bear. They had seen one in the caves before. But it was weaker than the one we had seen in the mountain, she said, looking at it carefully. Clyde thought the bear was after him. But as he watched it lumber towards Lenly, he realized that he was not its target. Kaiser ran up to him and started shouting that they had to run away right now, while Lenly was busy. Lenly, seeing that the king was going to run away, ordered Bebe to take care of Clyde's cavalry, and he would take care of Kaiser and then move on to the purple bear. Baby the mouse quickly flew off to carry out the order. Dellen looked at Lenly in irritation, wondering if he was so stupid that he didn't realize that level nine beasts like this bear 
could understand their language. Meanwhile, the furious Bebe was attacking the king's cavalry with all her might, her size and speed playing into her hands, and she was skillfully laying them to waste like an angry bee. Linley took care of Kaiser, who was trying to guard his king, and began to attack him in order to get to Clyde. The boy reinforced his purple blade with spells and attacked Kaiser from all sides. Giving him no time to think, Kaiser realized with anger that his big sword was weaker than Lenly's, and it irritated him greatly. But the king's protector did not give up and shouted the spell Sunshine, and his sword glowed golden, giving it extra strength with this spell. This made Lenly even angrier. Kaiser was swinging his sword furiously, realizing that this could be his last fight in his life. Lenly looked at his efforts, mentally cursed and decided that Kaiser's trick would not work, and shouted the spell, Dragon Field, drawing a protective circle around him. Delon suddenly shouted at him to look up. He quickly looked up and saw that the bear was not leaving him alone, so he decided to run between its paws to confuse it. But the purple bear noticed his plan, and quickly orientated himself and blocked his way with his paw. He grabbed Lenly and lifted him up high to get a good look at him. Lenly shouted to Delon, Why does this animal keep attacking him? She answered him in surprise that the bear had probably heard from Clyde that he had the interdimensional ring. Meanwhile, Clyde could not calm down and asked Kaiser to look for the ring. Everything was on fire. The bodies of his cavalry were lying around, and Kaiser was telling him that there was no time for that and that he had to run away or it would be too late. Clyde waved his hand and decided to run away, when suddenly he saw a huge horned shadow in front of him. He looked back and was dumbfounded. It was his nightmare, the jade-scaled black dragon, and he was not alone. Clyde almost fainted from what he saw. Bibi saw the dragons and started shouting to Lenly that it was not good, if the dragons were already here. They had to run away. The situation was becoming critical. But Lenly could not be persuaded. He wanted to complete his revenge here and now, and flew towards the defenseless Clyde. Surrounded by magical beasts, he swung his purple blade and shouted, Clyde, die! and struck with all his might. The blade activated, and its purple glow lit up everything around him. And all the dragons noticed Lenly and started flying straight for the boy. Finally, Lenly noticed them. But it was too late to run away. Now he had to accept an unequal fight because they were level nine magical beasts. The dragons were in full swing circling the boy, who was a tasty prey for them, and began to fire at the boy who was ten times smaller than them. Dylan and Bibi the mouse screamed in terror when they saw this picture and tried to fly closer to Lenly. And then the worst thing happened, which everyone was so afraid of. One of the pillars of fire unfortunately hit him, and Lenly lost consciousness and started spinning in the air. Clyde, who saw all this, began to rejoice that Lenly was finally dead. He wondered how the boy dared to go against the dragons. As Lenly continued to fall, he saw the whole crowd of dragons flying in the sky through his half-closed eyes, and his consciousness left him. Delon and Bibi flew to his aid, shouting for him to wake up. And then a miracle happened when he hit the ground, and Lenly regained consciousness. Seeing the dragon near him, he grabbed his purple blade and stabbed it with all his might, and he succeeded. The blow was accurate. The body of the dead dragon fell to the ground with a thud. Its size was simply impressive. Bebe flew around and shouted to be allowed to help. But the boy was attacked by the next dragon, and he began to fight it off desperately. The dragon turned out to be smarter than the previous one, and did not fly close to Lenly, and used its advantages to attack him from a distance. Clyde, realizing that his opponent was alive and that he was going to take revenge again, began to run away desperately. Suddenly, the unexpected happened. The dragon turned around and hit Lenly hard with its tail, and the boy fell unconscious again. But the wounds he had inflicted on the dragon were fatal, and the beast also fell to the ground without signs of life. The other dragons flying in the sky, seeing their slain companions, quickly turned around and began to flee, crying like crows. Bibi the mouse flew over to Lenly and began to look him over and bring him back to life, asking if he was all right. Lenly finally opened his eyes, his body hurt from the blows. But the main thing was that he was alive. He stood up a little and looked up at the sky, wondering if the last of the dragons had flown away. 
Baby was shouting at him to get out of here quickly. The boy sat down with a grimace of pain, and he remembered Clyde and his unfinished business. He stood up and looked around. The king was nowhere to be seen. Bebe told him that he had disappeared somewhere and that only the ruins were smoking around him. Linley began to shout in despair that he had to do something, not let them escape like that. Delon tried to calm him down, saying that even if he used the power of the dragon's blood, he would not be able to catch up with them. Then she began to tell him her guesses, that since Clyde is a very cautious person, it means that he would not use the main road, but would go off the beaten track. They can all leave the city only through the western gate, and since the Holy Alliance is now fleeing north, they most likely need to go there as well, and then find out exactly where the king is. Lenly finally calmed down and agreed. Baby the mouse shouted to everyone that they had to hurry. The boy looked around at the carnage and destruction and noticed a horse nearby. Quickly catching it, he mounted it and began to ride at breakneck speed towards the west gate, with Baby flying after him shouting that he had waited for her. When she caught up with the horse, she grabbed its tail with her paw and continued her journey in this way. After a while, Lenly told Delon that he had some strange bad feelings and did not understand what his intuition was telling him. His horse was approaching a village that was beginning to be visible, but he couldn't figure out what kind of village it was. Looking at the buildings, Lenly was amazed to see that it was his home village of Wushan and that they would definitely pass through it. As he drove along, he looked around in horror. All the houses were either completely destroyed or mutilated, and there were many wounded and dead people. Why did this happen? Lenly whispered in shock with tears in his eyes. He could not believe what he was seeing. He started shouting with all his might, trying to get at least someone to hear him, and came out to him. But there was silence around him. Linley got down from his horse and started running over the bodies of people, looking for at least someone who was wounded, but still alive. But there were no survivors around. Instantly, Bebby the mouse looked into the distance and quietly turned to him and said, Boss! Her eyes rounded. She saw something. Linley looked in his direction and shouted in despair, Baruch! Deline whispered quietly, This is the road. Before him stood his father's house, the Baruch family castle, completely destroyed, with a fire still burning in some places, which was finishing destroying his memories. Lenly stood there crying. He could not believe that his home was destroyed, where his happy parents lived, where he and his younger brother were born and grew up. All his memories vanished like smoke. The boy started to have a real hysteria. He cried and shouted that when the magical beasts attacked the city, he ran away from the Shining Church and he considered himself selfish in his desires, and he never believed that people could really be food for magical beasts. This misfortune is not your fault, Delon told him, feeling sorry for her student. Most of the Holy Union's territory had been invaded by magical beasts, Delon continued. Bibi finally said that it was dangerous in this village, and that they should leave. But Lenly did not hear her at all, finally. Lenly came back to reality and told the mouse that he had to find a way out of the village and get away and climbed on his horse. The terrible day was coming to an end. They rode into the forest and decided to spend the night, making a fire. Bebe fell asleep sweetly, and Lenly sat for a long time thinking about everything that had happened. Deline came out of the ring, and Lenly asked her if it was because he was not strong enough. He could deal with a level seven or eight magical beast, but if he encountered a level nine beast, he would only be able to dodge it, not attack it back. Delin listened to him and said, Does he really want to learn how to defeat level nine beasts? Before he learnt to dragonize, he had seventh level strength. And after he learnt to dragonize, his strength rose to ninth level when he reached eighth level. After dragonizing, his strength would be above ninth level, but now, Delin said. You're strong enough to defeat a level nine beast, I believe, Delin finished. Lenly listened to her in surprise and asked if she had a plan. The girl mentally said a spell, and her hands began to glow, as if she was thinking of something. Then she quickly rose into the air, holding a sword in one hand and a flexible blade in the other. Lenly stared and asked if it was really a model of the purple blood flexible blade and the big sword. That's right. Now watch carefully, Lenly. I'll show you. 
Dellen said loudly and calmly, and she struck the two stones with the sword and blade with a bang. Lenly watched carefully as one stone split in two, and the other one. It shattered into thousands of tiny pieces, and the shockwave sent the boy crashing to the ground. He's completely destroyed, exclaimed the amazed Lenly. That's right, Dellen smiled at him. She went on to explain that heavy weapons release the strength of their wielder and the power of their strikes. Even if the weapon weighs a ton, it will not affect the speed of a ninth-level warrior. Lenly finally understood and replied that he would have to look for a heavier weapon and sat back down to think about it. Suddenly, Bebe the mouse jumped up and started shouting squeal as she peered into the trees. All three of them peered cautiously into the darkness and saw something big with red eyes standing there, looking back at them. On closer inspection, they all panicked and saw that it was a titanic black python, one of the most fearsome magical beasts. The python launched a purple pillar of magic from its mouth towards Lenly, and Bebby just managed to shout at it to be careful. The snake released a strong poison along with the magic. It was its main weapon. But Lenly noticed this and shouted the spell, Purple Blood, and took out a flexible blade that activated. As he got close, he began to attack the python with the flexible blade, and the python kept roaring and dodging him. The guy shouted in surprise to Delon, Why doesn't the purple blood work as it should? And the girl explained that a python like that was like a military machine. Lenly didn't understand what she meant. Suddenly the python launched the purple pillar again, and the boy began to attack without speaking. The titanic black python is a dark aggro beast, and its defenses are very strong. You have to watch out for clicks, Dellen exclaimed. Lindley whispered softly to Bibi. Are you ready? He had his own plans for this python. The mouse shouted back that she was always ready, and Lindley began the process of dragonization. Once he had transformed into a dragon, Lindley activated his purple blade and got close to the dragon's face and stabbed it between the eyes with all his might. But his blow was like a nut on the forehead, and the boy shouted to Dellen that the python's defenses were very strong and nothing worked. Dellen shouted back to him that he should think carefully and find a way to kill him. But the python got very angry and started to attack Lenly with all his might. Bibi could hardly dodge his jaws, and Lenly decided to run away. Bibi, hold on to my cloak, Lenly told the mouse, and he shouted a spell of air to get up into the air. He quickly took off from the ground and flew with Bebe hanging onto his cloak. His speed was enough to move instantly to another part of the forest, leaving the angry and confused Black Python behind. But as Lenly was taking off, the power of magic still hit the snake with a painful shock, stunning it for a while. Bibi was very frightened because she thought the Python was going to eat her. Lenly smiled at her and told her that she was so small that she would not get stuck in his teeth. Meanwhile, Dellen looked at the boy and wondered why nothing had worked. She thought it was because of her. Suddenly she said she heard something. On the lawn next to them was a part of the surviving royal cavalry with their horses. The soldiers were resting. A red flag with a familiar symbol was flying next to them. Lenly looked at the flag and whispered that the soldiers looked like cavalry commanders. He looked at the banner again and said louder, saying that it looked like Clyde's cavalry. Dellen still had her doubts. Then they heard one of the soldiers approach the man in the hat and say, Your lordship, your water. Lindley finally remembered it was Clyde's second son, Shaq. Indeed, it was the youngest son of the king, dressed in royal clothes. Deline said that it looked like the king was separated from his family, and they were all fleeing the city in different directions. But if they met Shaq, it meant they were going in the right direction. Lenly started to twist Clyde's ring on his finger and said he had an idea, but Shaq must not know that Lenly tried to kill him. Dylan whispered in surprise, is he really going to... I'll try, Lenly interrupted her firmly, and the boy came out of the bushes and into the clearing, saying, Your Highness, Shaq turned to him in surprise, not expecting to meet anyone, but he was filled with fear. The guards rushed to Lenly and said, Stop, don't panic, it's Lord Lenly. King Shark ordered the guards with his hands in the air. He rushed to Lenly and hugged him, saying that he was very happy to see him here and that Lenly was fine. Shark asked him that it looked like Lenly was also under attack and then apologized for Feng Lai being attacked so quickly 
and asked him not to blame his father for not being able to protect him. Lenly cryptically replied that he was not offended. The events had indeed happened suddenly. He then asked Shark if the king had also left the city, and where had they agreed to meet. Dulin, who had been listening to the whole dialogue, didn't even breathe. She knew that Lenly was taking a very big risk for revenge, but Shark shook his head sadly and said that in truth, both cities in which he and his father had agreed to meet were quickly destroyed by monsters. It was clear that he was crushed by these events. When we arrived, we could only watch these monsters from the mountain range destroying our city right in front of our eyes, and we were afraid to come closer. Then we all decided to go north, to a safer town, and then we would contact our father, Shark said sadly. We had no choice. The monsters' attacks had never been so strong, Shark sighed. Dellen was also listening attentively to his story, and she whispered quietly to Lenly, that this meant that Shark and the King had not decided where to meet and had simply decided to go north, which meant that there were many options for where they could meet. Lenly quietly agreed with her. Lenly, don't worry. By the time we all reach somewhere north, my father will have shown up, so I suggest you come with us because we have more people, Shark said to Lenly. Suddenly they all heard the terrible sounds of a battle taking place somewhere across the road. Shark saw something incredible roaring and scattering the warriors around. Delin whispered quietly that it looked like a monster. One of the warriors quickly reported to Shaq that there was a group of cavalry ahead of them, and they were holding off the attack and needed to. Shaq interrupted him and sharply ordered the soldiers to continue to hold back. They would come anyway. Lenly looked at him with square eyes. The warrior saluted and ran off to deliver the order. Shaq turned around and looked at Lenly's face and with a calm face asked him what he was thinking. Lenly quickly put his hand over Bebe's mouth, because she was about to scream madness, and thought that this Shaq had no compassion. He was calmly sacrificing people for his own safety, and he had no regrets. Ahead of them, a huge six-eyed lion could already be seen burning all the remnants of the cavalry with fire. Their strengths were far from equal, and so Shaq's decision looked wild. We can't take it anymore, save yourself, your highness, shouted a handful of warriors who heroically defended their master, realizing that this was their last battle. The king, who was riding fast on his horse, threw them the words, keep the line, and calmly continued his journey. Lenly walked alongside and was deeply shocked by the situation. Suddenly they all heard some strange male cries, and a moment later they all saw that another six-eyed lion was attacking someone but because of the fire, they could not see who it was. The man was screaming in a voice that was not his own, heroically resisting the terrible beast. Shaq looked closely and recognized him. It was Prince Louis, and Shaq's guard prepared to take the fight, and he ordered them to go forward and rescue the prince. Lenly looked at him in surprise, thinking that Shaq didn't want to go. So why was he so insistent and always doing the opposite? Bibi whispered quietly, do they have to go there to save the poor people? I don't know what Shaq is going to do, so let's just follow him, Lenly answered her quietly. Shaq's cavalry was engaged in an unequal battle with the six-eyed lion. Everything was on fire, so that none of the soldiers could be seen. Only their desperate cries could be heard. Lenly, watching and listening to all this, could not stand this savagery shouted the spell of the wind element and quickly and decisively rose into the air. And then he fought with the six-eyed lion flying into the fire. He began to attack the lion with his purple blade, striking it again and again with determination. And using his maneuverability, he managed to attack the lion in all parts of its huge body. After some time of incredible attacks, the six-eyed lion fell to the ground with a roar. Dead. His battle was lost. Lenly was once again victorious over a level nine magical beast. His plan had worked again. Prince Louis looked at the dead lion and at Lenly, terrified, torn and incredibly frightened, tears rolling down his cheeks. A gray-haired man from the remnants of the cavalry rushed over to him, asking if he was all right. Louis could barely stand up on trembling legs and assured him that everything was fine. Suddenly, a strange bag fell at the prince's feet and Lenly wanted to pick it up. But Prince Louis threw his whole body towards the bag and began to close it, saying that he would do everything himself, which looked quite strange. 
He was so excited at that moment that Dellen thought that this sack was not simple and quite heavy, because the ground cracked under it, and the prince was behaving strangely. Meanwhile, Prince Shaq's cavalry had killed the other lower-level beasts, so they were successful. Prince Louis was still in shock and shouted that everyone had come just in time, a few more seconds, and he would have been killed by that lion. The gray-haired warrior bowed and thanked them as well, adding that this lion was not easy to defeat and that Lenly had only used a broken sword. Lenly was embarrassed and quietly replied that nothing had happened. Finally, Shaq arrived and rushed to Prince Louis, who was worried. He said that he had noticed the prince's cavalry surrounded by beasts, but he did not know that it was Luis's soldiers who were fighting, and if he had changed his pace, he would have helped them, and their losses would have been less. Prince Luis rushed to Shaq in hysterics, thanking him for his help and rescue. Shaq replied that it was too early to rejoice, that these magical beasts were all around them, and that they all had to go on together as a single army. He added that he had noticed that Prince Louis had lost more than half of his cavalry, and if he went alone without it, he would easily become prey for the beasts. Prince Louis panicked again. Suddenly he began to behave strangely, and told Shaku that he was very grateful, but they needed to do some searching before they could leave together. He was saying some incomprehensible things in the middle of the forest, and Shaq looked suspiciously in his direction. Then he looked back to Lenly and whispered quietly, asking if he had seen anything. Lenly could not understand what Shaq was referring to, and asked again. Shaq whispered quietly to him that he meant treasures, because Prince Louis was from the kingdom of Hanmu, and when he ran away he most likely took the king's treasures with him. And pointing to Louis, he added that their luggage was huge and most likely full of treasures. Then he came closer to Lenly and began to talk about how Lenly had saved Luis and would be trusted, so it would be very easy to defeat them. And if Lenly helped Shaq when they arrived in the kingdom of Hanmu, Shaq would give him 20% of Luis's treasure. Lenly did not expect to hear this from him. He was amazed and thought that Shaq had saved his cousin for profit. Dellen sarcastically added that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. While Lenly was fighting the lion, Beb the mouse remained on the horse holding the reins and did not know what to do. Then she came up with a brilliant idea that she was now the owner of this lovely horse and would ride it proudly. She pulled the reins and the horse started running madly in a circle trying to throw off the damn mouse. But Bibi, not realizing that the horse was not happy with her, shouted at Lenly to teach her to ride as soon as possible. She had her own entertainment and preferences. Finally, everyone gathered together, and the troop, replenished with Luis's soldiers, went north again. Dellen flew quietly beside Lanelli and whispered that Shaq had no idea how much Lanelli hated King Clyde. He probably thought that Lanelli would obey him as a subject, and that was why he had offered to rob Louis. Will you help Shaq? she asked Lenly. The guy kept walking and listening to her in silence, and at the end of her monologue he replied that he didn't know yet and would see what happened. After a while they all stopped at a large clearing and decided to stay overnight until the morning. Everyone was sleeping, except for Lenly, who could not get to sleep, thinking about what he should do in the situation of the robbery. Lenly was lying in a tree as usual. He always thought it was the safest place to sleep, and Bibi was by his side like a faithful guard. A stranger was sneaking up on their tree. Lenly woke up from the rustling of the grass and watched him in surprise. The stranger said quietly, It's me. It was Prince Shaq. He told Lenly that Prince Louis and his soldiers were asleep, and that if Lenly used his earth thorn spell, it would probably surprise them. Lenly climbed down from the tree with a flourish. Dellen hissed at him in surprise, asking if he was really going to help these people. He replied that when monsters were raging around, and instead of helping his kingdom's people, Luis had taken off with all the kingdom's treasures, which meant that he was nothing more than a pile of garbage. To which Dellen replied that now that she thought about it, the soldiers from Wushan were not stronger than the cavalry, but they fought to the last, and Lenly was of the same blood. And Lenly did indeed cast a seventh-level spell, shouting Field of Earth Thorns and the ground began to crack under his feet with a terrible roar. Luis's cavalry was surrounded by thorns, and the men screamed as thorns began to come out of the ground between them. There were hundreds of them, 
hard as stone and tall as trees and sharp as knives. After a while, some of the cavalry fell through the cracks in the ground, and some were killed by the thorns. Shock watched with satisfaction. He was not a great mind, but he was greedy for money. He exclaimed that the magic of the land of Lenly was very powerful. Louis, seeing what had happened to his guards, screamed in panic as if he were being cut. What's going on here? He rushed to Lenly and Shaq. A gray-haired soldier was running after him, asking him who had attacked this time. Attack! Shaq shouted, and all his cavalry ran towards Luis's soldiers, who were only a handful. The sword fight began. The warriors fought each other, but Shaq's men outnumbered them. After about ten minutes, all of Luis's soldiers were defeated in a terrible and bloody battle. Luis finally realized that it was Shaq who had done it and shouted to him, Is it really him? He replied that in the world, the strong eat the weak, and the glorious Hanmu family would soon come to an end. He was pleased with the result of his adventure. You bastard Shaq! Luis shouted at him, furious and powerless. Shaq came up to him and grabbed him by the waist and hissed at him to give up his treasure, and maybe then he would let him live. By some miracle, Luis wriggled out of Shaq's grasp and ran to his gray-haired warrior, thinking that nothing good was going to happen to him, and that in any case, the treasure of the seven Hanmu was not in Shaq's hands. The gray-haired warrior was still fighting the enemy on the battlefield. When Luis reached him, he shouted that he was the strongest of all the survivors, and handed him the pouch that had been falling backwards, saying that it was the most valuable treasure of the seven Hanmu, and that it could not fall into Shaq's hands. He ordered the surprised warrior to take the sack and run away as fast as he could. The warrior held the sack in confusion and could not understand what was happening and what was wanted of him. And then Luis shouted at the top of his voice, Go! And the warrior ran as fast as he could as far as he could see. Meanwhile, Shaq ordered his cavalry to kill all the remaining men, and his soldiers set about the task with shouts. For some time, the gray-haired warrior ran very fast. Then his strength began to leave him. So he stopped in the middle of the forest to catch his breath, for he was a very old man. Suddenly, as if from the ground, the figure of Lenly appeared in front of him, with the evil mouse Bibi standing next to him like a samurai. Are you with Shaq? The gray-haired man roared. Lenly calmly told him to give him the sack and walked away. Why are you serving this idiot? The gray-haired man shouted and swung his sword at Lenly with all his might. For although he was old, he was very strong. Anger flashed in Lenly's eyes and he prepared himself for another fight. The gray-haired man shouted an incantation that Lenly had never heard before Adamantium read, and struck again with his sword, and Lenly activated his flexible purple blade in response and deflected his attack. The fight was extremely intense, and both warriors had something to show each other. The air was filled with the whistling of their swords and sparks from their blows. The gray-haired man shouted the spell Battle Aura, and instantly, earth spikes grew in front of him. Lenly was ahead of him. The spikes completely surrounded him in a circle so tightly that he couldn't even turn and swing to break them. He was trapped. Who would have thought that this little guy would have such strength, thought the furious warrior. Meanwhile, Lenly picked up the sack, and with the words, I got what I wanted, you are free, and Lenly walked away merrily. The gray-haired warrior stood as if in a prison of thorns and screamed in helplessness, and suddenly, Lenly heard an arrow whistle, and he looked back and saw that it was flying straight into his heart. It was the arrow of Shaq who had appeared nearby and had slyly launched it. He came up to Lenly and told him that he had killed the warrior in time, and now Lenly could choose any treasure for his help. Lenly picked up the bag and said that he wanted to take it. Shaq looked at him with puzzlement, but thought that the sack was small and there would be few treasures in it, so he agreed. They returned to the place where they had spent the night, and Shaq ordered his soldiers to gather all the treasure and get ready to continue on. Lindley got on his horse and rode along with Bibi the mouse to look at the mysterious sack, not understanding what was so valuable in it. When he opened the bag, he saw a red box with jade, which was not a very valuable stone for him. Dylan was also looking at the contents of the sack with interest, and suddenly she started screaming, because under the box was a square, black, shiny ingot of adamantium ore. What's wrong, Dylan? Lenly asked the girl, frightened. He had never seen her react like this to anything before. This can't exist in the human dimension. I can't believe it's here. Dylan screamed like a mad woman, 
Lenly started to think and remembered that even the gods cannot destroy the adamantium stone. That's right, and this stone is bigger than a palm. It's much more valuable than all the crystals of magical beasts. If it is added to a weapon, even a saint-level warrior cannot destroy such a weapon. Delon's excitement was overwhelming. Lenly also stood there amazed. Looking at the perfect square of stone, he asked Delling, If this is the case, can he use adamantium to create a heavy sword? Of course you can. But heavy swords are too big and so you'll need more materials. Adamantium ore is very difficult to melt, so you'll need an extraordinary smith, Delon explained. Yes, you're right, I guess we'll have to find another way, said Lenly thoughtfully. After a while, Shaq's cavalry, along with Lenly and his team, arrived at the gates of the city. It was the city of Hesse, a small, cozy town in the north of the kingdom. Shaq told Lenly that it looked like the kingdom of Hesse had not yet fallen, and they would finally be able to rest here, and invited him to stay. Lenly thought to himself that it was very likely that the Shining Church would not give him a chance anymore. But he asked Shaq if King Clyde had reached Hesse yet. He replied that it would take my father longer, about two or three days, to get here. Then I will have time to finish some of my business, and since the king is not here yet, I will not disturb you, Lenly replied. Shaq was surprised by this answer. Lenly told Bebe, the mouse, to secretly follow Shaq, and if the king's men came to use telepathy to tell him. Bebe heroically agreed, and the boy went to the city, with Delon flying alongside him and saying that this time they would wait for King Clyde's move. And then she asked the boy what he was up to. Without answering, Lenly walked over to a men's clothing store and started looking at everything. He chose a beautiful men's suit and a hat, paid 500 gold pieces and left the shop, leaving the seller in shock, who could not believe his eyes when he counted out such a pile of money. Having changed into his suit back at the shop, Lenly stood outside and admired himself. Delon liked the way he looked and finally guessed that Lenly wanted to be inconspicuous in this so that he could be ready to defeat Clyde. And so that I can make a cool weapon, Master Delon, added Lenly happily. So they went around the city looking for a forge, and after a while they came across one with a girl working in front of it. Lenly went into the forge and began to look at the finished products on the walls. The girl was looking at the handsome boy with interest. What kind of weapon do you want to buy from us? She finally dared to ask Lenly and bowed politely. Lenly pulled his hat up over his eyes to be unrecognizable and asked her who was the best gunsmith in the town. Master Corby is the best in town, the girl replied cheerfully. He is the best and he works for us. There is no weapon he cannot make, she continued. Meanwhile, Lenly took down a huge sword from the wall and carefully examined how it was made. The girl was shocked to think that this stranger could hold such a huge sword with only one hand. Lindley asked to call the blacksmith. He had an order for him. The girl replied that Master Corby was usually not in the shop. She told him to follow her and led him somewhere through the labyrinths. Lindley walked silently and looked at the forge's jungle with interest, because he had never seen such labyrinths before. After about five minutes, they came to a room where a blacksmith was sitting and sharpening a sword. The girl turned to him and said, Master Corby, a wizard would like to speak to you. It was Master Blacksmith Corby, a bald old man with a long white beard and glasses. Okay, go back to the shop, he told the girl and turned to the guest. Young man, my prices for weapons are very high. If you want me to forge a weapon for you, you will need at least 10,000 gold pieces, said Corby to Lindley. Lindley agreed and said he had the material for a weapon. The old man looked at him in surprise. What kind of material can you give me, boy? Corby asked him. Adamantium, Lenly answered him loudly and confidently. Did you say adamantium? The blacksmith exclaimed, frightened and surprised. And it was clear that Lenly's answer had shocked him. That's right. I want to use it to create my weapon. Can you do that? Corby gasped and replied that he could not melt adamantium ore. Lenly thought that no one could do it. Then the blacksmith asked him compassionately if he could at least look at the adamantium ore, and if he could see it at least once, he would be happy for the rest of his life. Lindley silently took out the stone and showed it to the blacksmith Corby. A purple glow filled the entire forge. My God, it's beautiful, Corby exclaimed dumbfounded. 
Lenly asked him again if he knew anyone who could melt it down. His grandfather explained that as far as he knew, the masters of the Shining Church were highly skilled blacksmiths and weaponsmiths, and that over the course of its long existence, the Church had to develop the technology of adamantium melting, and that masters from the Dark Alliance and the Four Empires also possessed these techniques. Lenly listened attentively and thought it was too risky for him to return to the Shining Church. He thanked the blacksmith Corby and walked back through the labyrinth to the street, wondering where he could find that blacksmith. He needed to make a two-handed weapon, and when he got outside he heard someone calling him. He looked round and saw his three friends, Jaeli, Georg, and Renard, who were running towards him across the square shouting Lenly. All three of them rushed to him, shouting and hugging him, and Lenly could not understand where they all came from. It was a shock to him. Gale shouted at him that he did not know how hard it was for them all to meet here. Lenly shouted back that they recognized him even in his new suit. After hugging each other, Lenly told his friends that he had a problem. The boys listened to him carefully. We need to get a huge sword, said Yale for some reason. Zuli Yale started to shout, and across the square Monroe the fat man came running towards him, shouting why he was calling him. He loved his crazy son very much. Yale began to explain to Monroe that Lenly needed a blacksmith who could forge a sword with adamantium. And did he know anyone? He replied that there was such a master, and he was in this town. And he explained that there was a family in the city, whose status as the highest warriors belonged to the Baruch family, the Hyde family, and he would definitely introduce him to them. And the fat man took everyone to this famous family. And on the way he told the boys that the Purple Flame Warrior was from the Hyde family, and their history goes back five thousand years. There are very few of them left, but they are very proud. So he didn't even know if they would accept his request, but he would try anyway. After a while, they reached the castle, knocked on the door, and were opened by a servant who invited them in. In the room, a very tall man was sitting on a luxurious chair. It was Vincent. He stood up and everyone noticed his extraordinary height. Monroe asked permission to introduce his guest. This is the brilliant magician I was telling you about, said old Dawson. Vincent looked down at Lenly in silence as if assessing him. He was a man of about sixty, gloomy, thin and tall, but with a proud bearing. Finally he said, Lenly of the house of Baruch, magician and fine sculptor. The man's face was calm and intelligent, and his eyes were surprisingly piercing. Lenly and Vincent sat down to talk. Mr. Vincent, I want to order a heavier sword, but I hope you can add this material to it, said Lenly as he placed a perfect square block of adamantium on the table. Vincent stared at the piece of adamantium in disbelief, his hands shaking with excitement. Adamantium. A piece of it weighs about a thousand pounds. Legend has it that adamantium is a hundred times heavier than gold, and it's true. With these words, Vincent could hardly pick it up. That's not a problem, Mr. Vincent. He can concentrate on forging, Lenly told him. Vincent, still in shock, asked him if he wanted to put all the adamantium into a heavy sword. Because if you take into account the weight of other ores, this sword will weigh about three thousand pounds. Delin listened to the story about the weight of the future sword and thought that the strength of a dragon-blood warrior was his body. And with that strength, three thousand pounds would not be a problem. Monroe Dawson entered the conversation, and assured Vincent that the Dawson conglomerate would pay for the other components of the oars for the sword. Vincent thought about it for a moment and said that he would start working on the sword tomorrow morning. When the morning came, Vincent went not to his usual forge, but to the one he had used only a few times in his life and that was a long time ago. The place did not look like a forge. It was a round pedestal with an anvil to which four gutters led, which supplied special water, and under the pedestal was a huge furnace that gave out a gigantic amount of fire, and he began his work, which this time was also very difficult. Once the furnace was fired up and the right amount of heat was generated, Vincent began to melt the adamantium. He constantly kept the precious piece of ore over the fire occasionally hitting it with a huge hammer. More fire! Vincent shouted to his servants, seeing that the ore had already become softer. Finally it's starting to melt! Vincent exclaimed to himself as he looked at the adamantium, and ordered his servants to bring in other ores for the sword to mix. 
he poured the adamantium into a huge sword mold and began to pour in the colored crystals of the other ores, keeping the proportions of the metal exactly right. Bring Spring Mountain water, Vincent ordered his servants again, and four streams of crystal-clear mountain water rushed out of the gutters to cool the metal. After the water was poured into the mold, Vincent saw the silhouette of a heavy sword. It was glowing. The sword was ready, and Vincent happily picked it up and raised it above his head. It is complete, and he laughed out loud, echoing. Never before had Vincent been so excited and happy with the results of his work. This is my best creation yet, Vincent shouted again. The sword weighed 3,000 pounds, and Vincent used the power of a purple flame warrior to hold it. He still held the yogi in his hands and looked at him from all sides, laughing with pleasure. Suddenly, Vincent lifted it above his head to look at it once again in the sunlight. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning that came from nowhere struck the sword, charging it with thousands of neurons of energy. The lightning strike was so strong that the energy passed through the sword and burned Vincent's entire hand. He started screaming in pain, and losing his balance, he started to fall from the pedestal but managed to order his servants to run quickly to the Dawson conglomerate and call Armand. And he fell with a thud. Monroe, his servants, and Lanley ran up to him and began to revive him. Everyone was very frightened and thought he was dead. After half an hour, Vincent finally opened his eyes and barely managed to say that he was fine. But he needed time to recover a little. He was a purple flame warrior after all, and they were famous for their endurance and he grimaced in pain as he grabbed his arm, which his servants had already bandaged. Dellen explained quietly to Lenly that Vincent was at the blue flame level, and was only approaching the white flame level, but he was still far from the violet flame. He most likely doesn't have reborn nirvana, but he can heal his wounds, so there's no need to worry about him. Lenly breathed out a sigh of relief. Monroe also tried to reassure Vincent, and told him that with Artemand, he had nothing to worry about, because his light magic would be able to heal his arm 100%. Vincent lay on the bed and did not move, but he grabbed Lenly's hand and told him to look at his heavy sword and check if it was all right. It's there. And he gestured to a large wooden box standing next to his bed. The servants began to open it and the sword was revealed. Lenly quietly walked over to it and took it in his hands. Picking it up, he began to examine it carefully. After the blue lightning struck it, a violet-blue shimmer appeared on the black sword, and it was as if covered with frost. The servants were whispering to each other, gawking, that the four of them had barely brought it, and this guy had easily picked it up and twirled it around. The boy wanted to try it out, because it was the first time he had such a beautiful and rare weapon, and he began to draw a circle around himself with it. Then he swung it with ease and struck the ground which instantly split into rough stones. Lindley swung the sword several more times, each time increasing the force of the blow, and the holes in the ground became even deeper. Nice sword, thought Lindley. Vincent, who got up from the bed, told him that the sword weighed 1,630 pounds and was one and a half meters long. It is the perfect weapon, Vincent said with delight, and continued that it must have been the will of heaven that Lindley should have it. Lenly suddenly asked him what else was special about this sword besides the adamantium. He wanted to know all the properties of his new toy, and he explained to him that the most difficult thing about making it from adamantium was to unlock its maximum potential, because all the latest metal impurities are inferior to it in everything. But the secret method of the Vincent clan allows you to achieve this, even with a high level of impurities. It wasn't easy to forge it, Vincent continued but I didn't expect that right after it was hardened it would be struck by lightning, which balanced the sword with its strike and helped to correct all the flaws and make it perfect. Just look at the way it glows. I touched it, and its surface is very slippery so there will never be blood on it, added Vicent. Lindley was delighted with the big sword and thanked Vincent for his work and shook his hand with a smile. He hung it on his back and went to the boys who had been waiting for him outside all this time. The boys rushed over to him to look at his new weapon, saying how huge and beautiful it was. At that moment, Lenly was very happy that one of his dreams had come true and so quickly. The boys twirled the great sword and looked at it with delight from all sides, Yale constantly shouting that it was a sword from adamantium itself, 
The sword itself was as big as they were tall, and then Yale had a brilliant idea. He wanted to pick up the big sword and grab the handle and started pulling it everywhere. Georg noticed that he was not light for him and recommended to leave him alone. But Yale stubbornly tried to lift it, shaking it in all directions and trying to lift it. Yale overestimated his abilities and fell to the ground, with the sword pressed down on top of him with all his weight. The boys began to laugh at him, and Yale shouted, Help! until Lenly came to him and took hold of the sword's handle. With one hand, the thief easily lifted it and put it away, while Yale screamed that it was so heavy, and thanked Lenly for his help. The boys around him laughed at Yale's heroism. Georg asked Lenly if he had named his sword. Reynald suggested that he should call it Heavenly Thunder, because it had been struck by lightning. Yale started laughing and said that was bullshit, and suggested that they call it His Highness Lightning. Georg replied that this was also bullshit. He suggested calling it the bladeless sword, because it doesn't need to be sharpened. Bladeless? Lenly asked him again and thought about it. His new sword stood on its own at the thin end, but because of its balance it didn't even fall, and Lenly looked at it and didn't say anything. Okay, it's a good name, let it be. Lenly finally answered and hugged his new metal friend. The next morning Lenly woke up earlier than everyone else eager to finally play with his new acquisition alone and feel how it worked in his hands. He trained for at least an hour, and despite the weight of the sword, Lenly was able to handle it easily, feeling that it was the perfect weapon for him. Suddenly, Baby the Mouse appeared and began to squeak that everyone had to go to Shaq's house because King Clyde had arrived. Lenly asked him if he was sure of his words, and the mouse confirmed that he was. Dellen, hearing this, began to speak quickly, telling Lenly to hurry. This time there was no mistaking it and letting Clyde escape, and since Lenly came to town with Shaq, Clyde probably already knew that the boy was here. I understand, Master Dellen, Lenly told her firmly. Lenly shouted an air elemental spell and quickly flew up into the sky. Meanwhile, King Clyde appeared on the streets of Hesse City with a huge number of people guarding him, and he finally reached a safe place. Lenly who was nearby saw him and crouched down near a house to be invisible. Beb, having been ordered by Lenly to count the number of guards, quickly reported that Clyde had seventy, eighty men with him, who surrounded him on all sides so that he was barely visible. Lenly was surprised, but said that Clyde had suffered heavy losses of his bodyguards when he fled Feng Lai, and it was unclear where all these people had come from. Delin, who was also involved in the surveillance, told him, that it would be better to rent a room nearby to better observe Clyde. Lenly supported her suggestion, and within an hour they had rented a room opposite Clyde's son's huge house. From the window of the room, they could see what was happening in the yard and in some of the rooms. Lenly took up his observation post. Baby, who had never seen Lenly's new sword before, looked at it with great interest and touched it with her paws. She was delighted with its size and appearance and asked Lenly if it was his new sword. Lenly walked over to the sword and picked it up, saying that he was very good with it. Bibi asked him what he would do if Clyde found out he was in town. Why do you say that? asked Bibi Lenly. And Bibi answered that when Lenly was caught by the Shining Church, he could call upon the purple blood at any time. This new sword also knows its master by blood, and Clyde's ring also senses Clyde, and so most likely the king has already tracked him down. Lenly stared silently at the safety ring on his hand. No, it doesn't, Lenly replied. Although the ring and the sword work very similarly, the purple blood is a divine sword and the ring is not. And so Clyde could not have tracked me through it, Lenly assured her with confidence. Well, that makes sense to me, Bebe said. What are you going to do now, Bebe asked him. Lenly laid down in silence and closed his eyes, intending to rest. He told her that he would wait until nightfall and then he would go to Shaq's house and reconnoiter the situation, and then decide on the spot. He lay there looking up at the ceiling, twisting his ring around his neck and thinking. He knew that the divine artifact could not be sealed in this world on the Yulan continent, but he did not fully understand the ownership of his ring. He recalled that when the Shining Church tried to subjugate him, and he was on top of the church tower with the king, his ring saved his life, which meant that it had some great power unknown to him. Finally, evening came, and then a dark night. 
Lenley got ready and went quietly to reconnoiter Shaq's house. He made his way into the courtyard without incident, and on the first floor, he looked out the window and saw King Kaleida sitting in a magnificent room. His son Shaq had brought his father some tea and placed it on the table next to him, the king holding his injured arm. Lenley looked at his hand in amazement and thought that Clyde did not even have a scar, which meant that his healing magic was very strong because only a ninth-level archmage could do that. Meanwhile, Shaq asked his father how he had met the people of the Shining Church, because it was clear that they were incredibly strong. Clyde drank tea and told him that the Aztecs under the Fallen Leaf had many ninth-level mages, and they were completely safe while traveling with them. It was clear that he was enjoying the circumstances. Lindley repeated in his mind in amazement that these were the Aztecs of the Fallen Leaf. This means that Shaq's house is now full of powerful magicians, and this means that it will be more difficult to kill Clyde, Lenley continued to think. Suddenly a tile clattered under his feet, and the guards shouted out loud, Who's there? Lenley quietly summoned the magic of the element of soaring and rose into the air unnoticed. The guards shone their torches in Lenley's direction and told each other that they must have imagined it and calmed down. Meanwhile, Lenley flew away and talked to Dellen, who asked him what he was going to do now. I guess we'll just have to wait, Lenley replied. Dellen told him not to worry, because the fallen leaf would not be here for long. Clyde is the king of Fen Lai, and now that the kingdom is gone, it is no longer of any value to the church, although the Shining Church will now choose its own capital, but it is unlikely to be the city of Hesse. As they flew past a nightclub where people were relaxing, Dellen coyly said that even though they were going to kill Clyde now, they could at least relax. But Lenly did not notice her hints. But after a minute, he did tell her to forget about the party, because some of the townspeople might recognize him, but he had to go buy some food for Bebe. On the way to his room, Lenly bought a whole bowl of chicken legs and gave them to Bebe, who was overjoyed and swallowed them one by one with a delicious smack. Suddenly, Lenly noticed some people coming out of Shaq's house. They were the Aztecs of the Fallen Leaf, and the king was with them. One of them loudly told Clyde that it was time for them to leave. For some reason, one of the Aztecs was looking intently at Lenly, looking for something. Lenly noticed him and sat down, saying that the Aztecs had very sharp eyesight and that he should be more careful. At the same time, he wondered if Clyde was letting them go, and the Aztecs were going home. Clyde said goodbye to them, and they left. Then he told his son, who was standing nearby, that if the Aztecs were around, he would not be afraid of the animals. Shaq told him that he had forgotten to tell him something. He went on to say that a few days ago, Lord Lenly had joined them on their way to the city of Hesse, but he had not stayed long and had gone north. Lenly? Clyde asked his son, frightened, almost fainting. Why didn't you tell me this before? The furious king shouted. What's wrong, father? Shaq could not understand his anger. Meanwhile, Clyde furiously remembered Lenly, and thought it meant that he hadn't died when the magic beasts attacked. Lenly was with you so he knows where you're staying. Clyde snapped at Shaq. I guess so. The boy recoiled from him in fright. This meant to the king that Lenly had definitely not left the city. Clyde turned round and gave his guards an order to search the whole city immediately. For several days, the king's guards searched for Lenly. They turned the whole city upside down but they could not find him anywhere. They searched every house and institution, looking through every crack and crevice, but Lenly seemed to have vanished into thin air. Lenly eventually came out of his hiding place and told Bebby that they were going to act. The mouse was in a fighting mood. Meanwhile, the king was visibly nervous after hearing about Lenly's appearance and called Lord Ascetic to talk to him. He was really afraid for his life, knowing Lenly's stubbornness. He asked the Lord why he still wanted to leave him with his men. He replied that they really had to go, and thanked Clyde for his kindness and hospitality. Well, where are you going, Lord Ascetic? Maybe we can go with you, and in case of danger we can help each other. Clyde tried his best to talk to the Ascetic, his fear of death making him cry. But the Ascetic silently turned around and quickly walked to the exit, and Clyde began to run after him and persuade him. But the ascetic jumped on his horse and asked in surprise if the king was chasing him or if he was imagining things. He added that they were the Shining Church, not the king's guards, 
and did not have to answer to Clyde and set off. Curses! What a curse on my head! shouted the furious king. Meanwhile, one of the guards came up to him to report. He reported that they had searched the whole city but found no trace of Lenly, so he must be outside the city, and saluted the king. Shaq still couldn't understand what had happened to his father, and asked him again. Without explaining anything to his son, the king ordered him to gather all the people and leave through the back door. Shaq stood there in amazement. Meanwhile, Clyde was furiously thinking that he was the only one who saw the true horror of Lenly's abilities. So without the protection of the ascetics, it was becoming more and more dangerous every minute. Shaq was in charge of the cavalry and gave orders to all sides to gather quickly. The soldiers began to fuss. Meanwhile, Lenly and Baby landed on top of Shaq's house using air magic and being quiet. He began to quietly climb the stairs to the top of the tower. He told Bibi that Shaq must have told Clyde about him, and he guessed that Lenly was nearby. He told Bibi to watch the door they came to. Lenly began to generate air elemental magic, and a green glow spread over his hands. The next magic he used was wind detection magic, which he used to find out more about the king's plans. With the help of tracking magic, Lenly saw through the walls how King Clyde and his soldiers were gathering all the treasures in the house. Hurry up, everyone! Clyde shouted to the soldiers. Lenly noticed that everyone was gathering at the back door. He smiled. Everything was going according to his plan. Meanwhile, Clyde was ordering everyone to hurry up, and if something was too heavy, not to take it with them. He was in a great hurry to get away safely. Lenly whispered, Bebe, where are you? The mouse reported that she was in the bushes watching the entrance, and as soon as the king came out, she would do everything in a flash. Full dragonization, Lenly exclaimed and began to transform into a dragon. Bibi shouted, Cl Clyde's finally out, and Lenly took off and flew towards him. Clyde looked up and could only shout, Lenly! His greatest fear had come true. The soldiers who had seen the dragon began to shout that they were being attacked by a monster and had to protect the king, and began to rush about in panic. Where are you going to run to, Clady? Lenly growled at him, rage filling his heart. Lenly was sitting on the stone fence and did not see that a black warrior, Kaiser, had come to the fence with a dagger. He quickly jumped out and began to attack, but Lenly was not confused and managed to shout Earth Thorns, and sharp thorns came out of the ground from all sides of Kaiser. Geyser, this time I won't let you attack me from behind, shouted an angry Lenly, remembering his previous defeat. The earthy thorns spread all over the yard and surrounded King Clyde who was squealing like a pig in fright, and Lenly circled him like a kite. Thorns surrounded his whole body, but Clyde remained alive, standing with thorns cutting through his hat. Realizing that his time had come, he begged Lenly to let him go and began to cry. Clyde, don't ask me. You're going to die today, and I've decided there's only one choice left for you. Lenly shouted at him, holding the activated purple blade to his throat. Either you die now, or you tell me who killed my mother. Lenly shouted even louder as he loomed over him. Meanwhile, Kaiser was also aiming at Lenly, but Clyde told him to stop because then everyone would die. I'll tell you, he replied to Lenly in tears. And he began to say that every year the Shining Church offers the Sovereign the purest souls of people. What did this have to do with my mother? Lenly shouted in his face. Her soul was very bright and pure and she made everyone feel calm and happy, so I ordered Patterson to capture her. Clyde continued to say, tearfully recalling the image of Lenly's mother. On that day twelve years ago, he was walking along the wet streets of Feng Lai, and on that street, Clyde saw Lenly's mother calmly going about her business. She was the kind of pure soul that the church needed to have a shining church, Clyde went on to explain, describing Mother Lenly. And so I ordered Patterson to capture her, and he did as I told him, along with the other soldiers and he took her to the Shining Church, chained up. The Sovereign was already waiting for her to perform the ceremony. Lindley's mother had been brutally murdered, and her soul offered to the Shining Sovereign. And this was the reason why the Shining Church decided to reward Clyde with a divine blessing that had never been given to anyone before, which promoted him from a seventh-ranked warrior to a ninth-ranked warrior. The Shining Church also gave him holy protection in the form of a magic scroll. Clyde explained to the boy.
Did you just tell me the truth? Lenly shouted at him, pressing his dagger to the king's throat. Now you know everything and who your real enemy is. But with your powers, I'm not sure you can fight against the Shining Church. Think about it, Clyde answered him quietly. Linley, it sounds like he's telling the truth, Dellen whispered softly to him. Boy, I've been thinking about it, Clyde began to mumble. If it wasn't for that reason, why else would the attitude of the Shining Church have changed so much since you tried to kill me? Well, that's why, exclaimed Lenla. And suddenly Shaq, who had finally seen his father, began to shout at him to let his father go because he had already told everything. Let Clyde go. If I let him go, then why didn't he let my mother go that day? Shaq shouted to Lenly. The boy did not think to change his plans, and with a flick of his purple blade he killed King Clyde in cold blood. Clyde screamed loudly. His voice could be heard throughout the city. His life story was over. Lenly, with tears in his eyes, thought that today he had finally avenged and killed Clyde, but he had not yet fully avenged his mother. Dylan and Bibi, the mouse, looked at Lenly in silence and with horror in their eyes. There was only one thought in Lenly's mind. The Shining Church. Let's go, baby, he commanded the mouse. And they left the courtyard where the soldiers and King Shaq's son remained numb from what they had seen. Under the silence and without a fight, Lenly calmly and resolutely left the courtyard, his heart still filled with rage and revenge against the sovereign of the church. After walking down a deserted street for a while, they both saw six silhouettes of unknown men dressed in strange white clothes, their faces covered with masks and white caps on their heads. They were special enforcers from the church tribunal, and their appearance meant big problems. Dylan whispered frightenedly from her ring that these people were very dangerous, and Lenly said loudly, What are these special executors from the church tribunal doing here? One of the executors loudly told him that Lenly Baruch's name was on the red list. And that was why they were going to kill him. The church members immediately surrounded Lenly around the perimeter and prepared to attack him. Suddenly, Kaiser and Shaq raised their voices. They were still quietly following Lenly. The black warrior told the enforcers that his name was Kaiser, and the prince of the Fung Lai kingdom was with him, and they were servants of the church. So could they leave? The performer told him that they were not on the red list and therefore free to leave. Dillin, meanwhile, continued to whisper that these people are not easy to fight. As long as Kaiser and Shaq are leaving, you should take this chance and leave too. You don't need to waste your energy fighting them, she said. Linley thought about Dillon's words for a while and remained silent, assessing the situation. And then he shouted the spells Elemental Wind and Speedy Flight and flew swiftly into the sky. The performers looked at him in amazement. Suddenly, Lenly noticed that the guards were also following him into the air and surrounding him again. They're getting too close and I need to get away from them, thought Lenly. So he increased his speed, but the guards kept up with him. After a minute of flying, Lenly asked Baby if they had broken away from the guards. And then Lenly hid his face bitterly on something. Some unknown force was in front of him like transparent glass. Then a strange pink glow engulfed him. Because he collided with the glow with all his might, Lenly fell to the ground with great speed, creating a huge hole on impact. What is this, and why does it stop me even in my dragon form? Lenly could only think, and the executors were already flocking to him. The tribunal's executors lifted his body from the stones with the help of the glow, and Lenly hung in the air. Beb the mouse began to scream that they were surrounded by a hexagram that the executors had imposed, and its power was enormous. What should they do now? Lindley looked at the hexagram with her, which was constantly shrinking around them. The guy gave an order. Baby, try to go underground and I'll try to get out through the air. Lindley shouted the spell run and flew up with all his might. But the performers saw Bebe go underground, and one of them gave the order to get her out and launched the hexagram underground. Babe the mouse was sitting underground and suddenly began to feel the power coming from there. Lindley also failed to break through the frosted defense and he and Baby found themselves in a transparent environment, hanging in the air. The hexagram is getting bigger, and these three performers are increasing their attack. Baby shouted while shaking her head. At that moment, Lenly gave an order, pointing to one of the performers on the ground, that he should concentrate on him and kill him, and then the hexagram's defenses would collapse, and the mouse nodded her head. 
and it rushed into battle with the performer, screaming at the top of its lungs. Linley shouted the spell, Blade, and activated his huge new sword. And together with Baby, they attacked the church performer from the air, screaming. At this point, Lenley was only thinking, would the other performers come to his aid, or would they watch him kill him? Dellen just managed to shout out to him that she thought the powers of the Six were united, and didn't that mean that his power was... Lenley interrupted her and asked her what was going on. He was able to drive the performer into the ground up to his shoulders with his punch, but for some reason... He was not dead. The guy did not understand anything. Suddenly the performer pulled out his magic sword and sneakily stabbed Lenly in the shoulder. The boy was too close to him, and he succeeded. Lenly felt a crazy sharp pain, and only had time to think that his protective scales did not even slow down the performer's sword. The performer began to gradually rise from the hole and struck at Lenly with his sword again. Again. He severely wounded him, and for some reason the legendary dragon scales failed to protect him. A large bloody hole was visible in Lenly's shoulder. Dealing shouted in shock that the striking power of this sword was only slightly weaker than that of a saint-level expert. Was she shocked by what she saw? Bebe the mouse transformed into a beast and began to attack the performer with all her speed and strength. But she lost her focus for a second, and the performer stabbed her with his sword right in the body. Lenly saw this and started screaming. Baby was on fire. She tried to extinguish herself, but she was alive after that and shouted to Lenly that she was completely fine. After what happened to Baby, Lenly's anger reached incredible proportions. He shouted two spells, Dragon Blood Warrior and Battle Aura, and combined both magic into one stream. Then he shouted, Battle Aura, again doubling the aura and strengthening it with it. Revenge, anger, and rage tore through Lenly, and he began to attack. But the executors of the church tribunal saw his intentions, and simultaneously all four of them launched four pink streams of their magic directly at Lenly. Lenly took the hilt of his great sword and pointed it at the pink streams and tried to resist them. But his sword did not work as it should, and he could not understand what was happening. The aura of the performer's battle was boundless, and yet the magic of the performers won this battle. The four pillars united into one and hit Lenly directly in the body. The force of the blow was so great that Lenly flew to Shaq's house and hit the tower, completely destroying it. B thought that it was the end for her master and ran to him as fast as she could. But as she approached, she saw that the dragon scales that covered Lenly began to fall off completely, and she screamed in fear. Dylan saw Lenly fall down in fear and screamed his name. The boy himself was lying among a pile of stones and showed no signs of life. He had lost consciousness and looked as if he were dead. One of the performers looked down at Lenly and said that he had used his aura to fight against them and was now very weak. So they decided to finish him off and started to approach. When Dellen saw them, she quickly flew to Lenly and started shaking him to wake up immediately because the enemy was coming. But he did not regain consciousness. Meanwhile, the performers chorused the spell Earth Pierces, and again the earth thorns crawled across the surface of the earth. Deline shouted for Lenly to at least get up and move away from the advancing thorns. Suddenly, the boy opened his eyes and saw a frightened Bibi. The mouse, happy that her master had woken up, exclaimed that thank God he had woken up, because she thought Lenly was seriously injured, to which the boy barely replied that he was indeed seriously injured. What are you talking about, boss? Bebe shouted at him. Lindley was already lying between the sharp thorns that were now completely blocking his body, and he could barely tell Delling that he had used up his last strength in this attack and could no longer continue. Teacher Delling, I have failed you, wheezed Lindley, who could not even move his arms. The performer hovering in the air above Lindley shouted that he was barely hanging on and ordered him to hit him with a single spell and finally kill him. Dylan heard this and couldn't let his favorite student get killed, so she made the most serious decision of her life and started accumulating the power of the earth element. Lindley looked at her and instantly understood everything, and shouted at her that if she did this, she would be exposed immediately. Dylan calmly told him that as she watched him grow up, she became proud of his success, and even considered him a member of the family, and she swiftly took to the air telling him that from now on he had to rely on himself. 
Lenly shouted her name and cried. The performers looked at the silhouette approaching them and asked each other who it was and why this stranger had such strong spiritual energy. Dylan shouted her first spell, Heavenly Meteor Shower, and directed her magic directly at the performers. And at that moment, huge meteors covered in flames began to fly from the sky. One of the performers shouted, What is this, skills of the highest saint level? It's not possible. But it was too late for them to do anything. The fiery meteorites struck the performers, and they burned to ashes in an instant, with only their last screams echoing through the neighborhood. Shaq's house was completely destroyed by the force of the meteorite explosions. Deline stood calmly and looked at what was finally over. And she said quietly, It's finally over, and this is my power that I had 5,000 years ago. Delon walked straight through the fire as if over an unburnable bump. Master Delon! shouted Lenly, who had finally managed to get up. The boy was hysterical. He knew what was about to happen. Delon looked around and sighed. She seemed to be getting lighter and losing color for some reason. Bibi could finally tell through her eyes that Delon was incredibly strong. She quietly told Lenly that her spiritual power was now completely spent. And at that moment, the ring hanging around Lenly's neck cracked, and the boy noticed that Delon's body became even lighter. My time is coming to an end, Deline said sadly as she became transparent. No, Master Delon, Lenly shouted at her, crying as hard as he could and watching her melt. My boy, I am so grateful to you for waking me up and letting me live a more righteous life. Goodbye, my boy, Lenly. Dellen said quietly, looking at him. The boy was hysterical, on his knees, crying. Go on living. And she touched Lenly's claw with a transparent finger, and her hand began to shine and become invisible. And then it turned into a bright star and quietly disappeared. Lenly was screaming with a voice that was not his own, and kicking the ground, he had lost one of the most precious people in his life. Beeb the mouse could not understand what had happened and asked Lenly why her big sister had disappeared. Lenly could not say a word, and then the boy shouted at the top of his lungs like a wolf, Master Delin! and the echo echoed around him. He stood and cried, constantly repeating the same thing, Please don't disappear, please don't disappear, and cried bitterly among the ruins. In the midst of all these events, no one noticed that one of the performers managed to escape and make it to the undestroyed part of the city. He was bleeding and could barely move his legs. He shouted to the people he met on his way to run away as fast as they could, and an angry Lenly was already flying after him. The boy easily caught up with him and struck him with all the fury of his great sword, leaving him only a wet spot. The people who were standing there stared at Lenly numbly and scattered hysterically with the words, Monster. Lenly was still in the body of a dragon. Yale, George, and Renard were also in the crowd and heard the people shouting, Monster! Dragon! But they could not understand what was happening. Finally, Yale realized that it must be Lenly, and he started running towards the dragon with full confidence that it was his mate in the body of a dragon. And he was right. Running up to the boy, he began to shake him, seeing that Lenly was a little out of it and tried to calm him down. The boys also ran to Lenly with joyful shouts. When they ran to him and hugged him, they all saw that Lenly could barely stand and began to lift him up. Yale looked at the destroyed performer and said that Lenly had just killed all the special performers of the church, and if they found out, Lenly would be dead. They had to run away as fast as possible. Lenly could not say anything but, Teacher Delon is gone, and cried endlessly on his shoulder. Durgan Renard looked at each other and asked who Delon was they didn't know. Lindley picked up Bibi's mouse covered in wounds and wandered away in silence, forgetting to redragonize. And your heavy sword? Yale shouted after him, surprised. Lindley looked back and said that he couldn't even lift it. His strength was gone. Yale lost his patience. He and the boys hung the sword on his back and taking Lindley by the hand, he ordered everyone to follow him, and they went deeper into the city of Hess. After a while, the boys reached a castle. Yale explained that this was their home and it was very safe. Lenly would not find the Shining Church here, and so he could finally rest here. It was the secret home of the Dawson conglomerate, a rather spacious old house, but tidy. Yale still said that it was not modern, but Lenly would be able to stay here. And he turned to the boy, but he was already lying on the stairs, sound asleep. 
and the boys were silent at what they saw. They tried to wake him up, but it was all in vain. Lenly continued to sleep on the mortar. After some time passed, all three came to Lenly again. Renard asked him how many days he had been sleeping here. He had been sleeping here for two days, Yale replied sadly. They could not understand whether the boy was really tired or maybe. Days passed. After five days, they gathered again near Lenly. Yale began to scream, but how much sleep can you get? All three of them began to shake him with words. Cheer up, Lenly, you mustn't get too sleepy, and tried to bring him to his senses. Be serious, Georg shouted at him. Well, at least for me, Yale shouted. They were already starting to get hysterical from the desperation. For the sake of the family, mumbled Lenly, who finally began to show signs of life. Finally, Lenly woke up. The boys shouted in unison, and he struggled to get up and sit down and repeated the word family again. The boy finally started to come to his senses a little bit, and he kept thinking that his mother was dead. His father was also killed by someone, and now his only teacher was gone. He could not understand the reason why, after all the suffering for the sake of his family. And he was hysterical again, shouting to his friends to leave him alone because he wanted to be quiet and alone. Lenly's reaction shocked everyone. Yuyel was torn by his words, and he started shouting back at him that the longer he behaved like this, the more reasons they had not to leave him. He looked around at the other guys, and they were already running away in fear. Well then, keep listening to your silence, Yale said and ran away too. Lenly nervously dressed in his suit and went out with Bebby the Mouse to the yard. He took off his ring from his neck and held it in his hand thinking that Teacher Dellen would always be wearing that ring and waiting in solitude, probably wanting him to talk to her more. The ring was silent. But only during my magic will I be able to talk to her. If I had talked to her more before, it would have been much better. Lenly could not calm down. He looked at the ring and recalled the image of Dellen. How she looked, how she spoke, how she laughed. Sadness was tearing him apart from the inside out. Meanwhile, all three boys were in the yard on the other side of the house, and Yale looked carefully at the street and thought he saw his father. It was indeed Monroe Dawson, who was running and shouting at him. His horse was running so fast that the fat man could barely keep up. Yale shouted at him in surprise. What's wrong with his riding? This is no time for laughter. Something terrible is happening now. A huge horde of magical monsters is moving towards the city of Hesse. Monroe shouted to him. It was clear that he was very scared. His father's fear was transmitted to Yale. Monroe continued to shout that the army of the city's warriors would not last long. Get ready, Jail. We are leaving right now. Quickly tell the maids to pack. George and Renard, who had also heard this, began to panic. They were very scared. But Lenly's condition, Yale shouted back. It doesn't matter, but we must leave Hess tonight, shouted old Dawson. A whole darkness of magical monsters was indeed approaching the outskirts of Hesse City, burning and destroying everything in their path. Rows of soldiers were already lined up to defend the city. Yale ran into Lenly's room and started screaming, scared and anxious because he remembered the ruins of Feng Lai. The army of magical beasts has already broken through the border, and they all have to leave Hesse City tonight. And you're still sitting here, mourning, Yale shouted like a madman. Are we leaving? I understand. Lenly answered him quietly. Renard, who had also run into Lenly's room, took him by the scruff of the neck and started shouting that he had always admired him and bragged about him to everyone. Why do you admire me? What is there to admire about you? Look at you now. What have you become? You tried to kill Clyde and you killed him. You killed the people of the Shining Church. Isn't that something to be admired? Renard continued to shout, trying to bring Lenly to his senses. It's because they wanted to kill me, Lenly answered him quietly. Why did they want to kill you? George, who had also run into the room, interrupted the conversation. Because the Shining Church killed my mother? George asked him in surprise if this was true, and if he wanted revenge. And again the gleam of revenge flashed in Lenly's eyes, and he remembered all the recent events of his life. But look at you, you can't even think about revenge, shouted the furious Georg, who was the calmest person in his life. And then something unusual happened. Lenly screamed and reached up to the ceiling and pierced it. 
the boys were numb from what they saw. Revenge, 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 Lenley shouted at the top of his lungs. He finally woke up, and the familiar feeling of revenge filled his whole body. With a roar, he fell to the floor and growled. If they hadn't killed his mother and father, he wouldn't have sought revenge. If they hadn't, Master Dellen wouldn't have disappeared. It's all because of the Shining Church, Lenley shouted, and his eyes were already burning with real fire. I will take revenge on the Shining Church, he shouted so that the boy's ears began to ring. That's right, that's right, only revenge! All three of them shouted back at him. Baby looked at her master with tears in her eyes and whispered that the boiling blood of her boss was finally here again. Meanwhile, the magical beasts on the outskirts of Hesse City were already destroying the defensive walls and killing its defenders. The people of the Dawson conglomerate were quickly gathering and preparing to leave. Yale shouted to Lenley to get on his horse because they were about to leave. Lenley looked at him calmly and replied, Yale, George, Renard, I am very grateful to you, but I will go alone. Yale was torn by this answer. But the guy explained to his surprised friends that they shouldn't worry. This time the enemy was too strong and he couldn't risk them all. And using his aerial magic, he flew up into the air with Bebe. Georg shouted to him to remember that they are all brothers and no matter when it happens, they will always be there for him. Yale smiled and shouted that he could not stop him. And then he told everyone to go to their places and they were on their way. Lindley flew quickly over the forest and Bebe the mouse kept asking him where they would look for his revenge. The boy answered that first they would go to the center of the mountainous abundance of magical beasts, then they would go north of the center, and to the very end. He needed to hone his skills with a heavy sword, because he was not very good with it to fight the Shining Church. I will fulfill Master Dellen's last will and testament, and live longer and become stronger, shouted Lenly to the whole forest, and then I will take my revenge on the Shining Church. He shouted so loudly that it seemed he could be heard in every corner of the planet. Two years passed and Lenley became a grown-up. He grew long hair and grew noticeably taller. Bibi the mouse also changed. She became bigger and now had a real horn on her head like a unicorn. As usual, she demanded to eat. No, Bebe? It's time to get ready to go, Lenley replied. After staying in the mountain's abundance, Lenley became a very grown-up. He continued to tell Bebe that it was better to catch up with them, and then we would eat. Bebe was angry. She had other plans. Lenly really looked good. He was dressed in a completely different costume. He was courageous, strong, pumped up, a real dragon-blooded warrior of the Baruch family. He took off and flew with Bebe, easily cutting through the air with his body and maneuvering. Indeed, his soaring skills had become even better. To make the flight less boring, they had as much fun as they could. And when they reached the lake, they jumped into the water laughing. And after swimming for a while underwater, they came out laughing. Then Lenly swam with ease on the surface, swimming straighter, zigzagging, frightening the magical fish. Suddenly, Bebe waved her paw and shouted, Boss, look over there! A black panther was standing on the shore of the lake. Lenly looked and calmly said that the animal's movements were very light because he didn't even feel it walk on the ground. The panther began to chase them with a roar. Lindley quickly activated his spatial ring and it glowed purple. The power of the ring activated a heavy sword, and Lindley picked it up and began to attack. With all his strength, he struck the panther's body with the sword. It was only from this blow that the panther fell dead. Lindley looked at its body and said businesslike that it was only a seventh-level beast, just an electric panther. Boss, I think you can now use the sword to fight level eight beasts, Bebe shouted at him. Doesn't that mean you'll be even stronger after dragonization? Bebe asked him. After listening to her, Lenly replied that for the past two years he had been nourishing his dragon blood aura with his strength. He had also been using ancient techniques and had finally managed to develop his own personal lightning strike technique. That's cool. So does that mean the heavy sword is stronger than the flexible sword? Bebe asked him again, but Lenly didn't hear her. He just grumbled that he wasn't strong enough yet. But he did explain to Bebe that according to his ancestors' records, there are three stages of using heavy weapons. The first stage is mastery. The second stage is handling the heavy weapon as if it were light. And the third stage is the application, which is the most important. How does it work? 
Bebe asked him. The boy replied that he did not know exactly he would have to test it during training in the mountainous abundance and twirled the heavy sword in his hands. Lenly sat down to meditate. He had been practicing this very often for the past two years, and it was meditation that helped him improve his skills. Baby decided to get some sleep, but not before she noticed a new magical animal on the top of the mountain that looked like a striped hyena. Linley was in deep meditation because he had defeated several Zeras during the day, so Beb could not wake him up. So she decided to fight the monster herself. She transformed into a beast mouse and began to attack the hyena, hitting it once, twice, and Bibi was surprised to see that her attacks had no effect. Didn't you even scratch it? She shouted. And she flew off to attack again. Meanwhile, the hyena just took her with one paw and threw her away and the mouse flew away on the grass, thinking that the animal was too strong. Lenly opened one eye and watched it struggle, then said that it was an earth wolf, not a magical beast. Its earth elemental construction was made up entirely of mage power and elemental essence, and it had no weaknesses. Then how am I supposed to defeat it? Bibi shouted. Try a different attack, Lenly advised her and smiled. And Bebe screamed in a voice that wasn't her own and began to turn around in the air. With all her might, she slammed her body into the dirt wolf, tearing it to pieces. Meanwhile, Lenly also shouted loudly, spreading his arms. He exclaimed that he thought he had already become an eighth-level magician. So soon. This wolf was level eight? Bibi asked him in surprise. Yes, indeed, it was my eighth-level magician's mind power. Lenly answered her and telepathically helped Bibe kill the earth wolf. After a short rest in meditation, Lenly began to train again and activated his dragon blood magic. For a while he fought with a heavy sword, but something seemed wrong. Then he activated his purple blood and began to swing his flexible sword, hitting harder and harder. As he practiced, he noticed that there was something wrong with the purple blood, and that it was giving off a strange aura. After stabbing the flexible sword into the ground, he stood there looking at it, and wondering if the flexible sword had some secret, just like the ring. This made Lenly very angry, and he was determined to find out. Lenly activated his purple blood again, and something strange began to happen. He felt as if he was going to be torn to pieces. His body was engulfed in fire. The guy barely managed to stop, grabbing his head and trying to catch his breath. At that moment, the same words were repeated in his head. Destroy, 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 destroy everything around. He broke out in a cold sweat and his legs shook. Instantly his body rose and he flew into the gorge without controlling his flight. Baby was frightened and did not understand what was happening. She flew quickly after him and saw Lenly standing in the depths of the gorge with a bloody sword. Five magic monsters lying around him and they were all dead. What's wrong, boss? What's going on? Baby cried out. Lenly shouted that it was all the purple blood, and he had no idea who the previous owner was. The guy thought about it for a while and said that purple blood can emit such a killer aura, and when it is free, it can destroy everything around it, and it is unknown how many opponents it has already destroyed. So you shouldn't be swinging this sword around. Does this sword scare me? Baby cried out. As the sword emitted a killing aura, Baby was so frightened that she was numb, and even the beast was so depressed that it could not even move. Lenly put the power back into the ring. Okay, baby. Now that so many monsters are dead, let's at least collect the magic crystals and continue our journey, Lenly said. Beeb the mouse loved collecting magic crystals and happily said, Oh, how many legs I can buy with them, and went off to collect them. She gathered all the crystals in a ball and sat on Lenly's shoulder, holding them in front of her and the boy laughed at her happy face. He pushed off the stone and flew up into the sky, and they continued their journey together. After a while, Lenly landed in the middle of the forest. Two bald men stood next to him in the clearing. One of them was missing an eye, but they were wearing military armor. The one-eyed man spotted Lenly nearby and exclaimed that he did not expect to see a human being here. They headed in his direction, coming closer and greeting him. One of them said that they came in peace and explained that they were both lost and asked if they could go with Lenly. The boy looked at them appraisingly and remained silent. Lenly shouted, I'm not interested, and quickly took off into the sky. 
The men began to chase him and tried to persuade him to stop. Lenly stopped for a moment and looked back. The two strangers fell to their knees and begged him to let them follow him, and as soon as they got out of there, they would pay the reward. Lenly sighed and agreed to let them accompany him. The strangers were happy and began to thank him. The wicked Bibe snapped at them and said that if they were weak, they should not go to the mountain where magical animals abound, and stuck out her tongue. And they all left. Lenly walking in front, and the two strangers walking at a distance behind. Bibi hanging on Lenly's back and looking the men straight in the eyes. After about five minutes of silence, one of the men said they were from the O'Brien Empire, southwestern province, and asked where Lenly was from. The man remained silent, and Bebe snapped and said, Why are they asking? If you want to come with us, don't ask too many questions. The stranger could not understand her speech and could only hear her squeaking and wondered why the evil mouse was screeching so loudly. The one-eyed man asked the other man unhappily if they would get out of here. The other man replied, Look how calmly this guy's walking here. He must be very strong. Maybe they can get out of here with his help. They crossed a mountain river, and Lenly stopped. The men asked him why he was standing there because they were in the center of the mountain's abundance. They begged him to get out of there as soon as possible, and begged him with tears to take them out, and then he would rest. Lenly still stood there and remained silent. Looking at them, he thought that these men were suspicious, and wondered what they were up to. He told them that he wanted to get some rest. Suddenly, something unknown attacked one of the strangers. It was so fast that no one even had time to look at it. The stranger fell to the ground from the impact. Lenly was surprised to see the result of the attack and wondered what kind of speed it was. He and Babe stared at the scene as if mesmerized, unable to say a word. Something unfamiliar had killed one of the men, and one eye was shouting not to be killed or touched. Finally, B.B. told Lenly that this monster was very fast. In all the time they had been living on the mountain, she had never seen such a fast animal. She had not even seen its movements. And B.B. the mouse was a level nine beast after all, and it was impossible for her to have seen nothing unless it was a saint-level beast. Lenly rushed over to the one-eyed man and shouted at him to tell him everything about himself. Otherwise, he would leave him here. The one-eyed man began to shake and cry. He told him that he and his brother were part of a reconnaissance team that had been sent to the mountain range for training. They were also going to find crystals to sell, but after three days of training, they met a terrible monster. Monster? Lenly asked him in surprise. It was a jaguar, shouted the one-eyed man. Black, big, fast, and scary. Not a black panther, but a jaguar. Because panthers are not so fast. The body of this monster was covered with dark stripes, the one-eyed man continued to tell. Have you ever heard of such a beast, Bibi? Lenly asked the mouse. Nope, I've never heard of a beast that could scare you to such a degree. It seems that this beast is quite a difficult one, Bibi answered. The one-eyed man fell to his knees and began to cry bitterly, adding that there were twelve of them at first, and when the beast began to hunt them, it could have killed them all at once but it killed them one by one, mocking them so much. They even had one warrior of the ninth level, but he also lost to the calls of this jaguar. Now I'm left alone and I have no choice. I don't want to die, cried the one-eyed man bitterly. You don't want to die and that's why you drag me into all this? Lenly asked him again. You don't have to follow me, the one-eyed man shouted, and he suggested that Bibe find the jaguar as soon as possible. Lenly and the mouse hid in the shadows of the mountain in search of the black jaguar's tracks. Bibi's mouse made up her own version of events and said that the jaguar probably thought they were part of the bald, one-eyed man's group. Lenly snapped and told her to keep an eye on the perimeter. After a while, they noticed eyes glowing in the bush and growling. The black jaguar leapt from its hiding place so quickly that Lenly could only manage to order Bib to find a way to attack stealthily because it would be a difficult fight. Lindley summoned a dragon blood warrior and transformed into his enhanced dragon. Lindley shouted the following spell, dragon blood power, and slammed it into the body of the jaguar which began to attack him. When Lindley hit the animal with his dragon tail, he was amazed to see that it did not cause any damage. 
so he decided to use his heavy sword and stab the jaguar right in the face. Shouting, I try it, he struck again and again. But this strange jaguar was not phased. It attacked with great force and nothing happened. Lenly began to panic, and then Bibi started shouting to him that the black jaguar was growing and rapidly increasing in size. Lenly's eyes widened. There was a jaguar standing in front of them that had grown five times in size. Lenly summoned the magic of the wind with all his might. The jaguar was already ten meters away from him. And the guy hit him directly in the face with an airstream to slow down his speed. Lenly noticed that the jaguar's body became stronger, but its speed really dropped. That's when he decided to use the magic of the wind element to prevent it from catching him. He managed to fly under the jaguar's body so that it didn't even realize where Lenly had gone. The boy managed to scratch its stomach with his claws while flying under it. Lenly flew back up into the air and quickly cast the 8th level Holy Hurricane Cyclone wind magic. And the wind began to fly in a circle around the black jaguar. Then he shouted out heavy sword strike and struck the jaguar's body with all his might. This attack sent the jaguar flying with a roar on the ground, but it was still alive. When he finally got to his feet, he began to catch Lenly, who was flying over him like a restless fly. The boy shouted to him that he knew the black jaguar understood everything he was saying. I'm giving you a chance. If you become my subject, I'll save your cat's life, shouted the furious Lenly. The black jaguar did not give up and aggressively rushed towards Lenly. But he could not do anything to him. He could not fly. Lenly shouted at him again that he would beat him until he agreed. And again he stabbed the black jaguar in the back with his sword. Do you still not agree? Lenly asked him again, and he stabbed him again. And then he noticed the frightened eyes of the jaguar, which finally began to run away from him. Is that parasite running away? Lenly shouted after the jaguar and began to chase it as fast as he could. You will never outrun my dream of wind, the boy shouted after him as he caught up with him. Bebe, as an interpreter of the animal language, told Lenly that the jaguar was saying that he would never give up because Lenly could not beat him. Lenly whispered that of course it was true, but with the help of the magic of the wind element, he was almost catching up with him. And he came up with a new cunning plan by activating his ring on his hand. Gravity field, Lenly shouted, and the black jaguar stopped abruptly and fell to the ground as if it were glued. Lenly drew a circle of fire around it, and the animal lay sprawled out and whimpering. Are you going to run away now? Lenly gloated. And at first the jaguar growled, then whimpered, and then began to meow. But the gravitational field held it tightly as if it were a magnet. Bebe giggled and said that when the ring of fire closed, the cat would not go anywhere, and the circle of fire began to shrink. The black jaguar sighed and became as busy as a cat. Bib was surprised to tell Lenly that the jaguar had said it was finally giving up. Lenly went closer to the jaguar and told him that from now on, they would sign a contract of souls as a sign of loyalty to each other. And he put his hand on the jaguar's head, and a green glow spread over the jaguar's black skin. And at that moment something incredible happened. Lenly and Bibi saw the jaguar's body change.